round the sofa long ago i was placed by my parents under the medical treatment of a certain dr dawson a surgeon in edinburgh who had obtained a reputation for the cure of a particular class of diseases i was sent with my governess into lodgings near his house in the old town i was to combine lessons from the excellent edinburgh masters with the medicines and exercises needed for my indisposition it was at first rather dreary to leave my brothers and sisters and to give up our merry out-of-doors life with our country home for dull lodgings with only poor grave miss duncan for a companion and to exchange our romps in the garden and rambles through the fields for stiff walks in the streets the decorum of which obliged me to tie my bonnet strings neatly and put on my shawl with some regard to straightness the evenings were the worst it was autumn and of course they daily grew longer they were long enough i am sure when we first settled down in those grey and drab lodgings for you must know my father and mother were not rich and there were a great many of us and the medical expenses to be incurred by my being placed under mr dawson's care were expected to be considerable therefore one great point in our search after lodgings was economy my father who was too true a gentleman to feel false shame had named this necessity for cheapness to mr dawson and in return mr dawson had told him of those at number six cromer street in which we were finally settled the house belonged to an old man at one time a tutor to young men preparing for the university in which capacity he had become known to mr dawson but his pupils had dropped off and when we went to lodge with him i imagined that his principal support was derived from a few occasional lessons which he gave and from letting the rooms that we took a drawing-room opening into a bedroom out of which a smaller chamber led his daughter was his housekeeper a son whom we never saw was supposed to be leading the same life that his father had done before him only we never saw or heard of any pupils and there was one hard-working honest little scottish maiden square stumpy neat and plain who might have been any age from eighteen to forty looking back on the household now there was perhaps much to admire in their quiet endurance of decent poverty but at this time their poverty grated against many of my tastes for i could not recognize the fact that in a town the simple graces of fresh flowers clean white muslin curtains pretty bright chintzes all cost money which is saved by the adoption of dust-coloured moreen and mud-coloured carpets there was not a penny spent on mere elegance in that room yet there was everything considered necessary to comfort but after all such mere pretences of comfort a hard slippery black horsehair sofa which was no place of rest an old piano serving as a sideboard a grate narrowed by inner supplement till it hardly held a handful of the small coal which could scarcely ever be stirred up into a genial blaze but there were two evils worse than even this coldness and bareness of the rooms one was that we were provided with a latch-key which allowed us to open the front door whenever we came home from a walk and go upstairs without meeting any face of welcome or hearing the sound of a human voice in the apparently deserted house mr mackenzie piqued himself on the noiselessness of his establishment and the other which might almost seem to neutralize the first was the danger we were always exposed to on going out of the old man sly miserly and intelligent popping out upon us from his room close to the left hand of the door with some civility which we learned to distrust as a mere pretext for extorting more money yet which it was difficult to refuse such as the offer of any books out of his library a great temptation for we could see into the shelf-lined room but just as we were on the point of yielding there was a hint of the consideration to be expected for the loan of books of so much higher a class than any to be obtained at the circulating library which made us suddenly draw back 
another time he came out of his den to offer us written cards to distribute among our acquaintance on which he undertook to teach the very things i was to learn but i would rather have been the most ignorant woman that ever lived than tried to learn anything from that old fox in breeches when we had declined all his proposals he went apparently into dudgeon once when we had forgotten our latch-key we rang in vain for many times at the door seeing our landlord standing all the time at the window to the right looking out of it in an absent and philosophical state of mind from which no signs and gestures of ours could arouse him the women of the household were far better and were more really respectable though even on them poverty had laid her heavy left hand instead of her blessing right miss mackenzie kept us as short in our food as she decently could we paid so much a week for our board be it observed and if one day we had less appetite than another our meals were docked to the smaller standard until miss duncan ventured to remonstrate the sturdy maid of all work was scrupulously honest but looked discontented and scarcely vouchsafed us thanks when on leaving we gave her what mrs dawson had told us would be considered handsome in most lodgings i do not believe finis ever received wages from the mackenzies but that dear mrs dawson the mention of her comes into my mind like the bright sunshine into our dingy little drawing-room came on those days as a sweet scent of violets greets the sorrowful passer among the woodlands mrs dawson was not mr dawson's wife for he was a bachelor she was his crippled sister an old maid who had what she called taken her brevet rank after we had been about a fortnight in edinburgh mr dawson said in a sort of half doubtful manner to miss duncan my sister bids me say that every monday evening a few friends come in to sit around her sofa for an hour or so some before going to gayer parties and that if you and miss greatorex would like a little change she would only be too glad to see you any time from seven to eight to-night and i must add my injunctions both for her sake and for that of my little patients here that you leave at nine o'clock after all i do not know if you will care to come but margaret bade me ask you and he glanced up suspiciously and sharply at us if either of us had felt the slightest reluctance however well disguised by manner to accept this invitation i am sure he would have at once detected our feelings and withdrawn it so jealous and chary was he of anything pertaining to the appreciation of his beloved sister but if it had been to spend an evening at a dentist's i believe i should have welcomed the invitation so weary was i of the monotony of the nights in our lodgings and as for miss duncan an invitation to tea was of itself a pure and unmixed honour and one to be accepted with all becoming form and gratitude so mr dawson's sharp glances over his spectacles failed to detect anything but the truest pleasure and he went on you'll find it very dull i dare say only a few old fogies like myself and one or two good sweet young women i never know who'll come margaret is obliged to lie in a darkened room only half lighted i mean because her eyes are weak oh it will be very stupid i dare say don't thank me till you've been once and tried it and then if you like it your best thanks will be to come again every monday from half past seven to nine you know good-bye good-bye hitherto i had never been out to a party of grown-up people and no court ball to a london young lady could seem more redolent of honour and pleasure than this monday evening to me dressed out in new stiff book muslin made up to my throat a frock which had seemed to me and my sisters the height of earthly grandeur and finery alice our old nurse had been making it at home in contemplation of the possibility of such an event during my stay in edinburgh but which had then appeared to me a robe too lovely and angelic to be ever worn short of heaven i went with miss duncan to mr dawson's at the appointed time 
we entered through one small lofty room perhaps i ought to call it an antechamber for the house was old-fashioned and stately and grand the large square drawing-room into the centre of which mrs dawson's sofa was drawn behind her a little was placed a table with a great cluster candlestick upon it bearing seven or eight wax lights and that was all the light in the room which looked to me very vast and indistinct after our pinched up apartment at the mackenzies mrs dawson must have been sixty and yet her face looked very soft and smooth and childlike her hair was quite grey it would have looked white but for the snowiness of her cap and satin ribbon she was wrapped in a kind of dressing-gown of french grey merino the furniture of the room was deep rose colour and white and gold the paper which covered the walls was indian beginning low down with a profusion of tropical leaves and birds and insects and gradually diminishing in richness of detail till at the top it ended in the most delicate tendrils and most filmy insects mr dawson had acquired much riches in his profession and his house gave one this impression in the corners of the rooms were great jars of eastern china filled with flower leaves and spices and in the middle of all this was placed the sofa on which poor mrs margaret dawson passed whole days and months and years without the power of moving by herself by and by mrs dawson's maid brought in tea and macaroons for us and a little cup of milk and water and a biscuit for her then the door opened we had come very early and in came edinburgh professors edinburgh beauties and celebrities all on their way to some other gayer and later party but coming first to see mrs dawson and tell her their bon mots or their interests or their plans by each learned man by each lovely girl she was treated as a dear friend who knew something more about their own individual selves independent of their reputation and general society character than any one else it was very brilliant and very dazzling and gave enough to think about and wonder about for many days monday after monday we went stationary silent what could we find to say to any one but mrs margaret herself winter passed summer was coming still i was ailing and weary of my life but still mr dawson gave hopes of my ultimate recovery my father and mother came and went but they could not stay long they had so many claims upon them mrs margaret dawson had become my dear friend although perhaps i had never exchanged as many words with her as i had with miss mackenzie but then with mrs dawson every word was a pearl or a diamond people began to drop off from edinburgh only a few were left and i am not sure if our monday evenings were not all the pleasanter there was mr sperano the italian exile banished even from france where he had long resided and now teaching italian with meek diligence in the northern city there was mr preston the westmoreland squire or as he preferred to be called statesman whose wife had come to edinburgh for the education of their numerous family and who whenever her husband had come over on one of his occasional visits was only too glad to accompany him to mrs dawson's monday evenings he and the invalid lady having been friends from long ago these and ourselves kept steady visitors and enjoyed ourselves all the more for having the more of mrs dawson's society one evening i had brought the little stool close to her sofa and was caressing her thin white hand when the thought came into my head and out i spoke it tell me dear mrs dawson said i how long you have been in edinburgh you do not speak scotch and mr dawson says he is not scotch no i am lancashire liverpool born said she smiling don't you hear it in my broad tongue i hear something different to other people but i like it because it's just you is that lancashire i dare say it is for though i am sure lady ludlow took pains enough to correct me in my younger days 
I never could get rightly over the accent. Lady Ludlow, said I, what had she to do with you? I heard you talking about her to Lady Madeline Stuart the first evening I ever came here. You and she seemed so fond of Lady Ludlow. Who is she? She is dead, my child, dead long ago. I felt sorry I had spoken about her. Mrs. Dawson looked so grave and sad. I suppose she perceived my sorrow, for she went on and said, My dear, I like to talk and to think of Lady Ludlow. She was my true, kind friend and benefactress for many years. Ask me what you like about her, and do not think you give me pain. I grew bold at this. Will you tell me all about her then, please, Mrs. Dawson? Nay, said she, smiling. That would be too long a story. Here are Signor Sperano and Miss Duncan, and Mr. and Mrs. Preston are coming tonight. Mr. Preston told me. How would they like to hear an old world story, which after all would be no story at all, neither beginning nor middle nor end, only a bundle of recollections? If you speak of me, madame, said Signor Sprano, I can only say you do me one great honour by recounting in my presence anything about any person that has ever interested you. Miss Duncan tried to say something of the same kind. In the middle of her confused speech, Mr. and Mrs. Preston came in. I sprang up. I went to meet them. Oh, said I, Mrs. Dawson is just going to tell us all about Lady Ludlow and a great deal more, only she is afraid it won't interest anybody. Do say you would like to hear it. Mrs. Dawson smiled at me, and in reply to their urgency, she promised to tell us all about Lady Ludlow, on condition that each one of us should, after she had ended, narrate something interesting which we had either heard or which had fallen within our own experience. We all promised willingly and then gathered round her sofa to hear what she could tell us about my Lady Ludlow. My Lady Ludlow, Part 1 I am an old woman now, and things are very different to what they were in my youth. Then we, who travelled, travelled in coaches, carrying six inside, and making a two-day's journey, out of what people now go over in a couple of hours with a whiz and a flash and a screaming whistle enough to deafen one. Then letters came in but three times a week. Indeed, in some places in Scotland where I have stayed when I was a girl, the post came in but once a month. But letters were letters then, and we made great prizes of them, and read them and studied them like books. Now the post comes rattling in twice a day, bringing short jerky notes, some without beginning or end, but just a little sharp sentence, which well-bred folks would think too abrupt to be spoken. Well, well, they may all be improvements, I dare say they are, but you will never meet with a Lady Ludlow in these days. I will try and tell you about her. It is no story. It has... As I said, neither beginning, middle, nor end. My father was a poor clergyman with a large family. My mother was always said to have good blood in her veins, and when she wanted to maintain her position with the people she was thrown among, principally rich democratic manufacturers, all for liberty and the French Revolution, she would put on a pair of ruffles trimmed with real old English point, very much darned to be sure but which could not be bought new for love nor money as the art of making it was lost years before these ruffles showed as she said that her ancestors had been somebodies when the grandfathers of the rich folk who now looked down upon her had been nobodies if indeed they had any grandfathers at all I don't know whether anyone out of our own family ever noticed these ruffles, but we were all taught as children to feel rather proud when my mother put them on, and to hold up our heads as became the descendants of the lady who had first possessed the lace. 
not but what my dear father often told us that pride was a great sin we were never allowed to be proud of anything but my mother's ruffles and she was so innocently happy when she put them on often poor dear creature to a very worn and threadbare gown that i still think even after all my experience of life they were a blessing to the family you will think that i am wandering away from my lady ludlow not at all the lady who had owned the lace ursula hanbury was a common ancestress of both my mother and my lady ludlow and so it fell out that when my poor father died and my mother was sorely pressed to know what to do with her nine children and looked far and wide for signs of willingness to help lady ludlow sent her a letter proffering aid and assistance i see that letter now a large sheet of thick yellow paper with a straight broad margin left on the left-hand side of the delicate italian writing writing which contained far more in the same space of paper than all the sloping or masculine handwriting of the present day it was sealed with a coat of arms a lozenge for lady ludlow was a widow my mother made us notice the motto foy et loi and told us where to look for the quarterings of the hanbury arms before she opened the letter indeed i think she was rather afraid of what the contents might be for as i have said in her anxious love for her fatherless children she had written to many people upon whom to tell truly she had but little claim and their cold hard answers had many a time made her cry when she thought none of us were looking i do not even know if she had ever seen lady ludlow all i knew of her was that she was a very grand lady whose grandmother had been half-sister to my mother's great-grandmother but of her character and circumstances i had heard nothing and i doubt if my mother was acquainted with them i looked over my mother's shoulder to read the letter it began dear cousin margaret dawson and i think i felt hopeful from the moment i saw those words she went on to say stay i think i can remember the very words dear cousin margaret dawson i have been much grieved to hear of the loss you have sustained in the death of so good a husband and so excellent a clergyman as i have always heard that my late cousin richard was esteemed to be there said my mother laying a finger on the passage read that aloud to the little ones let them hear how their father's good report travelled far and wide and how well he is spoken of by one whom he never saw cousin richard how prettily her ladyship writes go on margaret she wiped her eyes as she spoke and laid her finger on her lips to still my little sister cecily who not understanding anything about the important letter was beginning to talk and make a noise you say you are left with nine children i too should have had nine if mine had all lived i have none left but rudolph the present lord ludlow he is married and lives for the most part in london but i entertain six young gentlewomen at my house at connington who are to me as daughters save that perhaps i restrict them in certain indulgences in dress and diet that might be befitting in young ladies of a higher rank and of more probable wealth these young persons all of condition though out of means are my constant companions and i strive to do my duty as a christian lady towards them one of these young gentlewomen died at her own home whither she had gone upon a visit last may will you do me the favour to allow your eldest daughter to supply her place in my household she is as i make out about sixteen years of age she will find companions here who are but a little older than herself i dress my young friends myself and make each of them a small allowance for pocket money they have but few opportunities for matrimony as Connington is far removed from any town. The clergyman is a deaf old widower. My agent is married. 
and as for the neighbouring farmers, they are, of course, below the notice of the young gentlewoman under my protection. Still, if any young woman wishes to marry, and has conducted herself to my satisfaction, I give her a wedding dinner, her clothes, and her house linen, and such as remain with me to my death, will find a small competency provided for them in my will. I reserve to myself the option of paying their travelling expenses. Disliking gadding woman on the one hand, on the other, not wishing by too long absence from the family home to weaken natural ties. If my proposal pleases you and your daughter, or rather if it pleases you, for I trust your daughter has been too well brought up to have a will in opposition to yours, let me know, dear cousin Margaret Dawson, and I will make arrangements for meeting the young gentlewoman at Caverstock, which is the nearest point to which the coach will bring her. My mother dropped the letter and sat silent. I shall not know what to do without you, Margaret. A moment before, like a young untried girl as I was, I had been pleased at the notion of seeing a new place and leading a new life, but now my mother's look of sorrow and the children's cry of remonstrance mother i won't go i said nay but you had better replied she shaking her head lady ludlow has much power she can help your brothers it will not do to slight her offer so we accepted it after much consultation we were rewarded or so we thought for afterwards, when I came to know Lady Ludlow, I saw that she would have done her duty by us as helpless relations, however we might have rejected her kindness, by a presentation to Christ's Hospital for one of my brothers. And this was how I came to know my Lady Ludlow. I remember well the afternoon of my arrival at Hanbury Court. Her ladyship had sent to meet me at the nearest post-town at which the mail-coach stopped. There was an old groom inquiring for me, the ostler said, if my name was Dawson, from Hanbury Court, he believed. I felt it rather formidable, and first began to understand what was meant by going among strangers when I lost sight of the guard to whom my mother had entrusted me. I was perched up in a high gig with a hood to it, such as in those days was called a chair, and my companion was driving deliberately through the most pastoral country I had ever yet seen. By and by we ascended a long hill, and the man got out and walked at the horse's head. I should have liked to walk too, very much indeed, but I did not know how far I might do it, and, in fact, I dared not speak to ask to be helped down the deep steps of the gig. We were at last at the top, on the long, breezy, sweeping, unenclosed piece of ground called, as I afterwards learnt, a chase. The groom stopped, breathed, patted his horse, and then mounted again to my side. Are we near Hanbury Court? I asked. Near? Why, miss, we've a matter of ten miles yet to go. Once launched into conversation, we went on pretty glibly. I fancy he had been afraid of beginning to speak to me, just as I was to him. But he got over his shyness with me sooner than I did mine with him. I let him choose the subjects of conversation, although very often I could not understand the points of interest in them. For instance, he talked for more than a quarter of an hour of a famous race which a certain dog fox had given him, above thirty years before and spoke of all the covers and turns just as if i knew them as well as he did and all the time i was wondering what kind of an animal a dog fox might be after we left the chase the road grew worse no one in these days who has not seen the by-roads of fifty years ago can imagine what they were we had to quarter as randall called it nearly all the way along the deep rutted miry lanes and the tremendous jolts i occasionally met with made my seat in the gig so unsteady that i could not look about me at all i was so much occupied in holding on the road was too muddy for me to walk without dirtying myself more than i liked to do just before my first sight of my lady ludlow 
but by and by when we came to the fields in which the lane ended i begged randall to help me down as i saw that i could pick my steps among the pasture grass without making myself unfit to be seen and randall out of pity for his steaming horse wearied with the hard struggle through the mud thanked me kindly and helped me down with a springing jump the pastures fell gradually down to the lower land shut in on one side by rows of high elms as if there had been a wide grand avenue here in former times down the grassy gorge we went seeing the sunset sky at the end of the shadowed descent suddenly we came to a long flight of steps if you run down there miss i'll go round and meet you and then you'd better mount again for my lady will like to see you drive up to the house are we near the house said i suddenly checked by the idea down there miss replied he pointing with his whip to certain stacks of twisted chimneys rising out of a group of trees in deep shadow against the crimson light and which lay just beyond a great square lawn at the base of the steep slope of a hundred yards on the edge of which we stood i went down the steps quietly enough i met randall and the gig at the bottom and falling into a side road to the left we drove sedately round through the gateway and into the great court in front of the house the road by which we had come lay right at the back hanbury court is a vast red brick house at least it is cased in part with red bricks and the gatehouse and walls about the place are of brick with stone facings at every corner and door and window such as you see at hampton court at the back are gables and arched doorways and stone mullions which show so lady ludlow used to tell us that it was once a priory there was a prior's parlour i know only we called it mrs meldicott's room and there was a tithe barn as big as a church and rows of fish ponds all got ready for the monks fasting days in old times but all this i did not see till afterwards i hardly noticed this first night the great virginian creeper said to have been the first planted in england by one of my lady's ancestors that half covered the front of the house as i had been unwilling to leave the guard of the coach so did i now feel unwilling to leave randall a known friend of three hours but there was no help for it in i must go past the grand-looking old gentleman holding the door open for me on into the great hall on the right hand into which the sun's last rays were sending in glorious red light the gentleman was now walking before me up a step on to the dais as i afterwards learnt that it was called then again to the left through a series of sitting-rooms opening one out of another and all of them looking into a stately garden glowing even in the twilight with the bloom of flowers we went up four steps out of the last of these rooms and then my guide lifted up a heavy silk curtain and i was in the presence of my lady ludlow she was very small of stature and very upright she wore a great lace cap nearly half her own height i should think that went round her head caps which tie under the chin and which we call mobs came in later and my lady held them in great contempt saying people might as well come down in their nightcaps in front of my lady's cap was a great bow of white satin ribbon and a broad band of the same ribbon was tied right around her head and served to keep the cap straight she had a fine indian muslin shawl folded over her shoulders and across her chest and an apron of the same a black silk mode gown made with short sleeves and ruffles and with the tail thereof pulled through the pocket hole so as to shorten it to a useful length beneath it she wore as i could plainly see a quilted lavender satin petticoat her hair was snowy white but i hardly saw it it was so covered with her cap her skin even at her age was waxen in texture and tint her eyes were large and dark blue and must have been her great beauty when she was young 
for there was nothing particular as far as i can remember either in mouth or nose she had a great gold-headed stick by her chair but i think it was more as a mark of state and dignity than for use for she had as light and brisk a step when she chose as any girl of fifteen and in her private early walk of meditation in the mornings would go as swiftly from garden alley to garden alley as any one of us she was standing up when i went in i dropped my curtsy at the door which my mother had always taught me as a part of good manners and went up instinctively to my lady she did not put out her hand but raised herself a little on tiptoe and kissed me on both cheeks you are cold my child you shall have a dish of tea with me she rang a little handbell on the table by her and her waiting-maid came in from a small ante-room and as if all had been prepared and was waiting my arrival brought with her a small china service with tea ready made and a plate of delicate cut bread and butter every morsel of which i could have eaten and been none the better for it so hungry was i after my long ride the waiting-maid took off my cloak and i sat down sorely alarmed at the silence the hushed footfalls of the subdued maiden over the thick carpet and the soft voice and clear pronunciation of my lady ludlow my teaspoon fell against my cup with a sharp noise that seemed so out of place and season that i blushed deeply my lady caught my eye with hers both keen and sweet were those dark blue eyes of her ladyship's your hands are very cold my dear take off those gloves i wore thick serviceable doe-skin and had been too shy to take them off unbidden and let me try and warm them the evenings are very chilly and she held my great red hands in hers soft warm white ring-laden looking at last a little wistfully into my face she said poor child and you're the eldest of nine i had a daughter who would have been just your age but i cannot fancy her the eldest of nine then came a pause of silence and then she rang her bell and desired her waiting-maid adams to show me to my room it was so small that i think it must have been a cell the walls were whitewashed stone the bed was of white dimity there was a small piece of red stair carpet on each side of the bed and two chairs in a closet adjoining were my washstand and toilet table there was a text of scripture painted on the wall right opposite to my bed and below hung a print common enough in those days of king george and queen charlotte with all their numerous children down to the little princess amelia in a go-cart on each side hung a small portrait also engraved on the left it was louis the sixteenth on the other marie antoinette on the chimney-piece there was a tinder-box and a prayer-book i do not remember anything else in the room indeed in those days people did not dream of writing-tables and inkstands and portfolios and easy-chairs and what not we were taught to go into our bedrooms for the purpose of dressing and sleeping and praying presently i was summoned to supper i followed the young lady who had been sent to call me down the wide shallow stairs into the great hall through which i had first passed on my way to my lady ludlow's room there were four other young gentlewomen all standing and all silent who curtsied to me when i first came in they were dressed in a kind of uniform muslin caps bound round their heads with blue ribbons plain muslin handkerchiefs lawn aprons and drab coloured stuff gowns they were all gathered together at a little distance from the table on which were placed a couple of cold chickens a salad and a fruit tart on the dais there was a smaller round table on which stood a silver jug filled with milk and a small roll near that was set a carved chair with a countess's coronet surmounting the back of it i thought that some one might have spoken to me but they were shy and i was shy or else there was some other reason but indeed almost the minute after i had come into the hall by the door at the lower end 
her ladyship entered by the door opening upon the dais whereupon we all curtsied very low i because i saw the others do it she stood and looked at us for a moment young gentlewomen said she make margaret dawson welcome among you and they treated me with the kind politeness due to a stranger but still without any talking beyond what was required for the purposes of the meal after it was over and grace was said by one of our party my lady rang her handbell and the servants came in and cleared away the supper things then they brought in a portable reading desk which was placed on the dais and the whole household trooping in my lady called to one of my companions to come up and read the psalms and lessons for the day i remember thinking how afraid i should have been had i been in her place there were no prayers my lady thought it schismatic to have any prayers excepting those in the prayer book and would as soon have preached a sermon herself in the parish church as have allowed any one not a deacon at the least to read prayers in a private dwelling-house i am not sure that even then she would have approved of his reading them in an unconsecrated place she had been maid of honour to queen charlotte a hanbury of that old stock that flourished in the days of the plantagenets and heiress of all the land that remained to the family of the great estates which had once stretched into four separate counties hanbury court was hers by right she had married lord ludlow and had lived for many years at his various seats and away from her ancestral home she had lost all her children but one and most of them had died at these houses of lord ludlow's and i dare say that gave my lady a distaste to the places and a longing to come back to hanbury court where she had been so happy as a girl i imagine her girlhood had been the happiest time of her life for now i think of it most of her opinions when i knew her in later life were singular enough then but had been universally prevalent fifty years before for instance while i lived at hanbury court the cry for education was beginning to come up mr rakes had set up his sunday schools and some clergymen were all for teaching writing and arithmetic as well as reading my lady would have none of this it was levelling and revolutionary she said when a young woman came to be hired my lady would have her in and see if she liked her looks and her dress and question her about her family her ladyship laid great stress upon this latter point saying that a girl who did not warm up when any interest or curiosity was expressed about her mother or the baby if there was one was not likely to make a good servant then she would make her put out her feet to see if they were well and neatly shod then she would bid her say the lord's prayer and the creed then she inquired if she could write if she could and she had liked all that had gone before her face sank it was a great disappointment for it was an all but inviolable rule with her never to engage a servant who could write but i have known her ladyship break through it although in both cases in which she did so she put the girl's principles to a further and unusual test in asking her to repeat the ten commandments one pert young woman and yet i was sorry for her too only she afterwards married a rich draper in shrewsbury who had got through her trials pretty tolerably considering she could write spoilt all by saying glibly at the end of the last commandment and please your ladyship i can cast accounts go away wench said my lady in a hurry you're only fit for trade you will not suit me for a servant the girl went away crestfallen in a minute however my lady sent me after her to see that she had something to eat before leaving the house and indeed she sent for her once again but it was only to give her a bible and to bid her beware of french principles which had led the french to cut off the kings and queens heads the poor blubbering girl said indeed my lady i wouldn't hurt a fly much less a king and i cannot abide the french nor frogs neither for that matter but my lady was inexorable and took a girl who could neither read nor write 
to make up for her alarm about the progress of education towards addition and subtraction and afterwards when the clergyman who was at hanbury parish when i came there had died and the bishop had appointed another and a younger man in his stead this was one of the points on which he and my lady did not agree while good old deaf mr mountford lived it was my lady's custom when indisposed for a sermon to stand up at the door of her large square pew just opposite to the reading desk and to say at that part of the morning service where it is decreed that in choirs and places where they sing here followeth the anthem mr mountford i will not trouble you for a discourse this morning and we all knelt down to the litany with great satisfaction for mr mountford though he could not hear had always his eyes open about this part of the service for any of my lady's movements but the new clergyman mr gray was of a different stamp he was very zealous in all his parish work and my lady who was just as good as she could be to the poor was often crying him up as a godsend to the parish and he never could send a miss to the court when he wanted broth or wine or jelly or sago for a sick person but he needs must take up the new hobby of education and i could see that this put my lady sadly about one sunday when she suspected i know not how that there was something to be said in his sermon about a sunday school which he was planning she stood up as she had not done since mr manford's death two years and better before this time and said mr gray i will not trouble you for a discourse this morning but her voice was not well assured and steady and we knelt down with more of curiosity than satisfaction in our minds mr gray preached a very rousing sermon on the necessity of establishing a sabbath school in the village my lady shut her eyes and seemed to go to sleep but i don't believe she lost a word of it though she said nothing about it that i heard until the next saturday when two of us as was the custom were riding out with her in her carriage and we went to see a poor bedridden woman who lived some miles away at the other end of the estate and of the parish and as we came out of the cottage we met mr gray walking up to it in a great heat and looking very tired my lady beckoned him to her and told him she would wait and take him home with her adding that she wondered to see him there so far from his home for that it was beyond a sabbath day's journey and from what she had gathered from his sermon the last sunday he was all for judaism against christianity he looked as if he did not understand what she meant but the truth was that besides the way in which he had spoken up for schools and schooling he had kept calling sunday the sabbath and as her ladyship said the sabbath is the sabbath and that's one thing it is saturday and if i keep it i'm a jew which i'm not and sunday is sunday and that's another thing and if i keep it i'm a christian which i humbly trust i am but when mr gray got an inkling of her meaning in talking about the sabbath day's journey he only took notice of a part of it he smiled and bowed and said no one knew better than her ladyship what were the duties that abrogated all inferior laws regarding the sabbath and that he must go in and read to old betty brown so that he would not detain her ladyship but i shall wait for you mr gray said she or i will take a drive around by oakfield and be back in an hour's time for you see she would not have him feel hurried or troubled with the thought that he was keeping her waiting while he ought to be comforting and praying with old betty a very pretty young man my dears said she as we drove away but i shall have my pew glazed all the same we did not know what she meant at the time but the next sunday but one we did she had the curtains all round the grand old hanbury family seat taken down and instead of them there was glass up to the height of six or seven feet we entered by a door with a window in it that drew up or down just like what you see in carriages this window was generally down and then we could hear perfectly but if mr gray used the word sabbath or spoke in favour of schooling and education my lady stepped out of her corner and drew up the window with a decided clang and clash 
I must tell you something more about Mr. Gray. The presentation to the living of Hanbury was vested in two trustees, of whom Lady Ludlow was one. Lord Ludlow had exercised this right in the appointment of Mr. Mountford, who had won his lordship's favour by his excellent horsemanship. Nor was Mr. Mountford a bad clergyman, as clergymen went in those days. He did not drink, though he liked good eating as much as any one. And if any poor person was ill, and he heard of it, he would send them plates from his own dinner of what he himself liked best, sometimes of dishes which were almost as bad as poison to sick people. He meant kindly to everybody except dissenters, whom Lady Ludlow and he united in trying to drive out of the parish. And among dissenters he particularly abhorred Methodists. Someone said because John Wesley had objected to his hunting. But that must have been long ago, for when I knew him he was far too stout and too heavy to hunt. Besides, the bishop of the diocese disapproved of hunting, and had intimated his disapprobation to the clergy. For my own part, I think a good run would not have come amiss, even in a moral point of view, to Mr. Mountford. He ate so much, and took so little exercise, that we young women often heard of his being in terrible passions with his servants, and the sexton and clerk. But they none of them minded him much, for he soon came to himself, and was sure to make them some present or other, some said in proportion to his anger. So that the sexton, who was a bit of a wag, as all sextons are, I think, said that the vicar saying, the devil take you, was worth a shilling any day, whereas the deuce was a shabby sixpenny speech, only fit for a curate. There was a great deal of good in Mr. Mountford, too. He could not bear to see pain, or sorrow, or misery of any kind, and if it came under his notice, he was never easy till he had relieved it, for the time at any rate. But he was afraid of being made uncomfortable, so if he possibly could, he would avoid seeing any one who was ill or unhappy, and he did not thank any one for telling him about them. "'What would your ladyship have me do?' he once said to my Lady Ludlow, when she wished him to go and see a poor man who had broken his leg. "'I cannot piece the leg, as the doctors can. I cannot nurse him as well as his wife does. I may talk to him, but he no more understands me than I do the language of the alchemists. My coming puts him out. He stiffens himself into an uncomfortable posture, out of respect to the cloth, and dare not take the comfort of kicking and swearing and scolding his wife while I am there. I hear him with my figurative ears, my lady, heave a sigh of relief when my back is turned, and the sermon that he thinks I ought to have kept for the pulpit, and have delivered to his neighbours, whose case, as he fancies, it would just have fitted, as it seemed to him to be addressed to the sinful, is all ended, and done for the day. I judge others as myself, I do to them as I would be done to. That's Christianity, at any rate. I should hate, saving your ladyship's presence, to have my Lord Ludlow coming and seeing me, if I were ill. T'would be a great honour, no doubt, but I should have to put on a clean nightcap for the occasion, and sham patience in order to be polite, and not weary his lordship with my complaints. I should be twice as thankful to him if he would send me game, or a good fat haunch, to bring me up to that pitch of health and strength one ought to be in to appreciate the honour of a visit from a nobleman. So I shall send Jerry Butler a good dinner every day till he is strong again and spare the poor old fellow my presence and advice. My lady would be puzzled by this, and by many other of Mr. Mountford's speeches, but he had been appointed by my lord, and she could not question her dead husband's wisdom. And she knew that the dinners were always sent, and often a guinea or two to help to pay the doctor's bills. And Mr. Mountford was true blue, as we call it, to the backbone, hated the dissenters and the French, and could hardly drink a dish of tea without giving out the toast of church and king and down with the rump moreover he had once had the honour of preaching before the king and queen and two of the princesses at weymouth and the king had applauded his sermon audibly with very good very good 
and that was a seal put upon his merit in my lady's eyes besides in the long winter sunday evenings he would come up to the court and read a sermon to us girls and play a game of piquet with my lady afterwards which served to shorten the tedium of the time my lady would on those occasions invite him to sup with her on the dais but as her meal was invariably bread and milk only mr mountford preferred sitting down among us and made a joke about its being wicked and heterodox to eat meagre on sunday a festival of the church we smiled at this joke just as much the twentieth time we heard it as we did at the first for we knew it was coming because he always coughed a little nervously before he made the joke for fear my lady would not approve and neither she nor he seemed to remember that he had ever hit upon the idea before mr mountford died quite suddenly at last we were all very sorry to lose him he left some of his property for he had a private estate to the poor of the parish to furnish them with an annual christmas dinner of roast beef and plum pudding for which he wrote out a very good receipt in the codicil to his will moreover he desired his executors to see that the vault in which the vicars of hanbury were interred was well aired before his coffin was taken in for all his life long he had a dread of damp and latterly he kept his rooms to such a pitch of warmth that some thought it hastened his end then the other trustee as i have said presented the living to mr gray fellow of lincoln college oxford it was quite natural for us all as belonging in some sort to the hanbury family to disapprove of the other trustee's choice but when some ill-natured person circulated the report that mr gray was a moravian methodist i remember my lady said she could not believe anything so bad without a great deal of evidence my lady ludlow part two before i tell you about mr gray i think i ought to make you understand something more of what we did all day long at hanbury court there were five of us at the time of which i am speaking all young women of good descent and allied however distantly to people of rank when we were not with my lady mrs medlicott looked after us a gentle little woman who had been companion to my lady for many years and was indeed i have been told some kind of relation to her mrs medlicott's parents had lived in germany and the consequence was she spoke english with a very foreign accent another consequence was that she excelled in all manner of needlework such as is not known even by name in these days she could darn either lace table linen india muslin or stockings so that no one could tell where the hole or rent had been though a good protestant and never missing guy fawkes day at church she was as skilful at fine work as any nun in a papist convent she would take a piece of french cambric and by drawing out some threads and working in others it became delicate lace in a very few hours she did the same by holland's cloth and made coarse strong lace with which all my lady's napkins and table linen were trimmed we worked under her during a great part of the day either in the still room or at our sewing in a chamber that opened out of the great hall my lady despised every kind of work that would now be called fancy work she considered that the use of coloured threads or worsted was only fit to amuse children but that grown women ought not to be taken with mere blues and reds but to restrict their pleasure in sewing to making small and delicate stitches she would speak of the old tapestry in the hall as the work of her ancestresses who lived before the reformation and were consequently unacquainted with pure and simple tastes in work as well as in religion nor would my lady sanction the fashion of the day which at the beginning of this century made all the fine ladies take to making shoes she said that such work was a consequence of the french revolution which had done much to annihilate all distinctions of rank and class and hence it was 
that she saw young ladies of birth and breeding handling lasts and awls and dirtly cobbler's wax like shoemaker's daughters very frequently one of us would be summoned to my lady to read aloud to her as she sat in her small withdrawing-room some improving book it was generally mr addison's spectator but one year i remember we had to read sturm's reflections translated from a german book mrs medlicott recommended mr sturm told us what to think about for every day in the year and very dull it was but i believe queen charlotte had liked the book very much and the thought of her royal approbation kept my lady awake during the reading mrs chapone's letters and dr gregory's advice to young ladies composed the rest of our library for weekday reading i for one was glad to leave my fine sewing and even my reading aloud though this lasted keep me with my dear lady to go to the still room and potter about among the preserves and the medicated waters there was no doctor for many miles around and with mrs medlicott to direct us and dr buchan to go by for recipes we sent out many a bottle of physic which i dare say was as good as what comes out of the druggist's shop at any rate i do not think we did much harm for if any of our physics tasted stronger than usual mrs medlicott would bid us let it down with cochineal and water to make all safe as she said so our bottles of medicine had very little real physic in them at last but we were careful in putting labels on them which looked very mysterious to those who could not read and helped the medicines to do its work i have sent off many a bottle of salt and water coloured red and whenever we had nothing else to do in the still room mrs medlicott would set us to making bread pills by way of practice and as far as i can say they were very efficacious as before we gave out a box mrs medlicott always told the patient what symptoms to expect and i hardly ever inquired without hearing that they had produced their effect there was one old man who took six pills a night of any kind we liked to give him to make him sleep and if by any chance his daughter had forgotten to let us know that he was out of his medicine he was so restless and miserable that as he said he thought he was like to die i think ours was what would be called homeopathic practice nowadays then we learnt to make all the cakes and dishes of the season in the still room we had plum porridge and mince pies at christmas fritters and pancakes on shrove tuesday fermenty on mothering sunday violet cakes in passion week tansy pudding on easter sunday three-cornered cakes on trinity sunday and so on through the year all made from good old church receipts handed down from one of my lady's earliest protestant ancestresses every one of us passed a portion of the day with lady ludlow and now and then we rode out with her in her coach and four she did not like to go out with a pair of horses considering this rather beneath her rank and indeed four horses were very often needed to pull her heavy coach through the stiff mud but it was rather a cumbersome equipage through the narrow warwickshire lanes and i used often to think it was well that countesses were not plentiful or else we might have met another lady of quality in another coach and four where there would have been no possibility of turning or passing each other and very little chance of backing once when the idea of this danger of meeting another countess in a narrow deep rutted lane was very prominent in my mind i ventured to ask mrs medlicott what would have to be done on such an occasion and she told me that the latest creation must back for sure which puzzled me a good deal at the time although i understand it now i began to find out the use of the peerage a book which had seemed to me rather dull before but as i was always a coward in a coach i made myself well acquainted with the dates of creation of our three warwickshire earls and was happy to find that earl ludlow ranked second the oldest earl being a hunting widower and not likely to drive out 
in a carriage all this time i have wandered from mr gray of course we first saw him in church when he read himself in he was very red-faced the kind of redness which goes with light hair and a blushing complexion he looked slight and short and his bright light frizzy hair had hardly a dash of powder in it i remember my lady making this observation and sighing over it for though since the famine in seventeen hundred and ninety nine and eighteen hundred there had been a tax on hair powder yet it was reckoned very revolutionary and jacobin not to wear a good deal of it my lady hardly liked the opinions of any man who wore his own hair but this she would say was rather a prejudice only in her youth none but the mob had gone wigless and she could not get over the association of wigs with birth and breeding a man's own hair with that class of people who had formed the rioters in seventeen hundred and eighty when lord george gordon had been one of the bugbears of my lady's life her husband and his brothers she told us had been put into breeches and had had their heads shaved on their seventh birthday each of them a handsome little wig of the newest fashion forming the old lady ludlow's invariable birthday present to her sons as they each arrived at that age and afterwards to the day of their death they never saw their own hair to be without powder as some underbred people were talking of being now was in fact to insult the proprieties of life by being undressed it was english sans culottism but mr gray did wear a little powder enough to save him in my lady's good opinion but not enough to make her approve of him decidedly the next time i saw him was in the great hall mary mason and i were going to drive out with my lady in her coach and when we went downstairs with our best hats and cloaks on we found mr gray awaiting my lady's coming i believe he had paid his respects to her before but we had never seen him and he had declined her invitation to spend sunday evening at the court as mr mountford used to do pretty regularly and play a game of piquet too which mrs medlicott told us had caused my lady to be not over well pleased with him he blushed redder than ever at the sight of us as we entered the hall and dropped him our curtsies he coughed two or three times as if he would have liked to speak to us if he could but have found something to say and every time he coughed he became hotter looking than ever i am ashamed to say we were nearly laughing at him half because we too were so shy that we understood what his awkwardness meant my lady came in with her quick active step she always walked quickly when she did not bethink herself of her cane as if she was sorry to have kept us waiting and as she entered she gave us all round one of those graceful sweeping curtsies of which i think the art must have died out with her it implied so much courtesy this time it said as well as words could do i am sorry to have kept you all waiting forgive me she went up to the mantelpiece near which mr gray had been standing until her entrance and curtsying afresh to him and pretty deeply this time because of his cloth and her being hostess and he a new guest she asked him if he would not prefer speaking to her in her own private parlour and looked as though she would have conducted him there but he burst out with his errand of which he was full even to choking and which sent the glistening tears into his large blue eyes which stood further and further out with his excitement my lady i want to speak to you and to persuade you to exert your kind interest with mr latham justice latham of hathaway manor harry latham inquired my lady as mr gray stopped to take the breath he had lost in his hurry i did not know he was in the commission he is only just appointed he took the oath not a month ago more's the pity i do not understand why you should regret it the lathams have held hathaway since edward i and mr latham bears a good character although his temper is hasty my lady he has committed job gregson for stealing a fault of which he is as innocent as i 
and all the evidence goes to prove it now that the case is brought before the bench only the squires hang so together that they can't be brought to see justice and are all for sending job to jail out of compliment to mr latham saying it is his first committal and it won't be civil to tell him there is no evidence against his man for god's sake my lady speak to the gentlemen they will attend to you while they only tell me to mind my own business now my lady was always inclined to stand by her order and the lathams of hathaway court were cousins to the hanburys besides it was rather a point of honour in those days to encourage a young magistrate by passing a pretty sharp sentence on his first committals and job gregson was the father of a girl who had been lately turned away from her place as scullery maid for sauciness to mrs adams her ladyship's own maid and mr gray had not said a word of the reasons why he believed the man innocent for he was in such a hurry i believe he would have had my lady drive off to the henley court house then and there so they seemed a good deal against the man and nothing but mr gray's bare word for him and my lady drew herself up a little and said mr gray i do not see what reason either you or i have to interfere mr harry latham is a sensible kind of young man well capable of ascertaining the truth without our help but more evidence has come out since broke in mr gray my lady went a little stiffer and spoke a little more coldly i suppose this additional evidence is before the justices men of good family and of honour and credit well known in the county they naturally feel that the opinion of one of themselves must have more weight than the words of a man like job gregson who bears a very indifferent character has been strongly suspected of poaching coming from no one knows where squatting on hareman's common which by the way is extra parochial i believe consequently you as a clergyman are not responsible for what goes on there and although impolitic there might be some truth in what the magistrate said in advising you to mind your own business said her ladyship smiling and they might be tempted to bid me mind mine if i interfered mr gray might they not he looked extremely uncomfortable half angry once or twice he began to speak but checked himself as if his words would not have been wise or prudent at last he said it may seem presumptuous in me a stranger of only a few weeks standing to set up my judgment as to men's character against that of residence lady ludlow gave a little bow of acquiescence which was i think involuntary on her part and which i don't think he perceived but i am convinced that the man is innocent of this offence and besides the justices themselves allege this ridiculous custom of paying a compliment to a newly appointed magistrate as their only reason that unlucky word ridiculous it undid all the good his modest beginning had done him with my lady i knew as well as words could have told me that she was affronted at the expression being used by a man inferior in rank to those whose actions he applied it to and truly it was a great want of tact considering to whom he was speaking lady ludlow spoke very gently and slowly she always did so when she was annoyed it was a certain sign the meaning of which we had all learnt i think mr gray we will drop the subject it is one on which we are not likely to agree mr gray's ruddy colour grew purple and then faded away and his face became pale i think both my lady and he had forgotten our presence and we were beginning to feel too awkward to wish to remind them of it and yet we could not help watching and listening with the greatest interest mr gray drew himself up to his full height with an unconscious feeling of dignity little as was his stature and awkward and embarrassed as he had been only a few minutes before i remember thinking he looked almost as grand as my lady when he spoke your ladyship must remember that it may be my duty to speak to my parishioners on many subjects on which they do not agree with me 
I am not at liberty to be silent, because they differ in opinion from me. Lady Ludlow's great blue eyes dilated with surprise, and, I do think, anger, at being thus spoken to. I am not sure whether it was very wise in Mr. Gray. He himself looked afraid of the consequences, but as if he was determined to bear them without flinching. For a minute there was silence. Then my lady replied, Mr. Gray, I respect your plain speaking, although I may wonder whether a young man of your age and position has any right to assume that he is a better judge than one with the experience which I have naturally gained at my time of life, and in the station I hold. If I, madam, as the clergyman of this parish, am not to shrink from telling what I believe to be the truth to the poor and lowly, no more am I to hold my peace in the presence of the rich and titled. Mr. Gray's face showed that he was in that state of excitement which in a child would have ended in a good fit of crying. He looked as if he had nerved himself up to doing and saying things which he disliked above everything, and which nothing short of serious duty could have compelled him to do and say. And at such times every minute circumstance which could add to pain comes vividly before one. I saw that he became aware of our presence, and that it added to his discomfiture. My lady flushed up. Are you aware, sir, asked she, that you have gone far astray from the original subject of conversation? But as you talk of your parish, allow me to remind you that Hareman's Common is beyond the bounds, and that you are really not responsible for the characters and lives of the squatters on that unlucky piece of ground. Madam, I see I have only done harm in speaking to you about the affair at all. I beg your pardon and take my leave. He bowed and looked very sad. Lady Ludlow caught the expression of his face. Good morning, she cried in rather a louder and quicker way than that in which she had been speaking. Remember, Job Gregson is a notorious poacher and evildoer, and you really are not responsible for what goes on at Hareman's Common. He was near the hall door and said something, half to himself, which we heard being nearer to him, but my lady did not, although she saw that he spoke. What did he say? she asked in a somewhat hurried manner, as soon as the door was closed. I did not hear. We looked at each other, and then I spoke. He said, my lady, that, God help him, he was responsible for all the evil he did not strive to overcome. My lady turned sharp round away from us, and Mary Mason said afterwards she thought her ladyship was much vexed with both of us for having been present, and with me for having repeated what Mr. Gray had said. But it was not our fault that we were in the hall, and when my lady asked what Mr. Gray had said, I thought it right to tell her. In a few minutes she bade us accompany her in her ride in the coach. Lady Ludlow always sat forward by herself, and we girls backwards. Somehow this was a rule which we never thought of questioning. It was true that riding backwards made some of us feel very uncomfortable and faint, and to remedy this my lady always drove with both windows open, which occasionally gave her the rheumatism, but we always went on in the old way. This day she did not pay any great attention to the road by which we were going, and Coachman took his own way. We were very silent, as my lady did not speak, and looked very serious, or else in general she made these rides very pleasant, to those who were not qualmish with riding backwards, by talking to us in a very agreeable manner, and telling us of the different things which had happened to her at various places at Paris and Versailles, where she had been in her youth, at Windsor and Kew and Weymouth, where she had been with the Queen when maid of honour, and so on. But this day she did not talk at all. All at once she put her head out of the window. "'John Footman,' said she, "'where are we? Surely this is Hareman's Common?' "'Yes, and please, my lady,' said John Footman, 
and waited for further speech or orders my lady thought a while and then said she would have the steps put down and get out as soon as she was gone we looked at each other and then without a word began to gaze after her we saw her pick her dainty way in the little high-heeled shoes she always wore because they had been in fashion in her youth among the yellow pools of stagnant water that had gathered in the clayey soil john footman followed stately after afraid too for all his stateliness of splashing his pure white stockings suddenly my lady turned round and said something to him and he returned to the carriage with a half pleased half puzzled air my lady went on to a cluster of rude mud houses at the higher end of the common cottages built as they were occasionally at that day of wattles and clay and thatched with sods as far as we could make out from dumb show lady ludlow saw enough of the interiors of these places to make her hesitate before entering or even speaking to any of the children who were playing about in the puddles after a pause she disappeared into one of the cottages it seemed to us a long time before she came out but i dare say it was not more than eight or ten minutes she came back with her head hanging down as if to choose her way but we saw it was more in thought and bewilderment than for any such purpose she had not made up her mind where we should drive to when she got into the carriage again john footman stood bareheaded waiting for orders to hathaway my dears if you are tired or if you have anything to do for mrs medlicott i can drop you at barford corner and it is but a quarter of an hour's brisk walk home but luckily we could safely say that mrs medlicott did not want us and as we had whispered to each other as we sat alone in the coach that surely my lady must have gone to job gregson's we were far too anxious to know the end of it all to say that we were tired so we all set off for hathaway mr harry latham was a bachelor squire thirty or thirty-five years of age more at home in the field than in the drawing-room and with sporting men than with ladies my lady did not alight of course it was mr latham's place to wait upon her and she bade the butler who had a smack of the gamekeeper in him very unlike our own powdered venerable fine gentleman at hanbury tell his master with her compliments that she wished to speak to him you may think how pleased we were to find that we should hear all that was said though i think afterwards we were half sorry when we saw how our presence confused the squire who would have found it bad enough to answer my lady's questions even without two eager girls for audience pray mr latham began my lady something abruptly for her but she was very full of her subject what is this i hear about job gregson mr latham looked annoyed and vexed but dared not show it in his words i gave out a warrant against him my lady for theft that is all you are doubtless aware of his character a man who sets nets and springs in long cover and fishes wherever he takes a fancy it is but a short step from poaching to thieving that is quite true replied lady ludlow who had a horror of poaching for this very reason but i imagine you do not send a man to jail on account of his bad character rogues and vagabonds said mr latham a man may be sent to prison for being a vagabond for no specific act but for his general mode of life he had the better of her ladyship for one moment but then she answered but in this case the charge on which you committed him was theft now his wife tells me he can prove he was some miles distant from holmwood where the robbery took place all that afternoon she says you had the evidence before you mr latham here interrupted my lady by saying in a somewhat sulky manner no such evidence was brought before me when i gave the warrant i am not answerable for the other magistrates decision when they had more evidence before them it was they who committed him to jail i am not responsible for that my lady did not often show signs of impatience 
but we knew she was feeling irritated by the little perpetual tapping of her high-heeled shoe against the bottom of the carriage about the same time we sitting backward caught a glimpse of mr gray through the open door standing in the shadow of the hall doubtless lady ludlow's arrival had interrupted a conversation between mr latham and mr gray the latter must have heard every word of what she was saying but of this she was not aware and caught at mr latham's disclaimer of responsibility with pretty much the same argument which she had heard through our repetition that mr gray had used not two hours before and do you mean to say mr latham that you don't consider yourself responsible for all injustice or wrong-doing that you might have prevented and have not nay in this case the first germ of injustice was your own mistake i wish you had been with me a little while ago and seen the misery in that poor fellow's cottage she spoke lower and mr gray drew near in a sort of involuntary manner as if to hear all she was saying we saw him and doubtless mr latham heard his footstep and knew who it was that was listening behind him and approving of every word that was said he grew yet more sullen in manner but still my lady was my lady and he dared not speak out before her as he would have done to mr gray lady ludlow however caught the look of stubbornness in his face and it roused her as i had never seen her roused i am sure you will not refuse sir to accept my bail i offer to bail the fellow out and to be responsible for his appearance at the sessions what say you to that mr latham the offence of theft is not bailable my lady not in ordinary cases i dare say but i imagine this is an extraordinary case the man is sent to prison out of compliment to you and against all evidence as far as i can learn he will have to rot in jail for two months and his wife and children to starve i lady ludlow offer to bail him out and pledge myself for his appearance at next quarter sessions it is against the law my lady bah 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 who makes the laws such as i in the house of lords such as you in the house of commons we who make the laws in st stephen's may break the mere forms of them when we have right on our sides on our own land and among our own people the lord lieutenant may take away my commission if he heard of it and a very good thing for the county harry latham and for you too if he did if you don't go on more wisely than you have begun a pretty set you and your brother magistrates are to administer justice through the land i always said a good despotism was the best form of government and i am twice as much in favour of it now i see what a quorum is my dears suddenly turning around to us if it would not tire you to walk home i would beg mr latham to take a seat in my coach and we would drive to henley jail and have the poor man out at once a walk over the fields at this time of day is hardly fitting for young ladies to take alone said mr latham anxious no doubt to escape from his tete-a-tete drive with my lady and possibly not quite prepared to go to the illegal length of prompt measures which she had in contemplation but mr gray now stepped forward too anxious for the release of the prisoner to allow any obstacle to intervene which he could do away with to see lady ludlow's face when she first perceived whom she had had for auditor and spectator of her interview with mr latham was as good as a play she had been doing and saying the very things she had been so much annoyed at mr gray's saying and proposing only an hour or two ago she had been setting down mr latham pretty smartly in the presence of the very man to whom she had spoken of that gentleman as so sensible and of such standing in the county that it was presumption to question his doings but before mr gray had finished his offer of escorting us back to hanbury court my lady had recovered herself there was neither surprise nor displeasure in her manner as she answered i thank you mr gray i was not aware that you were here but i think i can understand on what errand you came and seeing you here recalls me to a duty i owe mr latham 
Mr. Latham, I have spoken to you pretty plainly, forgetting, until I saw Mr. Gray, that only this very afternoon I differed from him on this very question, taking completely, at that time, the same view of the whole subject which you have done, thinking that the county would be well rid of such a man as Job Gregson, whether he had committed this theft or not. Mr. Gray and I did not part quite friends, she continued, bowing towards him, but it so happened that I saw Job Gregson's wife and home. I felt that Mr. Gray had been right and I had been wrong. So, with the famous inconsistency of my sex, I came hither to scold you, smiling towards Mr. Latham, who looked half sulky yet and did not relax a bit of his gravity at her smile, for holding the same opinions that I had done an hour before. Mr. Gray, again bowing towards him, these young ladies will be very much obliged to you for your escort, and so shall I. Mr. Latham, may I beg of you to accompany me to Henley? Mr. Gray bowed very low, and went very red. Mr. Latham said something which none of us heard, but which was, I think, some remonstrance against the course he was, as it were, compelled to take. Lady Ludlow, however, took no notice of his murmur, but sat in an attitude of polite expectancy, and as we turned off on our walk, I saw Mr. Latham getting into the coach with the air of a whipped hound. I must say, considering my lady's feelings, I did not envy him his ride, though I believe he was quite in the right as to the object of the ride being illegal. Our walk home was very dull. We had no fears and would far rather have been without the awkward, blushing young man into which Mr. Gray had sunk. At every style he hesitated. Sometimes he half got over it, thinking he could assist us better in that way. Then he would turn back, unwilling to go before ladies. He had no ease of manner, as my lady once said of him, though on any occasion of duty he had an immense deal of dignity. My Lady Ludlow, Part 3 As far as I can remember, it was very soon after this that I first began to have the pain in my hip, which has ended in making me a cripple for life. I hardly recollect more than one walk after our return under Mr. Gray's escort from Mr. Latham's. Indeed, at the time, I was not without suspicion, which I never named, that the beginning of all the mischief was a great jump I had taken from the top of one of the stiles on that very occasion. Well, it is a long while ago, and God disposes of us all, and I am not going to tire you out with telling you how I thought and felt, and how, when I saw what my life was to be, I could hardly bring myself to be patient, but rather wished to die at once. You can every one of you think for yourselves what becoming all at once useless and unable to move, and by and by growing hopeless of cure, and feeling that one must be a burden to someone all one's life long, would be to an active, willful, strong girl of seventeen, anxious to get on in the world, so as, if possible, to help her brothers and sisters. So I shall only say that one among the blessings which arose out of what seemed at the time a great black sorrow was that Lady Ludlow for many years took me, as it were, into her own especial charge, and now, as I lie still and alone in my old age, it is such a pleasure to think of her. Mrs. Medlicott was great as a nurse, and I am sure I can never be grateful enough to her memory for all her kindness. But she was puzzled to know how to manage me in other ways. I used to have long, hard fits of crying, and, thinking that I ought to go home, and yet what could they do with me there, and a hundred and fifty other anxious thoughts, some of which I could tell to Mrs. Medlicott and others I could not. Her way of comforting me was hurrying away for some kind of tempting or strengthening food, a basin of melted calf's foot jelly was, I am sure she thought, a cure for every woe. There, take it, dear, take it, she would say, and don't go on fretting for what can't be helped. 
but i think she got puzzled at length at the non-efficacy of good things to eat and one day after i had limped down to see the doctor in mrs medlicott's sitting-room a room lined with cupboards containing preserves and dainties of all kinds which she perpetually made and never touched herself when i was returning to my bedroom to cry away the afternoon under pretence of arranging my clothes john footman brought me a message from my lady with whom the doctor had been having a conversation to bid me go to her in the private sitting-room at the end of the suite of apartments about which i spoke in describing the day of my first arrival at hanbury i had hardly been in it since as when we read to my lady she generally sat in the small withdrawing-room out of which this private room of hers opened i suppose great people do not require what we smaller people value so much i mean privacy i do not think that there was a room which my lady occupied that had not two doors and some of them had three or four then my lady had always adams waiting upon her in her bedchamber and it was mrs medlicott's duty to sit within call as it were in a sort of anteroom that led out of my lady's own sitting-room on the opposite side of the drawing-room door to fancy the house you must take a great square and halve it by a line at one end of this line was the hall door or public entrance at the opposite the private entrance from a terrace which was terminated at one end by a sort of postern door in an old grey stone wall beyond which lay the farm buildings and offices so that people could come in this way to my lady on business while if she were going into the garden from her own room she had nothing to do but to pass through mrs medlicott's apartment out into the lesser hall and then turning to the right as she passed on to the terrace she could go down the flight of broad shallow steps at the corner of the house into the lovely garden with stretching sweeping lawns and gay flower beds and beautiful bossy laurels and other blooming or massy shrubs with full-grown beeches or larches feathering down to the ground a little farther off the whole was set in a frame as it were by the more distant woodlands the house had been modernized in the days of queen anne i think but the money had fallen short that was requisite to carry out all the improvements so it was only the suite of withdrawing rooms and the terrace rooms as far as the private entrance that had the new long high windows put in and these were old enough by this time to be draped with roses and honeysuckles and pyracanthus winter and summer long well to go back to that day when i limped into my lady's sitting-room trying hard to look as if i had not been crying and not to walk as if i was in much pain i do not know whether my lady saw how near my tears were to my eyes but she told me she had sent for me because she wanted some help in arranging the drawers of her bureau and asked me just as if it was a favour i was to do her if i could sit down in the easy-chair near the window all quietly arranged before i came in with a footstool and a table quite near and assist her you will wonder perhaps why i was not bidden to sit or lie on the sofa but although i found one there a morning or two afterwards when i came down the fact was that there was none in the room at this time i have even fancied that the easy chair was brought in on purpose for me for it was not the chair in which i remember my lady sitting the first time i saw her that chair was very much carved and gilded with a countess's coronet at the top i tried it one day some time afterwards when my lady was out of the room and i had a fancy for seeing how i could move about and very uncomfortable it was now my chair as i learned to call it and to think it was soft and luxurious and seemed somehow to give one's body rest just in that part where one most needed it i was not at my ease that first day nor indeed for many days afterwards notwithstanding my chair was so comfortable yet i forgot my sad pain in silently wondering over the meaning of many of the things we turned out of those curious old drawers i was puzzled to know why some were kept at all a scrap of writing maybe with only a half a dozen commonplace words written on it or a bit of broken riding-whip and here and there a stone 
of which I thought I could have picked up twenty just as good in the first walk I took. But it seemed that was just my ignorance, for my lady told me they were pieces of valuable marble used to make the floors of the great Roman emperor's palaces long ago, and that when she had been a girl and made the grand tour long ago, her cousin, Sir Horace Mann, the ambassador or envoy at Florence, had told her to be sure to go into the fields inside the walls of ancient Rome, when the farmers were preparing the ground for the onion sowing, and had to make the soil fine, and pick up what bits of marble she could find. She had done so, and meant to have them made into a table, but somehow that plan fell through, and there they were, with all the dirt out of the onion field upon them. But once, when I thought of cleaning them with soap and water, at any rate, she bade me not to do so, for it was Roman dirt, earth, I think she called it, but it was dirt all the same. Then, in this bureau, were many other things, the value of which I could understand, locks of hair, carefully ticketed, which my lady looked at very sadly, and lockets and bracelets with miniatures in them, very small pictures to what they make nowadays and call miniatures. Some of them had even to be looked at through a microscope before you could see the individual expression of the faces, or how beautiful they were painted. I don't think that looking at these made my lady seem so melancholy as the seeing and touching of the hair did. But, to be sure, the hair was, as it were, a part of some beloved body which she might never touch and caress again, but which lay beneath the turf, all faded and disfigured, except perhaps the very hair from which the lock she held had been dissevered. Whereas the pictures were but pictures, after all, likenesses, but not the very things themselves. This is only my own conjecture, mind. My lady rarely spoke out her feelings, for, to begin with, she was of rank, and I have heard her say that people of rank do not talk about their feelings, except to their equals, and even to them, they conceal them, except upon rare occasions. Secondly, and this is my own reflection, she was an only child and an heiress, and as such was more apt to think than to talk, as all well brought up heiresses must be, I think. Thirdly, she had long been a widow, without any companion of her own age with whom it would have been natural for her to refer to old associations, past pleasures or mutual sorrows. Mrs. Medlicott came nearest to her as a companion of this sort, and her ladyship talked more to Mrs. Medlicott in a kind of familiar way than she did to all the rest of the household put together. But Mrs. Medlicott was silent by nature, and did not reply at any great length. Adams, indeed, was the only one who spoke much to Lady Ludlow. After we had worked our way about an hour at the bureau, her ladyship said we had done enough for one day, and as the time was come for her afternoon ride, she left me, with the volume of engravings from Mr. Hogarth's pictures on one side of me. I don't like to write down the names of them, though my lady thought nothing of it, I am sure. And, upon a stand, her great prayer-book open at the evening psalms for the day, on the other. But as soon as she was gone, I troubled myself little with either, but amused myself with looking round the room at my leisure. The side on which the fireplace stood was all panelled, part of the old ornaments of the house, for there was an Indian paper with birds and beasts and insects on it on all the other sides. There were coats of arms of the various families with whom the Hanburys had intermarried all over these panels and up and down the ceiling as well. There was very little looking-glass in the room, though one of the great drawing-rooms was called the mirror-room, because it was lined with glass which my lady's great-grandfather had brought from Venice when he was ambassador there. There were china jars of all shapes and sizes around and about the room, and some china monsters or idols, of which I could never bear the sight, they were so ugly, though I think my lady valued them more than all. There was a thick carpet on the middle of the floor, which was made of small pieces of rare wood fitted into a pattern. The doors were opposite to each other, and were composed of two heavy tall wings, and opened in the middle, moving on brass grooves inserted into the floor. 
they would not have opened over a carpet there were two windows reaching up nearly to the ceiling but very narrow and with deep window seats in the thickness of the wall the room was full of scent partly from the flowers outside and partly from the great jars of potpourri inside the choice of odours was what my lady piqued herself upon saying nothing showed birth like a keen susceptibility of smell we never named musk in her presence her antipathy to it was so well understood through the household her opinion on the subject was believed to be that no scent derived from an animal could ever be of a sufficiently pure nature to give pleasure to any person of good family where of course the delicate perception of the senses had been cultivated for generations she would instance the way in which sportsmen preserve the breed of dogs who have shown keen scent and how such gifts descend for generations among animals who cannot be supposed to have anything of ancestral pride or hereditary fancies about them musk then was never mentioned at hanbury court no more were bergamot or southernwood although vegetable in their nature she considered these two latter as betraying a vulgar taste in the person who chose to gather or wear them she was sorry to notice sprigs of them in the buttonhole of any young man in whom she took an interest either because he was engaged to a servant of hers or otherwise as he came out of church on a sunday afternoon she was afraid that he liked coarse pleasures and i am not sure if she did not think that his preference for these coarse sweetnesses did not imply a probability that he would take to drinking but she distinguished between vulgar and common violets pinks and sweetbriar were common enough roses and mignonette for those who had gardens honeysuckle for those who walked along the bowery lanes but wearing them betrayed no vulgarity of taste the queen upon her throne might be glad to smell at a nosegay of these flowers a beau pot as we called it of pinks and roses freshly gathered was placed every morning that they were in bloom on my lady's own particular table for lasting vegetable odours she preferred lavender and sweet wood roof to any extract whatever lavender reminded her of old customs she said and of homely cottage gardens and many a cottager made his offering to her of a bundle of lavender sweet woodroof again grew in wild woodland places where the soil was fine and the air delicate the poor children used to go and gather it for her up in the woods on the higher lands and for this service she always rewarded them with bright new pennies of which my lord her son used to send her down a bagful fresh from the mint in london every february attar of roses again she disliked she said it reminded her of the city and of merchants wives over rich over heavy in its perfume and lilies of the valley somehow fell under the same condemnation they were most graceful and elegant to look at my lady was quite candid about this flower leaf colour everything was refined about them but the smell that was too strong but the great hereditary faculty on which my lady piqued herself and with reason for i never met with any other person who possessed it was the power she had of perceiving the delicious odour arising from a bed of strawberries in the late autumn when the leaves were all fading and dying bacon's essays was one of the few books that lay about in my lady's room and if you took it up and opened it carelessly it was sure to fall apart at his essay on gardens listen her ladyship would say to what that great philosopher and statesman says next to that he is speaking of violets my dear is the musk rose of which you remember the great bush at the corner of the south wall just by the blue drawing-room windows that is the old musk rose shakespeare's musk rose which is dying out through the kingdom now but to return to my lord bacon then the strawberry leaves dying with a most excellent cordial smell now the hanburys can always smell this excellent cordial odour 
and very delicious and refreshing it is you see in lord bacon's time there had not been so many intermarriages between the court and the city as there have been since the needy days of his majesty charles the second and altogether in the time of queen elizabeth the great old families of england were a distinct race just as a cart horse is one creature and very useful in its place and childers or eclipse is another creature though both are of the same species so the old families have gifts and powers of a different and higher class to what the other orders have my dear remember that you try if you can smell the scent of dying strawberry leaves in this next autumn you have some of ursula hanbury's blood in you and that gives you a chance but when october came i sniffed and sniffed and all to no purpose and my lady who had watched the little experiment rather anxiously had to give me up as a hybrid i was mortified i confess and thought that it was in some ostentation of her own powers that she ordered the gardener to plant a border of strawberries on that side of the terrace that lay under her windows i have wandered away from time and place i tell you all the remembrances i have of those years just as they come up and i hope that in my old age i am not getting too like a certain mrs nickleby whose speeches were once read out aloud to me i came by degrees to be all day long in this room which i have been describing sometimes sitting in the easy chair doing some little piece of dainty work for my lady or sometimes arranging flowers or sorting letters according to their handwriting so that she could arrange them afterwards and destroy or keep as she planned looking ever onward to her death then after the sofa was brought in she would watch my face and if she saw my colour change she would bid me lie down and rest and i used to try to walk upon the terrace every day for a short time it hurt me very much it is true but the doctor had ordered it and i knew her ladyship wished me to obey before i had seen the background of a great lady's life i had thought it all play and fine doings but whatever other grand people are my lady was never idle for one thing she had to superintend the agent for the large hanbury estate i believe it was mortgaged for a sum of money which had gone to improve the late lord's scotch lands but she was anxious to pay off this before her death and so leave her own inheritance free of encumbrance to her son the present earl whom i secretly think she considered a greater person as being the heir of the hanburys though through a female line than as being my lord ludlow with half a dozen other minor titles with this wish of releasing her property from the mortgage skilful care was much needed in the management of it and as far as my lady could go she took every pains she had a great book in which every page was ruled into three divisions on the first column was written the date and the name of the tenant who addressed any letter on business to her on the second was briefly stated the subject of the letter which generally contained a request of some kind this request would be surrounded and enveloped in so many words and often inserted amidst so many odd reasons and excuses that mr horner the steward would sometimes say it was like hunting through a bushel of chaff to find a grain of wheat now in the second column of this book the grain of meaning was placed clean and dry before her ladyship every morning she sometimes would ask to see the original letter sometimes she simply answered the request by a yes or a no and often she would send for leases and papers and examine them well with mr horner at her elbow to see if such petitions as to be allowed to plough up pasture fields etc were provided for in the terms of the original agreement on every thursday she made herself at liberty to see her tenants from four to six in the afternoon mornings would have suited my lady better as far as convenience went and i believe the old custom had been to have these levees as her ladyship used to call them held before twelve but as she said to mr horner when he urged returning to the former hours 
it spoilt a whole day for a farmer if he had to dress himself in his best and leave his work in the forenoon and my lady liked to see her tenants come in their sunday clothes she would not say a word maybe but she would take her spectacles slowly out and put them on with silent gravity and look at a dirty or raggedly dressed man so solemnly and earnestly that his nerves must have been pretty strong if he did not wince and resolve that however poor he might be soap and water a needle and thread should be used before he again appeared in her ladyship's ante-room the outlying tenants had always a supper provided for them in the servants hall on thursdays to which indeed all comers were welcome to sit down for my lady said though there were not many hours left of a working man's day when their business with her was ended yet that they needed food and rest and that she should be ashamed if they sought either at the fighting lion called at this day the hanbury arms they had as much beer as they could drink while they were eating and when the food was cleared away they had a cup apiece of good ale in which the oldest tenant present standing up gave madame's health and after that was drunk they were expected to set off homewards at any rate no more liquor was given them the tenants one and all called her madame for they recognized in her the married heiress of the hanburys not the widow of a lord ludlow of whom they and their forefathers knew nothing and against whose memory indeed there rankled a dim unspoken grudge the cause of which was accurately known to the very few who understood the nature of a mortgage and were therefore aware that madame's money had been taken to enrich my lord's poor land in scotland i am sure for you can understand i was behind the scenes as it were and had many an opportunity of seeing and hearing as i lay or sat motionless in my lady's room with the double doors open between it and the anteroom beyond where lady ludlow saw her steward and gave audience to her tenants i am certain i say that mr horner was silently as much annoyed at the money that was swallowed up by this mortgage as any one and some time or other he had probably spoken his mind out to my lady for there was a sort of offended reference on her part and respectful submission to blame on his while every now and then there was an implied protest whenever the payments of the interest became due or whenever my lady stinted herself of any personal expense such as mr horner thought was only decorous and becoming in the heiress of the hanburys her carriages were old and cumbrous wanting all the improvements which had been adopted by those of her rank throughout the county mr horner would fain have had the ordering of a new coach the carriage horses too were getting past their work yet all the promising colts bred on the estate were sold for ready money and so on my lord her son was ambassador at some foreign place and very proud we all were of his glory and dignity but i fancy it cost money and my lady would have lived on bread and water sooner than have called upon him to help her in paying off the mortgage although he was the one who was to benefit by it in the end mr horner was a very faithful steward and very respectful to my lady although sometimes i thought she was sharper to him than to any one else perhaps because she knew that although he never said anything he disapproved of the hanburys being made to pay for the earl ludlow's estates and state the late lord had been a sailor and had been as extravagant in his habits as most sailors are i am told for i never saw the sea and yet he had a long sight to his own interests but whatever he was my lady loved him and his memory with about as fond and proud a love as ever wife gave husband i should think for a part of his life mr horner who was born on the hanbury property had been a clerk to an attorney in birmingham and these few years had given him a kind of worldly wisdom which though always exerted for her benefit was antipathetic to her ladyship who thought that some of her steward's maxims savoured of trade and commerce i fancy that if it had been possible 
she would have preferred a return to the primitive system of living on the produce of the land and exchanging the surplus for such articles as were needed without the intervention of money but mr horner was bitten with new-fangled notions as she would say though his new-fangled notions were what folk at the present day would think sadly behindhand and some of mr gray's ideas fell on mr horner's mind like sparks on tow though they started from two different points mr horner wanted to make every man useful and active in this world and to direct as much activity and usefulness as possible to the improvement of the hanbury estates and the aggrandizement of the hanbury family and therefore he fell into the new cry for education mr gray did not care much mr horner thought not enough for this world and where any man or family stood in their earthly position but he would have every one prepared for the world to come and capable of understanding and receiving certain doctrines for which latter purpose it stands to reason he must have heard these doctrines and therefore mr gray wanted education the answer in the catechism that mr horner was most fond of calling upon a child to repeat was that to what is thy duty towards thy neighbour the answer mr gray liked best to hear repeated with unction was that to the question what is the inward and spiritual grace the reply to which lady ludlow bent her head the lowest as we said our catechism to her on sundays was to what is thy duty towards god but neither mr horner nor mr gray had heard many answers to the catechism as yet up to this time there was no sunday school in hanbury mr gray's desires were bounded by that object mr horner looked further on he hoped for a day school at some future time to train up intelligent labourers for working on the estate my lady would hear of neither one nor the other indeed not the boldest man whom she ever saw would have dared to name the project of a day school within her hearing so mr horner contented himself with quietly teaching a sharp clever lad to read and write with a view to making use of him as a kind of foreman in process of time he had his pick of the farm lads for this purpose and as the brightest and sharpest although by far the raggedest and dirtiest singled out joe gregson's son but all this as my lady never listened to gossip or indeed was spoken to unless she spoke first was quite unknown to her until the unlucky incident took place which i am going to relate my lady ludlow part four i think my lady was not aware of mr horner's views on education as making men into more useful members of society or the practice to which he was putting his precepts in taking harry gregson as pupil and protege if indeed she were aware of harry's distinct existence at all until the following unfortunate occasion the ante-room which was a kind of business place for my lady to receive her steward and tenants in was surrounded by shelves i cannot call them bookshelves though there were many books on them but the contents of the volumes were principally manuscript and relating to details connected with the hanbury property there were also one or two dictionaries gazetteers works of reference on the management of property all of a very old date the dictionary was bailey's i remember we had a great johnson in my lady's room but where lexicographers differed she generally preferred bailey in this antechamber a footman generally sat awaiting orders from my lady for she clung to the grand old customs and despised any bells except her own little handbell as modern inventions she would have her people always within summons of this silvery bell or her scarce less silvery voice this man had not the sinecure you might imagine he had to reply to the private entrance what we should call the back door in a smaller house as none came to the front door but my lady 
and those of the country whom she honoured by visiting and her nearest acquaintance of this kind lived eight miles of bad roads off the majority of comers knocked at the nail-studded terrace door not to have it opened for open it stood by my lady's orders winter and summer so that the snow often drifted into the back hall and lay there in heaps when the weather was severe but to summon some one to receive their message or carry their request to be allowed to speak to my lady i remember it was long before mr gray could be made to understand that the great door was only open on state occasions and even to the last he would as soon come in by that as the terrace entrance i had been received there on my first setting foot over my lady's threshold every stranger was led in by that way the first time they came but after that with the exceptions i have named they went round by the terrace as it were by instinct it was an assistance to this instinct to be aware that from time immemorial the magnificent and fierce hanbury wolfhounds which were extinct in every other part of the island had been and still were kept chained in the front quadrangle where they bayed through a great part of the day and night and were always ready with their deep savage growl at the sight of every person and thing excepting the man who fed them my lady's carriage and four and my lady herself it was pretty to see her small figure go up to the great crouching brutes thumping the flags with their heavy wagging tails and slobbering in an ecstasy of delight at her light approach and soft caress she had no fear of them but she was a hanbury born and the tale went that they and their kind knew all hanburys instantly and acknowledged their supremacy ever since the ancestors of the breed had been brought from the east by the great sir urian hanbury who lay with his legs crossed on the altar tomb in the church moreover it was reported that not fifty years before one of these dogs had eaten up a child which had inadvertently strayed within reach of its chain so you might imagine how most people preferred the terrace door mr gray did not seem to care for the dogs it might be absence of mind for i have heard of his starting away from their sudden spring when he had unwittingly walked within reach of their chains but it could hardly have been absence of mind when one day he went right up to one of them and patted him in the most friendly manner the dog meanwhile looking pleased and affably wagging his tail just as if mr gray had been a hanbury we were all very much puzzled by this and to this day i have not been able to account for it but now let us go back to the terrace door and the footman sitting in the antechamber one morning we heard a parleying which rose to such a vehemence and lasted for so long that my lady had to ring her handbell twice before the footman heard it what is the matter john asked she when he entered a little boy my lady who says he comes from mr horner and must see your ladyship impudent little lad this last to himself what does he want that's just what i have asked him my lady but he won't tell me please your ladyship it is probably some message from mr horner said lady ludlow with just a shade of annoyance in her manner for it was against all etiquette to send a message to her and by such a messenger too no please your ladyship i asked him if he had any message and he said no he had none but he must see your ladyship for all that you had better show him in then without more words said her ladyship quietly but still as i have said rather annoyed as if in mockery of the humble visitor the footman threw open both battens of the door and in the opening there stood a lithe wiry lad with a thick head of hair standing out in every direction as if stirred by some electrical current a short brown face red now from a fright and excitement wide resolute mouth and bright deep-set eyes which glanced keenly and rapidly round the room as if taking in everything and all was new and strange to be thought and puzzled over at some future time he knew enough of manners not to speak first to one above him in rank or else he was afraid what do you want with me 
asked my lady in so gentle a tone that it seemed to surprise and stun him and please your ladyship said he as if he had been deaf you come from mr horner's why do you want to see me again asked she a little more loudly and please your ladyship mr horner was sent for all on a sudden to warwick this morning his face began to work but he felt it and closed his lips into a resolute form well and he went off all, all on a sudden like well and he left a note for your ladyship with me your ladyship is that all you might have given it to the footman please your ladyship i've clean gone and lost it he never took his eyes off her face if he had not kept his look fixed he would have burst out crying that was very careless said my lady gently but i'm sure you are very sorry for it you had better try and find it it may have been of consequence please ma'am please your ladyship i can say it off by heart you what do you mean i was really afraid now my lady's blue eyes absolutely gave out light she was so much displeased and moreover perplexed the more reason he had for a fright the more his courage rose he must have seen so sharp a lad must have perceived her displeasure but he went on quickly and steadily mr horner my lady has taught me to read write and cast accounts my lady and he was in a hurry and he folded his paper up but he did not seal it and i read it my lady and now my lady it seems like as if i had got it off by heart and he went on with a high-pitched voice saying out very loud what i have no doubt were the identical words of the letter date signature and all it was merely something about a deed which required my lady's signature when he had done he stood almost as if he expected commendation for his accurate memory my lady's eyes contracted till the pupils were as needle points it was a way she had when much disturbed she looked at me and said margaret dawson what will this world come to and then she was silent the lad beginning to perceive he had given deep offence stood stock still as if his brave will had brought him into this presence and impelled him to confession and the best amends he could make but had now deserted him or was extinct and left his body motionless until some one else with word or deed made him quit the room my lady looked again at him and saw the frowning dumbfoundering terror at his misdeed and the manner in which his confession had been received my poor lad said she the angry look leaving her face into whose hands have you fallen the boy's lips began to quiver don't you know what tree we read of in genesis no i hope you have not got to read so easily as that a pause who has taught you to read and write please my lady i meant no harm my lady he was fairly blubbering overcome by her evident feeling of dismay and regret the soft repression of which was more frightening to him than any strong or violent words would have been who taught you i ask it were mr horner's clerk who learned me my lady and did mr horner know of it yes my lady and i am sure i thought for to please him well perhaps you were not to blame for that but i wonder at mr horner however my boy as you have got possession of edge tools you must have some rules how to use them did you never hear that you were not to open letters please my lady it were open mr horner forgot for to seal it in his hurry to be off but you must not read letters that are not intended for you you must never try to read any letters that are not directed to you even if they be open before you please my lady i thought it were good for practice all as one as a book my lady looked bewildered as to what way she could further explain to him the laws of honour as regarded letters you would not listen i am sure said she to anything you were not intended to hear he hesitated for a moment 
partly because he did not fully comprehend the question my lady repeated it the light of intelligence came into his eager eyes and i could see that he was not certain if he could tell the truth please my lady i always hearken when i hear folk talking secrets but i mean no harm my poor lady sighed she was not prepared to begin a long way off in morals honour was to her second nature and she had never tried to find out on what principle its laws were based so telling the lad that she wished to see mr horner when he returned from warwick she dismissed him with a despondent look he meanwhile right glad to be out of the awful gentleness of her presence what is to be done said she half to herself and half to me i could not answer for i was puzzled myself it was a right word she continued that i used when i called reading and writing edge tools if our lower orders have these edge tools given to them we shall have the terrible scenes of the french revolution acted over again in england when i was a girl one never heard of the rights of men one only heard of the duties now here was mr gray only last night talking of the right every child had to instruction i could hardly keep my patience with him and at length we fairly came to words and i told him i would have no such thing as a sunday school or a sabbath school as he calls it just like a jew in my village and what did he say to that my lady i asked for the struggle that seemed now to have come to a crisis had been going on for some time in a quiet way why he gave way to temper and said he was bound to remember he was under the bishop's authority not under mine and implied that he should persevere in his designs notwithstanding my expressed opinion and your ladyship i half inquired i could only rise and curtsy and civilly dismiss him when two persons have arrived at a certain point of expression on a subject about which they differ as materially as i do from mr gray the wisest course if they wish to remain friends is to drop the conversation entirely and suddenly it is one of the few cases where abruptness is desirable i was sorry for mr gray he had been to see me several times and had helped me to bear my illness in a better spirit than i should have done without his good advice and prayers and i had gathered from little things he said how much his heart was set upon this new scheme i liked him so much and i loved and respected my lady so well that i could not bear them to be on the cool terms to which they were constantly getting yet i could do nothing but keep silence i suppose my lady understood something of what was passing in my mind for after a minute or two she went on if mr gray knew all i know if he had my experience he would not be so ready to speak of setting up his new plans in opposition to my judgment indeed she continued lashing herself up with her own recollections times are changed when the parson of a village comes to beard the liege lady in her own house why in my grandfather's day the parson was family chaplain too and dined at the hall every sunday he was helped last and expected to have done first i remember seeing him take up his plate and knife and fork and say with his mouth full all the time he was speaking if you please sir urian and my lady i'll follow the beef into the housekeeper's room for you see unless he did so he stood no chance of a second helping a greedy man that parson was to be sure i recollect his once eating up the whole of some little bird at dinner and by way of diverting attention from his greediness he told how he had heard that a rook soaked in vinegar and then dressed in a particular way could not be distinguished from the bird he was then eating i saw by the grim look on my grandfather's face that the parson's doing and saying displeased him and child as i was i had some notion what was coming when as i was riding out on my little white pony by my grandfather's side the next friday he stopped one of the gamekeepers and bade him shoot one of the oldest rooks he could find i knew no more about it till sunday 
when a dish was set right before the parson and sir urian said now parson hemming i have had a rook shot and soaked in vinegar and dressed as you described last sunday fall to man and eat it with as good an appetite as you had last sunday pick the bones clean or by dash no more sunday dinners shall you eat at my table i gave one look at poor mr hemming's face as he tried to swallow the first morsel and make believe as though he thought it very good but i could not look again for shame although my grandfather laughed and kept asking us all round if we knew what could have become of the parson's appetite and did he finish it i asked oh yes my dear what my grandfather said was to be done was done always he was a terrible man in his anger but to think of the difference between parson hemming and mr gray or even of poor dear mr mountford and mr gray mr mountford would never have withstood me as mr gray did and your ladyship really thinks that it would not be right to have a sunday school i asked feeling very timid as i put the question certainly not as i told mr gray i consider a knowledge of the creed and of the lord's prayer as essential to salvation and that any child may have whose parents bring it regularly to church then there are the ten commandments which teach simple duties in the plainest language of course if a lad is taught to read and write as that unfortunate boy has been who was here this morning his duties become complicated and his temptations much greater while at the same time he has no hereditary principles and honourable training to serve as safeguards i might take up my old simile of the race-horse and cart-horse i am distressed continued she with a break in her ideas about that boy the whole thing reminds me so much of a story of what happened to a friend of mine clement de crequy did i ever tell you about him no your ladyship i replied poor clement more than twenty years ago lord ludlow and i spent a winter in paris he had many friends there perhaps not very good or very wise men but he was so kind that he liked every one and every one liked him we had an apartment as they call it there in the rue de lille we had the first floor of a grand hotel with the basement for our servants on the floor above us the owner of the house lived a marquise de crequy a widow they tell me that the crequy coat of arms is still emblazoned after all these terrible years on a shield above the arched fort crochet just as it was then though the family is quite extinct madame de crequy had only one son clement who was just the same age as my urian you may see his portrait in the great hall urian's i mean i knew that master urian had been drowned at sea and often had i looked at the presentment of his bonny hopeful face in his sailor's dress with right hand outstretched to a ship on the sea in the distance as if he had just said look at her all her sails are set and i'm just off poor master urian he went down in this very ship not a year after the picture was taken but now i will go back to my lady's story i can see those two boys playing now continued she softly shutting her eyes as if the better to call up the vision as they used to do five and twenty years ago in those old-fashioned french gardens behind our hotel many a time have i watched them from my windows it was perhaps a better play-place than an english garden would have been for there were but few flower-beds and no lawn at all to speak about but instead terraces and balustrades and vases and flights of stone steps more in the italian style and there were jets d'eau and little fountains that could be set playing by turning watercocks that were hidden here and there how clement delighted in turning the water on to surprise urian and how gracefully he did the honours as it were to my dear rough sailor lad urian was as dark as a gypsy boy and cared little for his appearance and resisted all my efforts at setting off his black eyes and tangled curls 
but clement without ever showing that he thought about himself and his dress was always dainty and elegant even though his clothes were sometimes but threadbare he used to be dressed in a kind of hunter's green suit open at the neck and halfway down the chest to beautiful old lace frills his long golden curls fell behind just like a girl's and his hair in front was cut over his straight dark eyebrows in a line almost as straight urian learnt more of a gentleman's carefulness and propriety of appearance from that lad in two months than he had done in years from all my lectures i recollect one day when the two boys were in full romp and my window being open i could hear them perfectly and urian was daring clement to some scrambling or climbing which clement refused to undertake but in a hesitating way as though he longed to do it if some reason had not stood in the way and at times urian who was hasty and thoughtless poor fellow told clement he was afraid fear said the french boy drawing himself up you do not know what you say if you will be here at six to-morrow morning when it is only just light i will take that starling's nest on the top of yonder chimney but why not now clement said urian putting his arm around clement's neck why then and not now just when we are in the humour for it because we de crequis are poor and my mother cannot afford me another suit of clothes this year and yonder stone carving is all jagged and would tear my coat and breeches now to-morrow morning i could go up with nothing on but an old shirt but you would tear your legs my race do not care for pain said the boy drawing himself from urian's arm and walking a few steps away with a becoming pride and reserve for he was hurt at being spoken to as if he were afraid and annoyed at having to confess the true reason for declining the feat but urian was not to be thus baffled he went up to clement and put his arm once more about his neck and i could see the two lads as they walked down the terrace away from the hotel windows first urian spoke eagerly looking with imploring fondness into clement's face which sought the ground till at last the french boy spoke and by and by his arm was around urian too and they paced backwards and forwards in deep talk but gravely as became men rather than boys all at once from the little chapel at the corner of the large garden belonging to the mission étranger i heard the tinkle of the little bell announcing the elevation of the host down on his knees went clement hands crossed eyes bent down while urian stood looking on in respectful thought what a friendship that might have been i never dream of urian without seeing clement too urian speaks to me or does something but clement only flits around urian and never seems to see any one else but i must not forget to tell you that the next morning before he was out of his room a footman of madame de crequy's brought urian the starling's nest well we came back to england and the boys were to correspond and madame de crequy and i exchanged civilities and urian went to sea after that all seemed to drop away i cannot tell you all however to confine myself to the de crequies i had a letter from clement i knew he felt his friend's death deeply but i should never have learnt it from the letter he sent it was formal and seemed like chaff to my hungering heart poor fellow i dare say he had found it hard to write what could he or any one say to a mother who has lost her child the world does not think so and in general one must conform to the customs of the world but judging from my own experience i should say that reverent silence at such times is the tenderest balm madame de crequy wrote too but i knew she could not feel my loss so much as clement and therefore her letter was not such a disappointment she and i went on being civil and polite in the way of commissions and occasionally introducing friends to each other for a year or two and then we ceased to have any intercourse 
then the terrible revolution came no one who did not live at those times can imagine the daily expectation of news the hourly terror of rumours affecting the fortunes and lives of those whom most of us had known as pleasant hosts receiving us with peaceful welcome in their magnificent houses of course there was sin enough and suffering enough behind the scenes but we english visitors to paris had seen little or nothing of that and i had sometimes thought indeed how even death seems loath to choose his victims out of that brilliant throng whom i had known madame de crequy's one boy lived while three out of my six were gone since we had met i do not think all lots are equal even now that i know the end of her hopes but i do say that whatever our individual lot is it is our duty to accept it without comparing it with that of others the times were thick with gloom and terror what next was the question we asked of every one who brought us news from paris where were these demons hidden when so few years ago we danced and feasted and enjoyed the brilliant salons and the charming friendships of paris one evening i was sitting alone in st james's square my lord offered the club with mr fox and others he had left me thinking that i should go to one of the many places to which i had been invited for that evening but i had no heart to go anywhere for it was poor urian's birthday and i had not even rung for lights though the day was fast closing in but was thinking over all his pretty ways and on his warm affectionate nature and how often i had been too hasty in speaking to him for all i loved him so dearly and how i seemed to have neglected and dropped his dear friend clement who might even now be in need of help in that cruel bloody paris i say i was thinking reproachfully of all this and particularly of clement de crequy in connection with urian when fenwick brought me a note sealed with a coat of arms i knew well though i could not remember at that moment where i had seen it i puzzled over it as one does sometimes for a minute or more before i opened the letter in a moment i saw it was from clement de crequy my mother is here he said she is very ill and i am bewildered in this strange country may i entreat you to receive me for a few minutes the bearer of the note was the woman of the house where they lodged i had her brought up into the anteroom and questioned her myself while my carriage was being brought around they had arrived in london a fortnight or so before she had not known their quality judging them according to her kind by their dress and their luggage poor enough no doubt the lady had never left her bedroom since her arrival the young man waited upon her did everything for her never left her in fact only she the messenger had promised to stay within call as soon as she returned while he went out somewhere she could hardly understand him he spoke english so badly he had never spoken it i dare say since he had talked to my urian my lady ludlow part five in the hurry of the moment i scarce knew what i did i bade the housekeeper put up every delicacy she had in order to tempt the invalid whom yet i hoped to bring back with me to our house when the carriage was ready i took the good woman with me to show us the exact way which my coachman professed not to know for indeed they were staying at but a poor kind of place at the back of leicester square of which they had heard as clement told me afterwards from one of the fishermen who had carried them across from the dutch coast in their disguises as a friesland peasant and his mother they had some jewels of value concealed around their persons but their ready money was all spent before i saw them and clement had been unwilling to leave his mother even for the time necessary to ascertain the best mode of disposing of the diamonds for overcome with distress of mind and bodily fatigue she had reached london only to take to her bed in a sort of low 
nervous fever in which her chief and only idea seemed to be that clement was about to be taken from her to some prison or other and if he were out of her sight though but a minute she cried like a child and could not be pacified or comforted the landlady was a kind good woman and though she but half understood the case she was truly sorry for them as foreigners and the mother sick in a strange land i sent her forwards to request permission for my entrance in a moment i saw clement a tall elegant young man in a curious dress of coarse cloth standing at the open door of a room and evidently even before he accosted me striving to soothe the terrors of his mother inside i went towards him and would have taken his hand but he bent down and kissed mine may i come in madame i asked looking at the poor sick lady lying in the dark dingy bed her head propped up on coarse and dirty pillows and gazing with affrighted eyes at all that was going on clement clement come to me she cried and when he went to the bedside she turned on one side and took his hand in both of hers and began stroking it and looking up in his face i could scarce keep back my tears he stood there quite still except that from time to time he spoke to her in a low tone at last i advanced into the room so that i could talk to him without renewing her alarm i asked for the doctor's address for i had heard that they had called in some one at their landlady's recommendation but i could hardly understand clement's broken english and mispronunciations of our proper names and was obliged to apply to the woman herself i could not say much to clement for his attention was perpetually needed by his mother who never seemed to perceive that i was there but i told him not to fear however long i might be away for that i would return before night and bidding the woman take charge of all the heterogeneous things the housekeeper had put up and leaving one of my men in the house who could understand a few words of french with directions that he was to hold himself at madame de crequy's orders until i sent or gave him fresh commands i drove off to the doctor's what i wanted was his permission to remove madame de crequy to my own house and to learn how it best could be done for i saw that every movement in the room every sound except clement's voice brought on a fresh access of trembling and nervous agitation the doctor was i should think a clever man but he had that kind of abrupt manner which people get who have much to do with the lower orders i told him the story of his patient the interest i had in her and the wish i entertained of removing her to my own house it can't be done said he any change will kill her but it must be done i replied and it shall not kill her then i have nothing more to say said he turning away from the carriage door and making as though he would go back into the house stop a moment you must help me and if you do you shall have reason to be glad for i will give you fifty pounds down with pleasure if you won't do it another shall he looked at me then furtively at the carriage hesitated and then said you do not mind expense apparently i suppose you are a rich lady of quality such folks will not stick at such trifles as the life or death of a sick woman to get their own way i suppose i must e'en help you for if i don't another will i did not mind what he said so that he would assist me i was pretty sure that she was in a state to require opiates and i had not forgotten christopher sly you may be sure so i told him what i had in my head that in the dead of night the quiet time in the streets she should be carried in a hospital litter softly and warmly covered over from the leicester square lodging house to rooms that i would have in perfect readiness for her as i planned so it was done i let clement know by a note of my design i had all prepared at home and we walked about my house as though shod with velvet while the porter watched at the open door at last through the darkness 
I saw the lanterns carried by my men, who were leading the little procession. The litter looked like a hearse. On one side walked the doctor, on the other Clement. They came softly and swiftly along. I could not try any further experiment. We dared not change her clothes. She was laid in the bed in the landlady's coarse night gear, and covered over warmly, and left in the shaded, scented room, with the nurse and the doctor watching by her, while I led Clement to the dressing-room adjoining, in which I had had a bed placed for him. Farther than that he would not go, and there I had refreshments brought. Meanwhile he had shown his gratitude by every possible action, for we none of us dared to speak. He had kneeled at my feet, and kissed my hand, and left it wet with his tears. He had thrown up his arms to heaven, and prayed earnestly, as I could see by the movement of his lips. I allowed him to relieve himself by these dumb expressions, if I may so call them, and then I left him, and went to my own rooms to sit up for my lord, and tell him what I had done. Of course it was all right, and neither my lord nor I could sleep for wondering how Madame de Crequy would bear her awakening. I had engaged the doctor, to whose face and voice she was accustomed, to remain with her all night. The nurse was experienced, and Clement was within call. But it was with the greatest relief that I heard from my own woman, when she brought me my chocolate, that Madame de Crequy, Monsieur had said, had awakened more tranquil than she had been for many days. To be sure, the whole aspect of the bedchamber must have been more familiar to her than the miserable place where I had found her, and she must have intuitively felt herself among friends. My lord was scandalized at Clement's dress, which after the first moment of seeing him I had forgotten in thinking of other things, and for which I had not prepared Lord Ludlow. He sent for his own tailor, and bade him bring patterns of stuffs, and engage his men to work night and day, till Clement could appear as became his rank. In short, in a few days, so much of the traces of their flight were removed, that we had almost forgotten the terrible causes of it, and rather felt as if they had come on a visit to us, than that they had been compelled to fly their country. Their diamonds, too, were sold well by my lord's agents, though the London shops were stocked with jewellery, and such portable valuables, some of rare and curious fashion, which were sold for half their real value by emigrants who could not afford to wait. Madame de Crequy was recovering her health, although her strength was sadly gone, and she would never be equal to such another flight as the perilous one which she had gone through, and to which she could not bear the slightest reference. For some time things continued in this state, the de Crequies still our honoured visitors. Many houses besides our own, even among our own friends, open to receive the poor flying nobility of France, driven from their country by the brutal republicans, and every freshly arrived emigrant bringing new tales of horror, as if these revolutionists were drunk with blood, and mad to devise new atrocities. One day Clement, I should tell you he had been presented to our good King George and the sweet Queen, and they had accosted him most graciously, and his beauty and elegance, and some of the circumstances attendant on his flight, made him be received in the world quite like a hero of romance. He might have been on intimate terms in many a distinguished house had he cared to visit much, but he accompanied my lord and me with an air of indifference and languor which I sometimes fancied made him all the more sought after. Monkshaven, that was the title my eldest son bore, tried in vain to interest him in all young men's sports. But no, it was the same through all. His mother took far more interest in the on of the London world, into which she was far too great an invalid to venture, than he did, in the absolute events themselves, in which he might have been an actor, one day, as I was saying, an old Frenchman of a humble class presented himself to our servants, several of whom understood French, and, through Medlicott, 
i learnt that he was in some way connected with the de crequies not with their paris life but i fancy he had been intendant of their estates in the country estates which were more useful as hunting grounds than as adding to their income however there was the old man and with him wrapped around his person he had brought the long parchment rolls and deeds relating to their property these he would deliver up to none but monsieur de crequy the rightful owner and clement was out with monkshaven so the old man waited and when clement came in i told him of the steward's arrival and how he had been cared for by my people clement went directly to see him he was a long time away and i was waiting for him to drive out with me for some purpose or another i scarce know what but i remember i was tired of waiting and was just in the act of ringing the bell to desire that he might be reminded of his engagement with me when he came in his face was white as the powder in his hair his beautiful eyes dilated with horror i saw that he had heard something that touched him even more closely than the usual tales which every fresh emigrant brought what is it clement i asked he clasped his hands and looked as though he tried to speak but could not bring out the words they have guillotined my uncle said he at last now i knew that there was a count de crequy but i had always understood that the elder branch held very little communication with him in fact that he was a vaurien of some kind and rather a disgrace than otherwise to the family so perhaps i was hard-hearted but i was a little surprised at this excess of emotion till i saw that peculiar look in his eyes that many people have when there is more terror in their hearts than they dare put into words he wanted me to understand something without his saying it but how could i i had never heard of a mademoiselle de crequy virginie at last he uttered in an instant i understood it all and remembered that if urian had lived he too might have been in love your uncle's daughter i inquired my cousin he replied i did not say your betrothed but i had no doubt of it i was mistaken however oh madame he continued her mother died long ago her father now and she is in daily fear alone deserted is she in the abbey asked i no she is in hiding with the widow of her father's old concierge any day they may search the house for aristocrats they are seeking them everywhere then not her life alone but that of the old woman her hostess is sacrificed the old woman knows this and trembles with fear even if she is brave enough to be faithful her fears would betray her should the house be searched yet there is no one to help virginie escape she is alone in paris i saw what was in his mind he was fretting and chafing to go to his cousin's assistance but the thought of his mother restrained him i would not have kept back urian from such an errand at such a time how should i restrain him and yet perhaps i did wrong in not urging the chances of danger more still if it was danger to him was it not the same or even greater danger to her for the french spared neither age nor sex in those wicked days of terror so i rather fell in with his wish and encouraged him to think how best and most prudently it might be fulfilled never doubting as i have said that he and his cousin were troth plighted but when i went to madame de crequy after he had imparted his or rather our plan to her i found out my mistake she who was in general too feeble to walk across the room save slowly and with a stick was going from end to end with quick tottering steps and if now and then she sank upon a chair it seemed as if she could not rest for she was up again in a moment pacing along wringing her hands and speaking rapidly to herself when she saw me she stopped madame she said you have lost your own boy you might have left me mine 
I was so astonished, I hardly knew what to say. I had spoken to Clement as if his mother's consent were secure, as I had felt my own would have been if Urian had been alive to ask it. Of course, both he and I knew that his mother's consent must be asked and obtained before he could leave her to go on such an undertaking, but somehow my blood always rose at the sight or sound of danger, perhaps because my life had been so peaceful. Poor Madame de Crequy! It was otherwise with her. She despaired while I hoped, and Clement trusted. Dear Madame de Crequy, said I, he will return safely to us. Every precaution shall be taken, that either he or you or my lord or Monkshaven can think of. But he cannot leave a girl, his nearest relation save you. His betrothed, is she not? His betrothed, cried she, now at the utmost pitch of her excitement, Virginie betrothed to Clement? No, thank heavens, not so bad as that. Yet it might have been. But Mademoiselle scorned my son. She would have nothing to do with him. Now is the time for him to have nothing to do with her. Clement had entered at the door behind his mother as she thus spoke. His face was set and pale, till it looked as grey and immovable as if it had been carved in stone. He came forward and stood before his mother. She stopped her walk, threw back her haughty head, and the two looked each other steadily in the face. After a minute or two in this attitude, her proud and resolute gaze never flinching or wavering, he went down upon one knee, and, taking her hand, her hard stony hand which never closed on his, but remained straight and stiff. Mother, he pleaded, withdraw your prohibition let me go what were her words madame de crequy replied slowly as if forcing her memory to the extreme of accuracy my cousin she said when i marry i marry a man not a petit maitre i marry a man who whatever his rank may be will add dignity to the human race by his virtues and not be content to live in an effeminate court on the traditions of past grandeur. She borrowed her words from the infamous Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the friend of her scarce less infamous father. Nay, I will say it, if not her words, she borrowed her principles, and my son to request her to marry him. It was my father's written wish, said Clement. But did you not love her? You plead your father's words, words written twelve years before and as if that were your reason for being indifferent to my dislike to the alliance but you requested her to marry you and she refused you with insolent contempt and now you are ready to leave me leave me desolate in a foreign land desolate my mother and the countess ludlow stands there pardon madame but all the earth though it were full of kind hearts is but a desolation and a desert place to a mother when her only child is absent. And you, Clement, would leave me for this Virginie, this degenerate de Crequy, tainted with the atheism of the encyclopedists. She is only reaping some of the fruit of the harvest whereof her friends have sown the seed. Let her alone. Doubtless she has friends, it may be lovers, among these demons who under the cry of liberty commit every license let her alone clement she refused you with scorn be too proud to notice her now mother i cannot think of myself only of her think of me then i your mother forbid you to go clement bowed low and went out of the room instantly as one blinded she saw his groping movement and for an instant i think her heart was touched but she turned to me and tried to exculpate her past violence by dilating upon her wrongs and they certainly were many the count her husband's younger brother had invariably tried to make mischief between husband and wife he had been the cleverer man of the two and had possessed extraordinary influence over her husband she suspected him of having instigated that clause in her husband's will 
by which the marquise expressed his wish for the marriage of the cousins the count had had some interest in the management of the decrequi property during her son's minority indeed i remembered then that it was through count de crequy that lord ludlow had first heard of the apartment which we afterwards took in the hotel de crequy and then the recollection of a past feeling came distinctly out of the mist as it were and i called to mind how when we first took up our abode in the hotel de crequy both lord ludlow and i imagined that the arrangement was displeasing to our hostess and how it had taken us a considerable time before we had been able to establish relations of friendship with her years after our visit she began to suspect that clement whom she could not forbid to visit at his uncle's house considering the terms on which his father had been with his brother though she herself never set foot over the count de crequy's threshold was attaching himself to mademoiselle his cousin and she made cautious inquiries as to the appearance character and disposition of the young lady mademoiselle was not handsome they said but of a fine figure and generally considered as having a very noble and attractive presence in character she was daring and wilful said one set original and independent said another she was much indulged by her father who had given her something of a man's education and selected for her intimate friend a young lady below her in rank one of the bureaucratique a mademoiselle necker daughter of the minister of finance mademoiselle de crequy was thus introduced into all the free-thinking salons of paris among people who were always full of plans for subverting society and did clement affect such people madame de crequy had asked with some anxiety no Monsieur de Crequy had neither eyes nor ears nor thought for anything but his cousin while she was by. And she? She hardly took notice of his devotion, so evident to everyone else, the proud creature. But perhaps that was her haughty way of concealing what she felt. And so Madame de Crequy listened and questioned and learnt nothing decided, until one day she surprised Clement with the note in his hand, of which she remembered the stinging words so well in which virginie had said in reply to a proposal clement had sent her through her father that when she married she married a man not a petit maître clement was justly indignant at the insulting nature of the answer virginie had sent to a proposal respectful in its tone and which was after all but the cool hardened lava over a burning heart he acquiesced in his mother's desire that he should not again present himself in his uncle's salons but he did not forget virginie though he never mentioned her name madame de crequy and her son were among the earliest proscripts as they were of the strongest possible royalists and aristocrats as it was the custom of the horrid sans culottes to term those who adhered to the habits of expression and action in which it was their pride to have been educated they had left paris some weeks before they had arrived in england and clement's belief at the time of quitting the hotel de crequy had certainly been that his uncle was not merely safe but rather a popular man with the party in power and as all communication having relation to private individuals of a reliable kind was intercepted Monsieur de crequy had felt but little anxiety for his uncle and cousin in comparison with what he did for many other friends of very different opinions in politics until the day when he was stunned by the fatal information that even his progressive uncle was guillotined and learnt that his cousin was imprisoned by the license of the mob whose rights as she called them she was always advocating when i had heard all this story i confess i lost in sympathy for clement what i gained for his mother virginie's life did not seem to me worth the risk that clement's would run but when i saw him sad depressed nay hopeless going about like one oppressed by a heavy dream which he cannot shake off caring neither to eat drink nor sleep 
yet bearing all with silent dignity and even trying to force a poor faint smile when he caught my anxious eyes i turned round again and wondered how madame de crequy could resist this mute pleading of her son's altered appearance as for my lord ludlow and monkshaven as soon as they understood the case they were indignant that any mother should attempt to keep a son out of honourable danger and it was honourable and a clear duty according to them to try to save the life of a helpless orphan girl his next of kin none but a frenchman said my lord would hold himself bound by an old woman's whimsies and fears even though she were his mother as it was he was chafing himself to death under the restraint if he went to be sure the dashed wretches might make an end of him as they had done of many a fine fellow but my lord would take heavy odds that instead of being guillotined he would save the girl and bring her safe to england just desperately in love with her preserver and then we would have a jolly wedding down at monkshaven my lord repeated his opinion so often that it became a certain prophecy in his mind of what was to take place and one day seeing clement look even paler and thinner than he had ever done before he sent a message to madame de crequy requesting permission to speak to her in private for by george said he she shall hear my opinion and not let that lad of hers kill himself by fretting he's too good for that if he had been an english lad he would have been off to his sweetheart long before this without saying with your leave or by your leave but being a frenchman he is all for aeneas and filial piety filial fiddlesticks my lord had run away to sea when a boy against his father's consent i am sorry to say and as all had ended well and he had come back to find both his parents alive i do not think he was ever as much aware of his fault as he might have been under other circumstances no my lady he went on don't come with me a woman can manage a man best when he has a fit of obstinacy and a man can persuade a woman out of her tantrums when all her own sex the whole army of them would fail allow me to go alone to my tete-a-tete -tete with madame what he said what passed he never could repeat but he came back graver than he went however the point was gained madame de crequy withdrew her prohibition and had given him leave to tell clement as much but she is an old cassandra said he don't let the lad be much with her her talk would destroy the courage of the bravest man she is so given over to superstition something that she had said had touched a chord in my lord's nature which he inherited from his scotch ancestors long afterwards i heard what this was medlicott told me however my lord shook off all fancies that told against the fulfilment of clement's wishes all that afternoon we three sat together planning and monkshaven passed in and out executing our commissions and preparing everything towards nightfall all was ready for clement's start on his journey towards the coast madame had declined seeing any of us since my lord's stormy interview with her she sent word that she was fatigued and desired repose but of course before clement set off he was bound to wish her farewell and to ask for her blessing in order to avoid an agitating conversation between mother and son my lord and i resolved to be present at the interview clement was already in his travelling dress that of a norman fisherman which monkshaven had with infinite trouble discovered in the possession of one of the emigres who thronged london and who had made his escape from the shores of france in this disguise clement's plan was to go down to the coast of sussex and get some of the fishing or smuggling boats to take him across to the french coast near dieppe there again he would have to change his dress oh it was so well planned his mother was startled by his disguise of which we had not thought to forewarn her as he entered her apartment and either that or the being suddenly aroused from the heavy slumber into which she was apt to fall when she was left alone 
gave her manner an air of wildness that was almost like insanity. "'Go, go!' she said to him, almost pushing him away as he knelt to kiss her hand. "'Virginie is beckoning to you, but you don't see what kind of a bed it is.' "'Clement, make haste,' said my lord, in a hurried manner, as if to interrupt madame. "'The time is later than I thought, and you must not miss the morning's tide. "'Bid your mother good-bye at once, and let us be off. "'For my lord and Monkshaven were to ride with him to an inn near the shore, "'from whence he was to walk to his destination.' My lord almost took him by the arm to pull him away, and they were gone. And I was left alone with Madame de Crequy. When she heard the horse's feet, she seemed to find out the truth, as if for the first time. She set her teeth together. He has left me for her, she almost screamed. Left me for her, she kept muttering. And then, as the wild look came back into her eyes, she said, almost with exultation, But I did not give him my blessing. My Lady Ludlow, Part Six All night, Madame de Crequy raved in delirium. If I could, I would have sent for Clement back again. I did send off one man, but I suppose my directions were confused, or they were wrong for he came back after my lord's return on the following afternoon by this time madame de crequy was quieter she was indeed asleep from exhaustion when lord ludlow and monkshaven came in they were in high spirits and their hopefulness brought me round to a less dispirited state all had gone well they had accompanied clement on foot along the shore until they had met with a lugger which my lord had hailed in good nautical language. The captain had responded to these Freemason terms by sending a boat to pick up his passenger, and by an invitation to breakfast sent through a speaking trumpet. Monkshaven did not approve of either the meal or the company, and had returned to the inn, but my lord had gone with Clement and breakfasted on board, upon grog, biscuit, fresh caught fish, the best breakfast he ever ate, he said, but that was probably owing to the appetite his night's ride had given him. However, his good fellowship had evidently won the captain's heart, and Clement had set sail under the best auspices. It was agreed that I should tell all this to Madame de Crequy if she inquired, otherwise it would be wiser not to renew her agitation by alluding to her son's journey. I sat with her constantly for many days. But she never spoke of Clement. She forced herself to talk of the little occurrences of Parisian society in former days. She tried to be conversational and agreeable, and to betray no anxiety or even interest in the object of Clement's journey. And, as far as unremitting efforts could go, she succeeded. But the tones of her voice were sharp and yet piteous, as if she were in constant pain and the glance of her eye hurried and fearful, as if she dared not let it rest on any object. In a week we heard of Clement's safe arrival on the French coast. He sent a letter to this effect by the captain of the smuggler, when the latter returned. We hoped to hear again, but week after week elapsed, and there was no news of Clement. I had told Lord Ludlow, in Madame de Crequy's presence, as he and I had arranged, of the note I had received from her son, informing us of his landing in France. She heard, but she took no notice. Yet now, evidently, she began to wonder that we did not mention any further intelligence of him in the same manner before her, and daily I began to fear that her pride would give way, and that she would supplicate for news before I had any to give her. One morning on my awakening, my maid told me that Madame de Crequy had passed a wretched night, and had bidden Medlicott, whom, as understanding French, and speaking it pretty well, though with that horrid German accent, I had put about her, request that I would go to Madame's room as soon as I was dressed. I knew what was coming, and I trembled all the time they were doing my hair, and otherwise arranging me. 
i was not encouraged by my lord's speeches he had heard the message and kept declaring that he would rather be shot than have to tell her that there was no news of her son and yet he said every now and then when i was at the lowest pitch of uneasiness that he never expected to hear again that some day soon we should see him walking in and introducing mademoiselle de crequy to us however at last i was ready and go i must her eyes were fixed on the door by which i entered i went up to the bedside she was not rouged she had left it off now for several days she no longer attempted to keep up the vain show of not feeling and loving and fearing for a moment or two she did not speak and i was glad of the respite clement she said at length covering her mouth with a handkerchief the minute she had spoken that i might not see it quiver there has been no news since the first letter saying how well the voyage was performed and how safely he had landed near dieppe you know i replied as cheerfully as possible my lord does not expect that we shall have another letter he thinks that we shall see him soon there was no answer as i looked uncertain whether to do or say more she slowly turned herself in bed and lay with her face to the wall and as if that did not shut out the light of day and the busy happy world enough she put out her trembling hands and covered her face with her handkerchief there was no violence hardly any sound i told her what my lord had said about clement's coming in some day and taking us all by surprise i did not believe it myself but it was just possible and i had nothing else to say pity to one who was striving so hard to conceal her feelings would have been impertinent she let me talk but she did not reply she knew that my words were vain and idle and had no root in my belief as well as i did myself i was very thankful when medlicott came in with madame's breakfast and gave me an excuse for leaving but i think that conversation made me feel more anxious and impatient than ever i felt almost pledged to madame de crequy for the fulfilment of the vision i had held out she had taken entirely to her bed by this time not from illness but because she had no hope within her to stir her up to the effort of dressing in the same way she hardly cared for food she had no appetite why eat to prolong a life of despair but she let medlicott feed her sooner than take the trouble of resisting and so it went on for weeks months i could hardly count the time it seemed so long medlicott told me she noticed a preternatural sensitiveness of ear in madame de crequy induced by the habit of listening silently for the slightest unusual sound in the house medlicott was always a minute watcher of any one whom she cared about and one day she made me notice by a sign madame's acuteness of hearing although the quick expectation was but evinced for a moment in the turn of the eye the hushed breath and then when the unusual footstep turned into my lord's apartment the soft quivering sigh and the closed eyelids at length the intendant of the de crequy estates the old man you will remember whose information respecting virginie de crequy first gave clement the desire to return to paris came to st james's square and begged to speak to me i made haste to go down to him in the housekeeper's room sooner than that he should be ushered into mine for fear of madame hearing any sound the old man stood i see him now with his hat held before him in both his hands he slowly bowed till his face touched it when i came in such long excess of courtesy augured ill he waited for me to speak have you any intelligence i inquired he had been often to the house before to ask if we had received any news and once or twice i had seen him but this was the first time he had begged to see me yes madame 
he replied, still standing with his head bent down, like a child in disgrace. And it is bad, I exclaimed. It is bad. For a moment I was angry at the cold tone in which my words were echoed, but directly afterwards I saw the large, slow, heavy tears of age falling down the old man's cheeks and on to the sleeve of his poor threadbare coat. I asked him how he had heard it. It seemed as though I could not all at once bear to hear what it was. He told me that the night before, in crossing Long Acre, he had stumbled upon an old acquaintance of his, one who, like himself, had been a dependent upon the de Crequy family, but had managed their Paris affairs, while Flechier had taken charge of their estates in the country. Both were now emigrants, and living on the proceeds of such small available talents as they possessed. Flechier, as I knew, earned a very fair livelihood by going about to dress salads for dinner parties. His compatriot, Lefebvre, had begun to give a few lessons as a dancing master. One of them took the other home to his lodgings, and there, when their most immediate personal adventures had been hastily talked over, came the inquiry from Flechier as to Monsieur de Crequy. Clement was dead, guillotined. Virginie was dead, guillotined. When Flechier had told me thus much, he could not speak for sobbing, and I, myself, could hardly tell how to restrain my tears sufficiently, until I could go to my own room and be at liberty to give way. He asked my leave to bring his friend Lefebvre, who was walking in the square, awaiting a possible summons to tell his story. I heard afterwards a good many details, which filled up the account, and made me feel, which brings me back to the point I started from, how unfit the lower orders are for being trusted indiscriminately with the dangerous powers of education. I have made a long preamble, but now I am coming to the moral of my story. My lady was trying to shake off the emotion which she evidently felt in recurring to this sad history of Monsieur de Crequy's death. She came behind me and arranged my pillows, and then, seeing I had been crying, for, indeed, I was weak-spirited at the time, and a little served to unloose my tears, she stooped down and kissed my forehead, and said, Poor child, almost as if she thanked me for feeling that old grief of hers. Being once in France, it was no difficult thing for Clement to get to Paris. The difficulty in those days was to leave, not to enter. He came in dressed as a Norman peasant, in charge of a load of fruit and vegetables, with which one of the Seine barges was freighted. He worked hard with his companions in landing and arranging their produce on the quays, and then, when they dispersed to get their breakfasts at some of the estaminets near the old Marché aux Fleurs, he sauntered up a street which conducted him, by many an odd turn, through the Quartier Latin to a horrid back alley leading out of the Rue L'Ecole de Médecins, some atrocious place, as I have heard, not far from the shadow of that terrible abbey, where so many of the best blood of France awaited their deaths. But here some old man lived on whose fidelity Clément thought that he might rely. I am not sure if he had not been gardener in those very gardens, behind the Hôtel Crequy, where Clement and Urian used to play together years before. But, whatever the old man's dwelling might be, Clement was only too glad to reach it, you may be sure. He had been kept in Normandy, in all sorts of disguises, for many days after landing in Dieppe, through the difficulty of entering Paris unsuspected by the many ruffians who were always on the lookout for aristocrats. The old gardener was, I believe, both faithful and tried, and sheltered Clement in his garret as well as might be. Before he could stir out, it was necessary to procure a fresh disguise, and one more in character with an inhabitant of Paris than that of a Norman carter was procured. And after waiting indoors for one or two days, to see if any suspicion was excited, Clement set off to discover Virginie. 
he found her at the old concierge's dwelling madame babette was the name of this woman who must have been a less faithful or rather perhaps i should say a more interested friend to her guest than the old gardener jacques was to clement i have seen a miniature of virginie which a french lady of quality happened to have in her possession at the time of her flight from paris and which she brought with her to england unwittingly for it belonged to the count de crequy with whom she was slightly acquainted i should fancy from it that virginie was taller and of a more powerful figure for a woman than her cousin clement was for a man her dark brown hair was arranged in short curls the way of dressing the hair announced the politics of the individual in those days just as patches did in my grandmother's time and virginie's hair was not to my taste or according to my principles it was too classical her large black eyes looked out at you steadily one cannot judge of the shape of a nose from a full face miniature but the nostrils were clearly cut and largely opened i do not fancy her nose could have been pretty but her mouth had a character all its own and which would i think have redeemed a plainer face it was wide and deep set into the cheeks at the corners the upper lip was very much arched and hardly closed over the teeth so that the whole face looked from the serious intent look in the eyes and the sweet intelligence of the mouth as if she were listening eagerly to something to which her answer was quite ready and would come out of those red opening lips as soon as ever you had done speaking and you longed to know what she would say well this virginie de crequy was living with madame babette in the conciergerie of an old french inn somewhere to the north of paris so far enough from clement's refuge the inn had been frequented by farmers from brittany and such kind of people in the days when that sort of intercourse went on between paris and the provinces which had nearly stopped now few bretons came near it now and the inn had fallen into the hands of madame babette's brother as payment for a bad wine debt of the last proprietor he put his sister and her child in to keep it open as it were and sent all the people he could to occupy the half-furnished rooms of the house they paid babette for their lodging every morning as they went out to breakfast and returned or not as they chose at night every three days the wine merchant or his son came to madame babette and she accounted to them for the money she had received she and her child occupied the porter's office in which the lad slept at nights and a little miserable bedroom which opened out of it and received all the light and air that was admitted through the door of communication which was half glass madame babette must have had a kind of attachment for the de crequies her de crequies you understand virginie's father the count for at some risk to herself she had warned both him and his daughter of the danger impending over them but he infatuated would not believe that his dear human race could ever do him harm and as long as he did not fear virginie was not afraid it was by some ruse the nature of which i never heard that madame babette induced virginie to come to her abode at the very hour in which the count had been recognized in the streets and hurried off to the lantern it was after babette had got her there safe shut up in the little back den that she told her what had befallen her father from that day virginie had never stirred out of the gates or crossed the threshold of the porter's lodge i do not say that madame babette was tired of her continual presence or regretted the impulse which had made her rush to the de crequy's well-known house after being compelled to form one of the mad crowds that saw the count de crequy seized and hung and hurry his daughter out through alleys and back ways until at length she had the orphan safe in her own dark sleeping-room and could tell her tale of horror but madame babette was poorly paid for her porter's work by her avaricious brother and it was hard enough to find food for herself and her growing boy and though the poor girl ate little enough i dare say yet there seemed no end to the burthen that madame babette had imposed upon herself 
the de Crequies were plundered, ruined, had become an extinct race, all but a lonely, friendless girl, in broken health and spirits. And, though she lent no positive encouragement to his suit, yet at the time when Clamart reappeared in Paris, Madame Babette was beginning to think that Virginie might do worse than encourage the attentions of Monsieur Morin Fils, her nephew, and the wine merchant's son. Of course he and his father had the entree into the conciergerie of the hotel that belonged to them, in right of being both proprietors and relations. The son, Morin, had seen Virginie in this manner. He was fully aware that she was far above him in rank, and guessed from her whole aspect that she had lost her natural protectors by the terrible guillotine. But he did not know her exact name or station, nor could he persuade his aunt to tell him. However, he fell head over ears in love with her, whether she were princess or peasant, and, though at first there was something about her which made his passionate love conceal itself with shy, awkward reserve, and then made it only appear in the guise of deep, respectful devotion. Yet, by and by, by the same process of reasoning, I suppose, that his aunt had gone through even before him, Jean Morin began to let hope oust despair from his heart. Sometimes, he thought, perhaps years hence, that solitary, friendless lady, pent up in squalor, might turn to him as to a friend and comforter, and then, and then, Meanwhile, Jean Morin was most attentive to his aunt, whom he had rather slighted before. He would linger over the accounts, would bring her little presents, and, above all, he made a pet and favourite of Pierre, the little cousin who could tell him about all the ways of going on of Mademoiselle Cannes, as Virginie was called. Pierre was thoroughly aware of the drift and cause of his cousin's inquiries and was his ardent partisan, as I have heard, even before Jean Morin had exactly acknowledged his wishes to himself. It must have required some patience, and much diplomacy, before Clement de Crequy found out the exact place where his cousin was hidden. The old gardener took the cause very much to heart, as, judging from my recollections, I imagine he would have forwarded any fancy, however wild, of Monsieur Clemence. I will tell you afterwards how I came to know all these particulars so well. After Clemence's return, on two succeeding days, from his dangerous search, without meeting with any good results, Jacques entreated Monsieur de Crequy to let him take it in hand. He represented that he, as gardener for the space of twenty years and more at the Hotel de Crequy, had a right to be acquainted with all the successive concierges at the Count's house, that he should not go among them as a stranger, but as an old friend, anxious to renew pleasant intercourse, and that if the intendant's story, which he had told Monsieur de Crequy in England, was true, that Mademoiselle was in hiding at the house of a former concierge, why, something relating to her would surely drop out in the course of conversation. So he persuaded Clement to remain indoors, while he set off on his round, with no apparent object but to gossip. At night he came home, having seen Mademoiselle. He told Clement much of the story relating to Madame Babette that I have told to you. Of course he had heard nothing of the ambitious hopes of Morin Fils, hardly of his existence, I should think. Madame Babette had received him kindly although for some time she had kept him standing in the carriage gateway outside her door. But on his complaining of the draught and his rheumatism, she had asked him in, first looking round with some anxiety to see who was in the room behind her. No one was there when he entered and sat down, but in a minute or two a tall, thin young lady with great sad eyes and pale cheeks came from the inner room and, seeing him, retired. It is Mademoiselle Cannes, said Madame Babette, rather unnecessarily, for if he had not been on the watch for some sign of Mademoiselle de Crequy, he would hardly have noticed the entrance and withdrawal. Clément and the good old gardener 
were always rather perplexed by madame babette's evident avoidance of all mention of the de crequy family if she was so much interested in one member as to be willing to undergo the pains and penalties of a domiciliary visit it was strange that she never inquired after the existence of her charge's friends and relations from one who might very probably have heard something of them they settled that madame babette must believe that the marquise and clement were dead and admired her for her reticence in never speaking of virginie the truth was i suspect that she was so desirous of her nephew's success by this time that she did not like letting any one in the secret of virginie's whereabouts who might interfere with their plan however it was arranged between clement and his humble friend that the former dressed in the peasant's clothes in which he had entered paris but smartened up in one or two particulars as if although a countryman he had money to spare should go and engage a sleeping-room in the old breton inn where as i told you accommodation for the night was to be had this was accordingly done without exciting madame babette's suspicions for she was unacquainted with the normandy accent and consequently did not perceive the exaggeration of it which m de crequy adopted in order to disguise his pure parisian but after he had for two nights slept in a queer dark closet at the end of one of the numerous short galleries in the hotel du guesclin and paid his money for such accommodation each morning at the little bureau under the window of the conciergerie he found himself no nearer to his object he stood outside in the gateway madame babette opened a pane in her window counted out the change gave polite thanks and shut to the pane with a clack before he could ever find out what to say that might be the means of opening a conversation once in the streets he was in danger from the bloodthirsty mob who were ready in those days to hunt to death every one who looked like a gentleman as an aristocrat and clement depend upon it looked a gentleman whatever dress he wore yet it was unwise to traverse paris to his old friend the gardener's grenier so he had to loiter about where i hardly know only he did leave the hotel de guesclin and he did not go to old jacques and there was not another house in paris open to him at the end of two days he had made out pierre's existence and he began to try to make friends with the lad pierre was too sharp and shrewd not to suspect something from the confused attempts at friendliness it was not for nothing that the norman farmer lounged in the court and doorway and brought home presents of galette pierre accepted the galette reciprocated the civil speeches but kept his eyes open once returning home pretty late at night he surprised the norman studying the shadows on the blind which was drawn down when madame babette's lamp was lighted on going in he found mademoiselle cannes with his mother sitting by the table and helping in the family mending pierre was afraid that the norman had some view upon the money which his mother as concierge collected for her brother but the money was all safe next evening when his cousin monsieur morin fils came to collect it madame babette asked her nephew to sit down and skilfully barred the passage to the inner door so that virginie had she been ever so much disposed could not have retreated she sat silently sewing all at once the little party was startled by a very sweet tenor voice just close to the street window singing one of the airs out of beaumarchais's operas which a few years before had been popular all over paris but after a few moments of silence and one or two remarks the talking went on again pierre however noticed an increased air of abstraction in virginie who i suppose was recurring to the last time that she had heard the song and did not consider as her cousin had hoped she would have done what were the words set to the air which he imagined she would remember and which would have told her so much for only a few years before a dame's opera of richard le roi had made the story of the minstrel blondel and our english coeur de lion familiar to all the opera-going part of the parisian public 
and clement had bethought him of establishing a communication with virginie by some such means the next night about the same hour the same voice was singing outside the window again pierre who had been irritated by the proceeding the evening before as it had diverted virginie's attention from his cousin who had been doing his utmost to make himself agreeable rushed out to the door just as the norman was ringing the bell to be admitted for the night pierre looked up and down the street no one else was to be seen the next day the norman mollified him somewhat by knocking at the door of the conciergerie and begging monsieur pierre's acceptance of some knee buckles which had taken the country farmer's fancy the day before as he had been gazing into the shops but which being too small for his purpose he took the liberty of offering to monsieur pierre pierre a french boy inclined to foppery was charmed ravished by the beauty of the present and with monsieur's goodness and he began to adjust them to his breeches immediately as well as he could at least in his mother's absence the norman whom pierre kept carefully on the outside of the threshold stood by as if amused by the boy's eagerness take care said he clearly and distinctly take care my little friend lest you become a fop and in that case some day years hence when your heart is devoted to some young lady she may be inclined to say to you here he raised his voice no thank you when i marry i marry a man not a petit mate i marry a man who whatever his position may be will add dignity to the human race by his virtues farther than that in his quotation clement dared not go his sentiments so much above the apparent occasion met with applause from pierre who liked to contemplate himself in the light of a lover even though it should be a rejected one and who hailed the mention of the words virtues and dignity of the human race as belonging to the cant of a good citizen but clement was more anxious to know how the invisible lady took his speech there was no sign at the time but when he returned at night he heard a voice low singing behind madame babette as she handed him his candle the very air he had sung without effect for two nights past as if he had caught it up from her murmuring voice he sang it loudly and clearly as he crossed the court here is our opera singer exclaimed madame babette why the norman grazier sings like Boupre naming a favourite singer at the neighbouring theatre pierre was struck by the remark and quietly resolved to look after the norman but again i believe it was more because of his mother's deposit of money than with any thought of virginie however the next morning to the wonder of both mother and son mademoiselle can proposed with much hesitation to go out and make some little purchase for herself a month or two ago this was what madame babette had been never weary of urging but now she was as much surprised as if she had expected virginie to remain a prisoner in her rooms all the rest of her life i suppose she had hoped that her first time of quitting it would be when she left it for monsieur morin's house as his wife a quick look from madame babette towards pierre was all that was needed to encourage the boy to follow her he went out cautiously she was at the end of the street she looked up and down as if waiting for someone no one was there back she came so swiftly that she nearly caught pierre before he could retreat through the porte cochere there he looked out again the neighbourhood was low and wild and strange and someone spoke to virginie nay laid his hand upon her arm whose dress and aspect he had emerged from a side street pierre did not know but after a start and pierre could fancy a little scream virginie recognized the stranger and the two turned up the side street whence the man had come pierre stole swiftly to the corner of this street no one was there they had disappeared up some of the alleys pierre returned home to excite his mother's infinite surprise but they had hardly done talking when virginie returned with a colour and a radiance in her face 
which they had never seen there since her father's death. My Lady Ludlow, Part 7 I have told you that I heard much of this story from a friend of the intendant of the de Crequies, whom we met with in London. Some years afterwards, the summer before my lord's death, I was travelling with him in Devonshire, and we went to see the French prisoners of war on Dartmoor. We fell into conversation with one of them, whom I found out to be the very peer of whom I had heard before, as having been involved in the fatal story of Clement and Virginie, and by him I was told much of their last days, and thus I learnt how to have some sympathy with all those who were concerned in those terrible events. Yes, even with the younger Morin himself, on whose behalf Pierre spoke warmly, even after so long a time had elapsed. For when the younger Morin called at the porter's lodge, on the evening of the day when Virginie had gone out for the first time, after so many months' confinement to the conciergerie, he was struck with the improvement in her appearance. It seems to have hardly been that he thought her beauty greater, for, in addition to the fact that she was not beautiful, Morin had arrived at that point of being enamoured when it does not signify whether the beloved one is plain or handsome. She has enchanted one pair of eyes, which henceforward see her through their own medium, but Morin noticed the faint increase of colour and light in her countenance. It was as though she had broken through her thick cloud of hopeless sorrow, and was dawning forth into a happier life. And so, whereas during her grief he had revered and respected it even to a point of silent sympathy, now that she was gladdened, his heart rose on the wings of strengthened hopes, even in the dreary monotony of his existence in his aunt babette's conciergerie time had not failed in his work and now perhaps soon he might humbly strive to help time the very next day he returned on some pretence of business to the hotel du guesclin and made his aunt's room rather than his aunt herself a present of roses and geraniums tied up in a bouquet with a tricolor ribbon Virginie was in the room, sitting at the coarse sewing she liked to do for Madame Babette. He saw her eyes brighten at the sight of the flowers. She asked his aunt to let her arrange them. He saw her untie the ribbon, and with a gesture of dislike, throw it on the ground and give it a kick with her little foot, and even in this girlish manner of insulting his dearest prejudices, he found something to admire. As he was coming out, Pierre stopped him. The lad had been trying to arrest his cousin's attention by futile grimaces and signs played off behind Virginie's back, but Monsieur Morin saw nothing but Mademoiselle Cannes. However, Pierre was not to be baffled, and Monsieur Morin found him in waiting just outside the threshold. With his finger on his lips, Pierre walked on tiptoe by his companion's side till they would have been long past sight or hearing of the conciergerie even had the inhabitants devoted themselves to the purpose of spying or listening chut said pierre at last she goes out walking well said monsieur morin half curious half annoyed at being disturbed in the delicious reverie of the future into which he longed to fall well it is not well it is bad why i do not ask who she is but i have my ideas she is an aristocrat do the people about here begin to suspect her no no said pierre but she goes out walking she has gone these two mornings i have watched her she meets a man she is friends with him for she talks to him as eagerly as he does to her mamma cannot tell who he is has my aunt seen him no not so much as a fly's wing of him i myself have only seen his back it strikes me like a familiar back and yet i cannot think who it is but they separate with sudden darts like two birds who have been together to feed their young ones one moment they are in close talk their heads together chuckotting the next he has turned up some by-street and mademoiselle cannes is close upon me 
has almost caught me but she did not see you inquired monsieur morin in so altered a voice that pierre gave him one of his quick penetrating looks he was struck by the way in which his cousin's features always coarse and commonplace had become contracted and pinched struck too by the livid look on his sallow complexion but as if morin was conscious of the manner in which his face belied his feelings he made an effort and smiled and patted pierre's head and thanked him for his intelligence and gave him a five-franc piece and bade him go on with his observations of mademoiselle Cannes's movements and report all to him pierre returned home with a light heart tossing up his five-franc piece as he ran just as he was at the conciergerie door a great tall man bustled past him and snatched his money away from him looking back with a laugh which added insult to injury pierre had no redress no one had witnessed the impudent theft and if they had no one to be seen in the street was strong enough to give him redress besides pierre had seen enough of the state of the streets of paris at that time to know that friends not enemies were required and the man had a bad air about him but all these considerations did not keep pierre from bursting out into a fit of crying when he was once more under his mother's roof and virginie who was alone there madame babette having gone out to make her daily purchases might have imagined him pommeled to death by the loudness of his sobs what is the matter asked she speak my child what hast thou done he has robbed me he has robbed me was all pierre could gulp out robbed thee and of what my poor boy said virginie stroking his hair gently of my five franc piece of a five franc piece said pierre correcting himself and leaving out the word my half fearful lest virginie should inquire how he became possessed of such a sum and for what services it had been given him but of course no such idea came into her head for it would have been impertinent and she was gentle born wait a moment my lad and going to the one small drawer in the inner apartment which held all her few possessions she brought back a little ring a ring just with one ruby in it which she had worn in the days when she cared to wear jewels take this said she and run with it to a jeweller's it is but a poor valueless thing but it will bring you in your five francs at any rate go i desire you but i cannot said the boy hesitating some dim sense of honour flitting through his misty morals yes you must she continued urging him with her hand to the door run if it brings in more than five francs you shall return the surplus to me thus tempted by her urgency and i suppose reasoning with himself to the effect that he might as well have the money and then see whether he thought it right to act as a spy upon her or not the one action did not pledge him to the other nor yet did she make any conditions with her gift pierre went off with her ring and after repaying himself his five francs he was enabled to bring virginie back two more so well had he managed his affairs but although the whole transaction did not leave him bound in any way to discover or forward virginie's wishes it did leave him pledged according to his code to act according to her advantage and he considered himself the judge of the best course to be pursued to this end and moreover this little kindness attached him to her personally he began to think how pleasant it would be to have so kind and generous a person for a relation how easily his troubles might be borne if he had always such a ready helper at hand how much he should like to make her like him and come to him for the protection of his masculine power first of all his duties as her self-appointed squire came the necessity of finding out who her strange new acquaintance was thus you see he arrived at the same end via supposed duty that he was previously pledged to via interest i fancy a good number of us when any line of action will promote our own interests can make ourselves believe that reason exists which compels us to it as a duty in the course of a very few days pierre had so circumvented virginie 
as to have discovered that her new friend was no other than the Norman farmer in a different dress. This was a great piece of knowledge to impart to Morin. But Pierre was not prepared for the immediate physical effect it had on his cousin. Morin sat suddenly down on one of the seats in the boulevards. It was there Pierre had met with him accidentally, when he heard who it was that Virginie met. I do not suppose the man had the faintest idea of any relationship or even previous acquaintanceship between Clement and Virginie. If he thought of anything beyond the mere fact presented to him that his idol was in communication with another, younger, handsomer man than himself, it must have been that the Norman farmer had seen her at the conciergerie and had been attracted by her and, as was but natural, had tried to make her acquaintance and had succeeded. But, from what Pierre told me, I should not think that even this much thought passed through Morin's mind. He seems to have been a man of rare and concentrated attachments, violent though restrained and undemonstrative passions, and, above all, a capability of jealousy, of which his dark oriental complexion must have been a type. I could fancy that if he had married Virginie, he would have coined his life-blood for luxuries to make her happy, would have watched over and petted her at every sacrifice to himself as long as she would have been content to live for him alone. But as Pierre expressed it to me, when I saw what my cousin was, when I learned his nature too late, I perceived that he would have strangled a bird if she whom he loved was attracted by it from him. When Pierre had told Morin of his discovery, Morin sat down, as I have said, quite suddenly, as if he had been shot. He found out that the first meeting between the Norman and Virginie was no accidental, isolated circumstance. Pierre was torturing him with his accounts of daily rendezvous, if but for a moment. They were seeing each other every day, sometimes twice a day. And Virginie could speak to this man, though to himself, she was so coy and reserved as hardly to utter a sentence. Pierre caught these broken words while his cousin's complexion grew more and more livid, and then purple, as if some great effect were produced on his circulation by the news he had just heard. Pierre was so startled by his cousin's wondering, senseless eyes and otherwise disordered looks that he rushed into a neighbouring cabaret for a glass of absinthe, which he paid for, as he recollected afterwards, with a portion of Virginie's five francs. By and by Morin recovered his natural appearance, but he was gloomy and silent, and all that Pierre could get out of him was that the Norman farmer should not sleep another night at the Hotel du Guesclin, giving him such opportunities of passing and repassing by the conciergerie door. He was too much absorbed in his own thoughts to repay Pierre the half-franc he had spent on the absinthe, which Pierre perceived and seemed to have noted down in the ledger of his mind as on Virginie's balance of favour. Altogether he was so much disappointed at his cousin's mode of receiving intelligence, which the lad thought worth another five-franc piece at least, or, if not paid for in money, to be paid for in open-mouthed confidence and expression of feeling, that he was for a time, so far a partisan of Virginie's, unconscious Virginie, against his cousin as to feel regret when the Norman returned no more to his night's lodging, and when Virginie's eager watch at the crevice of the closely drawn blind ended only with a sigh of disappointment. If it had not been for his mother's presence at the time, Pierre thought he should have told her all. But how far was his mother in his cousin's confidence as regard the dismissal of the Norman? In a few days, however, Pierre felt almost sure that they had established some new means of communication. Virginie went out for a short time every day, but, though Pierre followed her as closely as he could without exciting her observation, he was unable to discover what kind of intercourse she held with the Norman. She went, in general, the same short round among the little shops in the neighbourhood, not entering any, but stopping at two or three. Pierre afterwards remembered that she had invariably paused at the nosegays displayed in a certain window, and studied them long. 
but then she stopped and looked at caps hats fashions confectionery all of the humble kind common in that quarter so how should he have known that any particular attraction existed among the flowers morin came more regularly than ever to his aunts but virginie was apparently unconscious that she was the attraction she looked healthier and more hopeful than she had done for months and her manners to all were gentler and not so reserved almost as if she wished to manifest her gratitude to madame babat for her long continuance of a kindness the necessity for which was nearly ended virginie showed an unusual alacrity in rendering the old woman any little service in her power and evidently tried to respond to monsieur morin's civilities he being madame babette's nephew with the soft graciousness which must have made one of her principal charms for all who knew her speak of the fascination of her manners so winning and attentive to others while yet her opinions and often her actions were of so decided a character for as i have said her beauty was by no means great yet every man who came near her seems to have fallen into the sphere of her influence monsieur morin was deeper than ever in love with her during these last few days he was worked up into a state capable of any sacrifice either of himself or others so that he might obtain her at last he sat devouring her with his eyes to use pierre's expression whenever she could not see him but if she looked towards him he looked to the ground anywhere away from her and almost stammered in his replies if she addressed any question to him he had been i should think ashamed of his extreme agitation on the boulevards for pierre thought that he absolutely shunned him for these few succeeding days he must have believed that he had driven the norman my poor clement off the field by banishing him from his inn and thought that the intercourse between him and virginie which he had thus interrupted was of so slight and transient a character as to be quenched by a little difficulty but he appears to have felt that he made but little way and he awkwardly turned to pierre for help not yet confessing his love though he only tried to make friends again with the lad after their silent estrangement and pierre for some time did not choose to perceive his cousin's advances he would reply to all the roundabout questions morin put to him respecting household conversations when he was not present or household occupations and tone of thought without mentioning virginie's name any more than his questioner did the lad would seem to suppose that his cousin's strong interest in their domestic ways of going on was all on account of madame babette at last he worked his cousin up to the point of making him a confidant and then the boy was half frightened at the torrent of vehement words he had unloosed the lava came down with a greater rush for having been pent up so long Morin cried out his words in a hoarse, passionate voice, clenched his teeth, his fingers, and seemed almost convulsed as he spoke out his terrible love for Virginie, which would lead him to kill her sooner than see her and others. And if another stepped in between him and her, and then he smiled a fierce, triumphant smile, but did not say any more. Pierre was, as I said, half frightened, but also half admiring this was really love a grand passion a really fine dramatic thing like the plays they acted at the little theatre yonder he had a dozen times the sympathy with his cousin now that he had had before and readily swore by the infernal gods for they were far too enlightened to believe in one god or christianity or anything of the kind that he would devote himself body and soul to forwarding his cousin's views then his cousin took him to a shop and bought him a smart second-hand watch on which they scratched the words fidelite and thus was the compact sealed pierre settled in his own mind that if he were a woman he should like to be beloved as virginie was by his cousin and that it would be an extremely good thing for her to be the wife of so rich a citizen as morin feels and for pierre himself too for doubtless their gratitude would lead them to give him rings and watches ad infinitum a day or two afterwards virginie was taken ill 
Madame Babette said it was because she had persevered in going out in all weathers, after confining herself to two warm rooms for so long, and very probably this was really the cause, for, from Pierre's account, she must have been suffering from a feverish cold, aggravated, no doubt, by her impatience at Madame Babette's familiar prohibitions of any more walks until she was better. Every day, in spite of her trembling, aching limbs, she would fain have arranged her dress for her walk at the usual time, but Madame Babette was fully prepared to put physical obstacles in her way, if she was not obedient in remaining tranquil on the little sofa by the side of the fire. The third day she called Pierre to her when his mother was not attending, having in fact locked up Mademoiselle Cannes' out-of-door things. See, my child, said Virginie, thou must do me a great favour. Go to the gardener's shop in the Rue de Bons Enfants and look at the nosegays in the window. I long for pinks, they are my favourite flower. Here are two francs. If thou seest a nosegay of pinks displayed in the window, if it be ever so faded, nay, if thou seest two or three nosegays of pinks, remember, buy them all and bring them to me. I have so great a desire for the smell. She fell back weak and exhausted. Pierre hurried out. Now was the time. Here was the clue to the long inspection of the nosegays in this very shop. Sure enough, there was a drooping nosegay of pinks in the window. Pierre went in, and with all his impatience he made as good a bargain as he could, urging that the flowers were faded and good for nothing. At last he purchased them at a very moderate price, and now you will learn the bad consequences of teaching the lower orders anything beyond what is immediately necessary to enable them to earn their daily bread. The silly Count de Crequy, he who had been sent to his bloody rest by the very canal of whom he thought so much, he who had made Virginie, indirectly it is true, reject such a man as her cousin Clement, by inflating her mind with his bubbles of theories. This Count de Crequy had long ago taken a fancy to Pierre, as he saw the bright, sharp child playing about his courtyard. Monsieur de Crequy had even begun to educate the boy himself, to try to work out certain opinions of his into practice. But the drudgery of the affair wearied him, and besides, Babette had left his employment. Still, the Count took a kind of interest in his former pupil, and made some sort of arrangement by which Pierre was to be taught reading and writing, and accounts, and heaven knows what besides, Latin, I dare say. So Pierre, instead of being an innocent messenger, as he ought to have been, as Mr. Horner's little lad Gregson ought to have been this morning, could read writing as well as either you or I. So what does he do, on obtaining the nosegay, but examine it well? The stalks of the flowers were tied up with slips of matting in wet moss. Pierre undid the strings, unwrapped the moss, and out fell a piece of wet paper, with the writing all blurred with moisture. It was but a torn piece of writing paper, apparently, but Pierre's wicked, mischievous eyes read what was written on it, written so as to look like a fragment. Ready, every and any night at nine, all is prepared, have no fright, Trust one who, whatever hopes he might once have had, is content now to serve you as a faithful cousin. And the place was named, which I forget, but which Pierre did not, as it was evidently the rendezvous. After the lad had studied every word till he could say it off by heart, he placed the paper where he had found it, enveloped it in moss, and tied the whole up again carefully. Virginie's face coloured scarlet as she received it. She kept smelling at it and trembling, but she did not untie it, although Pierre suggested how much fresher it would be if the stalks were immediately put into water. But once, after his back had been turned for a minute, he saw it untied when he looked round again, and Virginie was blushing and hiding something in her bosom. Pierre was now all impatience to set off and find his cousin, but his mother seemed to want him for small domestic purposes even more than usual, and he had chafed over a multitude of errands connected with the hotel before he could set off and search for his cousin at his usual haunts. At last the two met, and Pierre related all the events of the morning to Morin. 
he said the note off word by word that lad this morning had something of the magpie look of pierre it made me shudder to see him and hear him repeat the note by heart then morin asked him to tell him all over again pierre was struck by morin's heavy sighs as he repeated the story when he came the second time to the note morin tried to write the words down but either he was not a good ready scholar or his fingers trembled too much pierre hardly remembered but at any rate the lad had to do it with his wicked reading and writing when this was done morin sat heavily silent pierre would have preferred the expected outburst for this impenetrable gloom perplexed and baffled him he had even to speak to his cousin to rouse him and when he replied what he said had so little apparent connection with the subject which pierre had expected to find uppermost in his mind that he was half afraid that his cousin had lost his wits my aunt babette is out of coffee i am sure i do not know said pierre yes she is i heard her say so tell her that a friend of mine has just opened a shop in the rue saint antoine and that if she will join me there in an hour i will supply her with a good stock of coffee just to give my friend encouragement his name is antoine mayer number one hundred and fifty at the sign of the cap of liberty i could go with you now i can carry a few pounds of coffee better than my mother said pierre all in good faith he told me he should never forget the look on his cousin's face as he turned round and bade him be gone and give his mother the message without another word it had evidently sent him home promptly to obey his cousin's command morin's message perplexed madame babette how could he know i was out of coffee said she i am but i only used the last up this morning how could victor know about it i am sure i can't tell said pierre who by this time had recovered his usual self-possession all i know is that monsieur is in a pretty temper and that if you are not sharp to your time at this antoine mayer's you are likely to come in for some of his black looks well it is very kind of him to offer to give me some coffee to be sure but how could he know i was out pierre hurried his mother off impatiently for he was certain that the offer of the coffee was only a blind to some hidden purpose on his cousin's part and he made no doubt that when his mother had been informed of what his cousin's real intention was he pierre could extract it from her by coaxing or bullying but he was mistaken madame babette returned home grave depressed silent and loaded with the best coffee some time afterwards he learnt why his cousin had sought for this interview it was to extract from her by promises and threats the real name of mademoiselle Cannes, which would give him a clue to the true appellation of the faithful cousin he concealed this second purpose from his aunt who had been quite unaware of his jealousy of the norman farmer or of his identification of him with any relation of virginie's but madame babette instinctively shrank from giving him any information she must have felt that in the lowering mood in which she found him his desire for greater knowledge of virginie's antecedents boded her no good and yet he made his aunt his confidant told her what she had only suspected before that he was deeply enamoured of mademoiselle Cannes, and would gladly marry her he spoke to madame babette of his father's hoarded riches and of the share which he as partner had in them at the present time and of the prospect of the succession to the whole which he had as an only child he told his aunt of the provision for her madame babette's life which he would make on the day when he married mademoiselle can and yet and yet babette saw that in his eye and look which made her more and more reluctant to confide in him by and by he tried threats she should leave the conciergerie and find employment where she liked still silence then he grew angry and swore that he would inform against her at the bureau of the directory for harbouring an aristocrat an aristocrat he knew mademoiselle was whatever her real name might be his aunt should have a domiciliary visit and see how she liked that the officers of the government were the people for finding out secrets 
in vain she reminded him that by so doing he would expose to imminent danger the lady whom he had professed to love he told her with a sullen relapse into silence after his vehement outpouring of passion never to trouble herself about that at last he wearied out the old woman and frightened alike of herself and of him she told him all that mademoiselle cannes was mademoiselle virginie de crequy daughter of the count of that name who was the count younger brother of the marquise where was the marquise dead long ago leaving a widow and child a son eagerly yes a son where was he parbleu how should she know for her courage returned a little as the talk went away from the only person of the de crequy family that she cared about but by dint of some small glasses out of a bottle of antoine mayer's she told him more about the de crequys than she liked afterwards to remember for the exhilaration of the brandy lasted but a very short time and she came home as i have said depressed with a presentiment of coming evil she would not answer pierre but cuffed him about in a manner to which the spoiled boy was quite unaccustomed his cousin's short angry words and sudden withdrawal of confidence his mother's unwanted crossness and fault-finding all made virginie's kind gentle treatment more than ever charming to the lad he half resolved to tell her how he had been acting as a spy upon her actions and at whose desire he had done it but he was afraid of morin and of the vengeance which he was sure would fall upon him for any breach of confidence towards half-past eight that evening pierre watching saw virginie arrange several little things she was in the inner room but he sat where he could see her through the glazed partition his mother sat apparently sleeping in the great easy chair virginie moved about softly for fear of disturbing her she made up one or two little parcels of the few things she could call her own one packet she concealed about herself the others she directed and left on the shelf she is going thought pierre and as he said in giving me the account his heart gave a spring to think that he should never see her again if either his mother or his cousin had been more kind to him he might have endeavoured to intercept her but as it was he held his breath and when she came out he pretended to read scarcely knowing whether he wished her to succeed in the purpose which he was almost sure she entertained or not she stopped by him and passed her hand over his hair he told me that his eyes filled with tears at this caress then she stood for a moment looking at the sleeping madame babette and stooped down and softly kissed her on the forehead pierre dreaded lest his mother should wake for by this time the wayward vacillating boy must have been quite on virginie's side but the brandy she had drunk made her slumber heavily virginie went pierre's heart beat fast he was sure his cousin would try to intercept her but how he could not imagine he longed to run out and see the catastrophe but he had let the moment slip he was also afraid of reawakening his mother to her unusual state of anger and violence my lady ludlow part eight pierre went on pretending to read but in reality listening with acute tension of ear to every little sound his perceptions became so sensitive in this respect that he was incapable of measuring time every moment had seemed so full of noises from the beating of his heart up to the roll of the heavy carts in the distance he wondered whether virginie would have reached the place of rendezvous and yet he was unable to compute the passage of minutes his mother slept soundly that was well by this time virginie must have met the faithful cousin if indeed morin had not made his appearance at length he felt as if he could no longer sit still awaiting the issue but must run out and see what course events had taken in vain his mother half rousing herself called after him to ask whether he was going he was already out of hearing before she had ended her sentence 
and he ran on until stopped by the sight of mademoiselle cannes walking along at so swift a pace that it was almost a run while at her side resolutely keeping by her morin was striding abreast pierre had just turned the corner of the street when he came upon them virginie would have passed him without recognizing him she was in such passionate agitation but for morin's gesture by which he would fain have kept pierre from interrupting them then when virginie saw the lad she caught at his arm and thanked god as if in that boy of twelve or fourteen she held a protector pierre felt her tremble from head to foot and was afraid lest she would fall there where she stood in the hard rough street begone pierre said morin i cannot replied pierre who indeed was held firmly by virginie besides i won't he added who has been frightening mademoiselle in this way asked he very much inclined to brave his cousin at all hazards mademoiselle is not accustomed to walk in the streets alone said morin sulkily she came upon a crowd attracted by the arrest of an aristocrat and their cries alarmed her i offered to take charge of her home mademoiselle should not walk in these streets alone we are not like the cold-blooded people of the faubourg saint germain virginie did not speak pierre doubted if she heard a word of what they were saying she leant upon him more and more heavily will mademoiselle condescend to take my arm said morin with sulky and yet humble uncouthness i dare say he would have given worlds if he might have had that little hand within his arm but though she still kept silence she shuddered up away from him as you shrink from touching a toad he had said something to her during that walk you may be sure which had made her loathe him he marked and understood the gesture he held himself aloof while pierre gave her all the assistance he could in their slow progress homewards but morin accompanied her all the same he had played too desperate a game to be balked now he had given information against the ci devant marquis de crequy as a returned emigre to be met with at such a time in such a place morin had hoped that all sign of the arrest would have been cleared away before virginie reached the spot so swiftly were terrible deeds done in those days but clement defended himself desperately virginie was punctual to a second and though the wounded man was borne off to the abbey amid a crowd of the unsympathizing jeerers who mingled with the armed officials of the directory morin feared lest virginie had recognized him and he would have preferred that she should have thought that the faithful cousin was faithless than that she should have seen him in bloody danger on her account i suppose he fancied that if virginie never saw or heard more of him her imagination would not dwell on his simple disappearance as it would do if she knew what he was suffering for her sake at any rate pierre saw that his cousin was deeply mortified by the whole tenor of his behaviour during their walk home when they arrived at madame babette's virginie fell fainting on the floor her strength had but just sufficed for this exertion of reaching the shelter of the house her first sign of restoring consciousness consisted in avoidance of morin he had been most assiduous in his efforts to bring her round quite tender in his way pierre said and this marked instinctive repugnance to him evidently gave him extreme pain i suppose frenchmen are more demonstrative than we are for pierre declared that he saw his cousin's eyes fill with tears as she shrank away from his touch if he tried to arrange the shawl they had laid under her head like a pillow or as she shut her eyes when he passed before her madame babette was urgent with her to go and lie down on the bed in the inner room but it was some time before she was strong enough to rise and do this when madame babette returned from arranging the girl comfortably the three relations sat down in silence a silence which pierre thought would never be broken he wanted his mother to ask his cousin what had happened but madame babette was afraid of her nephew and thought it more discreet to wait for such crumbs of intelligence as he might think fit to throw to her but after she had twice reported virginie to be asleep without a word being uttered in reply to her whispers by either of her companions 
Morant's powers of self-containment gave way. "'It is hard,' he said. "'What is hard?' asked Madame Babette, after she had paused for a time, to enable him to add to, or to finish his sentence, if he pleased. "'It is hard for a man to love a woman as I do,' he went on. "'I did not seek to love her. It came upon me before I was aware, before I had even thought about it at all. I loved her better than all the world beside.' All my life before I knew her seems a dull blank. I neither know nor care for what I did before then, and now there are just two lives before me. Either I have her, or I have not. That is all. But that is everything. And what can I do to make her have me? Tell me, aunt. And he caught at Madame Babette's arm, and gave it so sharp a shake that she half screamed out, Pierre said, and evidently grew alarmed at her nephew's excitement. Hush, Victor, said she, there are other women in the world, if this one will not have you. None other for me, he said, sinking back as if hopeless. I am plain and coarse, not one of the scented darlings of the aristocrats. Say that I am ugly, brutish. I did not make myself so, any more than I made myself love her. It is my fate, but am I to submit to the consequences of my fate without a struggle? Not I. As strong as my love is, so strong is my will. It can be no stronger, continued he gloomily. Aunt Babette, you must help me. You must make her love me. He was so fierce here that Pierre said he did not wonder that his mother was frightened. I, Victor, she claimed, I make her love you? How can I? Ask me to speak for you to Mademoiselle Didot, or to Mademoiselle Cauchois even or to such as they, and I'll do it, and welcome. But to Mademoiselle de Crequy, why, you don't know the difference. Those people, the old nobility, I mean, why, they don't know a man from a dog out of their own rank. And no wonder, for the young gentlemen of quality are treated differently to us from their very birth. If she had you to-morrow, you would be miserable. Let me alone for knowing the aristocracy." I have not been a concierge to a duke and three counts for nothing. I tell you, all your ways are different to her ways. I would change my ways, as you call them. Be reasonable, Victor. No, I will not be reasonable. If by that you mean giving her up. I tell you, two lives are before me. One with her, one without her. But the latter will be but a short career for both of us. You said, aunt, that the talk went in the conciergerie of her father's hotel, that she would have nothing to do with this cousin, whom I put out of the way to-day. So the servant said, how could I know? All I know is that he left off coming to our hotel, and that at one time before then he had never been two days absent. So much the better for him. He suffers now for having come between me and my object in trying to snatch her away out of my sight. Take you warning, Pierre. I do not like your meddling to-night. And so he went off, leaving Madame Babette rocking herself backwards and forwards, in all the depression of spirits consequent upon the reaction after the brandy, and upon her knowledge of her nephew's threatened purpose combined. In telling you most of this, I have simply repeated Pierre's account, which I wrote down at the time. But here what he had to say came to a sudden break, for the next morning, when Madame Babette rose, Virginie was missing, and it was some time before either she or Pierre or Morin could get the slightest clue to the missing girl. And now I must take up the story as it was told to the Intendant Flechier by the old gardener Jacques, with whom Clément had been lodging on his first arrival in Paris. The old man could not, I dare say, remember half as much of what happened as Pierre did. The former had the dulled memory of age, while Pierre had evidently thought over the whole series of events as a story, as a play, if one may call it so, during the solitary hours in his afterlife, wherever they were passed, whether in lonely camp watches or in the foreign prison where he had to drag out many years. Clément had, as I said, returned to the gardener's garret after he had been dismissed from the Hôtel du Gasclin. There were several reasons for his thus doubling back. 
one was that he put nearly the whole breadth of paris between him and an enemy though why morin was an enemy and to what extent he carried his dislike or hatred clement could not tell of course the next reason for returning to jacques was no doubt the conviction that in multiplying his residences he multiplied the chances against his being suspected and recognized and then again the old man was in his secret and his ally although perhaps but a feeble kind of one it was through jacques that the plan of communication by means of a nosegay of pinks had been devised and it was jacques who procured him the last disguise that clement was to use in paris as he hoped and trusted it was that of a respectable shopkeeper of no particular class a dress that would have seemed perfectly suitable to the young man who would naturally have worn it and yet as clement put it on and adjusted it giving it a sort of finish and elegance which i always noticed about his appearance and which i believe was innate in the wearer i have no doubt it seemed like the usual apparel of a gentleman no coarseness of texture nor clumsiness of cut could disguise the nobleman of thirty descents it appeared for immediately on arriving at the place of rendezvous he was recognized by the men placed there on morin's information to seize him jacques following at a little distance with a bundle under his arm containing articles of feminine disguise for virginie saw four men attempt clement's arrest saw him quick as lightning draw a sword hitherto concealed in a clumsy stick saw his agile figure spring to his guard and saw him defend himself with the rapidity and art of a man skilled in arms but what good did it do as jacques piteously used to ask monsieur flechier told me a great blow from a heavy club on the sword-arm of monsieur de crequy laid it helpless and immovable by his side jacques always thought that the blow came from one of the spectators who by this time had collected round the scene of the affray the next instant his master his little marquise was down among the feet of the crowd and though he was up again before he had received much damage so active and light was my poor clement it was not before the old gardener had hobbled forward and with many an old-fashioned oath and curse proclaimed himself a partisan of the losing side a follower of a ci-devant aristocrat it was quite enough he received one or two good blows which were in fact aimed at his master and then almost before he was aware he found his arms pinioned behind him with a woman's garter which one of the viragos in the crowd had made no scruple of pulling off in public as soon as she heard for what purpose it was wanted poor jacques was stunned and unhappy his master was out of sight on before and the old gardener scarce knew whither they were taking him his head ached from the blows which had fallen upon it it was growing dark june day though it was and when first he seems to have become exactly aware of what had happened to him it was when he was turned into one of the larger rooms of the abbey in which all were put who had no other allotted place wherein to sleep one or two iron lamps hung from the ceiling by chains giving a dim light for a little circle jacques stumbled forward over a sleeping body lying on the ground the sleeper wakened up enough to complain and the apology of the old man in reply caught the ear of his master who until this time could hardly have been aware of the straits and difficulties of his faithful jacques and there they sat against a pillar the live-long night holding one another's hands and each restraining expressions of pain for fear of adding to the other's distress that night made them intimate friends in spite of the differences of age and rank the disappointed hopes the acute suffering of the present the apprehensions of the future made them seek solace in talking of the past Monsieur de crequy and the gardener found themselves disputing with interest in which chimney of the stack the starling used to build the starling whose nest clement sent to urion you remember and discussing the merits of different espalier pears which grew and may still grow in the old garden of the hotel de crequy towards morning both fell asleep the old man wakened first his frame was deadened to suffering i suppose for he felt relieved of his pain but clement moaned and cried in feverish slumber 
his broken arm was beginning to inflame his blood he was besides much injured by some kicks from the crowd as he fell as the old man looked sadly on the white baked lips and the flushed cheeks contorted with suffering even in his sleep clement gave a sharp cry which disturbed his miserable neighbours all slumbering around in uneasy attitudes they bade him with curses be silent and then turning round tried again to forget their own misery in sleep for you see the bloodthirsty canaille had not been slated with guillotining and hanging all the nobility they could find but were now informing right and left even against each other and when clement and jacques were in the prison there were few of gentle blood in the place and fewer still of gentle manners at the sound of the angry words and threats jacques thought it best to awaken his master from his feverish uncomfortable sleep lest he should provoke more enmity and tenderly lifting him up he tried to adjust his own body so that it should serve as a rest and a pillow for the younger man the motion aroused clement and he began to talk in a strange feverish way of virginie too whose name he would not have breathed in such a place had he been quite himself but jacques had as much delicacy of feeling as any lady in the land although mind you he knew neither how to read nor write and bent his head low down so that his master might tell him in a whisper what messages he was to take to mademoiselle de crequy in case poor clement he knew it must come to that no escape for him now in norman disguise or otherwise either by gathering fever or guillotine death was sure of his prey well when that happened jacques was to go and find mademoiselle de crequy and tell her that her cousin loved her at the last as he had loved her at the first but that she should never have heard another word of his attachment from his living lips that he knew he was not good enough for her his queen and that no thought of earning her love by his devotion had prompted his return to france only that if possible he might have the great privilege of serving her whom he loved and then he went off into rambling talk about petit maitre and such kind of expressions said jacques de flechier the intendant little knowing what a clue that one word gave to much of the poor lad's suffering the summer morning came slowly on in that dark prison and when jacques could look around his master was now sleeping on his shoulder still the uneasy starting sleep of fever he saw that there were many women among the prisoners i have heard some of those who have escaped from the prison say that the look of despair and agony that came into the faces of the prisoners on first awakening as the sense of their situation grew upon them was what lasted the longest in the memory of the survivors this look they said passed away from the women's faces sooner than it did from those of the men poor old jacques kept falling asleep and plucking himself up again for fear lest if he did not attend to his master some harm might come to the swollen helpless arm yet his weariness grew upon him in spite of all his efforts and at last he felt as if he must give way to the irresistible desire if only for five minutes but just then there was a bustle at the door jacques opened his eyes wide to look the jailer is early with breakfast said some one lazily it is the darkness of this accursed place that makes us think it early said another all this time a parley was going on at the door some one came in not the jailer a woman the door was shut to and locked behind her she only advanced a step or two for it was too sudden a change out of the light into the dark shadow for any one to see clearly for the first few minutes jacques had his eyes fairly open now and was wide awake it was mademoiselle de crequy looking bright clear and resolute the faithful heart of the old man read that look like an open page her cousin should not die there on her behalf without at least the comfort of her sweet presence here he is he whispered as her gown would have touched him in passing without her perceiving him in the heavy obscurity of the place the good god bless you my friend she murmured as she saw the attitude of the old man propped against a pillar 
and holding clement in his arms as if the young man had been a helpless baby while one of the poor gardener's hands supported the broken limb in the easiest position virginie sat down by the old man and held out her arms softly she moved clement's head on to her own shoulder softly she transferred the task of holding the arm to herself clement lay on the floor but she supported him and jacques was at liberty to arise and stretch and shake his stiff weary old body he then sat down at a little distance and watched the pair until he fell asleep clement had muttered virginie as they half roused him by their movements out of his stupor but jacques thought he was only dreaming nor did he seem fully awake when once his eyes opened and he looked full at virginie's face bending over him and growing crimson under his gaze though she never stirred for fear of hurting him if she moved clement looked in silence until his heavy lids came slowly down and he fell into his oppressive slumber again either he did not recognize her or she came in too completely as a part of his sleeping visions for him to be disturbed by her appearance there when jacques awoke it was full daylight at least as full as it would ever be in that place his breakfast the jail allowance of bread and van ordinaire was by his side he must have slept soundly he looked for his master he and virginie had recognized each other now hearts as well as appearance they were smiling into each other's faces as if that dull vaunted room in the dim abbey were the sunny gardens of versailles with music and festivity all abroad apparently they had much to say to each other for whispered questions and answers never ceased virginie had made a sling for the poor broken arm nay she had obtained two splinters of wood in some way and one of their fellow prisoners having it appeared some knowledge of surgery had set it jacques felt more desponding by far than they did for he was suffering from the night he had passed which told upon his aged frame while they must have heard some good news as it seemed to him so bright and happy did they look yet clement was still in bodily pain and suffering and virginie by her own act and deed was a prisoner in that dreadful abbey whence the only issue was the guillotine but they were together they loved they understood each other at length when virginie saw that jacques was awake and languidly munching his breakfast she rose from the wooden stool on which she was sitting and went to him holding out both hands and refusing to allow him to rise while she thanked him with pretty eagerness for all his kindnesses to monsieur monsieur himself came towards him following virginie but with tottering steps as if his head was weak and dizzy to thank the poor old man who now on his feet stood between them ready to cry while they gave him credit for faithful actions which he felt to have been almost involuntary on his part for loyalty was like an instinct in the good old days before your educational cant had come up and so two days went on the only event was the morning call for the victims a certain number of whom were summoned to trial every day and to be tried was to be condemned every one of the prisoners became grave as the hour for their summons approached most of the victims went to their doom with uncomplaining resignation and for a while after their departure there was comparative silence in the prison but by and by so said jacques the conversation or amusements began again human nature cannot stand the perpetual pressure of such keen anxiety without an effort to relieve itself by thinking of something else jacques said that monsieur and mademoiselle were forever talking together of the past days it was do you remember this or do you remember that perpetually he sometimes thought they forgot where they were and what was before them but jacques did not and every day he trembled more and more as the list was called over the third morning of their incarceration the jailer brought in a man whom jacques did not recognize and therefore did not at once observe as in duty bound upon his master and his sweet young lady 
as he always called her in repeating the story. He thought that the new introduction was some friend of the jailer, as the two seemed well acquainted, and the latter stayed a few minutes talking with his visitor before leaving him in the prison. So Jacques was surprised when, after a short time had elapsed, he looked round and saw the fierce stare with which the stranger was regarding Monsieur and Mademoiselle de Crequy as the pair sat at breakfast, the said breakfast being laid as well as Jacques knew how on a bench fastened into the prison wall, Virginie sitting on her low stool and Clement half lying on the ground by her side and submitting gladly to be fed by her pretty white fingers. For it was one of her fancies, Jacques said, to do all she could for him in consideration of his broken arm. And, indeed, Clement was wasting away daily, for he had received other injuries, internal and more serious than that to his arm, during the melee which had ended in his capture. The stranger made Jacques conscious of his presence by a sigh, which was almost a groan. All three prisoners looked round at the sound. Clement's face expressed little but scornful indifference. But Virginie's face froze into stony hate. Jacques said he never saw such a look, and hoped that he never should again. Yet after that first revelation of feeling, her look was steady and fixed in another direction to that in which the stranger stood, still motionless, still watching. He came a step nearer at last. Mademoiselle, he said, not the quivering of an eyelash showed that she had heard him. Mademoiselle, he said again, with an intensity of beseeching that made Jacques, not knowing who he was, almost pity him when he saw his young lady's obdurate face. There was perfect silence for a space of time, which Jacques could not measure. Then again the voice, hesitatingly saying, Monsieur, Clement could not hold the same icy countenance as Virginie. He turned his head with an impatient gesture of disgust, but even that emboldened the man. Monsieur, do ask Mademoiselle to listen to me. Just two words. Mademoiselle de Crequy only listens to whom she chooses. Very haughtily, my Clement would say that, I am sure. But Mademoiselle, lowering his voice and coming a step or two nearer, Virginie must have felt his approach, though she did not see it, for she drew herself a little on one side, so as to put as much space as possible between him and her. Mademoiselle, it is not too late. I can save you. But to-morrow your name is down on the list. I can save you if you will listen. Still no word or sign. Jacques did not understand the affair. Why was she so obdurate to one who might be ready to include Clement in the proposal, as far as Jacques knew? The man withdrew a little, but did not offer to leave the prison. He never took his eyes off Virginie. He seemed to be suffering from some acute and terrible pain as he watched her. Jacques cleared away the breakfast things as well as he could. Purposely, as I suspect, he passed near the man said the stranger. You are Jacques, the gardener, arrested for assisting an aristocrat. I know the jailer. You shall escape, if you will. Only take this message from me to Mademoiselle. You heard. She will not listen to me. I did not want her to come here. I never knew she was here. And she will die tomorrow. They will put her beautiful round throat under the guillotine. Tell her, good old man, Tell her how sweet life is, and how I can save her, and how I will not ask for more than just to see her from time to time. She is so young, and death is annihilation, you know. Why does she hate me so? I want to save her. I have done her no harm. Good old man, tell her how terrible death is, and that she will die tomorrow, unless she listens to me. Jacques saw no harm in repeating this message. Clément listened in silence, watching Virginie with an air of infinite tenderness. "'Will you not try him, my cherished one?' he said. "'Towards you he may mean well. 
which makes me think that virginie had never repeated to clement the conversation which she had overheard that last night at madame babette's you would be in no worse a situation than you were before no worse clement and i should have known what you were and have lost you my clement said she reproachfully ask him said she turning to jacques suddenly if he can save monsieur de crequy as well if he can oh clement we might escape to england we are but young and she hid her face on his shoulder jacques returned to the stranger and asked him virginie's question his eyes were fixed on the cousins he was very pale and the twitchings or contortions which must have been involuntary whenever he was agitated convulsed his whole body he made a long pause i will save mademoiselle and monsieur if she will go straight from prison to the mairie and be my wife your wife jacques could not help exclaiming that she will never be never ask her said morin hoarsely but almost before jacques thought he could have fairly uttered the words clement caught their meaning begone said he not one word more virginie touched the old man as he was moving away tell him he does not know how he makes me welcome death and smiling as if triumphant she turned again to clement the stranger did not speak as jacques gave him the meaning not the words of their replies he was going away but stopped a minute or two afterwards he beckoned to jacques the old gardener seemed to have thought it undesirable to throw away even the chance of assistance from such a man as this for he went forward to speak to him listen i have influence with the jailer he shall let thee pass out with the victims to-morrow no one will notice it or miss thee they will be led to trial even at the last moment i will save her if she sends me word she relents speak to her as the time draws on life is very sweet tell her how sweet speak to him he will do more with her than thou canst let him urge her to live even at the last i will be at the palais de justice at the grave i have followers i have interest come among the crowd that follows the victims i shall see thee it will be no worse for him if she escapes save my master and i will do all said jacques only on my one condition said morin doggedly and jacques was hopeless of that condition ever being fulfilled but he did not see why his own life might not be saved by remaining in prison until the next day he should have rendered every service in his power to his master and the young lady he poor fellow shrank from death and he agreed with morin to escape if he could by the means morin suggested and to bring him word if mademoiselle de crequy relented jacques had no expectation that she would but i fancy he did not think it necessary to tell morin of this conviction of his this bargaining with so base a man for so slight a thing as life was the only flaw that i heard of in the old gardener's behaviour of course the mere reopening of the subject was enough to stir virginie to displeasure clement urged her it is true but the light he had gained upon morin's motions made him rather try to set the case before her in as fair a manner as possible than use any persuasive arguments and even as it was what he said on the subject made virginie shed tears the first that had fallen from her since she entered the prison so they were summoned and went together at the fatal call of the muster roll of victims the next morning he feeble from his wounds and his injured health she calm and serene only petitioning to be allowed to walk next to him in order that she might hold him up when he turned faint and giddy from his extreme suffering together they stood at the bar together they were condemned as the words of judgment were pronounced virginie turned to clement and embraced him with passionate fondness then making him lean on her 
they marched out towards the place de la greve jacques was free now he had told morin how fruitless his efforts at persuasion had been and scarcely caring to note the effect of his information upon the man he had devoted himself to watching monsieur and mademoiselle de crequy and now he followed them to the place de la greve he saw them mount the platform saw them kneel down together till plucked up by the impatient officials could see that she was urging some request to the executioner the end of which seemed to be that clement advanced first to the guillotine was executed and just at this moment there was a stir among the crowd as of a man pressing forward toward the scaffold then she standing with her face to the guillotine slowly made the sign of the cross and knelt down jacques covered his eyes blind with tears the report of a pistol made him look up she was gone another victim in her place and where there had been the little stir in the crowd not five minutes before some men were carrying off a dead body a man had shot himself they said pierre told me who that man was my lady ludlow part nine after a pause i ventured to ask what became of madame de crequy clement's mother she never made an inquiry about him again said my lady she must have known that he was dead though how we never could tell medlicott remembered afterwards that it was about if not on medlicott to this day declares that it was on the very monday june the nineteenth when her son was executed that madame de crequy left off her rouge and took to her bed as one bereaved and hopeless it certainly was about that time and medlicott who was deeply impressed by that dream of madame de crequy's the relation of which i told you had such an effect on my lord in which she had seen the figure of virginie as the only light object amid much surrounding darkness as of night smiling and beckoning clement on on till at length the bright phantom stopped motionless and madame de crequy's eyes began to penetrate the murky darkness and to see closing around her the gloomy dripping walls which she had once seen and never forgotten the walls of the vault of the chapel of the de crequy's in saint germain l'auxerrois and there the two last of the crequy's laid them down among their forefathers and madame de crequy had wakened to the sound of the great door which led to the open air being locked upon her i say medlicott who was predisposed by this dream to look out for the supernatural always declared that madame de crequy was made conscious in some mysterious way of her son's death on the very day and hour when it occurred and that after that she had no more anxiety but was only conscious of a kind of stupefying despair and what became of her my lady asked i repeating my question what could become of her replied lady ludlow she never could be induced to rise again though she lived more than a year after her son's departure she kept her bed her room darkened her face turned towards the wall whenever any one besides medlicott was in the room she hardly ever spoke and would have died of starvation but for medlicott's tender care in putting a morsel to her lips every now and then feeding her in fact just as an old bird feeds her young ones in the height of summer my lord and i left london we would fain have taken her with us into scotland but the doctor we had the old doctor from leicester square forbade her removal and this time he gave such good reasons against it that i acquiesced medlicott and a maid were left with her every care was taken of her she survived till our return indeed i thought she was in much the same state as i had left her in when i came back to london but medlicott spoke of her as much weaker and one morning on awakening they told me she was dead i sent for medlicott who was in sad distress she had become so fond of her charge 
she said that about two o'clock she had been awakened by an unusual restlessness on madame de crequy's part that she had gone to her bedside and found the poor lady feebly but perpetually moving her wasted arm up and down saying to herself in a wailing voice i did not bless him when he left me i did not bless him when he left me medlicott gave her a spoonful or two of jelly and sat by her stroking her hand and soothing her till she seemed to fall asleep but in the morning she was dead it is a sad story your ladyship said i after a while yes it is people seldom arrive at my age without having watched the beginning middle and end of many lives and many fortunes we do not talk about them perhaps for they are often so sacred to us from having touched into the very quick of our own hearts as it were or into those of others who are dead and gone and veiled over from human sight that we cannot tell the tale as if it were a mere story but young people should remember that we have had this solemn experience of life on which to base our opinions and form our judgments so that they are not mere untried theories i am not alluding to mr horner just now for he is nearly as old as i am within ten years i dare say but i am thinking of mr gray with his endless plans for some new thing schools education sabbaths and what not now he has not seen what all this leads to it is a pity he has not heard your ladyship tell the story of monsieur de crequy not at all a pity my dear a young man like him who both by position and age must have had his experience confined to a very narrow circle ought not to set up his opinion against mine he ought not to require reasons from me nor to need such explanation of my arguments if i condescend to argue as going into relation of the circumstances on which my arguments are based in my own mind would be but my lady it might convince him i said with perhaps injudicious perseverance and why should he be convinced she asked with gentle inquiry in her tone he has only to acquiesce though he is appointed by mr croxton i am the lady of the manor as he must know but it is with mr horner that i must have to do about this unfortunate lad gregson i am afraid there will be no method of making him forget his unlucky knowledge his poor brains will be intoxicated with the sense of his powers without any counterbalancing principles to guide him poor fellow i am quite afraid it will end in his being hanged the next day mr horner came to apologize and explain he was evidently as i could tell from his voice as he spoke to my lady in the next room extremely annoyed at her ladyship's discovery of the education he had been giving to this boy my lady spoke with great authority and with reasonable grounds of complaint mr horner was well acquainted with her thoughts on the subject and had acted in defiance of her wishes he acknowledged as much and should on no account have done it in any other instance without her leave which i could never have granted you said my lady but this boy had extraordinary capabilities would in fact have taught himself much that was bad if he had not been rescued and another direction given to his powers and in all mr horner had done he had had her ladyship's service in view the business was getting almost beyond his power so many letters and so much account-keeping was required by the complicated state in which things were lady ludlow felt what was coming a reference to the mortgage for the benefit of my lord's scottish estates which she was perfectly aware mr horner considered as having been a most unwise proceeding and she hastened to observe all this may be very true mr horner and i am sure i should be the last person to wish you to overwork or distress yourself but of that we will talk another time what i am now anxious to remedy is if possible the state of this poor little gregson's mind would not hard work in the fields be a wholesome and excellent way of enabling him to forget i was in hopes my lady that you would have permitted me to bring him up to act as a kind of clerk 
said mr horner jerking out his project abruptly a what asked my lady in infinite surprise a kind of of assistant in the way of copying letters and doing up accounts he is already an excellent penman and very quick at figures mr horner said my lady with dignity the son of a poacher and vagamond ought never to have been able to copy letters relating to the hanbury estates and at any rate he shall not i wonder how it is that knowing the use he has made of his power of reading a letter you should venture to propose such an employment for him as would require his being in your confidence and you the trusted agent of this family why every secret and every ancient and honourable family has its secrets as you know mr horner would be learnt off by heart and repeated to the first comer i should have hoped to have trained him my lady to understand the rules of discretion trained train a bond or fowl to be a pheasant mr horner that would be the easier task but you did right to speak of discretion rather than honour discretion looks to the consequences of actions honour looks to the action itself and is an instinct rather than a virtue after all it is possible you might have trained him to be discreet mr horner was silent my lady was softened by his not replying and began as she always did in such cases to fear lest she had been too harsh i could tell that by her voice and by her next speech as well as if i had seen her face but i am sorry you are feeling the pressure of the affairs i am quite aware that i have entailed much additional trouble upon you by some of my measures i must try and provide you with some suitable assistance copying letters and doing up accounts i think you said mr horner had certainly had a distant idea of turning the little boy in process of time into a clerk but he had rather urged this possibility of future usefulness beyond what he had at first intended in speaking of it to my lady as a palliation of his offence and he certainly was very much inclined to retract his statement that the letter-writing or any other business had increased or that he was in the slightest want of help of any kind when my lady after a pause of consideration suddenly said i have it miss galindo will i am sure be glad to assist you i will speak to her myself the payment we should make to a clerk would be of real service to her i could hardly help echoing mr horner's tone of surprise as he said miss galindo for you must be told who miss galindo was at least told as much as i know miss galindo had lived in the village for many years keeping house on the smallest possible means yet always managing to maintain a servant and this servant was invariably chosen because she had some infirmity that made her undesirable to every one else i believe miss galindo had had lame and blind and humpbacked maids she had even at one time taken in a girl hopelessly gone in consumption because if not she would have had to go to the workhouse and not have had enough to eat of course the poor creature could not perform a single duty usually required of a servant and miss galindo herself was both servant and nurse her present maid was scarcely four feet high and bore a terrible character for ill temper nobody but miss galindo would have kept her but as it was mistress and servant squabbled perpetually and were at heart the best of friends for it was one of miss galindo's peculiarities to do all manner of kind and self-denying actions and to say all manner of provoking things lame blind deformed and dwarf all came in for scolding without number it was only the consumptive girl that never had heard a sharp word i don't think any of her servants liked her the worse for her peppery temper and passionate odd ways for they knew her real and beautiful kindness of heart and besides she had so great a turn for humour that very often her speeches amused as much or more than they irritated and on the other side a piece of witty impudence from her servant would occasionally tickle her so much and so suddenly that she would burst out laughing in the middle of her passion 
but the talk about miss galindo's choice and management of her servants was confined to village gossip and had never reached my lady ludlow's ears though doubtless mr horner was well acquainted with it what my lady knew of her amounted to this it was the custom in those days for the wealthy ladies of the county to set on foot a repository as it was called in the assize town the ostensible manager of this repository was generally a decayed gentlewoman a clergyman's widow or so forth she was however controlled by a committee of ladies and paid by them in proportion to the amount of goods she sold and these goods were the small manufactures of ladies of little or no fortune whose names if they chose it were only signified by initials poor water-colour drawings in indigo and indian ink screens ornamented with moss and dried leaves paintings on velvet and such faintly ornamental works were displayed on one side of the shop it was always reckoned a mark of characteristic gentility in the repository to have only common heavy framed sash windows which admitted very little light so i never was quite certain of the merit of these works of art as they were entitled but on the other side where the useful work placard was put up there was a great variety of articles of whose unusual excellence every one might judge such fine sewing and stitching and buttonholing such bundles of soft delicate knitted stockings and socks and above all in lady ludlow's eyes such hanks of the finest spun flaxen thread and the most delicate dainty work of all was done by miss galindo as lady ludlow very well knew yet for all their fine sewing it sometimes happened that miss galindo's patterns were of an old-fashioned kind and the dozen nightcaps, maybe, on the materials for which she had expended bona fide money, and on the making up no little time and eyesight, would lie for months in a yellow, neglected heap, and at such times, it was said, Miss Galindo was more amusing than usual, more full of dry drollery and humour, just as at the times when an order came in to X, the initial she had chosen, for a stock of well-paying things, she sat and stormed at her servant as she stitched away she herself explained her practice in this way when everything goes wrong one would give up breathing if one could not lighten one's heart by a joke but when i've to sit still from morning till night i must have something to stir my blood or i would go off into an apoplexy so i set to and quarrel with sally such were miss galindo's means and manner of living in her own house out of doors and in the village she was not popular although she would have been sorely missed had she left the place but she asked too many home questions not to say impertinent respecting the domestic economies for even the very poor like to spend their bit of money their own way and would open cupboards to find out hidden extravagances and questioned closely respecting the weekly amount of butter till one day she met with what would have been a rebuff to any other person but which she rather enjoyed than otherwise she was going into a cottage and in the doorway met the good woman chasing out a duck and apparently unconscious of her visitor get out miss galindo she cried addressing the duck get out oh i ask your pardon she continued as if seeing the lady for the first time it's only that weary duck that will come in get out miss gal to the duck and so you call it after me do you inquired her visitor oh yes ma'am my master would have it so for he said sure enough the unlucky bird was always poking herself where she was not wanted ha <laughs> ha very good and so your master is a wit is he well tell him to come up and speak to me to-night about my parlour chimney for there is no one like him for chimney doctoring and the master went up and was so won over by miss galinda's merry ways and sharp insight into the mysteries of his various kinds of businesses he was a mason chimney sweeper and rat catcher that he came home and abused his wife the next time she called the duck the name by which he himself had christened her 
but odd as miss galindo was in general she could be as well bred a lady as any one when she chose and choose she always did when my lady ludlow was by indeed i don't know the man woman or child that did not instinctively turn out its best side to her ladyship so she had no notion of the qualities which i am sure made mr horner think that miss galindo would be most unmanageable as a clerk and heartily wished that the idea had never come into my lady's head but there it was and he had annoyed her ladyship already more than he liked to-day so he could not directly contradict her but only urge difficulties which he hoped might prove insuperable but every one of them lady ludlow knocked down letters to copy doubtless miss galindo could come up to the hall she should have a room to herself she wrote a beautiful hand and writing would save her eyesight capability with regard to accounts my lady would answer for that too and for more than mr horner seemed to think it necessary to inquire about miss galindo was by birth and breeding a lady of the strictest honour and would if possible forget the substance of any letters that passed through her hands at any rate no one would ever hear of them again from her remuneration oh as for that lady ludlow would herself take care that it was managed in the most delicate manner possible she would send to invite miss galindo to tea at the hall that very afternoon if mr horner would only give her ladyship the slightest idea of the average length of time that my lady was to request miss galindo to sacrifice to her daily three hours very well mr horner looked very grave as he passed the windows of the room where i lay i don't think he liked the idea of miss galindo as a clerk lady ludlow's invitations were like royal commands indeed the village was too quiet to allow the inhabitants to have many evening engagements of any kind now and then mr and mrs horner gave a tea and supper to the principal tenants and their wives to which the clergyman was invited and miss galindo mrs medlicott and one or two other spinsters and widows the glory of the supper-table on these occasions was invariably furnished by her ladyship it was a cold roasted peacock with his tail stuck out as if in life mrs medlicott would take up the whole morning arranging the feathers in the proper semicircle and was always pleased with the wonder and admiration it excited it was considered a due reward and fitting compliment to her exertions that mr horner always took her into supper and placed her opposite to the magnificent dish at which she sweetly smiled all the time they were at table but since mrs horner had had the paralytic stroke these parties had been given up and miss galindo wrote a note to lady ludlow in reply to her invitation saying that she was entirely disengaged and would have great pleasure in doing herself the honour of waiting upon her ladyship whoever visited my lady took their meals with her sitting on the dais in the presence of all my former companions so i did not see miss galindo until some time after tea as the young gentlewoman had had to bring her their sewing and spinning to hear the remarks of so competent a judge at length her ladyship brought her visitor into the room where i lay it was one of my bad days i remember in order to have her little bit of private conversation miss galindo was dressed in her best gown i am sure but i have never seen anything like it except in a picture it was so old-fashioned she wore a white muslin apron delicately embroidered and put on a little crookedly in order as she told us even lady ludlow before the evening was over to conceal a spot whence the colour had been discharged by a lemon stain this crookedness had an odd effect especially when i saw that it was intentional indeed she was so anxious about her apron's right adjustment in the wrong place that she told us straight out why she wore it so and asked her ladyship if the spot was properly hidden at the same time lifting up her apron and showing her how large it was when my father was alive i always took his right arm so and used to remove any spotted or discoloured breaths 
to the left side if it was a walking dress that's the convenience of a gentleman but widows and spinsters must do what they can ah my dear to me when you are reckoning up the blessings in your lot though you may think it a hard one in some respects don't forget how little your stockings want darning as you are obliged to lie down so much i would rather knit two pairs of stockings than darn one any day have you been doing any of your beautiful knitting lately asked my lady who had now arranged miss galindo in the pleasantest chair and taking her own little wicker one and having her work in her hands was ready to try and open the subject no and alas your ladyship it is partly the hot weather's fault for people seem to forget that winter must come and partly i suppose that every one is stocked who has the money to pay four and sixpence a pair for stockings then may i ask if you have any time in your active days at liberty said my lady drawing a little nearer to her proposal which i fancy she found it a little awkward to make why the village keeps me busy your ladyship when i have neither knitting or sewing to do you know i took x for my letter at the repository because it stands for xantippe who was a great scold in old times as i have learnt but i'm sure i don't know how the world would get on without scolding your ladyship it would go to sleep and the sun would stand still i don't think i could bear to scold miss galindo said her ladyship smiling no because your ladyship has people to do it for you begging your pardon my lady it seems to me the generality of people may be divided into saints scolds and sinners now your ladyship is a saint because you have a sweet and holy nature in the first place and have people to do your anger and vexation for you in the second and jonathan walker is a sinner because he is sent to prison but here am i half way having but a poor kind of disposition at best and yet hating sin and all that leads to it such as wasting and extravagance and gossiping and yet all this lies right under my nose in the village and i am not saint enough to be vexed at it and so i scold and though i had rather be a saint yet i think i do good in my way no doubt you do dear miss galindo said lady ludlow but i am sorry to hear that there is so much that is bad going on in the village very sorry oh your ladyship then i am sorry i brought it out it was only by way of saying that when i have no particular work to do at home i take a turn abroad and set my neighbours to rights just by way of steering clear of satan for satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do you know my lady there was no leading into the subject by delicate degrees for miss galindo was evidently so fond of talking that if asked a question she made her answer so long that before she came to an end of it she had wandered far away from the original starting point so lady ludlow plunged at once into what she had to say miss galindo i have a great favour to ask of you my lady i wish i could tell you what a pleasure it is to hear you say so replied miss galindo almost with tears in her eyes so glad were we all to do anything for her ladyship which could be called a free service and not merely a duty it is this mr horner tells me that the business letters relating to the estate are multiplying so much that he finds it impossible to copy them all himself and i therefore require the services of some confidential and discreet person to copy these letters and occasionally to go through certain accounts now there is a very pleasant little sitting-room very near to mr horner's office you know mr horner's office on the other side of the stone hall and if i could prevail upon you to come here to breakfast and afterwards sit there for three hours every morning mr horner should bring or send you the papers lady ludlow stopped miss galindo's countenance had fallen there was some great obstacle in her mind to her wish for obliging lady ludlow what would sally do she asked at length lady ludlow had not a notion who sally was 
nor if she had had a notion would she have had a conception of the perplexities that poured into miss galindo's mind at the idea of leaving her rough forgetful dwarf without the perpetual monitorship of her mistress lady ludlow accustomed to a household where everything went on noiselessly perfectly and by clockwork conducted by a number of highly paid well-chosen and accomplished servants had not a conception of the nature of the rough material from which her servants came besides in her establishment so that the result was good no one inquired if the small economies had been observed in the production whereas every penny every halfpenny was of consequence to miss galindo and visions of squandered drops of milk and wasted crusts of bread filled her mind with dismay but she swallowed all her apprehensions down out of her regard for lady ludlow and desire to be of service to her no one knows how great a trial it was to her when she thought of sally unchecked and unscolded for three hours every morning but all she said was sally go to the deuce i beg your pardon my lady if i was talking to myself it's a habit i have got into of keeping my tongue in practice and i am not quite aware when i do it three hours every morning i shall be only too proud to do what i can for your ladyship and i hope mr horner will not be too impatient with me at first you know perhaps that i was nearly being an authoress once and that seems as if i was destined to employ my time in writing no indeed we must return to the subject of the clerkship afterwards if you please an authoress miss galindo you surprise me but indeed i was and all was quite ready dr burney used to teach me music not that i ever could learn but it was a fancy of my poor father's and his daughter wrote a book and they said she was but a very young lady and nothing but a music master's daughter so why should not i try well well i got paper and half a hundred good pens a bottle of ink all ready and then oh it ended in my having nothing to say when i sat down to write but sometimes when i get hold of a book i wonder why i let such a poor reason stop me it does not others but i think it was very well it did miss galindo said her ladyship i am extremely against women usurping men's employments as they are very apt to do but perhaps after all the notion of writing a book improved your hand it is one of the most legible i ever saw i despise zeds without tails said miss galindo with a good deal of gratified pride at my lady's praise presently my lady took her to look at a curious old cabinet which lord ludlow had picked up at the hague and while they were out of the room on this errand i suppose the question of remuneration was settled for i heard no more of it when they came back they were talking of mr gray miss galindo was unsparing in her expressions of opinion about him going much further than my lady in her language at least a little blushing man like him who can't say boo to a goose without hesitating and colouring to come to this village which is as good a village as ever lived and cry us down for a set of sinners as if we had all committed murder and that other thing i have no patience with him my lady and then how is he to help us to heaven by teaching us our a b a b b a b a and yet by all accounts that's to save poor children's souls oh i knew your ladyship would agree with me i'm sure my mother was as good a creature as ever breathed the blessed air and if she's not gone to heaven i don't want to go there and she could not spell a letter decently and does mr gray think god took note of that i was sure you would agree with me miss galindo said my lady you and i can remember how this talk about education rousseau and his writings stirred up the french people to their reign of terror and all those bloody scenes i'm afraid that rousseau and mr gray are birds of a feather replied miss galindo shaking her head and yet there is some good in the young man too 
he sat up all night with billy davis when his wife was fairly worn out with nursing him did he indeed said my lady her face lighting up as it always did when she heard of any kind or generous action no matter who performed it what a pity he is bitten with these new revolutionary ideas and is so much for disturbing the established order of society when miss galindo went she left so favourable an impression of her visit on my lady that she said to me with a pleased smile i think i have provided mr horner with a far better clock than he would have made of that lad gregson in twenty years and i will send the lad to my lord's grieve in scotland that he may be kept out of harm's way but something happened to the lad before this purpose could be accomplished my lady ludlow part ten the next morning miss galindo made her appearance and by some mistake unusual in my lady's well-trained servants was shown into the room where i was trying to walk for a certain amount of exercise was prescribed for me painful although the exertion had become she brought a little basket along with her and while the footman was gone to inquire my lady's wishes for i don't think that lady ludlow expected miss galindo so soon to assume her clerkship nor indeed had mr horner any work of any kind ready for his new assistant to do she launched out into conversation with me it was a sudden summons my dear however as i have often said to myself ever since an occasion long ago if lady ludlow ever honours me by asking for my right hand i'll cut it off and wrap the stump up so tidily she shall never find out it bleeds but if i had had a little more time i could have mended my pens better you see i have had to sit up pretty late to get these sleeves made and she took out of her basket a pair of brown holland over sleeves very much such as a grocer's apprentice wears and i had only time to make seven or eight pens out of some quills farmer thompson gave me last autumn as for ink i'm thankful to say that's always ready an ounce of steel filings an ounce of nut gall and a pint of water tea if you're extravagant which thank heavens i'm not put all in a bottle and hang it up behind the house door so that the hole gets a good shaking every time you slam it and even if you're in a passion and bang it as sally and i often do it's all the better for it and there's my ink ready for use ready to write my lady's will with if need be oh miss galindo said i don't talk so my lady's will and she not dead yet and if she were what would be the use of talking of making her will now if you were sally i should say answer me that you goose but as you're a relation of my lady's i must be civil and only say i can't think how you can talk so like a fool to be sure poor thing you're lame i do not know how long she would have gone on but my lady came in and i released from my duty of entertaining miss galindo made my limping way into the next room to tell the truth i was rather afraid of miss galindo's tongue for i never knew what she would say next after a while my lady came and began to look in the bureau for something and as she looked she said i think mr horner must have made some mistake when he said he had so much work that he almost required a clock for this morning he cannot find anything for miss galindo to do and there she is sitting with her pen behind her ear waiting for something to write i am come to find her my mother's letters for i should like to have a fair copy made of them oh here they are don't trouble yourself my dear child when my lady returned again she sat down and began to talk of mr gray miss galindo says she saw him going to hold a prayer meeting in a cottage now that really makes me unhappy it is so like what mr wesley used to do in my younger days and since then we have had rebellion in the american colonies and the french revolution you may depend upon it my dear making religion and education common vulgarizing them as it were is a bad thing for a nation 
a man who hears prayers read in the cottage where he has just supped on bread and bacon forgets the respect due to a church he begins to think that one place is as good as another and by and by that one person is as good as another and after that i always find that people begin to talk of their rights instead of thinking of their duties i wish mr gray had been more tractable and had left well alone what do you think i heard this morning why that the home hill estate which niches into the hanbury property was bought by a baptist baker from birmingham a baptist baker i exclaimed i had never seen a dissenter to my knowledge but having always heard them spoken of with horror i looked upon them almost as if they were rhinoceroses i wanted to see a live dissenter i believe and yet i wished it were over i was almost surprised when i heard that any of them were engaged in such peaceful occupations as baking yes so mr horner tells me a mr lamb i believe but at any rate he is a baptist and has been in trade what with his schismatism and mr gray's methodism i am afraid all the primitive character of this place will vanish from what i could hear mr gray seemed to be taking his own way at any rate more than he had done when he first came to the village when his natural timidity had made him defer to my lady and seek her consent and sanction before embarking on any new plan but newness was a quality lady ludlow especially disliked even in the fashions of dress and furniture she clung to the old to the modes which had prevailed when she was young and though she had a deep personal regard for queen charlotte to whom as i have already said she had been maid of honour yet there was a tinge of jacobitism about her such as made her extremely dislike to hear prince charles edward called the young pretender as many loyal people did in those days and made her fond of telling of the thorn tree in my lord's park in scotland which had been planted by bonny queen mary herself and before which every guest in the castle of monkshaven was expected to stand bareheaded out of respect to the memory and misfortunes of the royal planter we might play at cards if we so chose on a sunday at least i suppose we might for my lady and mr mountford used to do so often when i first went but we must neither play cards nor read nor sew on the fifth of november and on the thirtieth of january but must go to church and meditate all the rest of the day and very hard work meditating was i would far rather have scoured a room that was the reason i suppose why a passive life was seen to be better discipline for me than an active one but i am wandering away from my lady and her dislike to all innovation now it seemed to me as far as i heard that mr gray was full of nothing but new things and that what he first did was to attack all our established institutions both in the village and the parish and also in the nation to be sure i heard of his ways of going on principally from miss galindo who was apt to speak more strongly than accurately there he goes she said clucking up the children just like an old hen and trying to teach them about their salvation and their souls and i don't know what things that it is just blasphemy to speak about out of church and he potters old people about reading their bibles i am sure i don't want to speak disrespectful about the holy scriptures but i found old job horton busy reading his bible yesterday says i what are you reading and where did you get it and who gave it you so he made answer that he was reading susanna and the elders for that he had read bell and the dragon till he could pretty near say it off by heart and they were two as pretty stories as ever he had read and that it was a caution to him what bad old chaps there were in the world now as job is bedridden i don't think he is likely to meet with the elders and i say that i think repeating his creed the commandments and the lord's prayer and maybe throwing in a verse of the psalms if he wanted a bit of a change would have done him far more good than his pretty stories as he called them and what's the next thing our young parson does why he tries to make us all feel pitiful for the black slaves 
and leaves little pictures of negroes about with the question printed below am i not a man and a brother just as if i was to be a hail fellow well met with every negro footman they do say he takes no sugar in his tea because he thinks he sees spots of blood in it now i call that superstition the next day it was a still worse story well my dear and how are you my lady sent me in to sit a bit with you while mr horner looks out some papers for me to copy between ourselves mr steward horner does not like having me for a clerk it's all very well he does not for if he were decently civil to me i might want a chaperone you know now poor mrs horner is dead this was one of miss galindo's grim jokes as it is i try to make him forget i'm a woman i do everything as shipshape as a masculine man clerk i see he can't find a fault writing good spelling correct sums all right and then he squints up at me with the tail of his eye and looks glummer than ever just because i'm a woman as if i could help that i have gone good lengths to set his mind at ease i have stuck my pen behind my ear i have made him a bow instead of a curtsy i have whistled not a tune i can't pipe up that nay if you won't tell my lady i don't mind telling you that i have said confound it and zounds i can't get any further for all that mr horner won't forget i am a lady and so i am not half the use i might be and if it were not to please my lady ludlow mr horner and his books might go hang see how natural that came out and there is an order for a dozen nightcaps for a bride and i am so afraid i shan't have time to do them worst of all there's mr gray taking advantage of my absence to seduce sally to seduce sally mr gray pooh pooh child there's many a kind of seduction mr gray is seducing sally to want to go to church there has he been twice at my house while i have been away in the mornings talking to sally about the state of her soul and that sort of thing but when i found the meat all roasted to a cinder i said come sally let's have no more praying when beef is down at the fire pray at six o'clock in the morning and nine at night and i won't hinder you so she sourced me and said something about martha and mary implying that because she had let the beef get so overdone that i declare i could hardly find a bit fit for nancy pole's sick grandchild she had chosen the better part i was very much put about i own and perhaps you'll be shocked at what i said indeed i don't know if it was right myself but i told her i had a soul as well as she and if it was to be saved by my sitting still and thinking about salvation and never doing my duty i thought i had as good a right as she had to be mary and save my soul so that afternoon i sat quite still and it was really a comfort for i am often too busy i know to pray as i ought there is first one person wanting me then another and the house and the food and the neighbours to see after so when tea-time comes there enters my maid with her hump on her back and her soul to be saved please ma'am did you order the pound of butter no sally i said shaking my head this morning i did not go round by hale's farm and this afternoon i have been employed in spiritual things now our sally likes tea and bread and butter above everything and dry bread was not to her taste i'm thankful said the impudent hussy that you have taken a turn towards godliness it will be my prayers i trust that's given it you i was determined not to give her an opening towards the carnal subject of butter so she lingered still longing to ask leave to run for it but i gave her none and munched my dry bread myself thinking what a famous cake i could make for little ben pole with the bit of butter we were saving and when sally had had her butterless tea and was in none of the best of tempers because martha had not bethought herself of the butter i just quietly said now sally to-morrow we'll try to hash that beef well and to remember the butter and to work out our salvation all at the same time 
for I don't see why it can't all be done, as God has set us to do it all. But I heard her at it again about Mary and Martha, and I have no doubt that Mr. Gray will teach her to consider me a lost sheep. I had heard so many little speeches about Mr. Gray from one person or another, all speaking against him as a mischief-maker, a setter-up of new doctrines, and of a fanciful standard of life. And you may be sure that, where my Lady Ludlow led, Mrs. Medlicott and Adams were certain to follow, each in their different ways showing the influence my lady had over them. That I believe I had grown to consider him as a very instrument of evil, and to expect to perceive in his face marks of his presumption and arrogance and impertinent interference. It was now many weeks since I had seen him, and when he was one morning shown into the blue drawing-room, into which I had been removed for a change, I was quite surprised to see how innocent and awkward a young man he appeared, confused even more than I was at our unexpected tete-a-tete. -tete. He looked thinner, his eyes more eager, his expression more anxious, and his colour came and went more than it had done when I had seen him last. I tried to make a little conversation, as I was, to my own surprise, more at my ease than he was. But his thoughts were evidently too much preoccupied for him to do more than answer me with monosyllables. Presently my lady came in. Mr. Gray twitched and coloured more than ever, but plunged into the middle of his subject at once. My lady, I cannot answer it to my conscience if I allow the children of this village to go on any longer the little heathens that they are. I must do something to alter their condition. I am quite aware that your ladyship disapproves of many of the plans which have suggested themselves to me, but nevertheless I must do something, and I am come now to your ladyship to ask respectfully, but firmly, what you would advise me to do. His eyes were dilated and I could almost have said they were full of tears with his eagerness. But I am sure it is a bad plan to remind people of decided opinions, which they have once expressed, if you wish them to modify those opinions. Now Mr. Gray had done this with my lady, and though I do not mean to say she was obstinate, yet she was not one to retract. She was silent for a moment or two before she replied, you ask me to suggest a remedy for an evil of the existence of which I am not conscious, was her answer, very coldly, very gently given. In Mr. Mountford's time I heard no such complaints. Whenever I see the village children, and they are not unfrequent visitors at this house on one pretext or another, they are well and decently behaved. Oh, madam, you cannot judge, he broke in, they are trained to respect you in word and deed. You are the highest they ever look up to. They have no notion of a higher. Nay, Mr. Gray, said my lady, smiling, they are as loyally disposed as any children can be. They come up here every fourth of June and drink His Majesty's health, and have buns, and, as Margaret Dawson can testify, they take a great and respectful interest in all the pictures I can show them of the royal family. But, madam, I think of something higher than any earthly dignities. My lady coloured at the mistake she had made, for she herself was truly pious. Yet when she resumed the subject, it seemed to me as if her tone was a little sharper than before. Such want of reverence is, I should say, the clergyman's fault. You must excuse me, Mr. Gray, if I speak plainly. My lady, I want plain speaking. I myself am not accustomed to those ceremonies and forms which are, I suppose, the etiquette in your ladyship's rank of life, and which seem to hedge you in from any power of mine to touch you. Among those with whom I have passed my life hitherto, it has been the custom to speak plainly out what we have felt earnestly. So, instead of needing any apology from your ladyship for straightforward speaking, I will meet what you say at once and admit that it is the clergyman's fault, in a great measure, when the children of his parish swear and curse and are brutal and ignorant of all saving grace. Nay, some of them of the very name of God. 
and because this guilt of mine as the clergyman of this parish lies heavily on my soul and every day leads but from bad to worse till i am utterly bewildered how to do good to children who escape from me as if i were a monster and who are growing up to be men fit for and capable of any crime but those requiring wit or sense i come to you who seem to me all-powerful as far as material power goes for your ladyship only knows the surface of things and barely that that pass in your village to help me with advice and such outward help as you can give mr gray had stood up and sat down once or twice while he had been speaking in an agitated nervous kind of way and now he was interrupted by a violent fit of coughing after which he trembled all over my lady rang for a glass of water and looked much distressed mr gray said she i am sure you are not well and that makes you exaggerate childish faults into positive evils it is always the case with us when we are not strong in health i hear of your exerting yourself in every direction you overwork yourself and the consequence is that you imagine us all worse people than we are and my lady smiled very kindly and pleasantly at him as he sat a little panting a little flushed trying to recover his breath i am sure that now they were brought face to face she had quite forgotten all the offence she had taken at his doings when she heard of them from others and indeed it was enough to soften any one's heart to see that young almost boyish face looking in such anxiety and distress oh my lady what shall i do he asked as soon as he could recover breath and with such an air of humility that i am sure no one who had seen it could have ever thought him conceited again the evil of this world is too strong for me i can do so little it is all in vain it was only to-day <coughs> and again the cough and agitation returned my dear mr gray said my lady the day before i could never have believed she could have called him my dear you must take the advice of an old woman about yourself you are not fit to do anything just now but attend to your own health rest and see a doctor but indeed i will take care of that and when you are pretty strong again you will find that you have been magnifying evils to yourself but my lady i cannot rest the evils do exist and the burden of their continuance lies on my shoulders i have no place to gather the children together in that i may teach them the things necessary to salvation the rooms in my own house are too small but i have tried them i have money of my own and as your ladyship knows i tried to get a piece of leasehold property on which to build a schoolhouse at my own expense your ladyship's lawyer comes forward at your instructions to enforce some old feudal right by which no building is allowed on leasehold property without the sanction of the lady of the manor it may be all very true but it was a cruel thing to do that is if your ladyship had known which i am sure you do not the real moral and spiritual state of my poor parishioners and now i come to you to know what i am to do rest i cannot rest while children whom i could possibly save are being left in their ignorance their blasphemy their uncleanness their cruelty it is known through the village that your ladyship disapproves of my efforts and opposes all my plans if you think them wrong foolish ill-digested i have been a student living in a college and eschewing all society but that of pious men until now i may not judge for the best in my ignorance of this sinful human nature tell me of better plans and wiser projects for accomplishing my end but do not bid me rest with satan compassing me around and stealing souls away mr gray said my lady there may be some truth in what you have said i do not deny it though i think in your present state of indisposition and excitement you exaggerate it much i believe nay the experience of a pretty long life has convinced me that education is a bad thing if given indiscriminately it unfits the lower orders for their duties 
the duties to which they are called by god of submission to those placed in authority over them of contentment with that state of life to which it has pleased god to call them and of ordering themselves lowly and reverently to all their betters i have made this conviction of mine tolerably evident to you and have expressed distinctly my disapprobation of some of your ideas you may imagine then that i was not well pleased when i found that you had taken a rood or more of farmer hale's land and were laying the foundations of a schoolhouse you had done this without asking for my permission which as farmer hale's liege lady ought to have been obtained legally as well as asked for out of courtesy i put a stop to what i believed to be calculated to do harm to a village to a population in which to say the least of it i may be supposed to take as much interest as you can do how can reading and writing and the multiplication table if you choose to go so far prevent blasphemy and uncleanness and cruelty really mr gray i hardly like to express myself so strongly on the subject in your present state of health as i should do at any other time it seems to me that books do little character much and character is not formed from books i do not think of character i think of souls i must get some hold upon these children or what will become of them in the next world i must be found to have some power beyond what they have and which they are rendered capable of appreciating before they will listen to me at present physical force is all they look up to and i have none nay mr gray by your own admission they look up to me they would not do anything your ladyship disliked if it was likely to come to your knowledge but if they could conceal it from you the knowledge of your dislike to a particular line of conduct would never make them cease from pursuing it mr gray surprise in her air and some little indignation they and their fathers have lived on hanbury lands for generations i cannot help it madam i am telling you the truth whether you believe me or not there was a pause my lady looking perplexed and somewhat ruffled mr gray as though hopeless and wearied out then my lady said he at last rising as he spoke you can suggest nothing to ameliorate the state of things which i do assure you does exist on your lands and among your tenants surely you will not object to my using farmer hale's great barn every sabbath he will allow me the use of it if your ladyship will grant your permission you are not fit for any extra work at present and indeed he had been coughing very much all through the conversation give me time to consider of it tell me what you wish to teach you will be able to take care of your health and grow stronger while i consider it shall not be the worse for you if you leave it in my hands for a time my lady spoke very kindly but he was in too excited a state to recognize the kindness while the idea of delay was evidently a sore irritation i heard him say and i have so little time in which to do my work lord lay not this sin to my charge but my lady was speaking to the old butler for whom at her sign i had rung the bell some little time before now she turned round mr gray i find i have some bottles of malmsey of the vintage of seventeen hundred and seventy eight yet left malmsey as perhaps you know used to be considered a specific for coughs arising from weakness you must permit me to send you half a dozen bottles and depend upon it you will take a more cheerful view of life and its duties before you have finished them especially if you will be so kind as to see dr trevor who is coming to see me in the course of the week by the time you are strong enough to work i will try and find some means of preventing the children from using such bad language and otherwise annoying you my lady it is the sin and not the annoyance i wish i could make you understand he spoke with some impatience poor fellow he was too weak exhausted and nervous i am perfectly well i can set to work to-morrow 
i will do anything not to be oppressed with the thought of how little i am doing i do not want your wine liberty to act in the manner i think right will do me far more good but it is of no use it is preordained that i am to be nothing but a cumberer of the ground i beg your ladyship's pardon for this call he stood up and then turned dizzy my lady looked on deeply hurt and not a little offended he held out his hand to her and i could see that she had a little hesitation before she took it he then saw me i almost think for the first time and put out his hand once more drew it back as if undecided put it out again and finally took hold of mine for an instant in his damp listless hand and was gone lady ludlow was dissatisfied with both him and herself i was sure indeed i was dissatisfied with the result of the interview myself but my lady was not one to speak out her feelings on the subject nor was i one to forget myself and begin on a topic which she did not begin she came to me and was very tender with me so tender that that and the thought of mr gray's sick hopeless disappointed look nearly made me cry you are tired little one said my lady go and lie down in my room and hear what medlicott and i can decide upon in the way of strengthening dainties for that poor young man who is killing himself with his over-sensitive conscientiousness oh my lady said i and then i stopped well what asked she if you would but let him have farmer hale's barn at once it would do him more good than all pooh pooh child though i don't think she was displeased he is not fit for more work just now i shall go and write for dr trevor and for the next half hour we did nothing but arrange physical comforts and cures for poor mr gray at the end of the time mrs medlicott said has your ladyship heard that harry gregson has fallen from a tree and broken his thigh bone and is like to be a cripple for life harry gregson that black-eyed lad who read my letter it all comes from over-education my lady ludlow part eleven but i don't see how my lady could think it was over-education that made harry gregson break his thigh for the manner in which he met with the accident was this mr horner who had fallen sadly out of health since his wife's death had attached himself greatly to harry gregson now mr horner had a cold manner to every one and never spoke more than was necessary at the best of times and latterly it had not been the best of times with him i dare say he had had some causes for anxiety of which i knew nothing about my lady's affairs and he was evidently annoyed by my lady's whim as he once inadvertently called it of placing miss galindo under him in the position of a clerk yet he had always been friends in his quiet way with miss galindo and she devoted herself to her new occupation with diligence and punctuality although more than once she had moaned to me over the orders for needlework which had been sent to her and which owing to her occupation in the service of lady ludlow she had been unable to fulfil the only living creature to whom the staid mr horner could be said to be attached was harry gregson to my lady he was a faithful and devoted servant looking keenly after her interests and anxious to forward them at any cost of trouble to himself but the more shrewd mr horner was the more probability was there of his being annoyed at certain peculiarities of opinion which my lady held with a quiet gentle pertinacity against which no arguments based on mere worldly and business calculations made any way this frequent opposition to views which mr horner entertained although it did not interfere with the sincere respect which the lady and the steward felt for each other yet prevented any warmer feeling of affection from coming in it seems strange to say it but i must repeat it the only person for whom since his wife's death mr horner seemed to feel any love was the little imp harry gregson 
with his bright watchful eyes his tangled hair hanging right down into his eyebrows for all the world like a sky terrier this lad half gypsy and whole poacher as many people esteemed him hung about the silent respectable staid mr horner and followed his steps with something of the affectionate fidelity of the dog which he resembled i suspect this demonstration of attachment to his person on harry gregson's part was what won mr horner's regard in the first instance the steward had only chosen the lad out as the cleverest instrument he could find for his purpose and i don't mean to say that if harry had not been almost as shrewd as mr horner himself was both by original disposition and subsequent experience the steward would have taken to him as he did let the lad have shown ever so much affection for him but even to harry mr horner was silent still it was pleasant to find himself in many ways so readily understood to perceive that the crumbs of knowledge he let fall were picked up by his little follower and hoarded like gold that there was one to hate the persons and things whom mr horner coldly disliked and to reverence and admire all those for whom he had any regard mr horner had never had a child and unconsciously i suppose something of the paternal feeling had begun to develop itself in him towards harry gregson i heard one or two things from different people which have always made me fancy that mr horner secretly and almost unconsciously hoped that harry gregson might be trained so as to be first his clerk and next his assistant and finally his successor in his stewardship to the hanbury estates harry's disgrace with my lady in consequence of his reading the letter was a deeper blow to mr horner than his quiet manner would ever have led any one to suppose or than lady ludlow ever dreamed of inflicting i am sure probably harry had a short stern rebuke from mr horner at the time for his manner was always hard even to those he cared for the most but harry's love was not to be daunted or quelled by a few sharp words i dare say from what i heard of them afterwards that harry accompanied mr horner in his walk over the farm the very day of the rebuke his presence apparently unnoticed by the agent by whom his absence would have been painfully felt nevertheless that was the way of it as i have been told mr horner never bade harry go with him never thanked him for going or being at his heels ready to run on any errands straight as the crow flies to his point and back to his heel in as short a time as possible yet if harry were away mr horner never inquired the reason from any of the men who might be supposed to know whether he was detained by his father or otherwise engaged he never asked harry himself where he had been but miss galindo said that those labourers who knew mr horner well told her that he was always more quick-eyed to shortcomings more savage-like in fault-finding on those days when the lad was absent miss galindo indeed was my great authority for most of the village news which i heard she it was who gave me the particulars of poor harry's accident you see my dear she said the little poacher has taken some unaccountable fancy to my master this was the name by which miss galindo always spoke of mr horner to me ever since she had been as she called it appointed his clerk now if i had twenty hearts to lose i never could spare a bit of one of them for that good grey square severe man but different people have different tastes and here is that little imp of a gypsy tinker ready to turn slave for my master and odd enough my master who i should have said beforehand would have made short work of imp and imp's family and have sent hall the bang beggar after them in no time my master as they tell me is in his way quite fond of the lad and if he could without vexing my lady too much he would have made him what the folks here call a latiner however last night it seems that there was a letter of some importance forgotten i can't tell you what it was about my dear though i know perfectly well but service oblige as well as noblesse and you must take my word for it 
that it was important and one that i am surprised my master could forget till too late for the post the poor good orderly man is not what he was before his wife's death well it seems that he was sore annoyed by his forgetfulness and well he might be and it was all the more vexatious as he had no one to blame but himself as for that matter i always scold somebody else when i'm in fault but i suppose my master would never think of doing that else it's a mighty relief however he could eat no tea and was altogether put out and gloomy and the little faithful imp lad perceiving all this i suppose got up like a page in an old ballad and said he would run for his life across country to cumberford and see if he could not get there before the bags were made up so my master gave him the letter and nothing more was heard of the poor fellow till this morning for the father thought his son was sleeping in mr horner's barn as he does occasionally it seems and my master as was very natural that he had gone to his father's and he had fallen down the old stone quarry had he not yes sure enough mr gray had been up there fretting my lady with some of his new-fangled schemes and because the young man could not have it all his own way from what i understand he was put out and thought he would go home by the back lane instead of through the village where the folks would notice if the parson looked glum but however it was a mercy and i don't mind saying so ay and meaning it too though it may be like methodism for as mr gray walked by the quarry he heard a groan and at first he thought it was a lamb fallen down and he stood still and then he heard it again and then i suppose he looked down and saw harry so he let himself down by the boughs of the trees to the ledge where harry lay half dead and with his poor thigh broken there he had lain ever since the night before he had been returning to tell the master that he had safely posted the letter and the first words he said when they recovered him from the exhausted state he was in were miss galindo tried hard not to whimper as she said it it was in time sir i seed it put in the bag with my own eyes but where is he asked i how did mr gray get him out ay there it is you see why the old gentleman i daren't say devil in lady ludlow's house is not so black as he is painted and mr gray must have a deal of good in him as i say at times and then at others when he has gone against me i can't bear him and think hanging too good for him but he lifted the poor lad as if he had been a baby i suppose and carried him up the great ledges that were formerly used for steps and laid him soft and easy on the wayside grass and ran home and got help and a door and had him carried to his house and laid on his bed and then somehow for the first time either he or any one else perceived it he himself was all over blood his own blood he had broken a blood vessel and there he lies in the little dressing-room as white and as still as if he were dead and the little imp in mr gray's own bed sound asleep now his leg is set just as if linen sheets and a feather bed were his native element as one may say really now he is doing so well i've no patience with him lying there where mr gray ought to be it is just what my lady always prophesied would come to pass if there was any confusion of ranks poor mr gray said i thinking of his flushed face and his feverish restless ways when he had been calling on my lady not an hour before his exertions on harry's behalf and i told miss galindo how ill i had thought him yes said she and that was the reason my lady had sent for dr trevor well it has fallen out admirably for he looked well after that old donkey of a prince and saw that he made no blunders now that old donkey of a prince meant the village surgeon mr prince between whom and miss galindo there was war to the knife as they often met in the cottages where there was illness and she had her queer odd recipes which he with his grand pharmacopoeia held in infinite contempt and the consequence of their squabbling had been not long before this very time that he had established a kind of rule 
that into whatever sick room miss galindo was admitted there he refused to visit but miss galindo's prescriptions and visits cost nothing and were often backed by kitchen physic so though it was true that she never came but she scolded about something or other she was generally preferred as a medical attendant to mr prince yes the old donkey is obliged to tolerate me and to be civil to me for you see i got there first and had possession as it were and yet my lord the donkey likes the credit of attending the parson and being in consultation with so grand a country town doctor as dr trevor and dr trevor is an old friend of mine she sighed a little some time i may tell you why and treats me with infinite bowing and respect so the donkey not to be out of medical fashion bows too though it is sadly against the grain and he pulled a face as if he had heard a slate pencil gritting against a slate when i told dr trevor i meant to sit up with the two lads for i call mr gray no more than a lad and a pretty conceited one too at times but why should you sit up miss galindo it will tire you sadly not it you see there is gregson's mother to keep quiet for she sits by her lad fretting and sobbing so that i'm afraid of her disturbing mr gray and there's mr gray to keep quiet for dr trevor says his life depends on it and there is medicine to be given to the one and bandages to be attended to for the other and the wild horde of gypsy brothers and sisters to be turned out and the father to be held in from showing too much gratitude to mr gray who can't bear it and who is to do it all but me the only servant is old lame betty who once lived with me and would leave me because she said i was always bothering there was a good deal of truth in what she said i grant but she need not have said it a good deal of truth is best left alone at the bottom of the well and what can she do deaf as ever she can be too so miss galinda went her ways but not the less was she at her post in the morning a little crosser and more silent than usual but the first was not to be wondered at and the last was rather a blessing lady ludlow had been extremely anxious both about mr gray and harry gregson kind and thoughtful in any case of illness and accident she always was but somehow in this the feeling that she was not quite what shall i call it friends seems hardly the right word to use as to the possible feeling between the countess ludlow and the little vagabond messenger who had only once been in her presence that she had hardly parted from either as she could have wished to do had death been near made her more than usually anxious dr trevor was not to spare obtaining the best medical advice the county could afford whatever he ordered in the way of diet was to be prepared under mrs medlicott's own eye and sent down from the hall to the parsonage as mr horner had given somewhat similar directions in the case of harry gregson at least there was rather a multiplicity of counsellors and dainties than any lack of them and the second night mr horner insisted on taking the superintendence of the nursing himself and sat and snored by harry's bedside while the poor exhausted mother lay by her child thinking that she watched him but in reality fast asleep as miss galindo told us for distrusting any one's powers of watching and nursing but her own she had stolen across the quiet village street in cloak and dressing-gown and found mr gray in vain trying to reach the cup of barley-water which mr horner had placed just beyond his reach in consequence of mr gray's illness we had to have a strange curate to do duty a man who dropped his h's and hurried through the service and yet had time enough to stand in my lady's way bowing to her as she came out of church and so subservient in manner that i believe that sooner than remain unnoticed by a countess he would have preferred being scolded or even cuffed now i found out that great as was my lady's liking and approval of respect nay even reverence being paid to her as a person of quality a sort of tribute to her order which she had no individual right to remit or indeed not to exact yet she being personally simple 
sincere and holding herself in low esteem could not endure anything like the servility of mr cross the temporary curate she grew absolutely to loathe his perpetual smiling and bowing his instant agreement with the slightest opinion she uttered his veering round as she blew the wind i have often said that my lady did not talk much as she might have done had she lived among her equals but we all loved her so much that we had learned to interpret all her little ways pretty truly and i knew what particular turns of her head and contractions of her delicate fingers meant as well as if she had expressed herself in words i began to suspect that my lady would be very thankful to have mr gray about again and doing his duty even with a conscientiousness that might amount to worrying himself and fidgeting others and although mr gray might hold her opinion in as little esteem as those of any simple gentlewoman she was too sensible not to feel how much flavour there was in his conversation compared to that of mr cross who was only her tasteless echo as for miss galindo she was utterly and entirely a partisan of mr gray's almost ever since she had begun to nurse him during his illness you know i never set up for reasonableness my lady so i don't pretend to say as i might do if i were a sensible woman and all that that i am convinced by mr gray's arguments of this thing or t'other for one thing you see poor fellow he has never been able to argue or hardly indeed to speak for dr trevor has been very peremptory so there's been no scope for arguing but what i mean is this when i see a sick man thinking always of others and never of himself patient humble a trifle too much at times for i've caught him praying to be forgiven for having neglected his work as a parish priest miss galindo was making horrible faces to keep back tears squeezing up her eyes in a way which would have amused me at any other time but when she was speaking of mr gray when i see a downright good religious man i'm apt to think he's got hold of the right clue and that i can do no better than hold on to the tails of his coat and shut my eyes if we've got to go over doubtful places on our road to heaven so my lady you must excuse me if when he gets about again he is all agog about the sunday school for if he is i shall be agog too and perhaps twice as bad as him for you see i've a strong constitution compared to his and strong ways of speaking and acting and i tell your ladyship this now because i think from your rank and still more if i may say so for all your kindness to me long ago down to this very day you've a right to be told first of anything about me change of opinion i can't exactly call it for i don't see the good of schools and teaching a b c any more than i did before only mr gray does so i'm to shut my eyes and leap over the ditch to the side of education i've told sally already that if she does not mind her work but stands gossiping with nelly mother i'll teach her her lessons and i've never caught her with nelly since i think miss galindo's desertion to mr gray's opinion in this matter hurt my lady just a little bit but she only said of course if the parishioners wish for it mr gray must have his sunday school i shall in that case withdraw my opposition i am sorry i cannot change my opinions as easily as you my lady made herself smile as she said this miss galindo saw it was an effort to do so she thought a minute before she spoke again your ladyship has not seen mr gray as intimately as i have done that's one thing but as for the parishioners they will follow your ladyship's lead in everything so there is no chance of their wishing for a sunday school i have never done anything to make them follow my lead as you call it miss galindo said my lady gravely yes you have replied miss galindo bluntly and then correcting herself she said begging your ladyship's pardon you have your ancestors have lived here time out of mind and have owned the land on which their forefathers have lived ever since they were forefathers you yourself were born amongst them 
and have been like a little queen to them ever since i might say and they've never known your ladyship do anything but what was kind and gentle but i'll leave fine speeches about your ladyship to mr cross only you my lady lead the thoughts of the parish and save some of them a world of trouble for they could never tell what was right if they had to think for themselves it's all quite right that they should be guided by you my lady if only you would agree with mr gray well said my lady i told him only the last day that he was here that i would think about it i do believe i could make up my mind on certain subjects better if i were left alone than while being constantly talked to about them my lady said this in her usual soft tone but the words had a tinge of impatience about them indeed she was more ruffled than i had often seen her but checking herself in an instant she said you don't know how mr horner drags in this subject of education apropos of everything not that he says much about it at any time it is not his way but he cannot let the thing alone i know why my lady said miss galindo that poor lad harry gregson will never be able to earn his livelihood in any active way but will be lame for life now mr horner thinks more of harry than of any one else in the world except perhaps your ladyship was it not a pretty companionship for my lady and he has schemes of his own for teaching harry and if mr gray could but have his school mr horner and he think harry might be schoolmaster as your ladyship would not like to have him coming to you as steward's clerk i wish your ladyship would fall into this plan mr gray has it so at heart miss galindo looked wistfully at my lady as she said this but my lady only said dryly and rising at the same time as if to end the conversation so mr horner and mr gray seem to have gone a long way in advance of my consent to their plans there exclaimed miss galindo as my lady left the room with an apology for going away i have gone and done mischief with my long stupid tongue to be sure people plan a long way ahead of to-day more especially when one is a sick man lying all through the weary day on a sofa my lady will soon get over her annoyance said i as it were apologetically i only stopped miss galindo's self-reproaches to draw down her wrath upon myself and has not she a right to be annoyed with me if she likes and to keep annoyed as long as she likes am i complaining of her that you need tell me that let me tell you i have known my lady these thirty years and if she were to take me by the shoulders and turn me out of the house i should only love her the more so don't you think to come between us with any little mincing peace-making speeches i have been a mischief-making parrot and i like her the better for being vexed with me so good-bye to you miss and wait till you know my lady ludlow as well as i do before you next think of telling me she will soon get over her annoyance and off miss galindo went i could not exactly tell what i had done wrong but i took care never again to come in between my lady and her by any remark about the one to the other for i saw that some most powerful bond of grateful affection made miss galindo almost worship my lady meanwhile harry gregson was limping a little about in the village still finding his home in mr gray's house for there he could most conveniently be kept under the doctor's eye and receive the requisite care and enjoy the requisite nourishment as soon as he was a little better he was to go to mr horner's house but as the steward lived some distance out of the way and was much from home he had agreed to leave harry at the house to which he had first been taken until he was quite strong again and the more willingly i suspect from what i heard afterwards because mr gray gave up all the little strength of speaking which he had to teaching harry in the very manner which mr horner most desired as for gregson the father he wild man of the woods poacher tinker jack of all trades 
was getting tamed by this kindness to his child hitherto his hand had been against every man as every man's had been against him that affair before the justice which i told you about when mr gray and even my lady had interested themselves to get him released from unjust imprisonment was the first bit of justice he had ever met with it attracted him to the people and attached him to the spot on which he had but squatted for a time i am not sure if any of the villagers were grateful to him for remaining in their neighbourhood instead of decamping as he had often done before for good reasons doubtless of personal safety harry was only one out of a brood of ten or twelve children some of whom had earned for themselves no good character in service one indeed had been actually transported for a robbery committed in a distant part of the county and the tale was yet told in the village of how gregson the father came back from the trial in a state of wild rage striding through the place and uttering oaths of vengeance to himself his great black eyes gleaming out of his matted hair and his arms working by his side and now and then tossed up in his impotent despair as i heard the account his wife followed him child-laden and weeping after this they had vanished from the country for a time leaving their mud hovel locked up and the door key as the neighbours said buried in a hedge bank the gregsons had reappeared much about the same time that mr gray came to hanbury he had either never heard of their evil character or considered that it gave them all the more claim upon his christian care and the end of it was that this rough untamed strong giant of a heathen was loyal slave to the weak hectic nervous self-distrustful parson gregson had also a kind of grumbling respect for mr horner he did not quite like the steward's monopoly of his harry the mother submitted to that with a better grace swallowing down her maternal jealousy in the prospect of her child's advancement to a better and more respectable position than that in which his parents had struggled through life but mr horner the steward and gregson the poacher and squatter had come into disagreeable contact too often in former days for them to be perfectly cordial at any future time even now when there was no immediate cause for anything but gratitude for his child's sake on gregson's part he would skulk out of mr horner's way if he saw him coming and it took all mr horner's natural reserve and acquired self-restraint to keep him from occasionally holding up his father's life as a warning to harry now gregson had nothing of this desire for avoidance with regard to mr gray the poacher had a feeling of physical protection toward the parson while the latter had shown the moral courage without which gregson would never have respected him in coming right down upon him more than once in the exercise of unlawful pursuits and simply and boldly telling him he was doing wrong with such a quiet reliance upon gregson's better feeling at the same time that the strong poacher could not have lifted a finger against mr gray though it had been to save himself from being apprehended and taken to the lock-ups the very next hour he had rather listened to the parson's bold words with an approving smile much as mr gulliver might have hearkened to a lecture from a lilliputian but when brave words passed into kind deeds gregson's heart mutely acknowledged its master and keeper and the beauty of it all was that mr gray knew nothing of the good work he had done or recognized himself as the instrument which god had employed he thanked god it is true fervently and often that the work was done and loved the wild man for his rough gratitude but it never occurred to the poor young clergyman lying on his sick-bed and praying as miss galindo had told us he did to be forgiven for his unprofitable life to think of gregson's reclaimed soul as anything with which he had had to do it was now more than three months since mr gray had been at hanbury court during all that time he had been confined to his house if not to his sick-bed and he and my lady had never met since their last discussion and difference about farmer hale's barn this was not my dear lady's fault 
no one could have been more attentive in every way to the slightest possible want of either of the invalids especially of mr gray and she would have gone to see him at his own house as she sent him word but that her foot had slipped upon the polished oak staircase and her ankle had been sprained so we had never seen mr gray since his illness when one november day he was announced as wishing to speak to my lady she was sitting in her room the room in which i lay now pretty constantly and i remember she looked startled when word was brought to her of mr gray's being at the hall she could not go to him she was too lame for that so she bade him be shown in to where she sat such a day for him to go out she exclaimed looking at the fog which had crept up to the windows and was sapping the little remaining life in the brilliant virginian creeper leaves that draped the house on the terrace side he came in white trembling his large eyes wild and dilated he hastened up to lady ludlow's chair and to my surprise took one of her hands and kissed it without speaking yet shaking all over mr gray said she quickly with sharp tremulous apprehension of some unknown evil what is it there is something unusual about you something unusual has occurred replied he forcing his words to be calm as with a great effort a gentleman came to my house not half an hour ago a mr howard he came straight from vienna my son said my dear lady stretching out her arms in dumb questioning attitude the lord gave and the lord taketh away blessed be the name of the lord but my poor lady could not echo the words he was the last remaining child and once she had been the joyful mother of nine my lady ludlow part twelve i am ashamed to say what feeling became strongest in my mind about this time next to the sympathy we all of us felt for my dear lady in her deep sorrow i mean for that was greater and stronger than anything else however contradictory you may think it when you hear all it might arise from my being so far from well at the time which produced a diseased mind in a diseased body but i was absolutely jealous for my father's memory when i saw how many signs of grief there were for my lord's death he having done next to nothing for the village and parish which now changed as it were its daily course of life because his lordship died in a far-off city my father had spent the best part of his manhood in labouring hard body and soul for the people amongst whom he lived his family of course claimed the first place in his heart he would have been good for little even in the way of benevolence if they had not but close after them he cared for his parishioners and neighbours and yet when he died though the church bells tolled and smote upon our hearts with hard fresh pain at every beat the sounds of everyday life still went on close pressing around us carts and carriages street cries distant barrel organs the kindly neighbours kept them out of our street life active noisy life pressed on our acute consciousness of death and jarred upon it as on a quick nerve and when we went to church my father's own church though the pulpit cushions were black and many of the congregation had put on some humble sign of mourning yet it did not alter the whole material aspect of the place and yet what was lord ludlow's relation to hanbury compared to my father's work and place in dash oh it was very wicked in me i think if i had seen my lady if i had dared to ask to go to her i should not have felt so miserable so discontented but she sat in her own room hung with black all even over the shutters she saw no light but that which was artificial candles lamps and the like for more than a month only adams went near her mr gray was not admitted though he called daily 
even mrs medlicott did not see her for nearly a fortnight the sight of my lady's griefs or rather the recollection of it made mrs medlicott talk far more than was her wont she told us with many tears and much gesticulation even speaking german at times when her english would not flow that my lady sat there a white figure in the middle of the darkened room a shaded lamp near her the light of which fell upon an open bible the great family bible it was not open at any chapter or consoling verse but at the page whereon were registered the births of her nine children five had died in infancy sacrificed to the cruel system which forbade the mother to suckle her babies four had lived longer urian had been the first to die utred mortimer earl ludlow the last my lady did not cry mrs medlicott said she was quite composed very still very silent she put aside everything that savoured of mere business sent people to mr horner for that but she was proudly alive to every possible form which might do honour to the last of her race in those days expresses were slow things and forms still slower before my lady's directions could reach vienna my lord was buried there was some talk so mrs medlicott said about taking the body up and bringing him to hanbury but his executors connections on the ludlow side demurred to this if he were removed to england he must be carried on to scotland and interred with his monkshaven forefathers my lady deeply hurt withdrew from the discussion before it degenerated into an unseemly contest but all the more for this understood mortification of my lady's did the whole village and estate of hanbury assume every outward sign of mourning the church bells tolled morning and evening the church itself was draped in black inside hatchments were placed everywhere where hatchments could be put all the tenantry spoke in hushed voices for more than a week scarcely daring to observe that all flesh even that of an earl ludlow and the last of the hanburys was but grass after all the very fighting lion closed its front door front shutters it had none and those who needed drink stole in at the back and were silent and maudlin over their cups instead of riotous and noisy miss galindo's eyes were swollen up with crying and she told me with a fresh burst of tears that even humpbacked sally had been found sobbing over her bible and using a pocket handkerchief for the first time in her life her aprons having hitherto stood her in the necessary stead but not being sufficiently in accordance with etiquette to be used when mourning over an earl's premature decease if it was this way out of the hall you might work it by the rule of three as miss galindo used to say and judge what it was in the hall we none of us spoke but in a whisper we tried not to eat and indeed the shock had been so really great and we did really care so much for my lady that for some days we had but little appetite but after that i fear our sympathy grew weaker while our flesh grew stronger but we still spoke low and our hearts ached whenever we thought of my lady sitting there alone in the darkened room with the light ever falling on that one solemn page we wished oh how i wished that she would see mr gray but adam said she thought my lady ought to have a bishop come to see her still no one had authority enough to send for one mr horner all this time was suffering as much as any one he was too faithful a servant of the great hanbury family though now the family had dwindled down to a fragile old lady not to mourn acutely over its probable extinction he had besides a deeper sympathy and reverence with and for my lady in all things than probably he ever cared to show for his manners were always measured and cold he suffered from sorrow he also suffered from wrong 
my lord's executors kept writing to him continually my lady refused to listen to mere business saying she entrusted all to him but the all was more complicated than i ever thoroughly understood as far as i comprehended the case it was something of this kind there had been a mortgage raised on my lady's property of hanbury to enable my lord her husband to spend money in cultivating his scotch estates after some new fashion that required capital as long as my lord her son lived who was to succeed to both the estates after her death this did not signify so she had said and felt and she had refused to take any steps to secure the repayment of capital or even the payment of the interest of the mortgage from the possible representatives and possessors of the scotch estates to the possible owner of the hanbury property saying it ill became her to calculate on the contingency of her son's death but he had died childless unmarried the heir of the monkshaven property was an edinburgh advocate a far-away kinsman of my lord's the hanbury property at my lady's death would go to the descendants of a third son of the squire hanbury in the days of queen anne this complication of affairs was most grievous to mr horner he had always been opposed to the mortgage he hated the payment of the interest as obliging my lady to practise certain economies which though she took care to make them as personal as possible he disliked as derogatory to the family poor mr horner he was so cold and hard in his manner so curt and decisive in his speech that i don't think we any of us did him justice miss galindo was almost the first at this time to speak a kind word to him or to take thought of him at all any further than to get out of his way when we saw him approaching i don't think mr horner is well she said one day about three weeks after we had heard of my lord's death he sits resting his head on his hand and hardly hears me when i speak to him but i thought no more of it as miss galindo did not name it again my lady came amongst us once more from elderly she had become old a little frail old lady in heavy black drapery never speaking about nor alluding to her great sorrow quieter gentler paler than ever before and her eyes dim with much weeping never witnessed by mortal she had seen mr gray at the expiration of the month of deep retirement but i do not think that even to him she had said one word of her own particular individual sorrow all mention of it seemed buried deep for evermore one day mr horner sent word that he was too much indisposed to attend to his usual business at the hall but he wrote down some directions and requests to miss galindo saying that he would be at his office early the next morning the next morning he was dead miss galindo told my lady miss galindo herself cried plentifully but my lady although very much distressed could not cry it seemed a physical impossibility as if she had shed all the tears in her power moreover i almost think her wonder was far greater that she herself lived than that mr horner died it was almost natural that so faithful a servant should break his heart when the family he belonged to lost their stay their heir and their last hope yes mr horner was a faithful servant i do not think there are many so faithful now but perhaps that is an old woman's fancy of mine when his will came to be examined it was discovered that soon after harry gregson's accident mr horner had left the few thousand three i think of which he was possessed in trust for harry's benefit desiring his executors to see that the lad was well educated in certain things for which mr horner had thought that he had shown his special aptitude and there was a kind of implied apology to my lady in one sentence where he stated that harry's lameness would prevent his ever being able to gain his living by the exercise of any mere bodily faculties 
as had been wished by a lady whose wishes he the testator was bound to regard but there was a codicil in the will dated since lord ludlow's death feebly written by mr horner himself as if in preparation only for some more formal manner of bequest or perhaps only as a mere temporary arrangement till he could see a lawyer and have a fresh will made in this he revoked his previous bequest to harry gregson he only left two hundred pounds to mr gray to be used as that gentleman thought best for harry gregson's benefit with this one exception he bequeathed all the rest of his savings to my lady with a hope that they might form a nest egg as it were towards the paying off of the mortgage which had been such a grief to him during his life i may not repeat all this in lawyer's phrase i heard it through miss galindo and she might make mistakes though indeed she was very clear-headed and soon earned the respect of mr smithson my lady's lawyer from warwick mr smithson knew miss galindo a little before both personally and by reputation but i don't think he was prepared to find her installed as steward's clerk and at first he was inclined to treat her in this capacity with polite contempt but miss galindo was both a lady and a spirited sensible woman and she could put aside her self-indulgence in eccentricity of speech and manner whenever she chose nay more she was usually so talkative that if she had not been amusing and warm-hearted one might have thought her wearisome occasionally but to meet mr smithson she came out daily in her sunday gown she said no more than was required in answer to his questions her books and papers were in thorough order and methodically kept her statements of matters of fact accurate and to be relied on she was amusingly conscious of her victory over his contempt of a woman clerk and his preconceived opinion of her unpractical eccentricity let me alone said she one day when she came in to sit a while with me that man is a good man a sensible man and i have no doubt he is a good lawyer but he can't fathom women yet i make no doubt he'll go back to warwick and never give credit again to those people who made him think me half cracked to begin with oh my dear he did he showed it twenty times worse than my poor dear master ever did it was a form to be gone through to please my lady and for her sake he would hear my statements and see my books it was keeping a woman out of harm's way at any rate to let her fancy herself useful i read the man and i am thankful to say he cannot read me at least only one side of me when i see an end to be gained i can behave myself accordingly here was a man who thought that a woman in a black silk gown was a respectable orderly kind of person and i was a woman in a black silk gown he believed that a woman could not write straight lines and required a man to tell her that two and two made four i was not above ruling my books and had cocker a little more at my fingers ends than he had but my greatest triumph has been holding my tongue he would have thought nothing of my books or my sums or my black silk gown if i had spoken unasked so i have buried more sense in my bosom these ten days than ever i have uttered in the whole course of my life before i have been so curt so abrupt so abominably dull that i'll answer for it he thinks me worthy to be a man but i must go back to him my dear so good-bye to conversation and you but though mr smithson might be satisfied with miss galindo i am afraid she was the only part of the affair with which he was content everything else went wrong i could not say who told me so but the conviction of this seemed to pervade the house i never knew how much we had all looked up to the silent gruff mr horner for decisions until he was gone my lady herself was a pretty good woman of business as women of business go 
her father seeing that she would be the heiress of the hanbury property had given her a training which was thought unusual in those days and she liked to feel herself queen regnant and to have to decide in all cases between herself and her tenantry but perhaps mr horner would have done it more wisely not but what she always attended to him at last she would begin by saying pretty clearly and promptly what she would have done and what she would not have done if mr horner approved of it he bowed and set about obeying her directly if he disapproved of it he bowed and lingered so long before he obeyed her that she forced his opinion out of him with her well mr horner and what have you to say against it for she always understood his silence as well as if he had spoken but the estate was pressed for ready money and mr horner had grown gloomy and languid since the death of his wife and even his own personal affairs were not in the order in which they had been a year or two before for his old clerk had gradually become superannuated or at any rate unable by the superfluity of his own energy and wit to supply the spirit that was wanting in mr horner day after day mr smithson seemed to grow more fidgety more annoyed at the state of affairs like every one else employed by lady ludlow as far as i could learn he had an hereditary tie to the hanbury family as long as the smithsons had been lawyers they had been lawyers to the hanburys always coming in on all great family occasions and better able to understand the characters and connect the links of what had once been a large and scattered family than any individual thereof had ever been as long as a man was at the head of the hanburys the lawyers had simply acted as servants and had only given their advice when it was required but they had assumed a different position on the memorable occasion of the mortgage they had remonstrated against it my lady had resented this remonstrance and a slight unspoken coolness had existed between her and the father of this mr smithson ever since i was very sorry for my lady mr smithson was inclined to blame mr horner for the disorderly state in which he found some of the outlying farms and for the deficiencies in the annual payment of rents mr smithson had too much good feeling to put this blame into words but my lady's quick instinct led her to reply to a thought the existence of which she perceived and she quietly told the truth and explained how she had interfered repeatedly to prevent mr horner from taking certain desirable steps which were discordant to her hereditary sense of right and wrong between landlord and tenant she also spoke of the want of ready money as a misfortune that could be remedied by more economical personal expenditure on her own part by which individual saving it was possible that a reduction of fifty pounds a year might have been accomplished but as soon as mr smithson touched on larger economies such as either affected the welfare of others or the honour and standing of the great house of hanbury she was inflexible her establishment consisted of somewhere about forty servants of whom nearly as many as twenty were unable to perform their work properly and yet would have been hurt if they had been dismissed so they had the credit of fulfilling duties while my lady paid and kept their substitutes mr smithson made a calculation and would have saved some hundreds a year by pensioning off these old servants but my lady would not hear of it then again i know privately that he urged her to allow some of us to return to our homes bitterly we should have regretted the separation from lady ludlow but we would have gone back gladly had we known at the time that her circumstances required it but she would not listen to the proposal for a moment if i cannot act justly towards every one i will give up a plan which has been a source of much satisfaction at least i will not carry it out to such an extent in future but to these young ladies who do me the favour to live with me at present i stand pledged i cannot go back from my word mr smithson we had better talk no more of this 
as she spoke she entered the room where i lay she and mr smithson were coming for some papers contained in the bureau they did not know i was there and mr smithson started a little when he saw me as he must have been aware that i had overheard something but my lady did not change a muscle of her face all the world might overhear her kind just pure sayings and she had no fear of their misconstruction she came up to me and kissed me on the forehead and then went to search for the required papers i rode over the connington farms yesterday my lady i must say i was quite grieved to see the condition they are in all the land that is not waste is utterly exhausted with working successive white crops not a pinch of manure laid on the ground for years i must say that a greater contrast could never have been presented than that between harding's farm and the next fields fences in perfect order rotation crops sheep eating down the turnips on the waste lands everything that could be desired whose farm is that asked my lady why i am sorry to say twas on none of your ladyships that i saw such good methods adopted i hoped it was i stopped my horse to inquire a queer-looking man sitting on his horse like a tailor watching his men with a couple of the sharpest eyes i ever saw and dropping his h's at every word answered my question and told me it was his i could not go on asking him who he was but i fell into conversation with him and i gathered that he had earned some money in trade in birmingham and had bought the estate five hundred acres i think he said on which he was born and now was setting himself to cultivate it in downright earnest going to holcombe and woburn and half the country over to get himself up on the subject it would be brook that dissenting baker from birmingham said my lady in her most icy tone mr smithson i am sorry i have been detaining you so long but i think these are the letters you wished to see if her ladyship thought by this speech to quench mr smithson she was mistaken mr smithson just looked at the letters and went on with the old subject now my lady it struck me that if you had such a man to take poor horner's place he would work the rents and the land round most satisfactorily i should not despair of inducing this very man to undertake the work i should not mind speaking to him myself on the subject for we got capital friends over a snack of luncheon that he asked me to share with him lady ludlow fixed her eyes on mr smithson as he spoke and never took them off his face until he had ended she was silent a minute before she answered you are very good mr smithson but i need not trouble you with any such arrangements i am going to write this afternoon to captain james a friend of one of my sons who has i hear been severely wounded at trafalgar to request him to honour me by accepting mr horner's situation a captain james a captain in the navy going to manage your ladyship's estate if he will be so kind i shall esteem it a condescension on his part but i hear that he will have to resign his profession his state of health is so bad and a country life is especially prescribed for him i am in some hopes of tempting him here as i learn that he has but little to depend on if he gives up his profession a captain james an invalid captain you think i am asking too great a favour continued my lady i never could tell how far it was simplicity or how far a kind of innocent malice that made her misinterpret mr smithson's words and look as she did but he is not a post captain only a commander and his pension will be but small i may be able by offering him country air and a healthy occupation to restore him to health occupation my lady may i ask how a sailor is to manage land why your tenants will laugh him to scorn my tenants i trust will not behave so ill as to laugh at any one i choose to set over them captain james has had experience in managing men 
he has remarkable practical talents and great common sense as i hear from every one but whatever he may be the affair rests between him and myself i can only say i shall esteem myself fortunate if he comes there was no more to be said after my lady spoke in this manner i had heard her mention captain james before as a middy who had been very kind to her son urian i thought i remembered then that she had mentioned that his family circumstances were not very prosperous but i confess that little as i knew of the management of land i quite sided with mr smithson he silently prohibited from again speaking to my lady on the subject opened his mind to miss galindo from whom i was pretty sure to hear all the opinions and news of the household and the village she had taken a great fancy to me because she said i talked so agreeably i believe it was because i listened so well well have you heard the news she began about this captain james a sailor with a wooden leg i have no doubt what would the poor dear deceased master have said to it if he had known who was to be his successor my dear i have often thought of the postman's bringing me a letter as one of the pleasures i shall miss in heaven but really i think mr horner may be thankful he has got out of the reach of news or else he would hear of mr smithson's having made up to the birmingham baker and of his one-legged captain coming to dot and go one over the estate i suppose he will look after the labourers through a spyglass i only hope he won't stick in the mud with his wooden leg for i for one won't help him out yes i would said she correcting herself i would for my lady's sake but are you sure he has a wooden leg asked i i heard lady ludlow tell mr smithson about him and she only spoke of him as wounded well sailors are almost always wounded in the leg look at greenwich hospital i should say there were twenty one-legged pensioners to one without an arm there but say he has got half a dozen legs what has he to do with managing land i shall think him very impudent if he comes taking advantage of my lady's kind heart however come he did in a month from that time the carriage was sent to meet captain james just as three years before it had been sent to meet me his coming had been so much talked about that we were all as curious as possible to see him and to know how so unusual an experiment as it seemed to us would answer but before i tell you anything about our new agent i must speak of something quite as interesting and i really think quite as important and this was my lady's making friends with harry gregson i do believe she did it for mr horner's sake but of course i can only conjecture why my lady did anything but i heard one day from larry legard that my lady had sent for harry to come and see her if he was well enough to walk so far and the next day he was shown into the room he had been in once before under such unlucky circumstances the lad looked pale enough as he stood propping himself up on his crutch and the instant my lady saw him she bade john footman place a stool for him to sit down upon while she spoke to him it might be his paleness that gave his whole face a more refined and gentle look but i suspect it was that the boy was apt to take impressions and that mr horner's grave dignified ways and mr gray's tender and quiet manners had altered him and then the thoughts of illness and death seemed to turn many of us into gentlemen and gentlewomen as long as such thoughts are in our minds we cannot speak loudly or angrily at such times we are not apt to be eager about mere worldly things for our very awe at our quickened sense of the nearness of the invisible world makes us calm and serene about the petty trifles of to-day at least i know that was the explanation mr gray once gave me for what we all thought the great improvement in harry gregson's way of behaving my lady hesitated so long about what she had best say 
that Harry grew a little frightened at her silence. A few months ago it would have surprised me more than it did now, but since my lord, her son's death, she had seemed altered in many ways, more uncertain and distrustful of herself, as it were. At last, she said, and I think the tears were in her eyes, my poor little fellow, you have had a narrow escape with your life since I saw you last. To this there was nothing to be said but yes, and again there was silence. And you have lost a good, kind friend in Mr. Horner. The boy's lips worked, and I think he said, Please don't, but I can't be sure. At any rate, my lady went on, and so have I. A good, kind friend he was to both of us, and to you he wished to show his kindness in even a more generous way than he has done. Mr. Gray has told you about his legacy to you, has he not? There was no sign of eager joy on the lad's face, as if he realized the power and pleasure of having what to him must have seemed like a fortune. Mr. Gray said as how he had left me a matter of money. Yes, he has left you two hundred pounds. But I would rather have him alive, my lady, he burst out, sobbing as if his heart would break. My lad, I believe you. We would rather have our dead alive, would we not? And there is nothing in money that can comfort us for their loss. But you know, Mr. Gray has told you, who has appointed all our times to die? Mr. Horner was a good, just man, and has done well and kindly, both by me and you. You, perhaps, do not know, and now I understood what my lady had been making her mind up to say to Harry all the time she was hesitating how to begin, that Mr. Horner at one time meant to leave you a great deal more, probably all he had, with the exception of a legacy to his old clerk, Morrison. But he knew that this estate, on which my forefathers had lived for six hundred years, was in debt, and that I had no immediate chance of paying off this debt, and yet he felt that it was a very sad thing for an old property like this to belong in part to those other men who had lent the money. You understand me, I think, my little man, said she, questioning Harry's face. He had left off crying and was trying to understand with all his might and main, and I think he had got a pretty good general idea of the state of affairs, though probably he was puzzled by the term, the estate being in debt. But he was sufficiently interested to want my lady to go on, and he nodded his head at her to signify this to her. So Mr. Horner took the money which he had once meant to be yours, and has left the greater part of it to me, with the intention of helping me to pay off this debt I have told you about. It will go a long way, and I shall try hard to save the rest, and then I shall die happy in leaving the land free from debt. She paused. But I shall not die happy in thinking of you. I do not know if having money, or even having a great estate and much honour, is a good thing for any of us but God sees fit that some of us should be called to this condition, and it is our duty, then, to stand by our posts like brave soldiers. Now, Mr. Horner intended you to have this money first. I shall only call it borrowing from you, Harry Gregson, if I take it and use it to pay off the debt. I shall pay Mr. Gray interest on this money, because he is to stand as your guardian, as it were, till you come of age and he must fix what ought to be done with it, so as to fit you for spending the principal rightly, when the estate can repay it you. I suppose now it will be right for you to be educated. That will be another snare that will come with your money. But have courage, Harry. Both education and money may be used rightly, if we only pray against the temptations they bring with them. Harry could make no answer, though I am sure he understood it all. My lady wanted to get him to talk to her a little, by way of becoming acquainted with what was passing in his mind, 
and she asked him what he would like to have done with his money, if he could have part of it now. To such a simple question, invoking no talk about feelings, his answer came readily enough. Build a cottage for father with stairs in it, and give Mr. Gray a schoolhouse. Oh, father does so want Mr. Gray for to have his wish. Father saw all the stones lying quarried and hewn on Farmer Hale's land. Mr. Gray had paid for them all himself, and father said he would work night and day, and little Tommy should carry mortar, if the parson would let him, sooner than that he should be fretted and frabbed as he was, with no one giving him a helping hand or a kind word. Harry knew nothing of my lady's part in the affair. That was very clear. My lady kept silence. If I might have a piece of my money, I would buy land from Mr. Brooks. He has got a bit to sell just at the corner of Hendon Lane, and I would give it to Mr. Gray. And, perhaps, if your ladyship thinks I may be learned again, I might grow up into the schoolmaster. You are a good boy, said my lady, but there are more things to be thought of in carrying out such a plan than you are aware of. However, it shall be tried. The school, my lady? I exclaimed, almost thinking she did not know what she was saying. Yes, the school. For Mr. Horner's sake for Mr. Gray's sake, and last, not least, for this lad's sake, I will give the new plan a trial. Ask Mr. Gray to come to me this afternoon about the land he wants. He needs not go to a dissenter for it, and tell your father he shall have a good share in the building of it, and Tommy shall carry the mortar. And I may be schoolmaster? asked Harry eagerly. We'll see about that, said my lady, amused. It will be some time before that plan comes to pass, my little fellow. And now to return to Captain James. My first account of him was from Miss Galindo. He's not above thirty, and I must just pack up my pens and my paper and be off, for it would be the height of impropriety for me to be staying here as his clerk. It was all very well in the old master's days. But here am I, not fifty till next May, and this young unmarried man, who is not even a widower. Oh, there would be no end of gossip. Besides, he looks as askance at me as I do at him. My black silk gown had no effect. He is afraid I shall marry him, but I won't. He may feel himself quite safe from that, and Mr. Smithson has been recommending a clerk to my lady. She would far rather keep me on, but I can't stop. I really could not think it proper. What sort of a looking man is he? Oh, nothing particular. Short and brown and sunburnt. I did not think it became me to look at him. Well, now for the nightcaps. I should have grudged anyone else doing them, for I have got such a pretty pattern. But when it came to Miss Galindo's leaving, there was a great misunderstanding between her and my lady. Miss Galindo had imagined that my lady had asked her as a favour to copy the letters and enter the accounts, and had agreed to do the work without the notion of being paid for so doing. She had, now and then, grieved over a very profitable order for needlework passing out of her hands on account of her not having time to do it, because of her occupation at the hall. But she had never hinted this to my lady but gone on cheerfully at her writing as long as her clerkship was required. My lady was annoyed that she had not made her intention of paying Miss Galindo more clear in the first conversation she had had with her, but I suppose that she had been too delicate to be very explicit with regard to money matters, and now Miss Galindo was quite hurt at my lady's wanting to pay her for what she had done in such right-down good will. No, Miss Galindo said, my own dear lady, you may be as angry with me as you like, but don't offer me money. Think of six and twenty years ago, and poor Arthur, and as you were to me then. Besides, I wanted money, I don't disguise it, for a particular purpose, and when I found that, God bless you for asking me, I could do you a service, I turned it over in my mind, 
and I gave up one plan and took up another, and it's all settled now. Bessie is to leave school and come and live with me. Don't please offer me money again. You don't know how glad I have been to do anything for you. Have not I, Margaret Dawson? Did you not hear me say one day I would cut off my hand for my lady? For am I a stock or a stone that I should forget kindness? Oh, I have been so glad to work for you. And now Bessie is coming here, and no one knows anything about her, as if she had done anything wrong, poor child. Dear Miss Galindo, replied my lady, I will never ask you to take money again. Only I thought it was quite understood between us. And you know you have taken money for a set of morning wrappers before now. Yes, my lady, but that was not confidential. Now I was so proud to have something to do for you confidentially. But who is Bessie? asked my lady. I do not understand who she is, or why she is to come and live with you. Dear Miss Galindo, you must honour me by being confidential with me in your turn. My Lady Ludlow, Part 13 I had always understood that Miss Galindo had once been in much better circumstances, but I had never liked to ask any questions respecting her. But about this time many things came out respecting her former life, which I will try and arrange, not, however, in the order in which I heard them, but rather as they occurred. Miss Galindo was the daughter of a clergyman in Westmoreland. Her father was the younger brother of a baronet, his ancestor having been one of those of James I's creation. This baronet uncle of Miss Galindo was one of the queer, out-of-the-way people who were bred at that time, and in that northern district of England. I never heard much of him from any one, besides this one great fact, that he had early disappeared from his family, which indeed only consisted of a brother and sister who died unmarried, and lived no one knew where. Somewhere on the continent it was supposed, for he had never returned from the grand tour which he had been sent to make, according to the general fashion of the day, as soon as he had left Oxford. He corresponded occasionally with his brother the clergyman, but the letters passed through a banker's hands, the banker being pledged to secrecy, and, as he told Mr. Galindo, having the penalty, if he broke his pledge, of losing the whole profitable business, and of having the management of the baronet's affairs taken out of his hands, without any advantage accruing to the inquirer. For Sir Lawrence had told Messrs. Graham that, in case his place of residence was revealed by them, not only would he cease to bank with them, but instantly take measures to baffle any future inquiries as to his whereabouts by removing to some distant country. Sir Lawrence paid a certain sum of money to his brother's account every year, but the time of this payment varied, and it was sometimes eighteen or nineteen months between the deposits. Then again it would not be above a quarter of the time, showing that he intended it to be annual, but as this intention was never expressed in words, it was impossible to rely upon it, and a great deal of this money was swallowed up by the necessity Mr. Galindo felt himself under of living in the large, old, rambling family mansion, which had been one of Sir Lawrence's rarely expressed desires. Mr. and Mrs. Galindo often planned to live upon their own small fortune and the income derived from the living. A vicarage, of which the great tithes went to Sir Lawrence as lay improprietor, so as to put by the payments made by the baronet for the benefit of Laurentia, our Miss Galindo, but I suppose they found it difficult to live economically in a large house, even though they had it rent-free. They had to keep up with hereditary neighbours and friends, and could hardly help doing it in the hereditary manner. One of these neighbours, a Mr. Gibson, had a son a few years older than Laurentia. The families were sufficiently intimate for the young people to see a good deal of each other, 
and I was told that this young Mr. Mark Gibson was an unusually prepossessing man. He seemed to have impressed every one who spoke of him to me as being a handsome, manly, kind-hearted fellow, just what a girl would be sure to find most agreeable. The parents either forgot that their children were growing up to man's and woman's estate, or thought that that intimacy and probable attachment would be no bad thing, even if it did lead to a marriage. Still, nothing was ever said by young Gibson till later on, when it was too late, as it turned out. He went to and from Oxford, he shot and fished with Mr. Galindo, or came to the mere to skate in winter time, was asked to accompany Mr. Galindo to the hall, as the latter returned to quiet dinner with his wife and daughter, and so, and so, it went on. Nobody much knew how, until one day, when Mr. Galindo received a formal letter from his brother's bankers, announcing Sir Lawrence's death of malarial fever at Albano, and congratulating Sir Hubert on his accession to the estates and the baronetcy. The king is dead, long live the king, as I have since heard that the French express it. Sir Hubert and his wife were greatly surprised. Sir Lawrence was but two years older than his brother, and they had never heard of any illness till they heard of his death. They were sorry, very much shocked, but still a little elated at the succession to the baronetcy and estates. The London bankers had managed everything well. There was a large sum of ready money in their hands at Sir Hubert's service until he should touch his rents the rent-roll being eight thousand a year, and only Laurentia to inherit it all. Her mother, a poor clergyman's daughter, began to plan all sorts of fine marriages for her, nor was her father much behind his wife in his ambition. They took her up to London, when they went to buy new carriages and dresses and furniture, and it was then and there she made my lady's acquaintance. How it was they came to take a fancy to each other, I cannot say. My lady was of the old nobility, grand, composed, gentle, and stately in her ways. Miss Galindo must always have been hurried in her manner, and her energy must have shown itself in inquisitiveness and oddness even in her youth. But I don't pretend to account for things, I only narrate them. And the fact was this that the elegant, fastidious countess was attracted to the country girl, who on her part almost worshipped my lady. My lady's notice of their daughter made her parents think, I suppose, that there was no match that she might not command, she the heiress of eight thousand a year, and visiting about amongst earls and dukes. So when they came back to their old Westmoreland hall, and Mark Gibson rode over to offer his hand and his heart, and prospective estate of nine hundred a year to his old companion and playfellow, Laurentia, Sir Hubert and Lady Galindo made very short work of it. They refused him plumply themselves, and when he begged to be allowed to speak to Laurentia, they found some excuse for refusing him the opportunity of so doing, until they had talked to her themselves, and brought up every argument and fact in their power to convince her, a plain girl, and conscious of her plainness, that Mr. Mark Gibson had never thought of her in the way of marriage till after her father's accession to his fortune, and that it was the estate, not the young lady, that he was in love with. I suppose it will never be known in this world how far this supposition of theirs was true. My Lady Ludlow had always spoken as if it was. But perhaps events which came to her knowledge about this time, altered her opinion. At any rate, the end of it was, Laurentia refused Mark, and almost broke her heart in doing so. He discovered the suspicions of Sir Hubert and Lady Galindo, and that they had persuaded their daughter to share in them. So he flung off with high words, saying that they did not know a true heart when they met with one, and that although he had never offered till after Sir Lawrence's death, yet that his father knew all along that he had been attached to Laurentia, only that he, being the eldest of five children, and having as yet no profession, had had to conceal, rather than to express, 
an attachment which in those days he had believed was reciprocated he had always meant to study for the bar and the end of all he had hoped for had been to earn a moderate income which he might ask laurentia to share this or something like it was what he said but his reference to his father cut two ways old mr gibson was known to be very keen about money it was just as likely that he would urge mark to make love to the heiress now she was an heiress as that he would have restrained him previously as mark said he had done when this was repeated to mark he became proudly reserved or sullen and said that laurentia at any rate might have known him better he left the country and went up to london to study law soon afterwards and sir hubert and lady galindo thought they were well rid of him but laurentia never ceased reproaching herself and never did to her dying day as i believe the words she might have known me better told to her by some kind friend or other rankled in her mind and were never forgotten her father and mother took her up to london the next year but she did not care to visit dreaded going out even for a drive lest she should see mark gibson's reproachful eyes pined and lost her health lady ludlow saw this change with regret and was told the cause by lady galindo who of course gave her own version of mark's conduct and motives my lady never spoke to miss galindo about it but tried constantly to interest and please her it was at this time that my lady told miss galindo so much about her own early life and about hanbury that miss galindo resolved if ever she could she would go and see the old place which her friend loved so well the end of it all was that she came to live there as we know but a great change was to come first before sir hubert and lady galindo had left london on this their second visit they had a letter from the lawyer whom they employed saying that sir lawrence had left an heir his legitimate child by an italian woman of low rank at least legal claims to the title and property had been sent in to him on the boy's behalf sir lawrence had always been a man of adventurous and artistic rather than of luxurious tastes and it was supposed when all came to be proved at the trial that he was captivated by the free beautiful life they led in italy and had married this neapolitan fisherman's daughter who had people about her shrewd enough to see that the ceremony was legally performed she and her husband had wandered about the shores of the mediterranean for years leading a happy careless irresponsible life unencumbered by any duties except those connected with a rather numerous family it was enough for her that they never wanted money and that her husband's love was always continued to her she hated the name of england wicked cold heretic england and avoided the mention of any subject connected with her husband's early life so that when he died at albano she was almost roused out of her vehement grief to anger with the italian doctor who declared that he must write to a certain address to announce the death of lawrence galindo for some time she feared lest english barbarians might come down upon her making a claim to the children she hid herself and them in the abruzzi living upon the sale of what furniture and jewels sir lawrence had died possessed of when these failed she returned to naples which she had not visited since her marriage her father was dead but her brother inherited some of his keenness he interested the priests who made inquiries and found that the galindo succession was worth securing to an heir of the true faith they stirred about it obtained advice at the english embassy and hence that letter to the lawyers calling upon sir hubert to relinquish title and property and to refund what money he had expended he was vehement in his opposition to this claim he could not bear to think of his brother having married a foreigner a papist a fisherman's daughter nay of his having become a papist himself he was in despair at the thought of his ancestral property going to the issue of such a marriage 
he fought tooth and nail making enemies of his relations and losing almost all his own private property for he would go on against the lawyer's advice long after every one was convinced except himself and his wife at last he was conquered he gave up his living in gloomy despair he would have changed his name if he could so desirous was he to obliterate all ties between himself and the mongrel papist baronet and his italian mother and all the succession of children and nurses who came to take possession of the hall soon after mr hubert galindo's departure stayed there one winter and then flitted back to naples with gladness and delight mr and mrs hubert galindo lived in london he had obtained a curacy somewhere in the city they would have been thankful now if mr mark gibson had renewed his offer no one could accuse him of mercenary motives if he had done so because he did not come forward as they wished they brought his silence up as a justification of what they had previously attributed to him i don't know what miss galindo thought herself but lady ludlow has told me how she shrank from hearing her parents abuse him lady ludlow supposed that he was aware that they were living in london his father must have known the fact and it was curious if he had never named it to his son besides the name was very uncommon and it was unlikely that it should never come across him in the advertisements of charity sermons which the new and rather eloquent curate of st mark's east was asked to preach all this time lady ludlow never lost sight of them for miss galindo's sake and when the father and mother died it was my lady who upheld miss galindo in her determination not to apply for any provision to her cousin the italian baronet but rather to live upon the hundred a year which had been settled on her mother and the children of his son hubert's marriage by the old grandfather sir lawrence mr mark gibson had risen to some eminence as a barrister on the northern circuit but had died unmarried in the lifetime of his father a victim so people said to intemperance dr trevor the physician who had been called in to mr gray and harry gregson had married a sister of his and that was all my lady knew about the gibson family but who was bessie that mystery and secret came out too in process of time miss galindo had been to warwick some years before i arrived at hanbury on some kind of business or shopping which can only be transacted in a county town there was an old westmoreland connection between her and mrs trevor though i believe the latter was too young to have been made aware of her brother's offer to miss galindo at the time when it took place and such affairs if they are unsuccessful are seldom spoken about in the gentleman's family afterwards but the gibsons and galindos had been country neighbours too long for the connection not to be kept up between two members settled far away from their early homes miss galindo always desired her parcels to be sent to dr trevor's when she went to warwick for shopping purchases if she were going any journey and the coach did not come through warwick as soon as she arrived in my lady's coach or otherwise from hanbury she went to dr trevor's to wait she was as much expected to sit down to the household meals as if she had been one of the family and in after years it was mrs trevor who managed her repository business for her so on the day i spoke of she had gone to dr trevor's to rest and possibly to dine the post in those times came in at all hours of the morning and dr trevor's letters had not arrived until after his departure on his morning round miss galindo was sitting down to dinner with mrs trevor and her seven children when the doctor came in he was flurried and uncomfortable and hurried the children away as soon as he decently could then rather feeling miss galindo's presence an advantage both as a present restraint on the violence of his wife's grief and as a consoler when he was absent on his afternoon round he told mrs trevor of her brother's death he had been taken ill on circuit and had hurried back to his chambers in london only to die she cried terribly but dr trevor said afterwards he
he never noticed that Miss Galindo cared much about it one way or another. She helped him to soothe his wife, promised to stay with her all the afternoon instead of returning to Hanbury, and afterwards offered to remain with her while the doctor went to attend the funeral. When they heard of the old love story between the dead man and Miss Galindo, brought up by mutual friends in Westmoreland, in the review which we are all inclined to take of the events of a man's life when he comes to die, they tried to remember Miss Galindo's speeches and ways of going on during this visit. She was a little pale, a little silent, her eyes were sometimes swollen, and her nose red, but she was at an age when such appearances are generally attributed to a bad cold in the head, rather than to any more sentimental reason. They felt towards her as towards an old friend, a kindly, useful, eccentric old maid. She did not expect more, or wish them to remember that she might once have had other hopes and more youthful feelings. Dr. Trevor thanked her very warmly for staying with his wife when he returned home from London, where the funeral had taken place. He begged Miss Galinda to stay with them when the children were gone to bed, and she was preparing to leave the husband and wife by themselves. He told her and his wife many particulars, then paused, then went on. And Mark has left a child, a little girl. But he never married, exclaimed Mrs. Trevor. A little girl, continued her husband, whose mother, I conclude, is dead. At any rate, the child was in possession of his chambers. She and an old nurse, who seemed to have the charge of everything, and has cheated poor Mark, I should fancy, not a little. But the child, asked Mrs. Trevor, still almost breathless with astonishment, how do you know it is his? The nurse told me it was, with great appearance of indignation at my doubting it. I asked the little thing her name, and all I could get was Bessie, and the cry of me once papa. The nurse said that the mother was dead, and she knew no more about it than that Mr. Gibson had engaged her to take care of the little girl, calling it his child. One or two of his lawyer friends, whom I met with at the funeral, told me that they were aware of the existence of the child. "'What is to be done with her?' asked Mrs. Gibson. "'Nay, I don't know,' replied he. "'Mark has hardly left assets enough to pay his debts, and your father is not inclined to come forward.' That night, as Dr. Trevor sat in his study, after his wife had gone to bed, Miss Galindo knocked at his door. She and he had a long conversation. The result was that he accompanied Miss Galindo up to town the next day, that they took possession of the little Bessie, and she was brought down and placed at nurse at a farm in the country near Warwick, Miss Galindo undertaking to pay one half of the expense and to furnish her with clothes, and Dr. Trevor undertaking that the remaining half should be furnished by the Gibson family, or by himself in their default. Miss Galindo was not fond of children, and I dare say she dreaded taking this child to live with her for more reasons than one. My Lady Ludlow could not endure any mention of illegitimate children. It was a principle of hers that society ought to ignore them and I believe Miss Galindo had always agreed with her until now, when the thing came home to her womanly heart. Still she shrank from having this child of some strange woman under her roof. She went over to see it from time to time, she worked at its clothes long after everyone thought she was in bed, and when the time came for Bessie to be sent to school, Miss Galindo laboured away more diligently than ever in order to pay the increased expense for the Gibson family had, at first, paid their part of the compact, but with unwillingness and grudging hearts. Then they had left it off altogether, and it fell hard on Dr. Trevor with his twelve children, and latterly Miss Galindo had taken upon herself almost all the burden. One can hardly live and labour and plan and make sacrifices for any human creature without learning to love it, 
and bessy loved miss galindo too for all the poor girl's scanty pleasures came from her and miss galindo had always a kind word and latterly many a kind caress for mark gibson's child whereas if she went to dr trevor's for her holiday she was overlooked and neglected in that bustling family who seemed to think that if she had comfortable board and lodgings under their roof it was enough i am sure now that miss galindo had often longed to have bessie to live with her but as long as she could pay for her being at school she did not like to take so bold a step as bringing her home knowing what the effect of the consequent explanation would be on my lady and as the girl was now more than seventeen and past the age where young ladies are usually kept at school and as there was no great demand for governesses in those days and as bessie had never been taught any trade by which to earn her own living why i don't exactly see what could have been done but for miss galindo to bring her to her own home in hanbury for although the child had grown up lately in a kind of unexpected manner into a young woman miss galindo might have kept her at school for a year longer if she could have afforded it but this was impossible when she became mr horner's clerk and relinquished all the payment of her repository work and perhaps after all she was not sorry to be compelled to take the step she was longing for at any rate bessie came to live with miss galindo in a very few weeks from the time when captain james set miss galindo free to superintend her own domestic economy again for a long time i knew nothing about this new inhabitant of hanbury my lady never mentioned her in any way this was in accordance with lady ludlow's well-known principles she neither saw nor heard nor was in any way cognizant of the existence of those who had no legal right to exist at all if miss galindo had hoped to have an exception made in bessie's favour she was mistaken my lady sent a note inviting miss galindo herself to tea one evening about a month after bessie came but miss galindo had a cold and could not come the next time she was invited she had an engagement at home a step nearer to the absolute truth and the third time she had a young friend staying with her whom she was unable to leave my lady accepted every excuse as bona fide and took no further notice i missed miss galinda very much we all did for in the days when she was clerk she was sure to come in and find the opportunity of saying something amusing to some of us before she went away and i as an invalid or perhaps from natural tendency was particularly fond of little bits of village gossip there was no mr horner he even had come in now and then with formal stately pieces of intelligence and there was no miss galindo in these days i missed her much and so did my lady i am sure behind all her quiet sedate manner I am certain her heart ached sometimes for a few words from Miss Galindo, who seemed to have absented herself altogether from the hall, now Bessie was come. Captain James might be very sensible and all that, but not even my lady could call him a substitute for the old familiar friends. He was a thorough sailor, as sailors were in those days, swore a good deal, drank a good deal, without its ever affecting him in the least and was very prompt and kind-hearted in all his actions but he was not accustomed to women as my lady once said and would judge in all things for himself my lady had expected i think to find some one who would take his notions on the management of her estate from her ladyship's own self but he spoke as if he were responsible for the good management of the whole and must consequently be allowed full liberty of action he had been too long in command over men at sea to like to be directed by a woman in anything he undertook even though that woman was my lady i suppose this was the common sense my lady spoke of but when common sense goes against us i don't think we value it quite so much as we ought to lady ludlow was proud of her personal superintendence of her own estate 
she liked to tell us how her father used to take her with him in his rides and bid her observe this and that and on no account to allow such and such things to be done but i have heard that the first time she told all this to captain james he told her point-blank that he had heard from mr smithson that the farms were much neglected and the rents sadly behindhand and that he meant to set to in good earnest and study agriculture and see how he could remedy the state of things my lady would i am sure be greatly surprised but what could she do here was the very man she had chosen herself setting to with all his energy to conquer the defect of ignorance which was all that those who had presumed to offer her ladyship advice had ever had to say against him captain james read arthur young's tours in all his spare time as long as he was an invalid and shook his head at my lady's accounts as to how the land had been cropped or left fallow from time immemorial then he set to and tried too many new experiments at once my lady looked on in dignified silence but all the farmers and tenants were in an uproar and prophesied a hundred failures perhaps fifty did occur they were only half as many as lady ludlow had feared but they were twice as many four eight times as many as the captain had anticipated his openly expressed disappointment made him popular again the rough country people could not have understood silent and dignified regret at the failure of his plans but they sympathized with a man who swore at his ill success sympathized even while they chuckled over his discomfiture mr brooke the retired tradesman did not cease blaming him for not succeeding and for swearing but what could you expect from a sailor mr brooke asked even in my lady's hearing though he might have known captain james was my lady's own personal choice from the old friendship mr urian had always shown for him i think it was this speech of the birmingham bakers that made my lady determined to stand by captain james and encourage him to try again for she would not allow that her choice had been an unwise one at the bidding as it were of a dissenting tradesman the only person in the neighbourhood too who had flaunted about in coloured clothes when all the world was in mourning for my lady's only son captain james would have thrown the agency up at once if my lady had not felt herself bound to justify the wisdom of her choice by urging him to stay he was much touched by her confidence in him and swore a great oath that the next year he would make the land such as it had never been before for produce it was not my lady's way to repeat anything she had heard especially to another person's disadvantage so i don't think she ever told captain james of mr brooke's speech about a sailor's being likely to mismanage the property and the captain was too anxious to succeed in this the second year of his trial to be above going to the flourishing shrewd mr brooke and asking for his advice as to the best method of working the estate i dare say if miss galindo had been as intimate as formerly at the hall we should all of us have heard of this new acquaintance of the agents long before we did as it was i am sure my lady never dreamed that the captain who held opinions that were even more church and king than her own could ever have made friends with a baptist baker from birmingham even to serve her ladyship's own interests in the most loyal manner we heard of it first from mr gray who came now often to see my lady for neither he nor she could forget the solemn tie which the fact of he being the person to acquaint her with my lord's death had created between them for true and holy words spoken at that time though having no reference to aught below the solemn subject of life and death had made her withdraw her opposition to mr gray's wish about establishing a village school she had sighed a little it is true and was even yet more apprehensive than hopeful as to the result but almost as if as a memorial to my lord she had allowed a kind of rough schoolhouse to be built on the green just by the church and had gently used the power she undoubtedly had in expressing her strong wish that the boys might only be taught to read and write 
and the first four rules of arithmetic while the girls were only to learn to read and to add up in their heads and the rest of the time to work at mending their own clothes knitting stockings and spinning my lady presented the school with more spinning wheels than there were girls and requested that there might be a rule that they should have spun so many hanks of flax and knitted so many pairs of stockings before they were ever taught to read at all after all it was but making the best of a bad job with my poor lady but life was not what it had been to her i remember well the day that mr gray pulled some delicately fine yarn and i was a good judge of those things out of his pocket and laid it and a capital pair of knitted stockings before my lady as the first fruits so to say of his school i recollect seeing her put on her spectacles and carefully examined both productions then she passed them to me this is well mr gray i am much pleased you are fortunate in your schoolmistress she has had both proper knowledge of womanly things and much patience who is she one out of our village my lady said mr gray stammering and colouring in his old fashion miss bessie is so very kind as to teach all those sorts of things miss bessie and miss galindo sometimes my lady looked at him over her spectacles but she only repeated the words miss bessie and paused as if trying to remember who such a person could be and he if he had then intended to say more was quelled by her manner and dropped the subject he went on to say that he had thought it his duty to decline the subscription to his school offered by mr brooke because he was a dissenter that he mr gray feared that captain james through whom mr brooke's offer of money had been made was offended at his refusing to accept it from a man who held heterodox opinions nay whom mr gray suspected of being infected by dodwell's heresy i think there must be some mistake said my lady or i have misunderstood you captain james would never be sufficiently with a schismatic to be employed by that man brooke in distributing his charities i should have doubted until now if captain james knew him indeed my lady he not only knows him but is intimate with him i regret to say i have repeatedly seen the captain and mr brooke walking together going through the fields together and people do say my lady looked up in interrogation at mr gray's pause i disapprove of gossip and it may be untrue but people do say that captain james is very attentive to miss brooke impossible said my lady indignantly captain james is a loyal and religious man i beg your pardon mr gray but it is impossible my lady ludlow part fourteen like many other things which have been declared to be impossible this report of captain james being attentive to miss brooke turned out to be very true the mere idea of her agent being on the slightest possible terms of acquaintance with the dissenter the tradesman the birmingham democrat who had come to settle in our good orthodox aristocratic and agricultural hanbury made my lady very uneasy miss galindo's misdemeanour in having taken miss bessie to live with her faded into a mistake a mere error of judgment in comparison with captain james's intimacy at yeast house as the brooks called their ugly square-built farm my lady talked herself quite into complacency with miss galindo and even miss bessie was named by her the first time i had ever been aware that my lady recognized her existence but i recollect it was a long rainy afternoon and i sat with her ladyship and we had time and opportunity for a long uninterrupted talk whenever we had been silent for a little while she began again with something like a wonder how it was that captain james could ever have commenced an acquaintance with that man brooke 
my lady recapitulated all the time she could remember that anything had occurred or been said by captain james which she could now understand as throwing light upon the subject he said once that he was anxious to bring in the norfolk system of cropping and spoke a good deal about mr coke of holcombe who by the way was no more a coke than i am collateral in the female line which counts for little or nothing among the great old commoners families of pure blood and his new ways of cultivation of course new men bring in new ways but it does not follow that either are better than the old ways however captain james has been very anxious to try turnips and bone manure and he really is a man of such good sense and energy and was so sorry last year about the failure that i consented and now i begin to see my error i have always heard that town bakers adulterate their flour with bone dust and of course captain james would be aware of this and go to brook to inquire where the article was to be purchased my lady always ignored the fact which had sometimes i suspect been brought under her very eyes during her drives that mr brooks few fields were in a state of far higher cultivation than her own so she could not of course perceive that there was any wisdom to be gained from asking the advice of the tradesman turned farmer by and by this fact of her agent's intimacy with the person whom in the whole world she most disliked with that sort of dislike in which a large amount of uncomfortableness is combined the dislike which conscientious people sometimes feel to another without knowing why and yet which they cannot indulge in with comfort to themselves without having a moral reason why came before my lady in many shapes for indeed i am sure that captain james was not a man to conceal or be ashamed of one of his actions i cannot fancy his ever lowering his strong loud clear voice or having a confidential conversation with any one when his crops had failed all the village had known it he complained he regretted he was angry or owned himself a fool all down the village street and the consequence was that although he was a far more passionate man than mr horner all the tenants liked him far better people in general take a kindly interest in any one the workings of whose mind and heart they can watch and understand than in a man who only lets you know what he has been thinking about and feeling by what he does but harry gregson was faithful to the memory of mr horner miss galinda has told me that she used to watch him hobble out of the way of captain james as if to accept his notice however good-naturedly given would have been a kind of treachery to his former benefactor but gregson the father and the new agent rather took to each other and one day much to my surprise i heard that the poaching tinkering vagabond as the people used to call gregson when i first came to live at hanbury had been appointed gamekeeper mr gray standing godfather as it were to his trustworthiness if he were trusted with anything which i thought at the time was rather an experiment only it answered as many of mr gray's deeds of daring did it was curious how he was growing to be a kind of autocrat in the village and how unconscious he was of it he was as shy and awkward and nervous as ever in any affair that was not of some moral consequence to him but as soon as he was convinced that a thing was right he shut his eyes and ran and butted at it like a ram as captain james once expressed it in talking over something mr gray had done people in the village said they never knew what the parson would be at next or they might have said where his reverence would next turn up for i have heard of his marching right into the middle of a set of poachers gathered together for some desperate midnight enterprise or walking into a public-house that lay just beyond the bounds of my lady's estate and in that extra parochial piece of ground i named long ago and which was considered the rendezvous of all the ne'er-do-well characters for miles around and where a parson and a constable were held in much the same kind of esteem as unwelcome visitors 
and yet mr gray had his long fits of depression in which he felt as if he were doing nothing making no way in his work useless and unprofitable and better out of the world than in it in comparison with the work he had set himself to do what he did seemed to be nothing i suppose it was constitutional those attacks of lowness of spirit which he had about this time perhaps a part of the nervousness which made him always so awkward when he came to the hall even mrs medlicott who almost worshipped the ground he trod on as the saying is owned that mr gray never entered one of my lady's rooms without knocking down something and too often breaking it he would much sooner have faced a desperate poacher than a young lady any day at least so we thought i do not know how it was that it came to pass that my lady became reconciled to miss galindo about this time whether it was that her ladyship was weary of the unspoken coolness with her old friend or that the specimens of delicate sewing and fine spinning at the school had mollified her towards miss bessy but i was surprised to learn one day that miss galindo and her young friend were coming that very evening to tea at the hall this information was given me by mrs medlicott as a message from my lady who further went on to desire that certain little preparations should be made in her own private sitting-room in which the greater part of my days were spent from the nature of these preparations i became quite aware that my lady intended to do honour to her expected visitors indeed lady ludlow never forgave by halves as i have known some people do whoever was coming as a visitor to my lady peeress or poor nameless girl there was a certain amount of preparation required in order to do them fitting honour i do not mean to say that the preparation was of the same degree of importance in each case i dare say if a peeress had come to visit us at the hall the covers would have been taken off the furniture in the white drawing-room they never were uncovered all the time i stayed at the hall because my lady would wish to offer her the ornaments and luxuries which this grand visitor who never came i wish she had i did so want to see that furniture uncovered was accustomed to at home and to present them to her in the best order in which my lady could the same rule mollified held good with miss galindo certain things in which my lady knew she took an interest were laid out ready for her to examine on this very day and what was more great books of print were laid out such as i remembered my lady had brought forth to beguile my own early days of illness mr hogarth's works and the like which i was sure were put out for miss bessy no one knows how curious i was to see this mysterious miss bessy twenty times more mysterious of course for want of her surname and then again to try and account for my great curiosity of which in recollection i am more than half ashamed i had been leading the quiet monotonous life of a crippled invalid for many years shut up from any sight of new faces and this was to be the face of one whom i had thought about so much and so long oh i think i might be excused of course they drank tea in the great hall with the four young gentlewomen who with myself formed the small bevy now under her ladyship's charge of those who were at hanbury when first i came none remained all were married or gone once more to live at some home which could be called their own whether the ostensible head were father or brother i myself was not without some hopes of a similar kind my brother harry was now a curate in westmoreland and wanted me to go and live with him as eventually i did for a time but that is neither here nor there at present what i am talking about is miss bessy after a reasonable time had elapsed occupied as i well knew by the meal in the great hall the measured yet agreeable conversation afterwards and a certain promenade around the hall and through the drawing-rooms with pauses before different pictures the histories or subject of each which was invariably told by my lady to every new visitor a sort of giving them the freedom of the old family seat 
by describing the kind and nature of the great progenitors who had lived there before the narrator i heard the steps approaching my lady's room where i lay i think i was in such a state of nervous expectation that if i could have moved easily i should have got up and run away and yet i need not have been for miss galindo was not in the least altered her nose a little redder to be sure but then that might only have been a temporary cause in the private crying i know she would have had before coming to see her dear lady ludlow once again but i could almost have pushed miss galindo away as she intercepted me in my view of the mysterious miss bessie miss bessie was as i knew only about eighteen but she looked older dark hair dark eyes a tall firm figure a good sensible face with a serene expression not in the least disturbed by what i had been thinking must be such an awful circumstances as a first introduction to my lady who had so disapproved of her very existence those are the clearest impressions i remember of my first interview with miss bessie she seemed to observe us all in her quiet manner quite as much as i did her but she spoke very little occupied herself indeed as my lady had planned with looking over the great books of engravings i think i must have foolishly intended to make her feel at her ease by my patronage but she was seated far away from my sofa in order to command the light and really seemed so unconcerned at her unwanted circumstances that she did not need my countenance or kindness one thing i did like her watchful look at miss galindo from time to time it showed that her thoughts and sympathy were ever at miss galindo's service as indeed they well might be when miss bessie spoke her voice was full and clear and what she said to the purpose though there was a slight provincial accent in her way of speaking after a while my lady set us two to play at chess a game which i had lately learnt at mr gray's suggestion still we did not talk much together though we were becoming attracted towards each other i fancy you will play well said she you have only learnt about six months have you and yet you can nearly beat me who have been at it as many years i began to learn last november i remember mr gray's bringing me philidor on chess one very foggy dismal day what made her look up so suddenly with bright inquiry in her eyes what made her silent for a moment as if in thought and then go on with something i know not what in quite an altered tone my lady and miss galindo went on talking while i sat thinking I heard Captain James's name mentioned pretty frequently, and at last my lady put down her work and said, almost with tears in her eyes, I could not, I cannot believe it. He must be aware she is a schismatic, a baker's daughter, and he is a gentleman by virtue and feeling as well as by his profession, though his manners may be at times a little rough. My dear Miss Galindo, what will this world come to? Miss Galindo might possibly be aware of her own share in bringing the world to pass which now dismayed my lady, for of course, though all was now over and forgiven, yet Miss Bessie's being received into a respectable maiden lady's house was one of the portents as to the world's future which alarmed her ladyship, and Miss Galindo knew this, but at any rate she had too lately been forgiven herself not to plead for mercy for the next offender against my lady's delicate sense of fitness and propriety so she replied indeed my lady i have long left off trying to conjecture what makes jack fancy jill or jill jack it's best to sit down quiet under the belief that marriages are made for us somewhere out of this world and out of the range of this world's reasons and laws i'm not so sure that i should settle it down that they were made in heaven t'other place seems to me as likely a workshop but at any rate i've given up troubling my head as to why they take place captain james is a gentleman i make no doubt of that ever since i saw him stop to pick up old goody blake 
when she tumbled down on the slide last winter and then swear at a little lad who was laughing at her and cuff him till he tumbled down crying but we must have bread somehow and though i like it better baked at home in a good sweet brick oven yet as some folk never can get it to rise i don't see why a man may not be a baker you see my lady i look upon baking as a simple trade and as such lawful there is no machine comes in to take away a man's or a woman's power of earning their living like the spinning jenny the old busybody that she is to knock up all our good old woman's livelihood and send them to their graves before their time there's an invention of the enemy if you will that's very true said my lady shaking her head but baking bread is wholesome straightforward elbow work they have not got to inventing any contrivance for that yet thank heaven it does not seem to me natural nor according to scripture that iron and steel whose brows can't sweat should be made to do man's work and so i say all those trades where iron and steel do the work ordained by man at the fall are unlawful and i never stand up for them but say this baker brook did need his bread and made it rise and then that people who had perhaps no good ovens came to him and bought his good light bread and in this manner he turned an honest penny and got rich why all i say my lady is this i dare say he would have been born a hanbury or a lord if he could and if he was not it is no fault of his that i can see that he made good bread being a baker by trade and got money and bought his land it was his misfortune not his fault that he was not a person of quality by birth that's very true said my lady after a moment's pause for consideration but although he was a baker he might have been a churchman even your eloquence miss galindo shan't convince me that that is not his own fault i don't see even that begging your pardon my lady said miss galindo emboldened by the first success of her eloquence when a baptist is a baby if i understand their creed aright he is not baptized and consequently he can have no godfathers and godmothers to do anything for him in his baptism you agree to that my lady my lady would rather have known what her acquiescence would lead to before acknowledging that she could not dissent from this first proposition still she gave her tacit agreement by bowing her head and you know our godfathers and godmothers are expected to promise and vow three things in our name when we are little babies and can do nothing but squall for ourselves it is a great privilege but don't let us be hard upon those who have not had the chance of godfathers and godmothers some people we know are born with silver spoons that's to say a godfather to give one things and teach one's catechism and see that we're confirmed into good church-going christians and others with wooden ladles in their mouths these poor last folks must just be content to be godfatherless orphans and dissenters all their lives and if they are tradespeople into the bargain so much the worse for them but let us be humble christians my dear lady and not hold our heads too high because we were born orthodox quality you go on too fast miss galindo i can't follow you besides i do believe dissent to be an invention of the devils why can't they believe as we do it's very wrong besides it's schism and heresy and you know the bible says that's as bad as witchcraft my lady was not convinced as i could see after miss galindo had gone she sent mrs medlicott for certain books out of the great old library upstairs and had them made up into a parcel under her own eye if captain james comes to-morrow i will speak to him about these brooks i have not hitherto liked to speak to him because i did not wish to hurt him by supposing there could be any truth in the reports about his intimacy with them 
but now i will try and do my duty by him and them surely this great body of divinity will bring them back to the true church i could not tell for though my lady read me over the titles i was not any the wiser as to their contents besides i was much more anxious to consult my lady as to my own change of place i showed her the letter i had that day received from harry and we once more talked over the expediency of my going to live with him and trying what entire change of air would do to re-establish my failing health i could say anything to my lady she was so sure to understand me rightly for one thing she never thought of herself so i had no fear of hurting her by stating the truth i told her how happy my years had been while passed under her roof but that now i had begun to wonder whether i had not duties elsewhere in making a home for harry and whether the fulfilment of these duties quiet ones they must needs be in the case of such a cripple as myself would not prevent my sinking into the querulous habit of thinking and talking into which i found myself occasionally falling add to which there was the prospect of benefit from the more bracing air of the north it was then settled that my departure from hanbury my happy home for so long was to take place before many weeks had passed and as when one period of life is about to be shut up for ever we are sure to look back upon it with fond regret so i happy enough in my future prospects could not avoid recurring to all the days of my life in the hall from the time when i came to it a shy awkward girl scarcely past childhood to now when a grown woman past childhood almost from the very character of my illness past youth i was looking forward to leaving my lady's house as a residence for ever as it has turned out i never saw either her or it again like a piece of sea wreck i have drifted away from those days quiet happy eventless days very happy to remember i thought of good jovial mr mountford and his regrets that he might not keep a pack a very small pack of harriers and his merry ways and his love of good eating of the first coming of mr gray and my lady's attempt to quench his sermons when they tended to enforce any duty connected with education and now we had an absolute schoolhouse in the village and since miss bessie's drinking tea at the hall my lady had been twice inside it to give directions about some fine yarn she was having spun for table napery and her ladyship had so outgrown her old custom of dispensing with sermon or discourse that even during the temporary preaching of mr cross she had never had recourse to it though i believe she would have had all the congregation on her side if she had and mr horner was dead and captain james reigned in his stead good steady severe silent mr horner with his clock-like regularity and his snuff-coloured clothes and silver buckles i have often wondered which one misses most when they are dead and gone the bright creatures full of life who are hither and thither and everywhere so that no one can reckon upon their coming and going with whom stillness and the long quiet of the grave seem utterly irreconcilable so full are they of vivid motion and passion or the slow serious people whose movements nay whose very words seem to go by clockwork who never appear much to affect the course of our life while they are with us but whose methodical ways show themselves when they are gone to have been intertwined with our very roots of daily existence i think i miss these last the most although i may have loved the former best captain james never was to me what mr horner was though the latter had hardly changed a dozen words with me at the day of his death then miss galindo i remembered the time as if it had been only yesterday when she was but a name and a very odd one to me then she was a queer abrupt disagreeable busy old maid now i loved her dearly 
and I found out that I was almost jealous of Miss Bessie. Mr. Gray I never thought of with love. The feeling was almost reverence with which I looked upon him. I have not wished to speak much of myself, or else I could have told you how much he had been to me during these long, weary years of illness. But he was almost as much to everyone, rich and poor, from my lady down to Miss Galindo's Sally. The village, too, had a different look about it. I am sure I could not tell you what caused the change, but there were no more lounging young men to form a group at the crossroad, at a time of day when young men ought to be at work. I don't say this was all Mr. Gray's doing, for there really was so much to do in the fields that there was but little time for lounging nowadays, and the children were hushed up in school, and better behaved out of it, too, than in the days when I used to be able to go on my lady's errands in the village. I went so little about now, that I am sure I can't tell who Miss Galindo found to scold, and yet she looked so well and so happy, that I think she must have had her accustomed portion of that wholesome exercise. Before I left Hanbury, the rumour that Captain James was going to marry Miss Brooke, Baker Brooke's eldest daughter, who had only a sister to share his property with, was confirmed. He himself announced it to my lady. Nay, more, with a courage, gained, I suppose, in his former profession, where, as I have heard, he had led his ship into many a post of danger. He asked her ladyship, the Countess Ludlow, if he might bring his bride-elect, the Baptist baker's daughter, and present her to my lady. I am glad I was not present when he made this request. I should have felt so much ashamed for him, and I could not have helped being anxious till I heard my lady's answer, if I had been there. Of course, she acceded, but I can fancy the grave surprise of her look. I wonder if Captain James noticed it. I hardly dared ask my lady, after the interview had taken place, what she thought of the bride-elect. But I hinted my curiosity, and she told me, that if the young person had applied to Mrs. Medlicott for the situation of cook, and Mrs. Medlicott had engaged her, she thought that it would have been a very suitable arrangement. I understood from this how little she thought her marriage with Captain James R.N. suitable. About a year after I left Hanbury, I received a letter from Miss Galindo. I think I can find it. Yes, this is it. Hanbury, May 4th, 1811 Dear Margaret, You ask for news of us all. Don't you know there is no news in Hanbury? Did you ever hear of an event here? Now, if you have answered yes in your own mind to these questions, you have fallen into my trap, and never were more mistaken in your life. Hanbury is full of news, and we have more events on our hands than we know what to do with. I will take them in the order of the newspapers, births, deaths, and marriages. In the matter of births, Jenny Lucas has had twins not a week ago. Sadly, too much of a good thing, you'll say. Very true. But then they died, so their birth did not much signify. My cat has kittened, too. She has had three kittens, which again, you may observe, is too much of a good thing. And so it would be, if it were not for the next item of intelligence I shall lay before you. Captain and Mrs. James have taken the old house near Pearson's, and the house is overrun with mice, which is just as fortunate for me as the King of Egypt's rat-ridden kingdom was to Dick Whittington. For my cat's kittening decided me to go and call on the bride, in hopes she wanted a cat, which she did like a sensible woman, as I do believe she is, in spite of baptism, bakers, bread, and Birmingham, and something worse than all, which you shall hear about, if you'll only be patient. As I had got my best bonnet on, 
the one I bought when poor Lord Ludlow was last at Hanbury in ninety nine, I thought it a great condescension in myself, always remembering the date of the Galindo baronetcy, to go and call on the bride, though I don't think so much of myself in my everyday clothes, as you know. But who should I find there but my Lady Ludlow? She looks as frail and delicate as ever, but is, I think, in better heart ever since that old city merchant of a Hanbury took it into his head that he was a cadet of the Hanburys of Hanbury and left her that handsome legacy. I'll warrant you that the mortgage was paid off pretty fast, and Mr. Horner's money, or my lady's money, or Harry Gregson's money, call it which you will, is invested in his name, all right and tight, and they do talk of his being captain of his school, or Grecian, or something, and going to college after all. Harry Gregson, the poacher's son, well, to be sure, we are living in strange times. But I have not done with the marriages yet. Captain James's is all very well, but no one cares for it now. We are all so full of Mr. Gray's. Yes, indeed. Mr. Gray is going to be married, and to nobody else but my little Bessie. I tell her she will have to nurse him half the days of her life. He is such a frail little body. But she says she does not care for that, so that his body holds his soul, it is enough for her. She has a good spirit and a brave heart, has my Bessie. It is a great advantage that she won't have to mark her clothes over again. For when she had knitted herself her last set of stockings, I told her to put G for Galindo, if she did not choose to put it for Gibson. For she should be my child if she was no one else's. And now, you see, it stands for Grey. So there are two marriages, and what more would you have? and she promises to take another of my kittens. Now as to deaths. Old farmer Hale is dead, poor old man. I should think his wife thought it a good riddance, for he beat her every day that he was drunk, and he was never sober, in spite of Mr. Gray. I don't think, as I tell him, that Mr. Gray would ever have found courage to speak to Bessie as long as farmer Hale lived. He took the old gentleman's sins so much to heart, and seemed to think it was all his fault for not being able to make a sinner into a saint. The parish bull is dead too. I never was so glad in my life. But they say we are to have a new one in his place. In the meantime I cross the common in peace, which is very convenient just now, when I have so often to go to Mr. Gray's to see about furnishing. Now you think I have told you all the Hanbury news, don't you? Not so. The very greatest thing of all is to come. I won't tantalize you, but just out with it, for you would never guess it. My Lady Ludlow has given a party, just like any plebeian amongst us. We had tea and toast in the blue drawing room, old John Footman waiting with Tom Diggles, the lad that used to frighten away crows in Farmer Hale's fields, following in my lady's livery, hair powdered and everything. Mrs. Medlicott made tea in my lady's own room. My lady looked like a splendid fairy queen of mature age, in black velvet and the old lace, which I have never seen her wear before since my lord's death. But the company, you'll say, why? We had the parson of Clover, and the parson of Headley, and the parson of Merrybank, and the three parsonesses, and Farmer Donkin, and the two Miss Donkins, and Mr. Gray, of course, and myself, and Bessie, and Captain and Mrs. James, yes, and Mr. and Mrs. Brooke, think of that. I am not sure the parsons liked it, but he was there, for he had been helping Captain James to get my lady's land into order and then his daughter married the agent, and Mr. Gray, who ought to know, says that, after all, Baptists are not such bad people, and he was right against them at one time, as you may remember. Mrs. Brooke is a rough diamond, to be sure. People have said that of me, I know, but being a Galindo, I learnt manners in my youth, 
and can take them up when I choose. But Mrs. Brooke never learnt manners, I'll be bound. When John Footman handed her the tray with the teacups, she looked up at him as if she was sorely puzzled by that way of going on. I was sitting next to her, so I pretended not to see her perplexity, and put her cream and sugar in for her, and was all ready to pop it into her hands, when who should come up but that impudent lad Tom Diggles. I call him lad, for all his hair is powdered, for you know that it is not natural grey hair, with his tray full of cakes and what not, all as good as Mrs. Medlicott could make them. By this time, I should tell you, all the parsonesses were looking at Mrs. Brooke, for she had shown her want of breeding before, and the parsonesses, who were just a step above her in manners, were very much inclined to smile at her doings and sayings. Well, what does she do but pull out a clean bandana pocket handkerchief, all red and yellow silk, spread it over her best silk gown. It was, like enough, a new one, for I had it from Sally, who had it from her cousin Molly, who is a dairy woman at the Brooks's, that the Brookses were mighty set up with an invitation to drink tea at the hall. There we were, Tom Diggles even on the grin. I wonder how long it is since he was own brother to a scarecrow, only not so decently dressed. And Mrs. Parsoness of Headley, I forget her name, and it's no matter, for she's an ill-bred creature. I hope Bessie will behave herself better. Was right down bursting with laughter and as near a hee-haw as ever a donkey was. When what does my lady do? Aye, there's my own dear Lady Ludlow, God bless her. She takes out her own pocket-handkerchief, all snowy cambric, and lays it softly down upon her velvet lap, for all the world as if she did it every day of her life, just like Mrs. Brooke the baker's wife. And when the one got up to shake the crumbs into the fireplace, the other did just the same but with such grace, and such a look at us all. Tom Diggles went red all over, and Mrs. Parsoness of Headley scarce spoke for the rest of the evening, and the tears came into my old silly eyes, and Mr. Gray, who was before silent and awkward in a way which I tell Bessie she must cure him of, was made so happy by this pretty action of my lady's that he talked away all the rest of the evening and was the life of the company. Oh, Margaret Dawson, I sometimes wonder if you're the better off for leaving us. To be sure, you're with your brother, and blood is blood. But when I look at my lady and Mr. Gray, for all they're so different, I would not change places with any in England. Alas, alas, I never saw my dear lady again. She died in 1814, and Mr. Gray did not long survive her. As I dare say you know, the Reverend Henry Gregson is now vicar of Hanbury, and his wife is the daughter of Mr. Gray and Miss Bessie. As any one may guess, it had taken Mrs. Dawson several Monday evenings to narrate all this history of the days of her youth. Miss Duncan thought it would be a good exercise for me, both in memory and composition, to write out on Tuesday mornings all that I had heard the night before, and thus it came to pass that I have the manuscript of My Lady Ludlow, now lying by me. End of My Lady Ludlow An Accursed Race Mr. Dawson had often come in and out of the room during the time that his sister had been telling us about Lady Ludlow. He would stop and listen a little, and smile or sigh, as the case might be. The Monday after the dear old lady had wound up her tale, if tale it could be called, we felt rather at a loss what to talk about. We had grown so accustomed to listen to Mrs. Dawson. I remember I was saying, Oh dear, I wish someone would tell us another story. When her brother said, as if in answer to my speech, 
that he had drawn up a paper all ready for the philosophical society and that perhaps we might care to hear it before it was sent off it was in a great measure compiled from a french book published by one of the academies and rather dry in itself but to which mr dawson's attention had been directed after a tour he had made in england during the past year in which he had noticed small walled-up doors in unusual parts of some old parish churches and had been told that they had formerly been appropriated to the use of some half-heathen race who before the days of gypsies held the same outcast pariah position in most of the countries of western europe mr dawson had been recommended to the french book which he named as containing the fullest and most authentic account of this mysterious race the cagots i did not think i should like hearing this paper as much as a story but of course as he meant it kindly we were bound to submit and i found it on the whole more interesting than i anticipated an accursed race we have our prejudices in england or if that assertion offends any of my readers i will modify it we have had our prejudices in england we have tortured jews we have burnt catholics and protestants to say nothing of a few witches and wizards we have satirized puritans and we have dressed up guys but after all i do not think we have been so bad as our continental friends to be sure our insular position has kept us free to a certain degree from the inroads of alien races who driven from one land of refuge steal into another equally unwilling to receive them and where for long centuries their presence is barely endured and no pains is taken to conceal the repugnance which the natives of pure blood experience towards them there yet remains a remnant of the miserable people called cagos in the valleys of the pyrenees in the landes near bordeaux and stretching up on the west side of france their numbers becoming larger in lower brittany even now the origin of these families is a word of shame to them among their neighbours although they are protected by the law which confirmed them in the equal rights of citizens about the end of the last century before then they had lived for hundreds of years isolated from all those who boasted of pure blood and they had been all this time oppressed by cruel local edicts they were truly what they were popularly called the accursed race all distinct traces of their origin are lost even at the close of that period which we call the middle ages this was a problem which no one could solve and as the traces which even then were faint and uncertain have vanished away one by one it is a complete mystery at the present day why they were accursed in the first instance why isolated from their kind no one knows from the earliest accounts of their state that are yet remaining to us it seems that the names which they gave each other were ignored by the population they lived amongst who spoke of them as crestia or cagos just as we speak of animals by their generic names their houses or huts were always placed at some distance out of the villages of the country folk who unwillingly called in the services of the cagos as carpenters or tilers or slaters trades which seemed appropriated by this unfortunate race who were forbidden to occupy land or to bear arms the usual occupations of those times they had some small right of pasturage on the common lands and in the forests but the number of their cattle and livestock was strictly limited by the earliest laws relating to the cargoes they were forbidden by one act to have more than twenty sheep a pig a ram and six geese the pig was to be fattened and killed for winter food the fleece of the sheep was to clothe them but if the said sheep had lambs they were forbidden to eat them their only privilege arising from this increase was that they might choose out the strongest and finest in preference to keeping the old sheep at martinmas 
the authorities of the commune came round and counted over the stock of each cargo if he had more than his appointed number they were forfeited half went to the commune and half to the bailey or chief magistrate of the commune the poor beasts were limited as to the amount of common land which they might stray over in search of grass while the cattle of the inhabitants of the commune might wander hither and thither in search of the sweetest herbage the deepest shade or the coolest pool in which to stand on the hot days and lazily switch their dappled sides the cago sheep and pig had to learn imaginary bounds beyond which if they strayed any one might snap them up and kill them reserving a part of the flesh for his own use but graciously restoring the inferior parts to their original owner any damage done by the sheep was however fairly appraised and the cago paid no more for it than any other man would have done did a cago leave his poor cabin and venture into the towns even to render services required of him in the way of his trade he was bidden by all the municipal laws to stand by and remember his rude old state in all the towns and villages in the large districts extending on both sides of the pyrenees in all that part of spain they were forbidden to buy or sell anything eatable to walk in the middle esteemed the better part of the streets to come within the gates before sunrise or to be found after sunset within the walls of the town but still as the cagos were good-looking men and although they bore certain natural marks of their caste of which i shall speak by and by were not easily distinguished by casual passers-by from other men they were compelled to wear some distinctive peculiarity which should arrest the eye and in the greater number of towns it was decreed that the outward sign of a cago should be a piece of red cloth sewed conspicuously on the front of his dress in other towns the mark of cagoterie was the foot of a duck or a goose hung over their left shoulder so as to be seen by any one meeting them after a time the more convenient badge of a piece of yellow cloth cut out in the shape of a duck's foot was adopted if any cargo was found in any town or village without his badge he had to pay a fine of five sous and to lose his dress he was expected to shrink away from any passer-by for fear that their clothes should touch each other or else to stand still in some corner or by-place if the cagos were thirsty during the day in which they passed in those towns where their presence was barely suffered they had no means of quenching their thirst for they were forbidden to enter into the little cabarets or taverns even the water gushing out of the common fountain was prohibited to them far away in their own squalid village there was the cago fountain and they were not allowed to drink of any other water a cago woman having to make purchases in the town was liable to be flogged out of it if she went to buy anything except on a monday a day on which all other people who could kept their houses for fear of coming in contact with the accursed race in the pay basque the prejudices and for some time the laws ran stronger against them than any which i have hitherto mentioned the basque cago was not allowed to possess sheep he might keep a pig for provision but his pig had no right of pasturage he might cut and carry grass for the ass which was the only other animal he was permitted to own and this ass was permitted because its existence was rather an advantage to the oppressor who constantly availed himself of the cago's mechanical skill and was glad to have him and his tools easily conveyed from one place to another the race was repulsed by the state under the small local governments they could hold no post whatsoever and they were barely tolerated by the church although they were good catholics and zealous frequenters of the mass they might only enter the churches by a small door set apart for them through which no one of the pure race ever passed this door was low so as to compel them to make an obeisance it was occasionally surrounded by sculpture 
which invariably represented an oak branch with a dove above it. When they were once in, they might not go to the holy water used by others. They had a bentier of their own, nor were they allowed to share in the consecrated bread when that was handed round to the believers of the pure race. The cagos stood afar off near the door. There were certain boundaries, imaginary lines, on the nave and in the aisles which they might not pass. In one or two of the more tolerant of the Pyrenean villages, the blessed bread was offered to the cagos, the priest standing on one side of the boundary and giving the pieces of bread on a long wooden fork to each person successively. When the cago died, he was interred apart in a plot of burying ground on the north side of the cemetery. Under such laws and prescriptions as I have described, it is no wonder that he was generally too poor to have much property for his children to inherit. But certain descriptions of it were forfeited to the commune, the only possession which all who were not of his own race refused to touch was his furniture. That was tainted, infectious, unclean, fit for none but cargoes. When such were, for at least three centuries, the prevalent usages and opinions with regard to the suppressed race, it is not surprising that we read of occasional outbursts of ferocious violence on their part. In the Basse Pyrenees, for instance, it is only about a hundred years since that the Cagos of Rehuil rose up against the inhabitants of their neighbouring town of Lourdes, and got the better of them by their magical powers, as it is said. The people of Lourdes were conquered and slain, and their ghastly, bloody heads served the triumphant cagos for balls to play at ninepins with. The local parliaments had begun, by this time, to perceive how oppressive was the ban of public opinion under which the cagos lay, and were not inclined to enforce too severe a punishment. Accordingly, the decree of the Parliament of Toulouse condemned only the leading cagos concerned in this affray to be put to death, and that henceforward and forever no cago was to be permitted to enter the town of Lourdes by any gate but that called Capet Poutet. They were only to be allowed to walk under the rain gutters and neither to sit, eat, nor drink in the town. If they failed in observing any of these rules, the Parliament decreed, in the spirit of Shylock, that the disobedient cagos should have two strips of flesh, weighing never more than two ounces apiece, cut out from each side of their spines. In the fourteenth, fifteenth, and sixteenth centuries, it was considered no more a crime to kill a cago than to destroy obnoxious vermin. A nest of cagos, as the old accounts phrase it, had assembled in a deserted castle of Mauvaisin about the year 1600. And, certainly, they made themselves not very agreeable neighbours, as they seemed to enjoy their reputation of magicians, and, by some acoustic secrets which were known to them, all sorts of moanings and groanings were heard in the neighbouring forests, very much to the alarm of the good people of the pure race, who could not cut off a withered branch for firewood, but some unearthly sound seemed to fill the air, nor drink water which was not poisoned, because the cagos would persist in filling their pitchers at the same running stream. Added to these grievances, the various pilferings perpetually going on in the neighbourhood made the inhabitants of the adjacent towns and hamlets believe that they had a very sufficient cause for wishing to murder all the cagos in the Chateau de Mauvaisin. But it was surrounded by a moat, and only accessible by a drawbridge, besides which the cagos were fierce and vigilant. Someone, however, proposed to get into their confidence, and for this purpose he pretended to fall ill close to their path, so that on returning to their stronghold they perceived him, and took him in, restored him to health, and made a friend of him. One day, when they were all playing at ninepins in the woods, their treacherous friend left the party on pretense of being thirsty, 
and went back into the castle drawing up the bridge after he had passed over it and so cutting off their means of escape into safety then going up into the highest part of the castle he blew a horn and the pure race who were lying in wait on the watch for some such signal fell upon the cargoes at their games and slew them all for this murder i find no punishment decreed in the parliament of toulouse or elsewhere as any intermarriage with the pure race was strictly forbidden and as there were books kept in every commune in which the names and habitations of the reputed cargoes were written these unfortunate people had no hope of ever becoming blended with the rest of the population did a cago marriage take place the couple were serenaded with satirical songs they also had minstrels and many of their romances are still current in brittany but they did not attempt to make any reprisals of satire or abuse their disposition was amiable and their intelligence great indeed it required both these qualities and their great love of mechanical labour to make their lives tolerable at last they began to petition that they might receive some protection from the laws and towards the end of the seventeenth century the judicial power took their side but they gained little by this law could not prevail against custom and in the ten or twenty years just preceding the first french revolution the prejudice in france against the cargoes amounted to fierce and positive abhorrence at the beginning of the sixteenth century the cargoes of navarre complained to the pope that they were excluded from the fellowship of men and accursed by the church because their ancestors had given help to a certain count raymond of toulouse in his revolt against the holy see they entreated his holiness not to visit upon them the sins of their fathers the pope issued a bull on the thirteenth of may fifteen hundred and fifteen ordering them to be well treated and to be admitted to the same privileges as other men he charged don juan de santa maria of pampeluna to see to the execution of this bull but don juan was slow to help and the poor spanish cargoes grew impatient and resolved to try the secular power they accordingly applied to the cortes of navarre and were opposed on a variety of grounds first it was stated that their ancestors had had nothing to do with raymond count of toulouse or with any such knightly personage that they were in fact descended of gehazi servant of elisha second book of kings fifth chapter twenty seventh verse who had been accursed by his master for his fraud upon naaman and doomed he and his descendants to be lepers for evermore name cargoes or gahets gahets gehazites what can be more clear and if that is not enough and you tell us that the cargoes are not lepers now we reply that there are two kinds of leprosy one perceptible and the other imperceptible even to the person suffering from it besides it is the country talk that where the cargo treads the grass withers proving the unnatural heat of his body many credible and trustworthy witnesses will also tell you that if a cargo holds a freshly gathered apple in his hand it will shrivel and wither up in an hour's time as much as if it had been kept for a whole winter in a dry room they are born with tails although the parents are cunning enough to pinch them off immediately do you doubt this if it is not true why do the children of the pure race delight in sewing on sheep's tails to the dress of any cargo who is so absorbed in his work as not to perceive them and their bodily smell is so horrible and detestable that it shows that they must be heretics of some vile and pernicious description for do we not read of the incense of good workers and the fragrance of holiness such were literally the arguments by which the cargoes were thrown back into a worse position than ever as far as regards their rights as citizens the pope insisted that they should receive all their ecclesiastical privileges the spanish priests said nothing 
but tacitly refused to allow the cargoes to mingle with the rest of the faithful either dead or alive the accursed race obtained laws in their favour from the emperor charles v which however there was no one to carry into effect as a sort of revenge for their want of submission and for their impertinence in daring to complain their tools were all taken away from them by the local authorities an old man and all his family died of starvation being no longer allowed to fish they could not emigrate even to remove their poor mud habitations from one spot to another excited anger and suspicion to be sure in sixteen hundred and ninety five the spanish government ordered the alcades to search out all the cargoes and to expel them before two months had expired under pain of having fifty ducats to pay for every cargo remaining in spain at the expiration of that time the inhabitants of the villages rose up and flogged out any of the miserable race who might be in their neighbourhood but the french were on their guard against this enforced eruption and refused to permit them to enter france numbers were hunted up into the inhospitable pyrenees and there died of starvation or became a prey to wild beasts they were obliged to wear both gloves and shoes when they were thus put to flight otherwise the stones and herbage they trod upon and the balustrades of the bridges that they handled in crossing would according to popular belief have become poisonous and all this time there was nothing remarkable or disgusting in the outward appearance of this unfortunate people there was nothing about them to countenance the idea of their being lepers the most natural mode of accounting for the abhorrence in which they were held they were repeatedly examined by learned doctors whose experiments although singular and rude appear to have been made in the spirit of humanity for instance the surgeons of the king of navarre in sixteen hundred bled twenty-two cargoes in order to examine and analyse their blood they were young and healthy people of both sexes and the doctors seemed to have expected that they should have been able to extract some new kind of salt from their blood which might account for the wonderful heat of their bodies but their blood was just like that of other people some of these medical men have left us a description of the general appearance of this unfortunate race at a time when they were more numerous and less intermixed than they are now the families existing in the south and west of france who are reputed to be of cago descent at this day are like their ancestors tall largely made and powerful in frame fair and ruddy in complexion with grey-blue eyes in which some observers see a pensive heaviness of look their lips are thick but well formed some of the reports name their sad expression of countenance with surprise and suspicion they are not gay like other folk the wonder would be if they were dr Gouillon, the medical man of the last century who has left the clearest report on the health of the cargoes speaks of the vigorous old age they attain to in one family alone he found a man of seventy-four years of age a woman as old gathering cherries and another woman aged eighty-three was lying on the grass having her hair combed by her great-grandchildren dr Gouillon and the other surgeons examined into the subject of the horribly infectious smell which the cargoes were said to leave behind them and upon everything they touched but they could perceive nothing unusual on this head they also examined their ears which according to common belief a belief existing to this day were differently shaped from those of other people being round and gristly without the lobe of flesh into which the earring is inserted they decided that most of the cargoes whom they examined had the ears of this round shape but they gravely added that they saw no reason why this should exclude them from the good will of men and from the power of holding office in church and state they recorded the fact that the children of the towns ran buying after any cargo who had been compelled to come into the streets to make purchases 
in allusion to this peculiarity of the shape of the ear which bore some resemblance to the ears of the sheep as they are cut by the shepherds in this district dr Gouillon names the case of a beautiful cargo girl who sang most sweetly and prayed to be allowed to sing canticles in the organ loft the organist more musician than bigot allowed her to come but the indignant congregation finding out whence proceeded that clear fresh voice rushed up to the organ loft and chased the girl out bidding her remember her ears and not commit the sacrilege of singing praises to god along with the pure race but this medical report of dr gouillon's bringing facts and arguments to confirm his opinion that there was no physical reason why the cargoes should not be received on terms of social equality by the rest of the world did no more for his clients than the legal decrees promulgated two centuries before had done the french proved the truth of the saying in hudibras he that is convinced against his will is of the same opinion still and indeed the being convinced by dr gouillon that they ought to receive cargoes as fellow-creatures only made them more rabid in declaring that they would not one or two little occurrences which are recorded show that the bitterness of the repugnance to the cargoes was in full force at the time just preceding the first french revolution there was a monsieur d'abedos the curate of lourbe and brother to the seigneur of the neighbouring castle who was living in seventeen hundred and eighty he was well educated for the time a travelled man and sensible and moderate in all respects but that of his abhorrence of the cargoes he would insult them from the very altar calling out to them as they stood afar off oh ye cargoes damned for evermore one day a half-blind cago stumbled and touched the censer borne before this abbe de lourbe he was immediately turned out of the church and forbidden ever to re-enter it one does not know how to account for the fact that the very brother of this bigoted abbe the seigneur of the village went and married a cago girl but so it was and the abbe brought a legal process against him and had his estates taken from him solely on account of his marriage which reduced him to the condition of a cargo against whom the old law was still in force the descendants of this seigneur de lourbe are simple peasants at this very day working on the lands which belonged to their grandfather this prejudice against mixed marriages remained prevalent until very lately the tradition of the cago descent lingered among the people long after the laws against the accursed race were abolished a breton girl within the last few years having two lovers each of reputed cago descent employed a notary to examine their pedigrees and see which of the two had least cago in him and to that one she gave her hand in brittany the prejudice seems to have been more virulent than anywhere else monsieur emile souvest records proofs of the hatred borne to them in brittany so recently as in eighteen hundred and thirty five just lately a baker at hennebon having married a girl of cago descent lost all his custom the godfather and godmother of a cago child became cagos themselves by the breton laws unless indeed the poor little baby died before attaining a certain number of days they had to eat the butcher's meat condemned as unhealthy but for some unknown reason they were considered to have a right to every cut loaf turned upside down with its cut side towards the door and might enter any house in which they saw a loaf in this position and carry it away with them about thirty years ago there was a skeleton of a hand hanging up as an offering in a breton church near quimperl and the tradition was that it was the hand of a rich cago who had dared to take holy water out of the usual bentier some time at the beginning of the reign of louis the sixteenth which an old soldier witnessing 
he lay in wait and the next time the offender approached the bantier he cut off his hand and hung it up dripping with blood as an offering to the patron saint of the church the poor cargoes in brittany petitioned against their opprobrious name and begged to be distinguished by the appellation of malandrins to english ears one is much the same as the other as neither conveys any meaning but to this day the descendants of the cargoes do not like to have this name applied to them preferring that of malandrin the french cargoes tried to destroy all the records of their pariah descent in the commotions of seventeen hundred and eighty nine but if writings have disappeared the tradition yet remains and points out such and such a family as cagot or malandrin or Wasselier, according to the old terms of abhorrence there are various ways in which learned men have attempted to account for the universal repugnance in which this well-made powerful race are held some say that the antipathy to them took its rise in the days when leprosy was a dreadfully prevalent disease and that the cagos are more liable than any other men to a kind of skin disease not precisely leprosy but resembling it in some of its symptoms such as a dead whiteness of complexion and swellings of the face and extremities there was also some resemblance to the ancient jewish custom in respect to lepers in the habit of the people who on meeting a cago called out cagot cagot to which they were bound to reply perlute perlute leprosy is not properly an infectious complaint in spite of the horror in which the cago furniture and the cloth woven by them are held in some places the disorder is hereditary and hence say this body of wise men who have troubled themselves to account for the origin of cagoterie the reasonableness and the justice of preventing any mixed marriage by which this terrible tendency to leprous complaints might be spread far and wide another authority says that though the cagos are fine-looking men hard-working and good mechanics yet they bear in their faces and show in their actions reasons for the detestation in which they are held their glance if you meet it is the jettatura or evil eye and they are spiteful and cruel and deceitful above all other men all these qualities they derive from their ancestor gehazi the servant of elisha together with their tendency to leprosy again it is said that they are descended from the aryan goths who were permitted to live in certain places in guyenne and languedoc after their defeat by king clovis on condition that they abjured their heresy and kept themselves separate from all other men for ever the principal reason alleged in support of this supposition of their gothic descent is the specious one of derivation chien's gots can's gots cagots equivalent to dogs of goths again they were thought to be saracens coming from syria in confirmation of this idea was the belief that all cagots were possessed by a horrible smell the lombards also were an unfragrant race also reputed among the italians witness pope stephen's letter to charlemagne dissuading him from marrying bertha daughter of didier king of lombardy the lombards boasted of eastern descent and were noisome the cagots were noisome and therefore must be of eastern descent what could be clearer in addition there was the proof to be derived from the name cago which those maintaining the opinion of their saracen descent held to be chien or chasseur de got because the saracens chased the goths out of spain moreover the saracens were originally mahometans and as such obliged to bathe seven times a day whence the badge of the duck's foot a duck was a water bird mahometans bathed in the water proof upon proof 
in brittany the common idea was they were of jewish descent their unpleasant smell was again pressed into service the jews it was well known had this physical infirmity which might be cured either by bathing in a certain fountain in egypt which was a long way from brittany or by anointing themselves with the blood of a christian child blood gushed out of the body of every cargo on good friday no wonder if they were of jewish descent it was the only way of accounting for so portentous a fact again the cargoes were capital carpenters which gave the bretons every reason to believe that their ancestors were the very jews who made the cross when first the tide of emigration set from Brittany to America, the oppressed cargoes crowded to the ports, seeking to go to some new country where their race might be unknown. Here was another proof of their descent from Abraham and his nomadic people. And the forty years wandering in the wilderness and the wandering Jew himself were pressed into the service to prove that the cargoes derived their restlessness and love of change from their ancestors the jews the jews also practised arts magic and the cagos sold bags of wind to the breton sailors enchanted maidens to love them maidens who never would have cared for them unless they had been previously enchanted made hollow rocks and trees give out strange and unearthly noises and sold the magical herb called bon Cessé it is true enough that in all the early acts of the fourteenth century the same laws apply to jews as to cargoes and the appellations seem used indiscriminately but their fair complexions their remarkable devotion to all the ceremonies of the catholic church and many other circumstances conspire to forbid our believing them to be of hebrew descent another very plausible idea is that they are the descendants of unfortunate individuals afflicted with goiters which is even to this day not an uncommon disorder in the gorges and valleys of the pyrenees some have even derived the word goiter from got or goth but their name crestia is not unlike cretin and the same symptoms of idiotism were not unusual among the cagos although sometimes if old tradition is to be credited their malady of the brain took rather the form of violent delirium which attacked them at new and full moons then the workmen laid down their tools and rushed off from their labour to play mad pranks up and down the country perpetual motion was required to alleviate the agony of fury that seized upon the cargoes at such times in this desire for rapid movement the attack resembled the neapolitan tarantella while in the mad deeds they performed during such attacks they were not unlike the northern berserker in bjarne especially those suffering from this madness were dreaded by the pure race the bernays going to cut their wooden clogs in the great forests that lay around the base of the pyrenees feared above all things to go too near the periods when the cagotel seized upon the oppressed and accursed people from whom it was then the oppressor's turn to fly a man was living within the memory of some who had married a cago wife he used to beat her right soundly when he saw the first symptoms of the cagotel and having reduced her to a wholesome state of exhaustion and insensibility he locked her up until the moon had altered her shape in the heavens if he had not taken such decided steps say the oldest inhabitants there is no knowing what might have happened from the thirteenth to the end of the nineteenth century there are facts enough to prove the universal abhorrence in which this unfortunate race was held whether called cagos or gahets in the pyrenean districts Cacur in brittany or vaqueros in asturias the great french revolution brought some good out of its fermentation of the people the more intelligent among them tried to overcome the prejudice against the cagos 
in seventeen hundred and eighteen there was a famous cause tried at biarritz relating to cargo rights and privileges there was a wealthy miller etienne arnaud by name of the race of goths quagots bisigots astragots or gahets as his people are described in the legal document he married an heiress a got or cagot of biarritz and the newly married well-to-do couple saw no reason why they should stand near the door in the church nor why he should not hold some civil office in the commune of which he was the principal inhabitant accordingly he petitioned the law that he and his wife might be allowed to sit in the gallery of the church and that he might be relieved from his civil disabilities this wealthy white miller etienne arnaud pursued his rights with some vigour against the bailey of la bourde the dignitary of the neighbourhood whereupon the inhabitants of biarritz met in the open air on the eighth of may to the number of one hundred and fifty approved of the conduct of the bailey in rejecting arnaud made a subscription and gave all power to their lawyers to defend the cause of the pure race against etienne arnaud that stranger who having married a girl of cago blood ought also to be expelled from the holy places this lawsuit was carried through all the local courts and ended by an appeal to the highest court in paris where a decision was given against basque superstition and etienne arnaud was henceforward entitled to enter the gallery of the church of course the inhabitants of biarritz were all the more ferocious for having been conquered and four years later a carpenter miguel le garret suspected of cargo descent having placed himself in church among other people was dragged out by the abbe and two of the jurats of the parish le garret defended himself with a sharp knife at the time and went to law afterwards the end of which was that the abbe and his two accomplices were condemned to a public confession of penitence to be uttered while on their knees at the church door just after high mass they appealed to the parliament of bordeaux against this decision but met with no better success than the opponents of miller arnaud legaret was confirmed in his right of standing where he would in the parish church that a living cargo had equal rights with other men in the town of biarritz seemed now ceded to them but a dead cargo was a different thing the inhabitants of pure blood struggled long and hard to be interred apart from the abhorred race the cargoes were equally persistent in claiming to have a common burying ground again the texts of the old testament were referred to and the pure blood quoted triumphantly the precedent of uzziah the leper twenty sixth chapter of the second book of chronicles who was buried in the field of the sepulchres of the kings not in the sepulchres themselves the cagos pleaded that they were healthy and able-bodied with no taint of leprosy near them they were met by the strong argument so difficult to be refuted which i have quoted before leprosy was of two kinds perceptible and imperceptible if the cagos were suffering from the latter kind who could tell whether they were free from it or not that decision must be left to the judgment of others one sturdy cargo family alone bellone by name kept up a lawsuit claiming the privilege of common sepulture for forty-two years although the cure of biarritz had to pay one hundred livres for every cargo not interred in the right place the inhabitants indemnified the curate for all these fines monsieur de romagne bishop of tarbes who died in seventeen hundred and sixty eight was the first to allow a cargo to fill any office in the church to be sure some were so spiritless as to reject office when it was offered to them because by so claiming their equality they had to pay the same taxes as other men instead of the rancale or poll tax levied on the cargoes the collector of which had also a right to claim a piece of bread of a certain size for his dog 
at every cargo dwelling even in the present century it has been necessary in some churches for the archdeacon of the district followed by all his clergy to pass out of the smaller door previously appropriated to the cagos in order to mitigate the superstition which even so lately made the people refuse to mingle with them in the house of god a cago once played the congregation at la roque a trick suggested by what i have just named he slyly locked the great parish door of the church while the greater part of the inhabitants were assisting at mass inside put gravel in the lock itself so as to prevent the use of any duplicate key and had the pleasure of seeing the proud pure-blooded people file out with bended head through the small low door used by the abhorred cagots we are naturally shocked at discovering from facts such as these the causeless rancour with which innocent and industrious people were so recently persecuted the moral of the history of the accursed race may perhaps be best conveyed in the words of an epitaph on mrs mary hand who lies buried in the churchyard of stratford on avon what faults you saw in me pray strive to shun and look at home there's something to be done for some time past i had observed that miss duncan made a good deal of occupation for herself in writing but that she did not like me to notice her employment of course this made me all the more curious and many were my silent conjectures some of them so near the truth that i was not much surprised when after mr dawson had finished reading his paper to us she hesitated coughed and abruptly introduced a little formal speech to the effect that she had noted down an old welsh story the particulars of which had often been told her in her youth as she lived close to the place where the events occurred everybody pressed her to read the manuscript which she now produced from her reticule but when on the point of beginning her nervousness seemed to overcome her and she made so many apologies for its being the first and only attempt she had ever made at that kind of composition that i began to wonder if we should ever arrive at the story at all at length in a high-pitched ill-assured voice she read out the title the doom of the griffiths the doom of the griffiths part one i have always been much interested by the traditions which are scattered up and down north wales relating to owen glendower o w a i n g l e n d w r is the national spelling of the name and i fully enter into the feeling which makes the welsh peasant still look upon him as the hero of his country there was great joy among many of the inhabitants of the principality when the subject of the welsh prize poem at oxford some fifteen or sixteen years ago was announced to be owen glendower it was the most proudly national subject that had been given for years perhaps some may not be aware that this redoubted chieftain is even in the present days of enlightenment as famous among his illiterate countrymen for his magical powers as for his patriotism he says himself or shakespeare says it for him which is much the same thing at my nativity the font of heaven was full of fiery shapes of burning cressets i can call spirits from the vasty deep and few among the lower orders in the principality would think of asking hotspur's irreverent question in reply among other traditions preserved relative to this part of the welsh hero's character is the old family prophecy which gives a title to this tale when sir david gam as black a traitor as if he had been born in builth sought to murder owen at machunthleth there was one with him whose name glendower little dreamed of having associated with his enemies rhys ap griffith 
his old familiar friend his relation his more than brother had consented unto his blood sir david gam might be forgiven but one whom he had loved and who had betrayed him could never be forgiven glendower was too deeply read in the human heart to kill him no he let him live on the loathing and scorn of his compatriots and the victim of bitter remorse the mark of cain was upon him but before he went forth while yet he stood a prisoner cowering beneath his conscience before owen glendower that chieftain passed a doom upon him and his race i doom thee to live because i know thou wilt pray for death thou shalt live on beyond the natural term of the life of man the scorn of all good men the very children shall point to thee with hissing tongue and say there goes one who would have shed a brother's blood for i loved thee more than a brother o rees ap griffith thou shalt live on to see all of thy house except the weakling in arms perish by the sword thy race shall be accursed each generation shall see their lands melt away like snow yea their wealth shall vanish though they may labour night and day to heap up gold and when nine generations have passed from the face of the earth thy blood shall no longer flow in the veins of any human being in those days the last male of thy race shall avenge me the son shall slay the father such was the traditionary account of owen glendower's speech to his once trusted friend and it was declared that the doom had been fulfilled in all things that live in as miserly a manner as they would the griffiths never were wealthy and prosperous indeed that their worldly stock diminished without any visible cause but the lapse of many years had almost deadened the wonder-inspired power of the whole curse it was only brought forth from the hordes of memory when some untoward event happened to the griffith family and in the eighth generation the faith in the prophecy was nearly destroyed by the marriage of the griffith of that day to a miss owen who unexpectedly by the death of her brother became an heiress to no considerable amount to be sure but enough to make the prophecy appear reversed the heiress and her husband removed from his small patrimonial estate in merinethshire to her heritage in carnarvonshire and for a time the prophecy lay dormant if you go from tremadoc to crickaith you pass by the parochial church of anisan hanarn situated in a boggy valley running from the mountains which shoulder up to the rivals down to cardigan bay this tract of land has every appearance of having been redeemed at no distant period of time from the sea and has all the desolate rankness often attendant upon such marshes but the valley beyond similar in character had yet more of gloom at the time of which i write in the higher part there were large plantations of firs set too closely to attain to any size and remaining stunted in height and scrubby in appearance indeed many of the smaller and more weakly had died and the bark had fallen down on the brown soil neglected and unnoticed these trees had a ghastly appearance with their white trunks seen by the dim light which struggled through the thick boughs above nearer to the sea the valleys assumed a more open though hardly a more cheerful character it looked dank and overhung by sea fog through the greater part of the year and even a farmhouse which usually imparts something of cheerfulness to a landscape failed to do so here this valley formed the greater part of the estate to which owen griffiths became entitled by right of his wife in the higher part of the valley was situated the family mansion or rather dwelling-house for mansion is too grand a word to apply to the clumsy but substantially built bodoan it was square and heavy-looking with just that much pretension to ornament necessary to distinguish it from mere farmhouse in this dwelling mrs owen griffiths bore her husband two sons 
Llewellyn, the future squire, and Robert, who was early destined for the church. The only difference in their situation up to the time when Robert was entered at Jesus College was that the elder was invariably indulged by all around him, while Robert was thwarted and indulged by turns. That Llewellyn never learnt anything from the poor Welsh parson who was nominally his private tutor, while occasionally Squire Griffiths made a great point of enforcing Robert's diligence, telling him that, as he had his bread to earn, he must pay attention to his learning. There is no knowing how far the very irregular education he had received would have carried Robert through his college examinations. But, luckily for him, in this respect, before such a trial of his learning came round, he heard of the death of his elder brother, after a short illness, brought on by a hard drinking bout. Of course, Robert was summoned home, and it seemed quite as much of course now that there was no necessity for him to earn his bread by learning, that he should not return to Oxford. So the half-educated but not unintelligent young man continued at home during the short remainder of his parents' lifetime. His was not an uncommon character. In general he was mild, indolent, and easily managed. But once thoroughly roused, his passions were vehement and fearful. He seemed, indeed, almost afraid of himself, and in common hardly dared to give way to justifiable anger. So much did he dread losing his self-control. Had he been judiciously educated, he would probably have distinguished himself in those branches of literature which call for taste and imagination, rather than any exertion of reflection or judgment. As it was, his literary taste showed itself in making collections of Cambrian antiquities of every description, till his stock of Welsh manuscripts would have excited the envy of Dr. Pugh himself, had he been alive at the time of which I write. There is one characteristic of Robert Griffiths which I have omitted to note, and which was peculiar among his class. He was no hard drinker. Whether it was that his head was very easily affected, or that his partially refined taste led him to dislike intoxication and its attendant circumstances, I cannot say. But at five-and-twenty, Robert Griffiths was habitually sober, a thing so rare in Thin that he was almost shunned as a churlish, unsocial being, and passed much of his time in solitude. About this time he had to appear in some case that was tried at the Carnarvon Assizes, and while there was a guest at the house of his agent, a shrewd, sensible Welsh attorney, with one daughter, who had charms enough to captivate Robert Griffiths. Though he remained only a few days at her father's house, they were sufficient to decide his affections, and short was the period allowed to elapse before he brought home a mistress to Bodoan. The new Mrs. Griffiths was a gentle, yielding person, full of love toward her husband, of whom, nevertheless, she stood something in awe, partly arising from the differences in their ages, partly from his devoting much time to studies of which she could understand nothing. She soon made him the father of a blooming little daughter, called Aig Harad, after her mother. Then there came several uneventful years in the household of Bodoan, and when the old women had one and all declared that the cradle would not rock again, Mrs. Griffiths bore the son and heir. His birth was soon followed by his mother's death. She had been ailing and low-spirited during her pregnancy, and she seemed to lack the buoyancy of body and mind requisite to bring her round after her time of trial. Her husband, who loved her all the more from having few other claims on his affections, was deeply grieved by her early death, and his only comforter was the sweet little boy whom she had left behind. That part of the squire's character, which was so tender and almost feminine, seemed called forth by the helpless situation of the little infant, who stretched out his arms to his father with the same earnest cooing that happier children make use of to their mother alone. 
Eigharad was almost neglected, while the little Owen was king of the house. Still, next to his father, none tended him so lovingly as his sister. She was so accustomed to give way to him that it was no longer a hardship. By night and by day, Owen was constant companion of his father, and increasing years seemed only to confirm the custom. It was an unnatural life for the child, seeing no bright little faces peering into his own. For Eigharad was, as I said before, five or six years older, and her face, poor motherless girl, was often anything but bright. Hearing no din of clear ringing voices, but day after day sharing the otherwise solitary hours of his father, whether in the dim room, surrounded by wizard-like antiquities, or pattering his little feet to keep up with his tada, in his mountain rambles or shooting excursions. When the pair came to some little foaming brook, where the stepping-stones were far and wide, the father carried his little boy across with the tenderest care. When the lad was weary, they rested, he cradled in his father's arms, or the squire would lift him up and carry him to his home again. The boy was indulged, for his father felt flattered by the desire. In his wish of sharing his meals and keeping the same hours, all this indulgence did not render Owen unamiable, but it made him wilful and not a happy child. He had a thoughtful look, not common to the face of a young boy. He knew no games, no merry sports. His information was of an imaginative and speculative character. His father delighted to interest him in his own studies, without considering how far they were healthy for so young a mind. Of course, Squire Griffith was not unaware of the prophecy which was to be fulfilled in his generation. He would occasionally refer to it when among his friends, with sceptical levity, but in truth it lay nearer to his heart than he chose to acknowledge. His strong imagination rendered him peculiarly impressible on such subjects, while his judgment, seldom exercised or fortified by severe thought, could not prevent his continually recurring to it. He used to gaze on the half-sad countenance of the child, who sat looking up into his face with his large, dark eyes, so fondly, yet so inquiringly, till the old legend swelled around his heart, and became too painful for him not to require sympathy. Besides, the overpowering love he bore to the child seemed to demand fuller vent than tender words. It made him like, yet dread, to upbraid its object for the fearful contrast foretold. Still, Squire Griffith told the legend, in a half-jesting manner to his little son, when they were roaming over the wild heaths in the autumn days, the saddest of the year, or while they sat in the oak wainscoted room, surrounded by mysterious relics that gleamed strangely forth by the flickering firelight. The legend was wrought into the boy's mind, and he would crave, yet tremble, to hear it told over and over again, while the words were intermingled with caresses and questions as to his love. Occasionally his loving words and actions were cut short by his father's light yet bitter speech. Get thee away, my lad, thou knowest what is to come of all this love. When Eigharad was seventeen, and Owen eleven or twelve, the rector of the parish in which Badoan was situated, endeavoured to prevail on Squire Griffith to send the boy to school. Now, this rector had many congenial tastes with his parishioner, and was his only intimate, and, by repeated arguments, he succeeded in convincing the squire that the unnatural life Owen was leading was in every way injurious. Unwillingly was the father wrought to part from his son, but he did at length send him to the grammar school at Bangor, then under the management of an excellent classic. Here Owen showed that he had more talents than the rector had given him credit for, when he affirmed that the lad had been completely stupefied by the life he led at Bodoan. He bade fair to do credit to the school in the peculiar branch of learning for which it was famous, 
but he was not popular among his schoolfellows. He was wayward, though to a certain degree generous and unselfish. He was reserved but gentle, except when the tremendous bursts of passion, similar in character to those of his father, forced their way. On his return from school one Christmas time, when he had been a year or so at Bangor, he was stunned by hearing that the undervalued Aig Harad was about to be married to a gentleman of South Wales, residing near Aberystwyth. Boys seldom appreciate their sisters, but Owen thought of the many slights with which he had requited the patient Aig Harad, and he gave way to bitter regrets, which, with a selfish want of control over his words, he kept expressing to his father, until the squire was thoroughly hurt and chagrined at the repeated exclamations of, What shall we do when Aigharad is gone? How dull we shall be when Aigharad is married! Owen's holidays were prolonged a few weeks in order that he might be present at the wedding, and when all the festivities were over, and the bride and bridegroom had left but Owen, the boy and his father really felt how much they missed the quiet, loving Aigharad. She had performed so many thoughtful, noiseless little offices on which their daily comfort depended, and now she was gone. The household seemed to miss the spirit that peacefully kept it in order. The servants roamed about it in search of commands and directions. The rooms had no longer the unobtrusive ordering of taste to make them cheerful. The very fires burned dim, and were always sinking down into dull heaps of grey ashes. Altogether, Owen did not regret his return to Bangor, and this also the mortified parent perceived. Squire Griffiths was a selfish parent. Letters in those days were a rare occurrence. Owen usually received one during his half-yearly absences from home, and occasionally his father paid him a visit. This half-year the boy had no visit, nor even a letter, till very near the time of his leaving school, and then he was astounded by the intelligence that his father was married again. Then came one of his paroxysms of rage, the more disastrous in its effects upon his character, because he could find no vent in action independently of the slight to the memory of the first wife which children are so apt to fancy such an action implies owen had hitherto considered himself and with justice the first object of his father's life they had been so much to each other and now a shapeless but too real something had come between him and his father there forever he felt as if his permission should have been asked, as if he should have been consulted. Certainly he ought to have been told of the intended event. So the squire felt, and hence his constrained letter, which had so much increased the bitterness of Owen's feelings. With all this anger, when Owen saw his stepmother, he thought he had never seen so beautiful a woman for her age for she was no longer in the bloom of youth, being a widow when his father married her. Her manners to the Welsh lad, who had seen little of female grace among the families of the few antiquarians with whom his father visited, were so fascinating that he watched her with a sort of breathless admiration. Her measured grace, her faultless movements, her tones of voice, sweet, till the ear was sated with their sweetness, made Owen less angry at his father's marriage. Yet he felt, more than ever, that the cloud was between him and his father, that the hasty letter he had sent in answer to the announcement of his wedding was not forgotten, although no allusion was ever made to it. He was no longer his father's confidant, hardly ever his father's companion, for the newly married wife was all in all to the squire and his son felt himself almost a cipher where he had so long been everything the lady herself had ever the softest consideration for her stepson almost too obtrusive was the attention paid to his wishes but still he fancied that the heart had no part in the winning advances 
there was a watchful glance of the eye that owen once or twice caught when she had imagined herself unobserved and many other nameless little circumstances that gave him a strong feeling of want of sincerity in his stepmother mrs owen brought with her into the family her little child by her first husband a boy nearly three years old he was one of those selfish observant mocking children over whose feelings you seem to have no control agile and mischievous his little practical jokes at first performed in ignorance of the pain he gave but afterwards proceeding to a malicious pleasure in suffering really seemed to afford some ground to the superstitious notion of some of the common people that he was a fairy changeling years passed on and as owen grew older he became more observant he saw even in his occasional visits at home for from school he had passed on to college that a great change had taken place in the outward manifestations of his father's character and by degrees owen traced this change to the influence of his stepmother so slight so imperceptible to the common observer yet so resistless in its effects squire griffiths caught up his wife's humbly advanced opinions and unawares to himself adopted them as his own defying all argument and opposition it was the same with her wishes they met with their fulfilment from the extreme and delicate art with which she insinuated them into her husband's mind as his own she sacrificed the show of authority for the power at last when owen perceived some oppressive act in his father's conduct towards his dependents or some unaccountable thwarting of his own wishes he fancied he saw his stepmother's secret influence thus displayed however much she might regret the injustice of his father's actions in her conversations with him when they were alone his father was fast losing his temperate habits and frequent intoxication soon took its usual effect upon the temper yet even here was the spell of his wife upon him before her he placed a restraint upon his passion yet she was perfectly aware of his irritable disposition and directed it hither and thither with the same apparent ignorance of the tendency of her words meanwhile owen's situation became peculiarly mortifying to a youth whose early remembrances afforded such a contrast to his present state as a child he had been elevated to the consequence of a man before his years gave any mental check to the selfishness which such conduct was likely to engender he could remember when his will was law to the servants and dependents and his sympathy necessary to his father now he was a cipher in his father's house and the squire estranged in the first instance by a feeling of the injury he had done his son in not sooner acquainting him with his proposed marriage seemed rather to avoid than to seek him as a companion and too frequently showed the most utter indifference to the feelings and wishes which a young man of a high and independent spirit might be supposed to indulge perhaps owen was not fully aware of the force of all these circumstances for an actor in a family drama is seldom unimpassioned enough to be perfectly observant but he became moody and soured brooding over his unloved existence and craving with a human heart after sympathy this feeling took more full possession of his mind when he had left college and returned home to lead an idle and purposeless life as the heir there was no worldly necessity for exertion his father was too much of a welsh squire to dream of the moral necessity and he himself had not sufficient strength of mind to decide at once upon abandoning a place and mode of life which abounded in daily mortifications yet to this course his judgment was slowly tending when some circumstances occurred to detain him at Badoan, it was not to be expected that harmony would long be preserved even in appearance between an unguarded and soured young man such as owen and his wary stepmother when he had once left college 
and come not as a visitor but as the heir to his father's house some cause of difference occurred where the woman subdued her hidden anger sufficiently to become convinced that owen was not entirely the dupe she had believed him to be henceforward there was no peace between them not in vulgar altercations did this show itself but in moody reserve on owen's part and in undisguised and contemptuous pursuance of her own plans by his stepmother but owen was no longer a place where if owen was not loved or attended to he could at least find peace and care for himself he was thwarted at every step and in every wish by his father's desire apparently while the wife sat by with a smile of triumph on her beautiful lips so owen went forth at the early day dawn sometimes roaming about on the shore or the upland shooting or fishing as the season might be but oftener stretched in indolent repose on the short sweet grass indulging in gloomy and morbid reveries he would fancy that this mortified state of existence was a dream a horrible dream from which he would awaken and find himself again the sole object and darling of his father and then he would start up and strive to shake off the incubus there was the molten sunset of his childish memory the gorgeous crimson piles of glory in the west fading away into the cold calm light of the rising moon while here and there a cloud floated across the western heaven like a seraph's wing in its flaming beauty the earth was the same as in his childhood's days full of gentle evening sounds and the harmonies of twilight the breeze came sweeping low over the heather and bluebells by his side and the turf was sending up its evening incense of perfume but life and heart and hope were changed forever since those bygone days or he would seat himself in a favourite niche of the rocks in moyle guest hidden by a stunted growth of the witty or mountain ash from general observation with a rich tinted cushion of stone crop for his feet and a straight precipice of rock rising just above here would he sit for hours gazing idly at the bay below with its background of purple hills and the little fishing sail on its bosom showing white in the sunbeam and gliding on in such harmony with the quiet beauty of the glassy sea or he would pull out an old school volume his companion for years and in morbid accordance with the dark legend that still lurked in the recesses of his mind a shape of gloom in those innermost haunts awaiting its time to come forth in distinct outline would he turn to the old greek dramas which treat of a family foredoomed by an avenging fate the worn page opened of itself at the play of oedipus tyrannus and owen dealt with the craving of disease upon the prophecy so nearly resembling that which concerned himself with his consciousness of neglect there was a sort of self-flattery in the consequence which the legend gave him he almost wondered how they durst with slights and insults thus provoke the avenger the days drifted onward often he would vehemently pursue some sylvan sport till thought and feeling were lost in the violence of bodily exertion occasionally his evenings were spent at a small public house such as stood by the unfrequented wayside where the welcome hearty though bought seemed so strongly to contrast with the gloomy negligence of home unsympathizing home one evening owen might be four or five and twenty wearied with a day's shooting on the clenny moors he passed by the open door of the goat at penmorfa the light and the cheeriness within tempted him poor self-exhausted man as it has done many a one more wretched in worldly circumstances to step in and take his evening meal where at least his presence was of some consequence it was a busy day in the little hostel a flock of sheep amounting to some hundreds had arrived at penmorfa on their road to england and thronged the space before the house inside was the shrewd kind-hearted hostess 
bustling to and fro with merry greetings for every tired drover who was to pass the night in her house while the sheep were penned in a field close by ever and anon she kept attending to the second crowd of guests who were celebrating a rural wedding in her house it was busy work to martha thomas yet her smile never flagged and when owen griffith had finished his evening meal she was there ready with a hope that it had done him good and was to his mind and a word of intelligence that the wedding folk were about to dance in the kitchen and the harper was a famous edward of corwin owen partly from a good-natured compliance with his hostess's implied wish and partly from curiosity lounged to the passage which led to the kitchen not the everyday working cooking kitchen which was beyond but a good-sized room where the mistress sat when her work was done and where the country people were commonly entertained at such merry-makings as the present the lintels of the door formed a frame for the animated picture which owen saw within as he leaned against the wall in the dark passage the red light of the fire with every now and then a falling piece of turf sending forth a fresh blaze shone full upon four young men who were dancing a measure something like a scotch reel keeping admirable time in their rapid movements to the capital tune the harper was playing they had their hats on when owen first took his stand but as they grew more and more animated they flung them away and presently their shoes were kicked off with a like disregard to the spot where they might happen to alight shouts of applause followed any remarkable exertion of agility in which each seemed to try to excel his companions at length wearied and exhausted they sat down and the harper gradually changed to one of those wild inspiring national airs for which he was so famous the thronged audience sat earnest and breathless and you might have heard a pin drop except when some maiden passed hurriedly with flaring candle and busy look through to the real kitchen beyond when he had finished playing his beautiful theme on the march of the men of harlech he changed the measure again to three chanteaux bunon three hundred pounds and immediately a most unmusical looking man began chanting panichlian or a sort of recitative stanzas which were soon taken up by another and this amusement lasted so long that owen grew weary and was thinking of retreating from his post by the door when some little bustle was occasioned on the opposite side of the room by the entrance of a middle-aged man and a young girl apparently his daughter the man advanced to the bench occupied by the seniors of the party who welcomed him with the usual pretty welsh greeting pass it my de gallon how is thy heart and drinking his health passed on to him the cup of excellent kuru the girl evidently a village belle was as warmly greeted by the young men while the girls eyed her rather askance with a half jealous look which owen set down to the score of her extreme prettiness like most welsh women she was of middle size as to height but beautifully made with the most perfect yet delicate roundness in every limb her little mop cap was carefully adjusted to a face which was excessively pretty though it never could be called handsome it also was round with the slightest tendency to the oval shape richly coloured though somewhat olive in complexion with dimples in cheek and chin and the most scarlet lips owen had ever seen that were too short to meet over the small pearly teeth the nose was the most defective feature but the eyes were splendid they were so long so lustrous yet at times so very soft under their thick fringe of eyelash the nut-brown hair was carefully braided beneath the border of delicate lace it was evident the little village beauty knew how to make the most of all her attractions for the gay colours which were displayed in her neckerchief were in complete harmony with the complexion owen was much attracted while yet he was amused by the evident coquetry the girl displayed collecting around her a whole bevy of young fellows for each of whom she seemed to have some gay speech 
some attractive look or action in a few minutes young griffith of bodoan was at her side brought thither by a variety of idle motives and as her undivided attention was given to the welsh air her admirers one by one dropped off to seat themselves by some less fascinating but more attentive fair one the more owen conversed with the girl the more he was taken she had more wit and talent than he had fancied possible a self-abandon and thoughtfulness to boot that seemed full of charms and then her voice was so clear and sweet and her actions so full of grace that owen was fascinated before he was well aware and kept looking into her bright blushing face till her uplifted flashing eye fell beneath his earnest gaze while it thus happened that they were silent she from confusion at the unexpected warmth of his admiration he from an unconsciousness of anything but the beautiful changes in her flexible countenance the man whom owen took for her father came up and addressed some observation to his daughter from whence he glided into some commonplace yet respectable remark to owen and at length engaging him in some slight local conversation he led the way to the account of a spot on the peninsula of penthryn where teal abounded and concluded with begging owen to allow him to show him the exact place saying that whenever the young squire so inclined if he would honour him by a call at his house he would take him across in his boat while owen listened his attention was not so much absorbed as to be unaware that the little beauty at his side was refusing one or two who endeavoured to draw her from her place by invitations to dance flattered by his own construction of her refusals he again directed all his attention to her till she was called away by her father who was leaving the scene of festivity before he left he reminded owen of his promise and added perhaps sir you do not know me my name is ellis pritchard and i live at Glass, on this side of mole guest any one can point it out to you when the father and daughter had left owen slowly prepared for his ride home but encountering the hostess he could not resist asking a few questions relative to ellis pritchard and his pretty daughter she answered shortly but respectfully and then said rather hesitatingly master griffith you know the triad three feth te big a nice ir lach is kibber heb id mail deg heb di out a mech deg heb ir gerda three things are alike a fine barn without corn a fine cup without drink a fine woman without her reputation she hastily quitted him and owen rode slowly to his unhappy home ellis pritchard half farmer and half fisherman was shrewd and keen and worldly yet he was good-natured and sufficiently generous to have become rather a popular man among his equals he had been struck with the young squire's attention to his pretty daughter and was not insensible to the advantages to be derived from it nest would not be the first peasant girl by any means who had been transplanted to a welsh manor-house as its mistress and accordingly her father had shrewdly given the admiring young man some pretext for further opportunities of seeing her as for nest herself she had somewhat of her father's worldliness and was fully alive to the superior station of a new admirer and quite prepared to slight all her old sweethearts on his account but then she had something more of feeling in her reckoning she had not been insensible to the earnest yet comparatively refined homage which owen paid her she had noticed his expressive and occasionally handsome countenance with admiration and was flattered by his so immediately singling her out from her companions as to the hint which martha thomas had thrown out it is enough to say that nest was very giddy and that she was motherless she had high spirits and a great love of admiration or to use a softer term she loved to please 
men women children all she delighted to gladden with her smile and her voice she coquetted and flirted and went to the extreme lengths of welsh courtship till the seniors of the village shook their heads and cautioned their daughters against her acquaintance if not absolutely guilty she had too frequently been on the verge of guilt even at the time martha thomas's hint made but little impression on owen for his senses were otherwise occupied but in a few days the recollection thereof had wholly died away and one warm glorious summer's day he bent his steps towards ellis pritchard's with a beating heart for except some very slight flirtations at oxford owen had never been touched his thoughts his fancy had been otherwise engaged tiglas was built against one of the lower rocks of moor guest which indeed formed a side to the low lengthy house the materials of the cottage were the shingly stones which had fallen from above plastered rudely together with deep recesses for the small oblong windows altogether the exterior was much ruder than owen had expected but inside there seemed no lack of comforts the house was divided into two apartments one large roomy and dark into which owen entered immediately and before the blushing nest came from the inner chamber for she had seen the young squire coming and had hastily gone to make some alterations in her dress he had had time to look around him and note the various little particulars of the room beneath the window which commanded a magnificent view was an oaken dresser replete with drawers and cupboards and brightly polished to a rich dark colour in the farther part of the room owen could at first distinguish little entering as he did from the glaring sunlight but he soon saw that there were two oaken beds closed up after the manner of the welsh in fact the dormitories of ellis pritchard and the man who served under him both on sea and on land there was the large wheel used for spinning wool left standing on the middle of the floor as if in use only a few minutes before and around the ample chimney hung flitches of bacon dried kid's flesh and fish that was in process of smoking for winter's store before nest had shyly dared to enter her father who had been mending his nets down below and seen owen winding up to the house came in and gave him a hearty yet respectful welcome and then nest downcast and blushing full of the consciousness which her father's advice and conversation had not failed to inspire ventured to join them to owen's mind this reserve and shyness gave her new charms it was too bright too hot too anything to think of going to shoot teal till later in the day and owen was delighted to accept a hesitating invitation to share the noonday meal some ewe milk cheese very hard and dry oat cake slips of the dried kid's flesh broiled after having been previously soaked in water for a few minutes delicious butter and fresh buttermilk with a liquor called diod griafol made from the berries of the sorbus occuparia infused in water and then fermented composed the frugal repast but there was something so clean and neat and withal such a true welcome that owen had seldom enjoyed a meal so much indeed at that time of day the welsh squires differed from the farmers more in the plenty and rough abundance of their manners of living than in the refinement of style of their table at the present day down in llyn the welsh gentry are not a whit behind their saxon equals in the expensive elegances of life but then when there was but one pewter service in all northumberland there was nothing in ellis pritchard's mode of living that grated on the young squire's sense of refinement little was said by that young pair of wooers during the meal the father had all the conversation to himself apparently heedless of the ardent looks and inattentive mien of his guest as owen became more serious in his feelings he grew more timid in their expression and at night when they returned from their shooting excursion 
the caress he gave nest was almost as bashfully offered as received this was but the first of a series of days devoted to nest in reality though at first he thought some little disguise of his object was necessary the past the future was all forgotten in those happy days of love and every worldly plan every womanly wile was put in practice by ellis pritchard and his daughter to render his visits agreeable and alluring indeed the very circumstance of his being welcome was enough to attract the poor young man to whom the feeling so produced was new and full of charms he left a home with the certainty of being thwarted made him chary in expressing his wishes where no tone of love ever fell on his ear save those addressed to others where his presence or absence was a matter of utter indifference and when he entered tiglath all down to the little cur which with clamorous barking claimed a part of his attention seemed to rejoice his account of his day's employment found a willing listener in ellis and when he passed on to nest busy at her wheel or at her churn the deepened colour the conscious eye and the gradual yielding of herself up to his lover-like caress had worlds of charms ellis pritchard was a tenant on the bodoan estate and therefore had reasons in plenty for wishing to keep the young squire's visits secret and owen unwilling to disturb the sunny calm of these halcyon days by any storm at home was ready to use all the artifice which ellis suggested as to the mode of his calls at tiglas nor was he unaware of the probable nay the hoped-for termination of these repeated days of happiness he was quite conscious that the father wished for nothing better than the marriage of his daughter to the heir of bodoan and when nest had hidden her face in his neck which was encircled by her clasping arms and murmured into his ear her acknowledgment of love he felt only too desirous of finding some one to love him for ever though not highly principled he would not have tried to obtain nest on other terms save those of marriage he did so pine after enduring love and fancied he should have bound her heart for evermore to his when they had taken the solemn oaths of matrimony there was no great difficulty attending a secret marriage at such a place and at such a time one gusty autumn day ellis ferried them round penthryn to Llandutrywin, and there saw his little nest become future lady of bedoan how often do we see giddy coquetting restless girls become sobered by marriage a great object in life is decided one on which their thoughts have been running in all their vagaries and they seem to verify the beautiful fable of undine a new soul beams out in gentleness and repose of their future lives an indescribable softness and tenderness takes place of the wearying vanity of their former endeavours to attract admiration something of this sort took place in nest pritchard if at first she had been anxious to attract the young squire of bodoan long before her marriage this feeling had merged into a truer love than she had ever felt before and now that he was her own her husband her whole soul was bent toward making him amends as far as in her lay for the misery which with a woman's tact she saw that he had to endure at his home her greetings were abounding in delicately expressed love her study of his tastes unwearying in the arrangement of her dress her time her very thoughts no wonder that he looked back on his wedding day with a thankfulness which is seldom the result of unequal marriages no wonder that his heart beat aloud as formerly when he wound up the little path to tiglas and saw keen though the winter's wind might be that nest was standing out at the door to watch for his dimly seen approach while the candle flared in the little window as a beacon to guide him aright the angry words and unkind actions of home fell deadened on his heart he thought of the love that was surely his and of the new promise of love that a short time would bring forth 
and he could almost have smiled at the impotent efforts to disturb his peace. A few more months, and the young father was greeted by a feeble little cry when he hastily entered Tiglas one morning early in consequence of a summons conveyed mysteriously to Bodoan, and the pale mother, smiling and feebly holding up her babe to its father's kiss, seemed to him even more lovely than the bright gay nest who had won his heart at the little inn of Penmorpha. But the curse was at work. The fulfilment of the prophecy was nigh at hand. THE DOOM OF THE GRIFFITHS PART TWO It was the autumn after the birth of their boy. It had been a glorious summer, with bright, hot, sunny weather, and now the year was fading away, as seasonably, into mellow days, with mornings of silver mists and clear, frosty nights. The blooming look of the time of flowers was past and gone, but instead there was even richer tints abroad in the sun-coloured leaves, the lichens, the gold-blossomed firs. If it was the time of fading, there was a glory in the decay. Nest, in her loving anxiety to surround her dwelling with every charm for her husband's sake, had turned gardener, and the little corners of the rude court before the house were filled with many a delicate mountain flower, transplanted more for its beauty than its rarity. The sweet briar bush may even yet be seen, old and grey, which she and Owen planted a green slipling beneath the window of her little chamber. In those moments, Owen forgot all besides the present, all the cares and griefs he had known in the past, and all that might await him of woe and death in the future. The boy, too, was as lovely a child as the fondest parent was ever blessed with, and crowed with delight and clapped his little hands as his mother held him in her arms at the cottage door to watch his father's ascent up the rough path that led to Tiglas one bright autumnal morning. And when the three entered the house together, it was difficult to say which was the happiest. Owen carried his boy and tossed and played with him, while Nest sought out some little article of work and seated herself on the dresser beneath the window, where, now busily plying the needle, and then again looking at her husband, she eagerly told him the little pieces of domestic intelligence, the winning ways of the child, the result of yesterday's fishing, and such of the gossip of Penmorpha as came to the ears of the now retired nest. She noticed that, when she mentioned any little circumstance which bore the slightest reference to Bodoan, her husband appeared chafed and uneasy, and at last avoided anything that might in the least remind him of home. In truth, he had been suffering much of late from the irritability of his father, shown in trifles to be sure, but not the less galling on that account. While they were thus talking and caressing each other and the child, a shadow darkened the room, and before they could catch a glimpse of the object that had occasioned it, it vanished, and Squire Griffiths lifted the door-latch and stood before them. He stood and looked, first on his son, so different in his buoyant expression of content and enjoyment, with his noble child in his arms, like a proud and happy father, as he was, from the depressed, moody young man he too often appeared at Bodoan then on Nest, poor, trembling, sickened Nest, who dropped her work, but yet durst not stir from her seat on the dresser, while she looked to her husband as if for protection from his father. The squire was silent, as he glared from one to the other, his features white with restrained passion. When he spoke, his words came out most distinct in their forced composure, it was to his son he addressed himself. That woman? Who is she? Owen hesitated one moment, then replied in a steady yet quiet voice, Father, that woman is my wife. He would have added some apology for the long concealment of his marriage, have appealed to his father's forgiveness, 
but the foam flew from squire owen's lips as he burst forth with invective against nest you have married her it is as they told me married nest pritchard if bitten and you stand there as if you had not disgraced yourself for ever and ever with your accursed wiving and the fair harlot sits there in her mocking modesty practising the miming airs that will become her state as future lady of Badoan. but i will move heaven and earth before that false woman darkens the doors of my father's house as mistress all this was said with such rapidity that owen had no time for the words that thronged to his lips father he burst forth at length father whosoever told you that nest pritchard was a harlot told you a lie as false as hell ay a lie as false as hell he added in a voice of thunder while he advanced a step or two nearer to the squire and then in a lower tone he said she is as pure as your own wife nay god help me as the dear precious mother who brought me forth and then left me with no refuge in a mother's heart to struggle on through life alone i tell you nest is as pure as that dear dead mother fool poor fool at this moment the child the little owen who had kept gazing from one angry countenance to the other and with earnest look trying to understand what had brought the fierce glare into the face where till now he had read nothing but love in some way attracted the squire's attention and increased his wrath yes he continued poor weak fool that you are hugging the child of another as if it were your own offspring owen involuntarily caressed the affrighted child and half smiled at the implication of his father's words this the squire perceived and raising his voice to a scream of rage he went on i bid you if you call yourself my son to cast away that miserable shameless woman's offspring cast it away this instant this instant in his ungovernable rage seeing that owen was far from complying with his command he snatched the poor infant from the loving arms that held it and throwing it to its mother left the house inarticulate with fury nest who had been pale and still as marble during this terrible dialogue looking on and listening as if fascinated by the words that smote her heart opened her arms to receive and cherish her precious babe but the boy was not destined to reach the white refuge of her breast the furious action of the squire had been almost without aim and the infant fell against the sharp edge of the dresser down on to the stone floor owen sprang up to take the child but he lay so still so motionless that the awe of death came over the father and he stooped down to gaze more closely at that moment the upturned filmy eyes rolled convulsively a spasm passed along the body and the lips yet warm with kissing quivered into everlasting rest a word from her husband told nest all she slid down from her seat and lay by her little son as corpse-like as he unheeding of all the agonizing endearments and passionate adjurations of her husband and that poor desolate husband and father scarce one little quarter of an hour and he had been so blessed in his consciousness of love the bright promise of many years on his infant's face and the new fresh soul beaming forth in its awakened intelligence and there it was the little clay image that would never more gladden up the sight of him nor stretch forth to meet his embrace whose inarticulate yet most eloquent cooings might haunt him in his dreams but would never more be heard in waking life again and by the dead babe almost as utterly insensate the poor mother had fallen in a merciful faint the slandered heart-pierced nest owen struggled against the sickness that came over him and busied himself in vain attempts at her restoration it was now near noonday and ellis pritchard came home little dreaming of the sight that awaited him 
but though stunned he was able to take more effectual measures for his poor daughter's recovery than owen had done by and by she showed symptoms of returning sense and was placed in her own little bed in a darkened room where without ever waking to complete consciousness she fell asleep then it was that her husband suffocated by pressure of miserable thought gently drew his hand from her tightened clasp and printing one long soft kiss on her white waxen forehead hastily stole out of the room and out of the house near the base of Molgest, it might be a quarter of a mile from tiglath was a little neglected solitary copse wild and tangled with the trailing branches of the dog rose and the tendrils of the white bryony toward the middle of this thicket lay a deep crystal pool a clear mirror for the blue heavens above and round the margin floated the broad green leaves of the water-lily and when the regal sun shone down in his noonday glory the flowers arose from their cool depths to welcome and greet him the copse was musical with many sounds the warbling of birds rejoicing in its shades the ceaseless hum of the insects that hovered over the pool the chime of the distant waterfall the occasional bleating of the sheep from the mountain top were all blended into the delicious harmony of nature it had been one of owen's favourite resorts when he had been a lonely wanderer a pilgrim in search of love in the years gone by and thither he went as if by instinct when he left tiglath quelling the uprising agony till he should reach that little solitary spot it was the time of day when a change in the aspect of the weather so frequently takes place and the little pool was no longer the reflection of a blue and sunny sky it sent back the dark and slaty clouds above and every now and then a rough gust shook the painted autumn leaves from their branches and all other music was lost in the sound of the wild winds piping down from the moorlands which lay up and beyond the clefts in the mountain side presently the rain came on and beat down in torrents but owen heeded it not he sat on the dank ground his face buried in his hands and his whole strength physical and mental employed in quelling the rush of blood which rose and boiled and gurgled in his brain as if it would madden him the phantom of his dead child rose ever before him and seemed to cry aloud for vengeance and when the poor young man thought upon the victim whom he required in his wild longings for revenge he shuddered for it was his father again and again he tried not to think but still the circle of thought came round eddying through his brain at length he mastered his passions and they were calm then he forced himself to arrange some plan for the future he had not in the passionate hurry of the moment seen that his father had left the cottage before he was aware of the fatal accident that befell the child owen thought he had seen all and once he planned to go to the squire and tell him of the anguish of heart he had wrought and awe him as it were by the dignity of grief but that again he durst not he distrusted his self-control the old prophecy rose up in its horror he dreaded his doom at last he determined to leave his father for ever to take ness to some distant country where she might forget her first-born and where he himself might gain a livelihood by his own exertions but when he tried to descend to the various little arrangements which were involved in the execution of this plan he remembered that all his money and in this respect squire griffith was no niggard was locked up in his escritoire at Bodoan. In vain he tried to do away with this matter-of-fact difficulty. Go to Bodoan he must, and his only hope, nay, his determination, was to avoid his father. He rose and took a by-path to Bodoan. The house looked even more gloomy and desolate than usual in the heavy downpouring rain. Yet Owen gazed on it with something of regret 
for sorrowful as his days in it had been he was about to leave it for many many years if not for ever he entered by a side door opening into a passage that led to his own room where he kept his books his guns his fishing tackle his writing materials etc here he hurriedly began to select the few articles he intended to take for besides the dread of interruption he was feverishly anxious to travel far that very night if only nest was capable of performing the journey as he was thus employed he tried to conjecture what his father's feelings would be on finding that his once loved son was gone away for ever would he then awaken to regret for the conduct which had driven him from home and bitterly think on the loving and caressing boy who had haunted his footsteps in former days or alas would he only feel that an obstacle to his daily happiness to his contentment with his wife and his strange doting affection for her child was taken away would they make merry over the heir's departure then he thought of nest the young childless mother whose heart had not yet realized her fullness of desolation poor nest so loving as she was so devoted to her child how should he console her he pictured her away in a strange land pining for her native mountains and refusing to be comforted because her child was not even this thought of the homesickness that might possibly beset nest hardly made him hesitate in his determination so strongly had the idea taken possession of him that only by putting miles and leagues between him and his father could he avert the doom which seemed blending itself with the very purposes of his life as long as he stayed in proximity with the slayer of his child he had now nearly completed his hasty work of preparation and was full of tender thoughts of his wife when the door opened and the elfish robert peered in in search of some of his brother's possessions on seeing owen he hesitated but then came boldly forward and laid his hand on owen's arm saying nesta ir bitten how is nest ir bitten he looked maliciously into owen's face to mark the effect of his words but was terrified at the expression he read there he started off and ran to the door while owen tried to check himself saying continually he is but a child he does not understand the meaning of what he says he is but a child still robert now in fancied security kept calling out his insulting words and owen's hand was on his gun grasping it as if to restrain his rising fury but when robert passed on daringly to mocking words relating to the poor dead child owen could bear it no longer and before the boy was well aware owen was fiercely holding him in an iron clasp in one hand while he struck him hard with the other in a minute he checked himself he paused relaxed his grasp and to his horror he saw robert sink to the ground in fact the lad was half stunned half frightened and thought it best to assume insensibility owen miserable owen seeing him lie there prostrate was bitterly repentant and would have dragged him to the carved settle and done all he could to restore him to his senses but at this instant the squire came in probably when the household at bodoan rose that morning there was but one among them ignorant of the heir's relation to nest pritchard and her child for secret as he had tried to make his visits to tiglas they had been too frequent not to be noticed and nest's altered conduct no longer frequenting dances and merry-makings was a strong corroborative circumstance but mrs griffith's influence reigned paramount if unacknowledged at Badoan, and till she sanctioned the disclosure none would dare to tell the squire now however the time drew near when it suited her to make her husband aware of the connection his son had formed so with many tears and much seeming reluctance she broke the intelligence to him 
taking good care at the same time to inform him of the light character nest had borne nor did she confine this evil reputation to her conduct before her marriage but insinuated that even to this day she was a woman of the grove and brake for centuries the welsh term of opprobrium for the loosest female characters squire griffiths easily tracked owen to tiglas and without any aim but the gratification of his furious anger followed him to upbraid as we have seen but he left the cottage even more enraged against his son than he had entered it and returned home to hear the evil suggestions of the stepmother he had heard a slight scuffle in which he caught the tones of robert's voice as he passed along the hall and an instant afterwards he saw the apparently lifeless body of his little favourite dragged along by the culprit owen the marks of strong passion yet visible on his face not loud but bitter and deep were the evil words which the father bestowed on the son and as owen stood proudly and sullenly silent disdaining all exculpation of himself in the presence of one who had wrought him so much graver so fatal an injury robert's mother entered the room at sight of her natural emotion the wrath of the squire was redoubled and his wild suspicions that this violence of owen's to robert was a premeditated act appeared like the proven truth through the mists of rage he summoned domestics as if to guard his own and his wife's life from the attempts of his son and the servants stood wandering around now gazing at mrs griffith alternately scolding and sobbing while she tried to restore the lad from his really bruised and half unconscious state now at the fierce and angry squire and now at the sad and silent owen and he he was hardly aware of their looks of wonder and terror his father's words fell on a deadened ear for before his eyes there rose a pale dead babe and in that lady's violent sounds of grief he heard the wailing of a more sad more hopeless mother for by this time the lad robert had opened his eyes and though evidently suffering a good deal from the effects of owen's blows was fully conscious of all that was passing around him had owen been left to his own nature his heart would have worked itself to doubly love the boy whom he had injured but he was stubborn from injustice and hardened by suffering he refused to vindicate himself he made no effort to resist the imprisonment the squire had decreed until a surgeon's opinion of the real extent of robert's injuries was made known it was not until the door was locked and barred as if upon some wild and furious beast that the recollection of poor nest without his comforting presence came into his mind oh thought he how she would be wearying pining for his tender sympathy if indeed she had recovered the shock of mind sufficiently to be sensible of consolation what would she think of his absence could she imagine he believed his father's words and had left her in this her sore trouble and bereavement the thought maddened him and he looked around for some mode of escape he had been confined in a small unfurnished room on the first floor wainscoted and carved all round with a massy door calculated to resist the attempts of a dozen strong men even had he afterwards been able to escape from the house unseen unheard the window was placed as common in old welsh houses over the fireplace with the branching chimneys on either hand forming a sort of projection on the outside by this outlet his escape was easy even had he been less determined and desperate than he was and when he had descended with a little care a little winding he might elude all observation and pursue his original intention of going to Teaglass. the storm had abated and watery sunbeams were gilding the bay as owen descended from the window and stealing along in the broad afternoon shadows made his way to the little plateau of green turf in the garden at the top of a steep precipitous rock 
down the abrupt face of which he had often dropped by means of a well-secured rope into the small sailing boat his father's present alas in days gone by which lay moored in the deep sea water below he had always kept his boat there because it was the nearest available spot to the house but before he could reach the place unless indeed he crossed a broad sunlighted piece of ground in full view of the windows on that side of the house and without the shadow of a single sheltering tree or shrub he had to skirt round a rude semicircle of underwood which would have been considered as a shrubbery had any one taken pains with it step by step he stealthily moved along hearing voices now again seeing his father and stepmother in no distant walk the squire evidently caressing and consoling his wife who seemed to be urging some point with great vehemence again forced to crouch down to avoid being seen by the cook returning from the rude kitchen garden with a handful of herbs this was the way the doomed heir of bodoan left his ancestral house forever and hoped to leave behind him his doom at length he reached the plateau he breathed more freely he stooped to discover the hidden coil of rope kept safe and dry in a hole under a great round flat piece of rock his head was bent down he did not see his father approach nor did he hear his footstep for the rush of blood to his head in the stooping effort of lifting the stone the squire had grappled with him before he rose up again before he fully knew whose hands detained him now when his liberty of person and action seemed secure he made a vigorous struggle to free himself he wrestled with his father for a moment he pushed him hard and drove him on to the great displaced stone all unsteady in its balance down went the squire down into the deep waters below down after him went owen half consciously half unconsciously partly compelled by the sudden cessation of any opposing body partly from a vehement irrepressible impulse to rescue his father but he had instinctively chosen a safer place in the deep sea-water pool than that into which his push had sent his father the squire had hit his head with much violence against the side of the boat in his fall it is indeed doubtful whether he was not killed before he ever sank into the sea but owen knew nothing save that the awful doom seemed even now present he plunged down he dived below the water in search of the body which had none of the elasticity of life to buoy it up he saw his father in those depths he clutched at him he brought him up and cast him a dead weight into the boat and exhausted by the effort he had begun himself to sink again before he instinctively strove to rise and climb into the rocking boat there lay his father with a deep dent in the side of his head where the skull had been fractured by his fall his face blackened by the arrested course of the blood owen felt his pulse his heart all was still he called him by his name father father he cried come back come back you never knew how i loved you how i could love you still if oh god and the thought of his little child rose before him yes father he cried afresh you never knew how he fell how he died oh if i had but had patience to tell you if you would have but borne with me and listened and now it is over oh father father whether she had heard his wild wailing voice or whether it was only that she missed her husband and wanted him for some little everyday question or as was perhaps more likely she had discovered owen's escape and come to inform her husband of it i do not know but on the rock right above his head as it seemed owen heard his stepmother calling her husband he was silent and softly pushed the boat right under the rock till the sides grated against the stones and the overhanging branches concealed him and it 
from all not on a level with the water. Wet as he was, he lay down by his dead father, the better to conceal himself, and, somehow, the action recalled those early days of childhood, the first in the squire's widowhood, when Owen had shared his father's bed, and used to waken him in the morning to hear one of the old Welsh legends. How long he lay thus, body chill and brain hard working through the heavy pressure of a reality as terrible as a nightmare, he never knew. But at length he roused himself up to think of Nest. Drawing out a great sail, he covered up the body of his father with it, where he lay in the bottom of the boat. Then with his numbed hands he took the oars and pulled out into the more open sea towards Crickaith. He skirted along the coast till he found a shadowed cleft in the dark rocks. To that point he rowed and anchored his boat close inland. Then he mounted, staggering, half longing to fall into the dark waters and be at rest, half instinctively finding out the surest footrests on that precipitous face of rock, till he was high up, safe landed on the turfy summit. He ran off as if pursued towards Penmorpha. He ran with maddened energy. Suddenly he paused, turned, ran again with the same speed, and threw himself prone on the summit, looking down into his boat with straining eyes to see if there had been any movement of life, any displacement of a fold of sailcloth. It was all quiet deep down below, but as he gazed the shifting light gave the appearance of a slight movement. Owen ran to a lower part of the rock, stripped, plunged into the water, and swam to the boat. When there, all was still, awfully still. For a minute or two he dared not lift up the cloth. Then, reflecting that the same terror might beset him again of leaving his father unaided while yet a spark of life lingered, he removed the shrouding cover. The eyes looked into his with a dead stare. He closed the lids and bound up the jaw. Again he looked. This time he raised himself out of the water and kissed the brow. It was my doom, father. It would have been better if I had died at my birth. Daylight was fading away, precious daylight. He swam back, dressed, and set off afresh for Ben Morpha. When he opened the door of Tiglas, Ellis Pritchard looked at him reproachfully from his seat in the dark shadowed chimney corner. You come at last, said he, one of our kind, i.e. station, would not have left his wife to mourn by herself over her dead child, nor would one of our kind have let his father kill his own true son. I've a good mind to take her from you for ever. I did not tell him, cried Nest, looking piteously at her husband. He made me tell him part, and guessed the rest. She was nursing her babe on her knee, as if it was alive. Owen stood before Ellis Pritchard. Be silent, said he quietly. Neither words nor deeds, but what are decreed, can come to pass. I was set to do my work this hundred years and more. The time waited for me, and the man waited for me. I have done what was foretold of me for generations. Ellis Pritchard knew the old tale of the prophecy, and believed in it in a dull, dead kind of way, but somehow never thought it would come to pass in his time. Now, however, he understood it all in a moment. Though he mistook Owen's nature so much as to believe that the deed was intentionally done, out of revenge for the death of his boy, and viewing it in this light, Ellis thought it more than a just punishment for the cause of all the wild despairing sorrow he had seen his only child suffer during the hours of this long afternoon. He knew the law would not so regard it. Even the lax Welsh law of those days could not fail to examine into the death of a man of Squire Griffith's standing. So the acute Ellis thought how he could conceal the culprit for a time. 
Come, said he, don't look so scared. It was your doom, not your fault. And he laid a hand on Owen's shoulder. You're wet, said he suddenly. Where have you been? Nest, your husband is dripping drook it wet. That's what makes him look so blue and wan. Nest softly laid her baby in its cradle. She was half stupefied with crying, and had not understood to what Owen alluded when he spoke of his doom being fulfilled, if indeed she had heard the words. Her touch thawed Owen's miserable heart. Oh, Nest, said he, clasping her in his arms, do you love me still? Can you love me, my own darling? Why not? asked she, her eyes filling with tears. I only love you more than ever, for you were my poor baby's father. But Nest, oh, tell her, Alice, you know. No need, no need, said Alice. She's had enough to think on. Bustle, my girl, and get out my Sunday clothes. I don't understand, said Nest, putting her hand up to her head. What is to tell, and why are you so wet? God help me for a poor crazed thing, for I cannot guess at the meanings of your words and your strange looks. I only know my baby is dead. And she burst into tears. Come, Nest, go and fetch him a change, quick. And as she meekly obeyed, too languid to strive further to understand, Ellis said rapidly to Owen, in a low, hurried voice, Are you meaning that the squire is dead? Speak low, lest she hear. Well, well, no need to talk about how he died. It was sudden, I see, and we must all of us die, and he'll have to be buried. It's well the night is near. And I should not wonder now if you'd like to travel for a bit. It would do Nest a power of good. And then there's many a one goes out of his own house and never comes back again. And I trust he's not lying in his own house. And there's a stir for a bit, and a search, and a wonder. And by and by the air just steps in, as quiet as can be. And that's what you'll do, and bring Nest to Badoan after all. Nay, child, better stockings nor those. Find the blue woollens I bought at Llanroost Fair. Only, don't lose heart. It's done now, and can't be helped. It was the piece of work set you to do from the days of the Tudors, they say. And he deserved it. Look in yon cradle. So tell us where he is, and I'll take heart of grace and see what can be done for him. But Owen sat wet and haggard, looking into the peat fire as if for visions of the past, and never heeding a word Ellis said. Nor did he move when Nest brought the armful of dry clothes. Come, rouse up, man, said Ellis, growing impatient. But he neither spoke nor moved. What is the matter, father? asked Nest, bewildered. Ellis kept on watching Owen for a minute or two, till, on his daughter's repetition of the question, he said, Ask him yourself, Nest. Oh, husband, what is it? said she, kneeling down and bringing her face to a level with his. Don't you know? said he heavily. You won't love me when you do know. And yet it was not my doing, it was my doom. What does he mean, father? asked Nest, looking up. But she caught a gesture from Ellis, urging her to go on questioning her husband. I will love you, husband, whatever has happened. Only let me know the worst. A pause, during which Nest and Ellis hung breathless. My father is dead. Nest. Nest caught her breath with a sharp gasp. God forgive him, said she, thinking on her babe. God forgive me, said Owen. You did not? Nest stopped. Yes, I did. Now you know it. It was my doom. How could I help it? The devil helped me. 
he placed the stone so that my father fell i jumped into the water to save him i did indeed nest i was nearly drowned myself but he was dead dead killed by the fall then he is safe at the bottom of the sea said ellis with hungry eagerness no he is not he lies in my boat said owen shivering a little more at the thought of his last glimpse at his father's face than from cold oh husband change your wet clothes pleaded nest to whom the death of the old man was simply a horror with which she had nothing to do while her husband's discomfort was a present trouble while she helped him to take off the wet garments which he would never have had energy enough to remove of himself ellis was busy preparing food and mixing a great tumbler of spirits and hot water he stood over the unfortunate young man and compelled him to eat and drink and made nest too taste some mouthfuls all the while planning in his own mind how best to conceal what had been done and who had done it not altogether without a certain feeling of vulgar triumph in the reflection that nest as she stood there carelessly dressed dishevelled in her grief was in reality the mistress of Badoan, than which ellis pritchard had never seen a grander house though he believed such might exist by dint of a few dexterous questions he found out all he wanted to know from owen as he ate and drank in fact it was almost a relief to owen to dilute the horror by talking about it before the meal was done if meal it could be called ellis knew all he cared to know now nest on with your cloak and haps pack up what needs to go with you for you and your husband must be halfway to liverpool by to-morrow's morn i'll take you past real sands in my fishing boat with yours in tow and once over the dangerous part i'll return with my cargo of fish and learn how much stir there is at Badon. once half hidden in liverpool no one will know where you are and you may stay quiet till your time comes for returning i will never come home again said owen doggedly the place is accursed hoot be guided by me man why it was but an accident after all and we'll land at the holy island at the point of Lynn. there is an old cousin of mine the parson there for the pritchards have known better days squire and we'll bury him there it was but an accident man hold up your head you and nest will come home yet and fill Bodoan with children and i'll live to see it never said owen i am the last male of my race and the son has murdered his father nest came in laden and cloaked ellis was for hurrying them off the fire was extinguished the door was locked here nest my darling let me take your bundle while i guide you down the steps but her husband bent his head and spoke never a word nest gave her father the bundle already loaded with such things as he himself had seen fit to take but clasped another softly and tightly no one shall help me with this said she in a low voice her father did not understand her her husband did and placed his strong helping arm around her waist and blessed her we will all go together nest said he but where and he looked at the storm-tossed clouds coming up from windward it is a dirty night said ellis turning his head round to speak to his companions at last but never fear we'll weather it and he made for the place where his vessel was moored then he stopped and thought a moment stay here said he addressing his companions i may meet folk and i shall maybe have to hear and to speak you wait here till i come back for you so they sat down close together in a corner of the path let me look at him nest said owen she took her little dead son out from under her shawl they looked at his waxen face long and tenderly kissed it and covered it up reverently and softly 
Nest, said Owen at last, I feel as though my father's spirit had been near us, and as if it had bent over our poor little one. A strange chilly air met me as I stooped over him. I could fancy the spirit of our pure, blameless child guiding my father's safe over the paths of the sky to the gates of heaven, and escaping those accursed dogs of hell that were darting up from the north in pursuit of souls not five minutes since. "'Don't talk so, Owen,' said Nest, curling up to him in the darkness of the copse. "'Who knows what may be listening?' The pair were silent, in a kind of nameless terror, till they heard Ellis Pritchard's loud whisper, "'Where are ye? Come along, soft and steady. There were folk about even now. And the squire is missed, and Madame in a fright.' They went swiftly down to the little harbour and embarked on board Ellis's boat. The sea heaved and rocked even there. The torn clouds went hurrying overhead in a wild, tumultuous manner. They put out into the bay, still in silence, except when some word of command was spoken by Ellis, who took the management of the vessel. They made for the rocky shore where Owen's boat had been moored. It was not there. It had broken loose and disappeared. Owen sat down and covered his face. This last event, so simple and natural in itself, struck on his excited and superstitious mind in an extraordinary manner. He had hoped for a certain reconciliation, so to say, by laying his father and his child both in one grave. But now it appeared to him as if there was to be no forgiveness as if his father revolted even in death against any such peaceful union. Ellis took a practical view of the case. If the squire's body was found drifting about in a boat known to belong to his son, it would create terrible suspicion as to the manner of his death. At one time in the evening, Ellis had thought of persuading Owen to let him bury the squire in the sailor's grave, or, in other words, to sew him up in a spare sail and waiting it well, sink it for ever. He had not broached the subject from a certain fear of Owen's passionate repugnance to the plan. Otherwise, if he had consented, they might have returned to Penmorfa, and passively awaited the course of events, secure of Owen's succession to Bodoan sooner or later. Or if Owen was too much overwhelmed by what had happened, Ellis would have advised him to go away for a short time, and return when the buzz and the talk was over. Now it was different. It was absolutely necessary that they should leave the country for a time. Through those stormy waters they must plough their way that very night. Ellis had no fear, would have had no fear at any rate, with Owen as he had been a week, a day ago, but with Owen wild, despairing, helpless, fate pursued, what could he do? They sailed into the tossing darkness, and were never more seen of men. The house of Bodoan has sunk into damp, dark ruins, and the Saxon stranger holds the lands of the Griffiths. You cannot think how kindly Mrs. Dawson thanked Miss Duncan for writing and reading this story. She shook my poor, pale governess so tenderly by the hand that the tears came into her eyes and the colour into her cheeks. I thought you had been so kind. I liked hearing about Lady Ludlow. I fancied, perhaps, I could do something to give a little pleasure, were the half-finished sentences Miss Duncan stammered out. I am sure it was the wish to earn similar kind words from Mrs. Dawson that made Mrs. Preston try and rummage through her memory to see if she could not recollect some fact or event or history which might interest Mrs. Dawson and the little party that gathered round her sofa. Mrs. Preston it was who told us the following tale. Half a lifetime ago. End of the Doom of the Griffiths Half a Lifetime Ago, Part 1 
half a lifetime ago there lived in one of the westmoreland dales a single woman of the name of susan dixon she was owner of the small farmhouse where she resided and of some thirty or forty acres of land by which it was surrounded she had also an hereditary right to a sheep walk extending to the wild fells that overhang blear tarn in the language of the country she was a stateswoman her house is yet to be seen on the oxenfell road between skelwith and coniston you go along a moorland track made by the carts that occasionally came for turf from the oxenfell a brook babbles and brattles by the wayside giving you a sense of companionship which relieves the deep solitude in which this way is usually traversed some miles on this side of coniston there is a farmstead a grey stone house and a square of farm buildings surrounding a green space of rough turf in the midst of which stands a mighty funereal umbrageous yew making a solemn shadow as of death in the very heart and centre of the light and heat of the brightest summer day on the side away from the house this yard slopes down to a dark brown pool which is supplied with fresh water from the overflowings of a stone cistern into which some rivulet of the brook before mentioned continually and melodiously falls bubbling the cattle drink out of this cistern the household bring their pitchers and fill them with drinking water by a dilatory yet pretty process the water carrier brings with her a leaf of the hound's tongue fern and inserting it in the crevice of the grey rock makes a cool green spout for the sparkling stream the house is no specimen at the present day of what it was in the lifetime of susan dixon then every small diamond pane in the windows glittered with cleanliness you might have eaten off the floor you could see yourself in the pewter plates and the polished oaken armory or dresser of the state kitchen into which you entered few strangers penetrated further than this room once or twice wandering tourists attracted by the lonely picturesqueness of the situation and the exquisite cleanliness of the house itself made their way into this house place and offered money enough as they thought to tempt the hostess to receive them as lodgers they would give no trouble they said they would be out rambling or sketching all day long would be perfectly content with a share of the food which she provided for herself or would procure what they required from the waterhead inn at coniston but no liberal sum no fair words moved her from her stony manner or her monotonous tone of indifferent refusal no persuasion could induce her to show any more of the house than the first room no appearance of fatigue procured for the weary an invitation to sit down and rest and if one more bold and less delicate did so without being asked susan stood by cold and apparently deaf or only replying by the briefest monosyllables till the unwelcome visitor had departed yet those with whom she had dealings in the way of selling her cattle or her farm produce spoke of her as keen after a bargain a hard one to have to do with and she never spared herself exertion or fatigue at market or in the field to make the most of her produce she led the haymakers with her swift steady rake and her noiseless evenness of motion she was about among the earliest in the market examining samples of oats pricing them and then turning with grim satisfaction to her own cleaner corn she was served faithfully and long by those who were rather her fellow labourers than her servants she was even and just in her dealings with them if she was peculiar and silent they knew her and knew that she might be relied on some of them had known her from her childhood and deep in their hearts was an unspoken almost unconscious pity for her for they knew her story though they never spoke of it yes the time had been when that tall gaunt hard-featured angular woman who never smiled and hardly ever spoke an unnecessary word had been a fine-looking girl bright-spirited and rosy and when the hearth at the yew nook had been as bright as she with family love and youthful hope and mirth 
fifty or fifty-one years ago william dixon and his wife margaret were alive and susan their daughter was about eighteen years old ten years older than the only other child a boy named after his father william and margaret dixon were rather superior people of a character belonging as far as i have seen exclusively to the class of westmoreland and cumberland statesmen just independent upright not much given to much speaking kind-hearted but not demonstrative disliking change and new ways and new people sensible and shrewd each household self-contained and its members having little curiosity as to their neighbours with whom they rarely met for any social intercourse save at the stated times of sheep-shearing and christmas having a certain kind of sober pleasure in amassing money which occasionally made them miserable as they call miserly people up in the north in their old age reading no light or ephemeral literature but the grave solid books brought around by the peddlers such as the paradise lost and regained the death of abel the spiritual quixote and the pilgrim's progress were to be found in nearly every house the men occasionally going off laking i e playing i e drinking for days together and having to be hunted up by anxious wives who dared not leave their husbands to the chances of the wild precipitous roads but walked miles and miles lantern in hand in the dead of night to discover and guide the solemnly drunken husbands home who had a dreadful headache the next day and the day after that came forth as grave and sober and virtuous looking as if there were no such thing as malt and spirituous liquors in the world and who were seldom reminded of their misdoings by their wives to whom such occasional outbreaks were as things of course when once the immediate anxiety produced by them was over such were such are the characteristics of a class now passing away from the face of the land as their compeers the yeomen have done before them of such was william dixon he was a shrewd clever farmer in his day and generation when shrewdness was rather shown in the breeding and rearing of sheep and cattle than in the cultivation of land owing to this character of his statesmen from a distance beyond kendal or from borrowdale of greater wealth than he would send their sons to be farm servants for a year or two with him in order to learn some of his methods before setting up on land of their own when susan his daughter was about seventeen one michael hurst was farm servant at yew nook he worked with the master and lived with the family and was in all respects treated as an equal except in the field his father was a wealthy statesman at withburn up beyond grasmere and through michael's servitude the families had become acquainted and the dixons went over to the high beck sheep shearing and the hursts came down by the red bank and the lochrig tarn and across the oxen fell when there was the christmas tide feasting at yew nook the fathers strolled around the fields together examining cattle and sheep and looked knowing over each other's horses the mothers inspected the dairies and household arrangements each openly admiring the plans of the other but secretly preferring their own both fathers and mothers cast a glance from time to time at michael and susan who were thinking of nothing less than farm or dairy but whose unspoken attachment was in all ways so suitable and natural a thing that each parent rejoiced over it although with characteristic reserve it was never spoken about not even between husband and wife susan had been a strong independent healthy girl a clever help to her mother and a spirited companion to her father more of a man in her as he often said than her delicate little brother ever would have he was his mother's darling although she loved susan well there was no positive engagement between michael and susan i doubt whether even plain words of love had been spoken when one winter time margaret dixon was seized with inflammation consequent upon a neglected cold 
she had always been strong and notable and had been too busy to attend to the earliest symptoms of illness it would go off she said to the woman who helped in the kitchen or if she did not feel better when they had got the hams and bacon out of hand she would take some herb tea and nurse up a bit but death could not wait till the hams and bacon were cured he came on with rapid strides and shooting arrows of portentous agony susan had never seen illness never knew how much she loved her mother till now when she felt a dreadful instinctive certainty that she was losing her her mind was thronged with recollections of the many times she had slighted her mother's wishes her heart was full of the echoes of careless and angry replies that she had spoken what would she not now give to have opportunities of service and obedience and trials of her patience and love for that dear mother who lay gasping in torture and yet susan had been a good girl and an affectionate daughter the sharp pain went off and delicious ease came on yet still her mother sunk in the midst of this languid peace she was dying she motioned susan to her bedside for she could only whisper and then while the father was out of the room she spoke as much to the eager hungering eyes of her daughter by the motion of her lips as by the slow feeble sounds of her voice susan lass thou must not fret it is god's will and thou wilt have a deal to do keep father straight if thou canst and if he goes out elverston ways see that thou meet him before he gets to the old quarry it's a dree bit for a man who has had a drop as for lil will here the poor woman's face began to work and her fingers to move nervously as they lay on the bed quilt lil will will miss me most of all father's often vexed with him because he's not a quick strong lad he is not my poor lil chap and father thinks he's saucy because he cannot always stomach oat cake and porridge there's better than three pounds in the old black teapot on the top shelf of the cupboard just keep a piece of loaf bread by you susan dear for will to come to when he's not taken his breakfast i have maybe spoilt him but there'll be no one to spoil him now she began to cry a low feeble cry and covered up her face that susan might not see her that dear face those precious moments while yet the eyes could look out with love and intelligence susan laid her head down close by her mother's ear mother i'll take tent of will mother do you hear he shall not want aught i can give or get for him least of all the kind words which you had ever ready for us both bless you bless you my own mother thou'lt promise me that susan wilt thou i can die easy if thou'lt take charge of him but he's hardly like other folk he tries father at times though i think father'll be tender of him when i'm gone for my sake and susan there's one thing more i never spoke on it for fear of the baron being called a tell-tale but i just comforted him up he vexes michael at times and michael has struck him before now i did not want to make a stir but he's not strong and a word from thee susan will go a long way with michael susan was as red now as she had been pale before it was the first time that her influence over michael had been openly acknowledged by a third person and a flash of joy came athwart the solemn sadness of the moment her mother had spoken too much and now came on the miserable faintness she never spoke again coherently but when her children and her husband stood by her bedside she took lil will's hand and put it into susan's and looked at her with imploring eyes susan clasped her arms around will and leaned her head upon his curly little one and vowed within herself to be as a mother to him henceforward she was all in all to her brother she was a more spirited and amusing companion to him than his mother had been from her greater activity and perhaps also from her originality of character 
which often prompted her to perform her habitual actions in some new and racy manner she was tender to little will when she was prompt and sharp with everybody else with michael most of all for somehow the girl felt that unprotected by her mother she must keep up her own dignity and not allow her lover to see how strong a hold he had upon her heart he called her hard and cruel and left her so and she smiled softly to herself when his back was turned to think how little he guessed how deeply he was loved for susan was merely comely and fine-looking michael was strikingly handsome admired by all the girls for miles round and quite enough of a country coxcomb to know it and plume himself accordingly he was the second son of his father the eldest would have high beck farm of course but there was a good penny in the kendall bank in store for michael when harvest was over he went to chapel langdale to learn to dance and at night in his merry moods he would do his steps on the flag floor of the yew nook kitchen to the secret admiration of susan who had never learnt dancing but who flouted him perpetually even while she admired in accordance with the rule she seemed to have made for herself about keeping him at a distance so long as he lived under the same roof with her one evening he sulked at some saucy remark of hers he sitting in the chimney corner with his arms on his knees and his head bent forward lazily gazing into the wood fire on the hearth and luxuriating in rest after a hard day's labour she sitting among the geraniums on the long low window-seat trying to catch the last slanting rays of the autumnal light to enable her to finish stitching a shirt collar for will who lounged full length on the flags at the other side of the hearth to michael poking the burning wood from time to time with a long hazel stick to bring out the leap of glittering sparks and if you can dance a threesome reel what good does it do ye asked susan looking askance at michael who had just been vaunting his proficiency does it help you plough or reap or even climb the rocks to take a raven's nest if i were a man i'd be ashamed to give in to such softness if you were a man you'd be glad to do anything which made the pretty girls stand round and admire as they do to you eh ho oh, michael that would not be my way of being a man what would then asked he after a pause during which he had expected in vain that she would go on with her sentence no answer i should not like you as a man susie you'd be too hard and headstrong am i hard and headstrong asked she with as indifferent a tone as she could assume but which yet had a touch of pique in it his quick ear detected the inflection no susie you're wilful at times and that's right enough i don't like a girl without spirit there's a mighty pretty girl come to the dancing class but she's all milk and water her eyes never flash like yours when you're put out why i can see them flame across the kitchen like a cat's in the dark now if you were a man i should feel queer before those looks of yours as it is i rather like them because because what asked she looking up and perceiving that he had stolen close up to her because i can make all right in this way said he kissing her suddenly can you said she wrenching herself out of his grasp and panting half with rage take that by way of proof that making right is none so easy and she boxed his ear pretty sharply he went back to his seat discomfited and out of temper she could no longer see to look even if her face had not burnt and her eyes dazzled but she did not choose to move her seat so she still persevered her stooping attitude and pretended to go on sewing eleanor hebthwaite may be milk and water muttered he but confound thee lad what art doing exclaimed michael as a great piece of burning wood was cast into his face by an unlucky poke of wills thou great lounging clumsy chap i'll teach thee better and with one or two good round kicks he sent the lad whimpering away into the back kitchen when he had a little recovered himself from his passion he saw susan standing before him 
her face looking strange and almost ghastly by the reversed position of the shadows arising from the firelight shining upward right under it i tell thee what michael said she that lad's motherless but not friendless his own father lathers him and why should not i when he's given me such a burn on my face said michael putting up his hand to his cheek as if in pain his father's his father and there is naught more to be said but if he did burn thee it was by accident and not o purpose as thou kicked him it's a mercy if his ribs are not broken he howls loud enough i'm sure i might a kicked many a lad twice as hard and they'd nearer said aught but damn ye but yon lad must needs cry out like a stuck pig if one touches him replied michael sullenly susan went back to the window seat and looked absently out of the window at the drifting clouds for a minute or two while her eyes filled with tears then she got up and made for the outer door which led into the back kitchen before she reached it however she heard a low voice whose music made her thrill say susan susan her heart melted within her but it seemed like treachery to her poor boy like faithlessness to her dead mother to turn to her lover while the tears which he had caused to flow were yet unwiped on will's cheeks so she seemed to take no heed but passed into the darkness and guided by the sobs she found her way to where will sat crouched among disused tubs and churns come out wi me lad and they went into the orchard where the fruit trees were bare of leaves but ghastly in their tattered covering of grey moss and the soughing november wind came with long sweeps over the fells till it rattled among the crackling boughs underneath which the brother and sister sat in the dark he in her lap and she hushing his head against her shoulder thou shouldst not play with fire it's a naughty trick thou'lt suffer for it in worse ways nor this before thou'st done i'm afeard i should a hit thee twice as lungeous kicks as mike if i'd been in his place he didna hurt thee i'm sure she assumed half as a question yes but he did he turned me quite sick and he let his head fall languidly down on his sister's breast come lad come lad she said anxiously be a man it was not much that i saw why when first the red cow came she kicked me far harder for offering to milk her before her legs were tied see thee here's a peppermint drop and i'll make thee a pasty to-night only don't give way so for it hurts me sore to think that michael has done thee any harm my pretty willie roused himself up and put back the wet and ruffled hair from his heated face and he and susan rose up and hand in hand went towards the house walking slowly and quietly except for a kind of sob which willie could not repress susan took him to the pump and washed his tear-stained face till she thought she had obliterated all traces of the recent disturbance arranging his curls for him and then she kissed him tenderly and let him in hoping to find michael in the kitchen and make all straight between them but the blaze had dropped down into darkness the wood was a heap of grey ashes in which the sparks ran hither and thither but even in the groping darkness susan knew by the sinking at her heart that michael was not there she threw another brand on the hearth and lighted the candle and sat down to her work in silence willie cowered on his stool by the side of the fire eyeing his sister from time to time and sorry and oppressed he knew not why by the sight of her grave almost stern face no one came they too were in the house alone the old woman who helped susan with the household work had gone out for the night to some friend's dwelling william dixon the father was up on the fell seeing after his sheep susan had no heart to prepare the evening meal susy darling are you angry with me said willie in his little piping gentle voice he had stolen up to his sister's side i won't ever play with fire again and i'll not cry if michael does kick me 
only don't look so like dead mother don't don't please don't he exclaimed hiding his face on her shoulder i'm not angry willie said she don't be feared on me you want your supper and you shall have it and don't you be feared on michael he shall give reason for every hair of your head that he touches he shall when william dixon came home he found susan and willie sitting together hand in hand and apparently pretty cheerful he bade them go to bed for that he would sit up for michael and the next morning when susan came down she found that michael had started an hour before with the cart for lime it was a long day's work susan knew it would be late perhaps later than on the preceding night before he returned at any rate past her usual bedtime and on no account would she stop up a minute beyond that hour in the kitchen whatever she might do in her bedroom here she sat and watched till past midnight and when she saw him coming up the brow with the carts she knew full well even in that faint moonlight that his gait was the gait of man in liquor but though she was annoyed and mortified to find in what way he had chosen to forget her the fact did not disgust or shock her as it would have done many a girl even at that day who had not been brought up as susan had among a class who considered it no crime but rather a mark of spirit in a man to get drunk occasionally nevertheless she chose to hold herself very high all the next day when michael was perforce obliged to give up any attempt to do heavy work and hung about the outbuildings and farm in a very disconsolate and sickly state willie had far more pity on him than susan before evening willie and he were fast and on his side ostentatious friends willie rode the horses down to the water willie helped him to chop wood susan sat gloomily at her work hearing an indistinct but cheerful conversation going on in the shippen while the cows were being milked she almost felt irritated with her little brother as if he were a traitor and had gone over to the enemy in the very battle she was fighting in his cause she was alone with no one to speak to while they prattled on regardless if she were glad or sorry soon willie burst in susan susan come with me i've something so pretty to show you round the corner of the barn run run he was dragging her along half reluctant half desirous of some change in that weary day round the corner of the barn and caught hold of by michael who stood there awaiting her oh willie cried she you naughty boy there is nothing pretty what have you brought me here for let me go i won't be held only one word nay if you wish it so much you may go said michael suddenly loosing his hold as she struggled but now she was free she only drew off a step or two murmuring something about willie you are going then said michael with seeming sadness you won't hear me say a word of what is in my heart how can i tell whether it is what i should like to hear replied she still drawing back that is just what i want you to tell me i want you to hear it and then to tell me whether you like it or not well you may speak replied she turning her back and beginning to plait the hem of her apron he came close to her ear i'm sorry i hurt willie the other night he has forgiven me can you you hurt him very badly she replied but you are right to be sorry i forgive you stop stop said he laying his hand upon her arm there is something more i've got to say i want you to be my what is that they call it susan i don't know said she half laughing but trying to get away with all her might now and she was a strong girl but she could not manage it you do my what is it i want you to be i tell you i don't know and you had best be quiet 
and just let me go in, or I shall think you're as bad now as you were last night. And how did you know what I was last night? It was past twelve when I came home. Were you watching? Ah, Susan, be my wife, and you shall never have to watch for a drunken husband. If I were your husband, I would come straight home, and count every minute an hour till I saw your bonny face. Now you know what I want you to be. I ask you to be my wife. Will you, my own dear Susan? She did not speak for some time. Then she only said, Ask father. And now she was really off like a lapwing around the corner of the barn, and up in her own little room, crying with all her might, before the triumphant smile had left Michael's face where he stood. The Ask father was a mere form to be gone through. Old Daniel Hurst and William Dixon had talked over what they could respectively give their children long before this, and that was the parental way of arranging such matters. When the probable amount of worldly gear that he could give his child had been named by each father, the young folk, as they said, might take their own time in coming to the point which the old men, with the prescience of experience, saw that they were drifting to. No need to hurry them, for they were both young, and Michael, though active enough, was too thoughtless, old Daniel said, to be trusted with the entire management of a farm. Meanwhile his father would look about him, and see after all the farms that were to be let. Michael had a shrewd notion of this preliminary understanding between the fathers, and so felt less daunted than he might otherwise have done at making the application for Susan's hand. It was all right. There was not an obstacle, only a deal of good advice, which the lover thought might have as well been spared, and which it must be confessed he did not much attend to, although he assented to every part of it. Then Susan was called downstairs, and slowly came dropping into view down the steps which led from the two family apartments into the house-place. She tried to look composed and quiet, but it could not be done. She stood side by side with her lover, with her head drooping, her cheeks burning, not daring to look up or move, while her father made the newly betrothed a somewhat formal address, in which he gave his consent, and many a piece of worldly wisdom beside. Susan listened as well as she could for the beating of her heart, but when her father solemnly and sadly referred to his own lost wife, she could keep from sobbing no longer, but throwing her apron over her face, she sat down on the bench by the dresser, and fairly gave way to pent-up tears. Oh, how strangely sweet to be comforted as she was comforted, by tender caress and many a low-whispered promise of love. Her father sat by the fire, thinking of the days that were gone. Willie was still out of doors, but Susan and Michael felt no one's presence or absence. They only knew they were together as betrothed husband and wife. In a week or two they were formally told of the arrangements to be made in their favour. A small farm in the neighbourhood happened to fall vacant, and Michael's father offered to take it for him, and be responsible for the rent for the first year, while William Dixon was to contribute a certain amount of stock and both fathers were to help towards the furnishing of the house. Susan received all this information in a quiet, indifferent way. She did not much care for any of these preparations, which were to hurry her through the happy hours. She cared least of all for the money amount of dowry and of substance. It jarred on her to be made the confident of occasional slight repinings of Michael's, as one by one his future father-in-law set aside a beast or a pig for Susan's portion, which were not always the best animals of their kind upon the farm. But he also complained of his own father's stinginess, which somewhat, though not much, alleviated Susan's dislike to being awakened out of her pure dream of love to the consideration of worldly wealth. But in the midst of all this bustle, Willie moped and pined. 
he had the same cord of delicacy running through his mind that made his body feeble and weak he kept out of the way and was apparently occupied in whittling and carving uncouth heads on hazel sticks in an outhouse but he positively avoided michael and shrunk away even from susan she was too much occupied to notice this at first michael pointed it out to her saying with a laugh look at willie he might be a cast-off lover and jealous of me he looks so dark and downcast at me michael spoke this jest out loud and willie burst into tears and ran out of the house let me go let me go said susan for her lover's arm was round her waist i must go to him if he's fretting i promised mother i would she pulled herself away and went in search of the boy she sought in byre and barn through the orchard where indeed in this leafless winter time there was no great concealment up into the room where the wool was usually stored in the late summer and at last she found him sitting at bay like some hunted creature up behind the woodstack what are you gone for lad and me seeking you everywhere asked she breathless i did not know you would seek me i've been away many a time and no one has cared to seek me said he crying afresh nonsense replied susan don't be so foolish ye little good for naught but she crept up to him in the hole he had made underneath the great brown sheaves of wood and squeezed herself down by him what for should folk seek after you when you get away from them whenever you can asked she they don't want me to stay nobody wants me if i go with father he says i hinder more than i help you used to like to have me with you but now you've taken up with michael and you'd rather i was away and i can just bide away but i cannot stand michael jeering at me he's got you to love him and that might serve him but i love you too dearly lad said she putting her arm around his neck which on us do you like best said he wistfully after a little pause putting her arm away so that he might look in her face and see if she spoke truth she went very red you should not ask such questions they are not fit for you to ask nor for me to answer but mother bade you love me said he plaintively and so i do and so i ever will do lover nor husband shall come betwixt thee and me lad ne'er a one of them that i promise thee as i promised mother before in the sight of god and with her hearkening now if ever she can hearken to earthly word again only i cannot abide to have thee fretting just because my heart is large enough for two and thou'lt love me always always and ever and the more the more thou'lt love michael said she dropping her voice i'll try said the boy sighing for he remembered many a harsh word and blow of which his sister knew nothing she would have risen up to go away but he held her tight for here and now she was all his own and he did not know when such a time might come again so the two sat crouched up and silent till they heard the horn blowing at the field gate which was the summons home to any wanderers belonging to the farm and at this hour of the evening signified that supper was ready then the two went in <laughs>